man's eternal quest collected talks and essays on realizing God in daily life. By Paramahansa Yogananda. About this book. Man's Eternal Quest is the first in a series of anthologies of Paramahansa Yogananda's collected talks. He spoke extemporaneously, using no notes or written text, regardless of his topic. That his words have been preserved for present and future generations is due primarily to the devoted efforts of one of his earliest and closest disciples, who served for many years as his confidential secretary and assisted him in carrying out his spiritual and humanitarian work. For more than two decades Sridaya Mata recorded stenographically his public lectures and classes. Man's Eternal Quest provides readers with a generous selection of Paramahansa Yogananda's written and spoken words on a wide range of subjects, and offers as well a glimpse of the dynamic and loving personality of the great world teacher. Man's Eternal Quest Chapter How Seekers First Found God We can readily understand how man first conceived of a science of medicine. He suffered physically and therefore sought a method to heal himself. But how did man happen to try to find out about God? The question gives scope for profound reflection. In the Vedas of India, we find the earliest true concept of God. In her scriptures India has given the world immortal truths that have stood the test of time. Every material inventor is actuated by material need. Necessity is the mother of invention. Similarly motivated by necessity, the early rishis of India became ardent spiritual seekers. They had found that without inner satisfaction, no amount of external good fortune can bring lasting happiness. How then can one make himself really happy? That is the problem the wise men of India undertook to solve. Three aspects of nature. Worship of God in prehistoric times began through man's fear of the various forces of nature. When it rained excessively, floods killed many people. Odd man thought of the rain and wind and other natural forces as gods. Later on, human beings realized that nature operates in three ways, creative, preservative, and dissolutive. A wave rising out of the ocean exemplifies the creative state. Staying for a moment on the sea breast, it is in the preservative state, and sinking back into the deep, it passes through the dissolutive state. Just as Jesus beheld the universal force of evil personified in Satan, so the great rishis beheld the universal forces of creation, preservation, and dissolution personified in definite forms. The sages of old named them Brahma the Creator, Vishnu the Preserver, and Shiva the Destroyer. These primal powers were created as projections of the unmanifested spirit to unfold his infinite drama of creation, while he as God beyond creation remains ever hidden behind their consciousness. In times of cosmic dissolution, all creation and its vast activating forces dissolve back into spirit. There they rest until called upon again by the great director to reenact their roles. A story about Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. In India, there is a popular story about Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. They were boasting among themselves about their tremendous might. Suddenly, a little boy came up and said to Brahma, What do you create? Everything, Brahma replied grandly. The boy asked the other two gods what their work was. We preserve and destroy everything, they answered. The young visitor was holding in his hand a single piece of straw about the size of a toothpick. Placing it in front of Brahma, he asked, Can you create a piece of straw like this? After prodigious effort, Brahma found to his astonishment that he could not. The lad then turned to Vishnu and asked him to save the straw, which was slowly starting to dissolve under the boy's steady gaze. Vishnu's efforts to hold it together were fruitless. Finally, the little stranger produced the piece of straw again and asked Shiva to destroy it. But try as Shiva would to annihilate it, the tiny straw remained intact. The little boy turned again to Brahma, Did you create me? He asked. Brahma thought and thought, he could not remember ever having created this amazing child. Suddenly the boy vanished. The three gods awoke from their delusion and remembered that behind their power is a greater power. God, the Supreme Cause. 
In the Western world, the idea of God developed through observation of the law of cause and effect. Man can materialize objects by taking materials from the earth and shaping them in accordance with a preconceived idea. Therefore, it seemed reasonable to conclude that this whole universe must have been created out of ideas. This led to the concept that everything must have existed first as an idea. Someone had to create that first idea or cosmic plan. Thus, through the analogy of the law of cause and effect, intelligent men reasoned that there must be a supreme cause. Science has learned that all matter is made of invisible building blocks, electrons and protons, just as a house is built of bricks. But nobody can tell why some electrons and protons become wood and others become human bone and so on. What intelligence guides them? This line of questioning gives room for God in even the material scientist theories about the nature of the phenomenal worlds. The sages of India say that everything proceeds from and goes back into its source, God. Evidence of order and harmony is everywhere. Perceiving that every human being is a compound of matter and mind, the earliest Western thinkers believed that two independent forces existed, nature and mind. Later they began asking themselves, why is everything in nature arranged in a particular way? Why isn't one of man's arms longer than the other? Why don't stars and planets collide? Everywhere we see evidence of order and harmony in the universe. They concluded that mind and matter could not be both separate and sovereign. A single intelligence must govern all. This conclusion naturally led to the idea that there is just one God who is both the cause and matter and the intelligence within and behind it. One who attains the ultimate wisdom realizes that everything is spirit, in essence though hidden in manifestation. If you had the perception, you would see God in everything. Then the question is, how did seekers first find him? As the beginning step, they closed their eyes to shut out immediate contact with the world and matter, so they could concentrate more fully on discovering the intelligence behind it. They reasoned that they could not behold God's presence in nature through the ordinary perceptions of the five senses. So they began to try to feel Him within themselves by deeper and deeper concentration. They eventually discovered how to shut off all five senses, thus temporarily doing away entirely with the consciousness of matter. The inner world of the spirit began to open up. To those great ones of ancient India who undeviatingly persisted in these inner investigations, God finally revealed himself. Devotion and right activity attract God's attention. Thus the saints gradually began to convert their conceptions of God into perceptions of him. That is what you must do also if you would know him. You don't stay long enough at your prayers. First you must have a right concept of God, a definite idea through which you can form a relationship with Him, and then you must meditate and pray until that mental conception becomes changed into actual perception. Then you will know Him. If you persist, the Lord will come. The searcher of hearts wants only your sincere love. He is like a little child, Someone may offer him his whole wealth and he doesn't want it, and another cries to him, O oh Lord, I love you. And into that devotee's heart he comes running. Don't seek God with any ulterior motive, but pray to him with devotion. Unconditional, one-pointed, steady devotion. When your love for him is as great as your attachment to your mortal body, he will come to you. In seeking the Lord, activity comes after devotion and importance. Some say God is power, therefore let us act with power. When you are active in doing good with the Lord ever uppermost in your mind, you will perceive Him in this way. But there is wrong as well as right activity even in doing good. A zealous churchman who brings more and more people into his congregation solely to satisfy his own ego is not going to please God through that activity. To realize the presence of the divine indweller should be the first desire in every heart. It is when you persistently, selflessly perform every action with love-inspired thoughts of God that he will come to you. Then you realize that you are the ocean of life, which has become the tiny wave of each life. That is the way of knowing the Lord through activity. 
when in every action you think of him before you act, while you are performing the action, and after you have finished it, he will reveal himself to you. You must work, but let God work through you. This is the best part of devotion. If you are constantly thinking that he is walking through your feet, working through your hands, accomplishing through your will, you will know him. You should also develop discrimination, so that you prefer spiritually constructive, God-conscious activity to work performed without any thought of Him. Meditation is the highest form of activity. But greater than activity, devotion, or reason is meditation. To meditate truly is to concentrate solely on spirit. This is esoteric meditation. It is the highest form of activity that man can perform, and it is the most balanced way to find God. If you work all the time, you may become mechanical and lose him in preoccupation with your duties. And if you seek him only through discriminative thought, you may lose him in the labyrinths of endless reasoning. And if you cultivate only devotion for God, your development may become merely emotional. But meditation combines and balances all these approaches. Work, eat, walk, laugh, cry, meditate, only for him. That is the best way to live. In so doing you will be truly happy serving him, loving him, and communing with him. So long as you let the desires and weaknesses of the physical body control your thoughts and actions, you will not find him. Always be master of your body. When you sit in the church or temple, you perhaps feel a little devotion and a little discriminative perception, but that is not enough. The esoteric activity of meditation is necessary if you really want to be aware of his presence. You might think that after two hours of meditation I would be bored to death. No, I couldn't find anything in the world as intoxicating as this God of mine. When I drink that aged wine of my soul, a skyful of happiness throbs in my heart. Divine joy is in everyone. Sunlight shines equally on the charcoal and the diamond, but the diamond reflects the light. Such are the transparent minds that know and reflect spirit. Thus in the esoteric activity of meditation you have the solution to the mystery of knowing God. I do not blame you for what you do, but for what you do not do. You think you have no time for God. Suppose the Lord were too busy to look after you. What then? Rest your mind from the mirage of the senses and habit. Why be deluded like that? I am pointing out to you a land more beautiful than anything here can ever be. I am telling you of a happiness that will intoxicate you night and day. You won't need sense temptations to enthrall you. Discipline your body and your mind. Control your senses. Find God. I often say that this body is a switchboard and the five senses are its telephone instruments. Through them I am in touch with the world, but when I don't wish to communicate, I shut off my five senses and live in the inexpressible joy of God. The Heavenly Father doesn't want you, His children, to suffer anymore. The sensory delusion in which you live must be overcome. You should conceive of God as the highest necessity of life. Break the shackles of limitation, of dark habits and mechanical daily routine. I condemn no man, only man's unbelief and oblivion of God. He can be known by using the technique of meditation. Then he shall throb as wisdom in your mind, and as joy in your heart, and you will be more active and more successful than you have ever been before. Dear ones, I was once like you. I walked the earth seeking truth and happiness, yet everything that promised me joy gave me misery, and so I turned to God. You all must discover your own divinity and win the kingdom of God for yourselves. The self is your savior. These deep truths are not for the inspiration of a passing moment, but should be assimilated and made practical for your highest benefit. If only people knew wherein lies their own good. To those who act wrongly the self is an enemy. Befriend the self and the self will save you. There is no other savior than yourself. The fetters of ignorance and bad habits keep you bound. It is because you are determined to follow your wrong habits that you suffer. If only you would picture life a little ahead, lest the time, the precious time that is given you, slip away fruitlessly. The Hindus have a saying, The child is busy with play, the youth is busy with sex, and the adult is busy with worries. How few are busy with God? 
Banish the imaginary hope that happiness will come from worldly fulfillments. Prosperity isn't enough, gracious living isn't enough. You want to be eternally happy. Seize the God within you and realize that the self is divinity. You must be able to answer with surety the highest question of your intelligence, whence did I come? God and immortality are not myths. It is the gravest insult to the self within you to die believing you are a mortal being. How long will you let yourselves, sons of God, be helplessly mowed down by the sickle of death because you never tried during your lifetime to conquer Maya, ignorance? Reason gives man the power to seek God. There is a God. He has given man independence, power, and reason. Man can find the Lord because of the gift of reason. To spend your time just playing with life and not finding God is wasting the divinely bestowed power within you. Use the key of reason. It is not found in stones and animals. God gave man reason that he might find freedom from the delusion of mortality. If you let your reason be trampled by ego and wrong habits, what then? If people bow to your will, what then? Happiness still eludes you. That is why Jesus chose God instead of Satan when the devil tried to tempt him. Jesus realized that although worldly power has many attractions, it does not last. He had found something greater than all the riches of this universe. The things that most men desire are perishable. But God will never leave Jesus. He is still enjoying the omnipresent divine kingdom. So should each one of us choose the life that leads to God. You are punishing the soul by keeping it buried, slumbering in matter life after life, frightened by nightmares of suffering and death. Realize that you are the soul. Remember that the feeling behind your feeling, the will behind your will, the power behind your power, the wisdom behind your wisdom is the infinite Lord. Unite the heart's feeling and the mind's reason in a perfect balance. In a castle of calmness, again and again cast off identification with earthly titles and plunge into deep meditation to realize your divine kingship. Look within yourself. Remember the infinite is everywhere. Diving deep into superconsciousness, you can speed your mind through eternity. By the power of mind you can go farther than the farthest star. The searchlight of mind is fully equipped to throw its superconscious rays into the innermost heart of truth. Use it to do so. Remember it is you who must travel to the kingdom of heaven. It will not come to you by special delivery. Each man has to hide his own way alone. From this day make a resolution in your heart to seek God. When many devotees follow the path to Him, there will arise a united states of the world with God and His love as man's director and guide. I want to give you more than the temporary inspiration of words alone. I want to shoot star shells of wisdom straight into your spiritual darkness, that by their bursting light you may see for yourself the truth of what I have said. The two paths, activity and meditation. To summarize, there are basically two approaches to God realization, the outer way and the inner or transcendental way. The outer way is by right activity, loving and serving mankind with the consciousness centered in God. The transcendental way is by deep esoteric meditation. By the transcendental way you realize all the things you are not and discover that which you are. I am not the breath, I am not the body, neither bones nor flesh. I am not the mind or feeling. I am that which is behind the breath, body, mind and feeling. When you go beyond the consciousness of this world, knowing that you are not the body or the mind, and yet aware as never before that you exist, that divine consciousness is what you are. You are that in which is rooted everything in the universe. Why not inquire behind the darkness when you close your eyes? That is the place to explore. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Vast lights and cosmic forces are moving there. Skyfuls of eternal bliss will be open samedi is a joyous experience, a splendid light in which you behold the countless worlds floating in a vast bed of joy and bliss. Banish the spiritual ignorance that makes you think this mortal life is real. Have these beautiful experiences for yourself in eternal samadhi in God. Auroras of light, skyfuls of eternal bliss will be open to you. 
All great teachers declare that within this body is the immortal soul, a spark of that which sustains all. He who knows his soul knows this truth. I am beyond everything finite. I now see that the spirit alone in space with its ever new joy has expressed itself as the vast body of nature. I am the stars, I am the waves, I am the life of all. I am the laughter within all hearts. I am the smile on the faces of flowers and in each soul. I am the wisdom and power that sustain all creation. Realize that. My words may remain vibrating within you, but if you sleep on in delusion, you will not know it. If you awaken, you will be conscious that the truth I have spoken is ever throbbing within your soul. Meditate. Learn this liberating lesson. Wait no more. I came here not to entertain you with worldly festivities but to arouse your sleeping memory of immortality. You do not realize the pain that comes to those who remain in delusion. I suffer for you and will do everything to help you realize that illumination is within. Free yourself forever. Chapter The Universality of Yoga Yoga is a system of scientific methods for reuniting the soul with the spirit. We have come down from God and we must reason to Him. We have seemingly become separated from our Father and we must consciously reunite with Him. Yoga teaches us how to rise above the delusion of separation and realize our oneness with God. The poet Milton wrote of the soul of man and how it might regain paradise. That is the purpose and goal of yoga to regain the lost paradise of soul consciousness by which man knows that he is and ever has been one with spirit. The world's various religions are based more or less on the beliefs of man. But the true basis of religion should be a science that all devotees may apply in order to reach our one Father God. Yoga is that science. The practice of a science of religion is imperative. Different dogmatic isms have kept mankind divided, although Jesus pointed out, if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Unity among various religions may be brought about only when the individuals who practice those religions become actually aware of God within. Then we shall have a true brotherhood of man under the fatherhood of God. The great religions of the world all preach the necessity of finding God, of brotherhood among men and all have a moral code, such as the Ten Commandments. What then creates the differences among them? It is the bigotry in men's minds. Not by concentrating on dogma may we reach God, but by actual soul knowledge. When men perceive the universal truths underlying various religions, there will be no more difficulties over dogma. To me there is neither Jew, nor Christian, nor Hindu, all are my brothers. I worship in all temples for each of them has been erected to honor my Father. We should begin to build world unity with the idea that has been initiated by self-realization fellowship. A church of all religions, not eclecticism, but respect for all religions as constituting various paths to God. Such temples dedicated to the one God that all religions worship should be built everywhere. I predict that this will come about. East and West should destroy forever narrow divisions in the houses of God. Attaining self-realization through yoga, men will come to know that they are all children of the One Father. The blind cannot lead the blind. That unity of spirit is demonstrated in great men, those with God-realization. The blind cannot lead the blind. Only a master, one who knows God, may rightly teach others about him. To regain one's divinity one must have such a master or guru. He who faithfully follows a true guru becomes like him, for the guru helps to elevate the disciple to his own level of realization. When I found my guru, Swami Sri Yukteswarji, I made up my mind to follow his example, to place God alone on the altar of my heart, and to share him with others. The Hindu masters taught that to gain the deepest knowledge one should focus his gaze through the omniscient spiritual eye. When concentrating hard, even the non-yogi wrinkles his forehead at the point between the eyebrows, the center of concentration, and of the spherical spiritual eye, the seat of soul intuition. That is the real crystal ball into which the yogi gazes to learn the secrets of the universe. 
Those who go deep enough in their concentration will penetrate that third eye and see God. Seekers of truth, therefore, should develop the ability to project their perception through the spiritual eye. The practice of yoga helps the aspirant to open the single eye of intuitive consciousness. Intuition or direct knowledge does not depend on any data from the senses. That is why the intuitive faculty is often called the sixth sense. Everyone has this sixth sense, but most people do not develop it. However, almost everyone has had some intuitional experience, perhaps a feeling that a particular thing is going to happen when there is no sensory evidence to indicate it. It is important to develop intuition or direct soul knowledge for he who is God conscious is sure of himself. He knows and he knows that he knows. We must be sure of God's presence, as sure as we are that we know the taste of an orange. It was only after my guru had shown me how to commune with God, and after I had felt his presence every day, that I assumed the spiritual duty of telling others about him. The West has emphasized large temples of worship, but there are few in which the worshippers are shown how God may be found. In the East, the emphasis has been on the development of men of God realization, but they are in many cases inaccessible to spiritual seekers, remaining in seclusion in remote and solitary abodes. Spiritual centers in which people may come in with God, and teachers who can show people how to do so, are both necessary. How may one receive knowledge of God from a teacher who himself does not know God? My guru impressed upon me the necessity of knowing the Heavenly Father before trying to tell others about Him. How grateful I am to have received His training. He Himself truly communed with God. The Lord must first be perceived in one's own bodily temple. Every seeker should daily discipline his thoughts and place on the altar of his soul the wild flowers of his devotion. He who finds God within will be able to feel his presence in every church or temple he enters. Yoga converts theology to practical experience. Yoga enables man to perceive the truth in all religions. Ten commandments are preached in various words in every religion. But the two greatest commandments are those emphasized by Jesus. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Loving God with all thy mind means withdrawing one's attention from the senses and giving it to God, giving to Him one's whole concentration in meditation. Every seeker of God must learn to concentrate. A prayer that one utters while at the same time thinking of other things in the background of the mind is not a true prayer and is unheeded by God. Yoga teaches that in order to find the Father it is first necessary to seek Him with all one's mind, with concentration that is one-pointed. Some people say that the Hindus are more adapted to the practice of yoga, that yoga is not suited to Westerners. This is not true. Many Westerners are at present in a better position to practice yoga than many Hindus are, because scientific advancements have given Westerners much free time. India should more and more utilize the progressive material methods of the West to make life easier and freer, and the West should take from India the practical metaphysical methods of yoga whereby every man may find his way to God. Yoga is not a sect but a universally applicable science by which we can find our Father. Yoga is for everybody, for the people of the West as well as for those of the East. One would not say that the telephone is not for the East just because it was invented in the West. Similarly, the methods of yoga, although developed in the East, are not exclusively for the East but are useful to all mankind. Whether a man is born in India or in America, he someday has to die. Why not learn how to die daily in God, like St. Paul? Yoga teaches the method. Man lives in the body as a prisoner. When his term is over, he suffers the indignity of being thrown out. Love of the body is therefore nothing more than love of jail. Long accustomed to living in the body, we have forgotten what real freedom means. Being a Westerner is no excuse for not seeking freedom. It is vital to every man that he discover his soul and know his immortal nature. Yoga shows the way. The soul must recent to God. Before creation existed there was cosmic consciousness, 
spirit or God, the absolute, ever-existing, ever-conscious, ever-new bliss beyond form and manifestation. When creation came into being, cosmic consciousness descended into the physical universe where it manifests as Christ consciousness, the omnipresent pure reflection of God's intelligence and consciousness inherent and hidden within all creation. When the Christ consciousness descends into the physical body of man it becomes soul or superconsciousness. The ever-existing, ever-conscious, ever-new bliss of God individualized by encasement in the body. When the soul becomes identified with the body, it manifests as ego mortal consciousness. Yoga teaches that the soul must climb back up the ladder of consciousness to spirit. Secret of happiness is consciousness of God's presence. It is all right to enjoy life. The secret of happiness is not to become attached to anything. Enjoy the smell of the flower but see God in it. I have kept the consciousness of the senses only that in using them I may always perceive and think of God. Mine eyes were made to behold thy beauty everywhere. My ears were made to hear thine omnipresent voice. That is yoga union with God. It is not necessary to go to the forest to find him. Worldly habits will hold us fast wherever we may be until we free ourselves from them. The yogi learns to find God in the cave of his heart. Wherever he goes he carries with him the blissful consciousness of God's presence. Man has not only descended into mortal sense consciousness but has become bound by abnormalities of that sense consciousness such as greed, anger and jealousy. Man must banish these abnormalities in order to find God. Both Easterners and Westerners should be free from sense slavery. An ordinary man may become angry because his morning coffee hasn't been brought to him and he is sure the deprivation will give him a headache. He is a slave of his habits. The developed yogi is free. Everyone can be a yogi right where he is now. But we are prone to think strange and difficult anything that is beyond the horizon of our own habits of life. We do not consider how our habits may appear to others. The practice of yoga leads to freedom. Some yogis carry this idea of non-attachment to extremes. They teach that one should be able to lie on a bed of nails without discomfort and other forms of tapasya physical discipline. It is true that one who can sit on a bed of nails and think of God shows great strength of mind. But such feats are not necessary. One may just as well sit in a comfortable chair and meditate on God. Patanjali teaches that any posture that keeps the spine erect is good for meditation, yogic concentration on God. It is not necessary to go through physical contortions or to practice exercises requiring extraordinary physical endurance and suppleness, as is advocated in Hatha Yoga. God is the objective, consciousness of His presence is what we should work toward. The Bhagavad Gita says, He who with devotion absorbs himself in me with his soul immersed in me, him I regard, among all classes of yogis, as the most equilibrated. Hindu yogis have been known to demonstrate obliviousness to extremes of heat and cold and to mosquitoes and other annoying insects. Such a demonstration is not a requisite of being a yogi, but it is natural achievement of the adept. Try to eliminate disturbing elements or to endure them, if necessary, without being disturbed inwardly by them. If one can remain clean, it is pointless to be dirty. One may become attached to living in a hut as well as to living in a palace. The greatest factor in achieving spiritual success is willingness. Jesus said the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. People of the world seek the gifts of God, but he who is wise seeks the giver himself. To be a yogi is to meditate. The yogi doesn't think first of food for his body upon waking each morning. He feeds his soul with the ambrosia of God communion. Filled with the inspiration found by his deeply diving meditative mind, he is able to perform happily all the duties of the day. God made this earth as it is on purpose. In his plan, it is man's part to make the world better. The Westerner tends to go to extremes in keeping constantly busy getting new and improved material comforts. 
the Easterner tends to go to extremes in being satisfied with what he has. There is something appealing about both the go-ahead spirit of the West and the easy, calm spirit of the East. We should take the balanced road between. Meditation makes the yogi. Kind God, one should meditate every morning and night, and whenever there is a little spare time during the day. In addition, it is important to meditate for six hours on one day out of the week. This is not unreasonable. Some people practice at the piano for ten hours every day of the week and think nothing of it. To become a spiritual master, it is necessary to give more time to God. We have to make Him feel that we love Him more than anything else. When you become experienced in meditation, able to go deep into superconsciousness, five hours of sleep are enough. The rest of the night should be used for meditation. One can use nights and early mornings and holidays for meditating on God. In this way anyone, even the busy Westerner, can be a yogi. So become a Western yogi. You don't have to wear a turban or to have long hair like me. We need the hives of churches, but we also need to fill the churches with the honey of our own self-realization. God is present in the churches too, of course, but your just going there will not persuade him to reveal himself. Church going is good, but daily meditation is better still. Do both because you will certainly have inspiration from going to church, and from daily meditation you will receive even greater upliftment. It is when a devotee's heart is afire and when he throws shell after shell of prayer that God surrenders to him. That unceasing devotion is essential to finding him. In order to be a yogi and still keep pace with the modern world, it is necessary to meditate at home, to discipline oneself, and to perform all duties with the attitude that they are a service to God. My greatest desire is to build temples of God in the souls of men, to see the smile of God on men's faces. The most important of all life's accomplishments is to establish a temple of God in one's own soul, and it can be easily done. That is why Self-Realization Fellowship was sent to the West. Anyone who has established God in his soul temple is a yogi. He can say with me that yoga is for the East, North, South, and West, for all people, that they may follow the byways of theology to join the highway of yoga. The right road leads to the palace of God's bliss. He who once reaches there shall go no more out. Chapter The Infinite Nature of God the Hindu scriptures state that God is beyond comprehension by mind and intellect. Powerful as they are, their scope is insufficient to contain Him. So the human mind is incapable of a true conception of God. The question who made God arises only because mind cannot comprehend that which has neither beginning nor end. When you are looking at the sun millions of miles away in the sky, that huge luminary seems smaller by far than our earth. Yet the diameter of Earth is roughly 7,900 miles, and the Sun is more than a hundred times that wide. If you could place our planet next to the Sun, Earth would appear by comparison a tiny dot. Let us suppose the giant solar orb is expanding, growing more and more huge, until the vast blue expanse of the sky is entirely swallowed up by its mass. The space thus filled is nevertheless but a particle, a mere speck of the space that spreads through countless universes and into infinity. With the sun to go on endlessly enlarging in space, still it would not be able to take the measure of infinity. The cosmic delusion of finitude prevents the mind from conceiving such vastness. Where are its boundaries? Whence came this endless void? The originless immeasurable is God. Omnipresent in the farthest reaches of space, he is in the distant stars, and in you and me, and he is conscious every moment of every place he is. God is not mind, he created it, and he is beyond it. Otherwise we could conceive him in our minds. We can accurately call him divine consciousness, divine joy, divine existence, but not mind. Though mind is incapable of encompassing omnipresence, it is nevertheless able to feel God. Feeling His presence and measuring it are two different experiences. The wave cannot measure the ocean, but there is a point of contact between them. 
So where the infinite becomes the finite there is a point of contact, the superconscious mind. That mind can feel God. When we expand the ordinary mind until it impinges on the superconscious mind, we are able to feel his presence. We have descended from the infinite into the finite. We have descended from the infinite into the finite. Yoga is withdrawal of the attention from externals in order to focus it on the inner source of truth. Only in this way can we discover how God has condensed his consciousness into the multitudinous finite forms of his creatures and the universes they inhabit. The human body is the most intricate of all his creations. A single original cell, the united sperm and ovum, divides, and by multiplication of the process builds up trillions of cells around itself to create the bodily temple that houses our divine soul consciousness. You don't realize how much energy is locked in even one little gram of flesh. Its release would spread countless electrons far into space. And the power and extent of the consciousness that is present in the body is beyond human conception. Though externally we are made of flesh, behind its gross cells are electrical currents, life currents. And behind these subtle energies are the thoughts and perceptions. Thought is inexhaustible. Since the world began, thoughts in unimaginable numbers have passed through the ether. One could not begin to count them, but it is possible to get some idea if you reflect on how many thoughts and feelings you express during your own lifetime. Millions. Try to remember all you have thought in just one year, or even in one day. Consider the accumulation of thoughts of every human being through unrecorded ages past. God knows them all. Mind cannot measure even the subtle phenomena of nature. How many electrons whirl in the electricity that flows into the light bulbs here in the chapel? Trillions dancing together make this light you behold. These ultramicroscopic particles are moving at a speed equivalent to traveling from here to New York or to any other part of the world in a few seconds. Scientific experiments are proving this. If you try to calculate how many protons and electrons are condensed in our Earth, the mind goes only so far and then stops. What is revealed to the searching mind seems infinite, but there is a point beyond which ideas become too subtle to follow. From that sphere where the mind cannot penetrate, God is pouring forth his essential light, the cosmic intelligent vibration that structures finite creation. God's true nature known only through intuition. If we use the mind properly, we can understand how God is beyond mind and intellect, and how his true nature can be felt only through the soul's power of intuition. We must find his consciousness through the superconscious mind, the nucleus of mind and intelligence. His infinite nature is revealed to man through the intuitive superconsciousness of the soul. The joy felt in meditation reveals the presence of eternal joy spread over all creation. The light seen in meditation is the astral light from which our tangible creation is made. Beholding this light, one feels a unity with all things. The ordinary person lives in the world but is relatively unconscious of its nature and purpose. A life of such limited perception is not unlike that of the animals. We used to have here at MT. Washington a goat that was invariably attracted by my voice. One day, while I was speaking in this chapel, the goat came trotting in and right on up the aisle to me. I am sure it didn't know what I was saying, it simply liked to hear my voice. But you come to these lectures not only to listen to the words, but also to feel the presence of God behind them. If you attune your consciousness with his consciousness and remain in that current of bliss, you will feel at one minute with him. Whatever understanding I have attained has been acquired by becoming attuned to God's consciousness within. This you too can accomplish. As one develops spiritually and realizes his kinship with all that lives, his responsibility to share the suffering of others increases. Jesus was willing even to suffer in sharing the afflictions of others. We too must do what we can for those who are shivering with cold and disease. It is a nightmare for them, and whatever of their woes we can remove, we are removing them from God also. He is not happy when his children are in misery, for he suffers in them. At this moment most of you are enjoying beauty and peace, but think of those in Louisville today. 
Thousands are suffering there because of the floods. Once long ago I was thinking how wonderful America is without the disasters that afflict so many countries. Then God showed me the floods that are occurring now. The vibrations of the thoughts and feelings of thousands being killed in the fighting in Spain have caused atmospheric changes that are responsible for these floods and other disasters around the world. Or spews out vibrations of wrong that throw all nature out of balance and harmony, causing natural catastrophes. God gave freedom to man, and man has misused that freedom. This is the cause of all suffering. The misuse of our God-given free will has terrifying consequences. I would rather someone tell me that I am about to do wrong than allow me to act and not wake up until years later to the harm I had done. Satan created ignorance, cause of all suffering. Suffering is therefore not the work of God, but of Satan's power of Maya delusion. This force creates the ignorance that blinds people to the consequences of their actions, causing them to err and thus bring suffering upon themselves. Those who are fighting in Spain, both the government forces and their opponents, think they are trying to do right. The only way to avoid error is to develop the discriminative wisdom to know what is wrong and then resolve not to do it. One wrong fighting another wrong doesn't make a right. The true enemy of man is ignorance. It must be driven from this earth. We have everything necessary in the world today to bring about the millennium. Only man's selfishness makes it impossible. Tremendous unnecessary suffering is created by man's short-sighted self-interest. Money that could feed and clothe needy people is used instead for destruction. The root cause of the world's troubles is this selfishness born of ignorance. Each person thinks he is doing right, but when he seeks to satisfy only his own interest, he is setting in motion the karmic law of cause, an effect that will inevitably destroy his own and others' happiness. The more I see of world tragedies caused by man's ignorance, the more I realize that even if every street were paved with gold, happiness would not be lasting. Happiness lies in making others happy, in forsaking self-interest to bring joy to others. If each one would do that, then everyone would be happy and all would be taken care of. That is what Jesus meant when he said, All things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. A federation of all religions and all nations is necessary. But such a union will come only when every individual engages in that meditation which leads to direct contact with God. Communion with him is the solution. When one has realized God, he no longer feels that others are different from himself. Unless such wisdom comes not to just a few but to all men, there will be no freedom on earth. Even here in America freedom is not total, suffering still abounds. Each one of us has a responsibility to bring peace and happiness to our country and to all men. One should care not only for his own nation but all countries, not only for one's own family but for all mankind. The ordinary man's interest is limited to himself and his surroundings, but the man of God identifies with the whole world. Don't think the contribution made by your spiritualized consciousness is small. Your part may mean very much. In order to know God, you must become like Him. In spite of our transgressions, in spite of our forgetfulness of God and great indifference to Him, Still he lovingly gives us life and all that supports life in this world. Nothing is greater than God, and difference to him is the highest sin. Those who are not willing to give up all they have to find him will not know him. Whoever would know God must be able to forsake all else for him. Jesus was trying to make his disciples understand this truth when he told them to keep watch and pray with him at Gethsemane. But when they fell asleep he sadly observed, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Man is like a puppet. The strings of his habits, emotions, passions, and senses make him dance to their bidding. They bind his soul. He who is unwilling or unable to cut himself free in order to know God will not find him. I see myself apart from these attachments. I eat and sometimes I don't eat, I sleep and sometimes I don't sleep. I gave up all physical necessities to prove to myself that I do not need them. 
God doesn't eat or sleep, he isn't bound by senses and habits. That is what makes him God, and we are made in his image. We should be able to give up everything to know him, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Despite all the tests I have gone through for him, in the end God has given me everything I wanted or needed of this world. And I have given it all back, for he has bestowed on me a gift infinitely greater, divine joy day and night. In that joy all desires that come into my heart are satisfied. Meditation lifts the fog of ignorance. In the Bhagavad Gita, recorded by sage Vyasa, Lord Krishna explains that if your innate wisdom is covered over with ignorance, you are deluded and thus stumble through life. Tamasic ignorant action is that which is instituted through delusion without measuring one's ability and disregarding the consequences, loss to one's self of health, wealth and influence and harm to others. When the fog of ignorance is removed by meditation you will see the right path. You will be troubled no more, you will find fulfillment eternal. Verily, nothing else in this world is as sanctifying as wisdom. In due course of time, the devotee who is successful in yoga meditation will spontaneously realize this within his self. These truths are all real to me. Truth is reality. Self-realization is not something one can learn from books. It comes only through personal experience. Realization of truth, experience of God, not dogma merely is what every religion should bring to its followers. What Jesus Christ realized we too must experience. He didn't teach that his followers should worship him as a personality, but rather experience what he experienced in his oneness with God. That can be attained only by meditation and by following God's laws. To worship Jesus because he is Jesus is not enough. Embrace the universal ideals he taught and strive to be like him. We are here on earth in this particular body form for just a little while to learn our lessons and move on. Whither are we headed now? Think how many pages have already been turned in the Lord's dream novel of creation. When I visited Salt Lake City I saw in vision a great ocean and mammoths walking on the shore. Later I learned that the skeleton of an ancient mammoth had recently been found there. As human beings we have God-given power to cast away every habit and limitation and spread our consciousness throughout creation, penetrating not only the hearts of all creatures, but reaching out beyond the stars. Our native vastness encompasses even greater space. Such tremendous possibility lies within us. We are infinite. I live in that sphere of infinity and am conscious of the body only once in a while. You are limited now, but when by deep daily meditation you become able to transfer your consciousness from the finite to the infinite, you will be free. You are not meant to be a prisoner of the body. You are a child of God. You must live up to that divine birthright. Give God first place in your heart. Wherever your mind is, that is where you will spend your time. What if God had not given you the power to play or read or work? You could do nothing. So he should come first in your life. God knows what is in your heart. Give him first place there. The only way to catch God is by love. Meditate upon him and then deeply pray, Lord, I cannot live without you. You are the power behind my consciousness. I love you. Reveal yourself to me. When you give up sleep to meditate upon him, when you forsake selfishness and cry because of his suffering in your brothers, he comes to you. When you actually sacrifice for him, he is caught in the net of your love. Nothing else can capture him. Knowledge prepares the way to love. You cannot love that which you do not know. Knowledge of God must therefore precede love for him. That knowledge comes by practice of Kriya Yoga, the technique that Lahiri Mahaseya gave. When you know God, you will love him, and when you love him, you will surrender yourself to him. Until your devotion for God and awareness of Him become complete, don't rest. Don't give in to sleep when you should be meditating. Never give anything preference before God. His love is the greatest love there is. So long as you let other things come first, He will wait. But your delay may be too long and your suffering may be great. Don't procrastinate. 
be certain in the sincerity of your conscience that you have made the effort to commune with him. Don't rest, don't give up until you can see him with your own eyes or feel him in your heart. Birth, play, marriage, children, old age, life is finished. That is not living. Life is much deeper and more wonderful than that I have found. When you know God, there is no more sorrow. All those you loved and lost in death are with you again in the eternal life. You don't know whom to consider your own anymore because everyone is yours. The beauty of God is vast. To enjoy flowers for their loveliness is good, but far greater is to see behind their purity and beauty the face of God. To be carried away by music for its own sake cannot compare with hearing God's creative voice in it. Though God is immanent in the finite beauties of creation, it is wisdom to realize one's eternal self beyond form and finitude. You know how fond I am of our grounds at the Mount Washington and Encinitas ashrams. I never tire of their beauty. But the Lord gave me an awakening experience recently. I inwardly saw people sitting about and talking. One of them proposed some activity, but another said, No, Paramahansaji taught that we must not do that. I suddenly realized that this was a vision of years to come, after I was no longer here in this body. For a moment I was shaken, then I came back to ordinary consciousness. There is no use in becoming attached to anything in this world. So many things come and go in the Lord's cosmic drama. I see airfields destroyed and the sea filled with dead and many other things to come. In my heart I see a world without me. That freedom God gives ultimately to every soul. One great saint said, I care not where I may be, O Lord, but punish me not with obliviousness of thee. There is no greater punishment. Jesus said, It is better for thee to enter into life maimed. All suffering can be taken away by the contact of God. Awake from the nightmare of suffering. In a dream you may see yourself running down a street pursued by an enemy. Suddenly you are shocked and you think, oh how terrible. I am dying. I am sad to leave this world. Then you see yourself dead. The undertaker cremates your body and your friends come to mourn when the ashes are laid away. Suddenly you wake up and see that it was only a dream. You are alive. This is similar to what happens at death. God showed me in a vision that those who are dying in the fighting in Spain are only dreaming a terrible dream of death. As soon as their consciousness is lifted from the body, they awake as from a nightmare and are glad to be free of it. Our life experiences are all part of a dream. Man himself has created the nightmare of war. But after its victims have been thrown from their bodies, they realize it was only a horrible dream from which they have awakened. They know they are not dead. This is a great metaphysical truth. If you know you are dreaming, you don't suffer from your bad experiences in the dream. But if you are identified with the dream, and in it someone strikes your head and kills you, that dream death seems a true and terrible experience until you wake up and understand it was not real. It is the same after death. Once you are out of this body, you realize you are not dead, you are free of a nightmare. So death is not the end, it is a freeing of the consciousness from imprisonment in the physical dream body. That release brings a sense of great freedom. We should never seek death. Rather we should prepare our consciousness by meditation and God communion, so that when death comes in its own time, we are able to look upon it as a dream, nothing more. I can see the dream nature of life and death any time I wish. Hence I attach little importance to this body. In oneness with God know that life is a dream. Live in the consciousness of spirit, in that oneness with God wherein you know that life is a dream. It is very easy to do when you make the effort. When suffering comes it is more difficult to detach your consciousness from identification with the body. So be wise and make the effort now, while you have strength and health. Material desires take away the desire for the infinite. Every day or so someone tells me I need this or that. It seems ridiculous because I know that thousands do not have what I am told I need. If they don't need it, why should I? Your only real need is God, there is no other necessity. Be not attached to possessions, music, books, food, or any other sense pleasures. In God you have eternal life. Become aware of this great truth, 
otherwise your appointments in life will take over, and you will die still bound by them. If you are one with him, you are not compelled to return to this dream earth again. You are free to come and go as you like to serve God and his children on earth. If you live in the joy of God, you will not know what death is. You do not get to that state when you pray mechanically. Become completely absorbed in your prayer with faith that God is listening. If you thus fervently, lovingly pray to God, He will come to you at any time. Chapter Answered Prayers Having come to this world from we know not where, we naturally wonder about the origin and purpose of life. We hear about a Creator, read about Him, but know not any way to contact Him. We only know that the entire universe depicts His intelligence. Just as the intricate works of a tiny watch arouse our admiration for the watchmaker, and the huge complicated machines in a factory cause us to marvel at their inventor, so when we see nature's wonders we feel awed by the hidden intelligence behind them. We ask ourselves, who made the flower a living form reaching out to the sun? Whence came its fragrance and beauty? How are its petals formed so perfectly and tinged with lovely colors? At night the stars and the moon, shedding silvery light around us, move us to reflection on the intelligence guiding these celestial bodies through the sky. The moon's soft light is insufficient for the activities of the day. Thus a benign intelligence suggests to us that we rest at night. Then the sun comes up, and its bright light makes us look clearly and squarely at the world around us and at our responsibility to satisfy the needs that beset us. There are two ways in which our needs can be taken care of. One is the material. For example, when we have ill health we can go to a doctor for medical treatment. But a time comes when no human aid can help. Then we look to the other way, to the spiritual power, the maker of our body, mind, and soul. Material power is limited, and when it fails, we turn to the unlimited divine power. Likewise with our financial needs, when we have done our best and still it is inadequate, we turn to that other power. Everyone thinks that his problems are the worst. Some feel more oppressed than others because their resistance is weaker. Because of differences in their mental power, people put forth varying amounts of energy. If one has a very great difficulty and his mind is weak, he will not succeed in overcoming the problem. A man whose mind is powerful could break down the barriers of that difficulty. Even so the mightiest men have sometimes met failure. When overwhelming material, mental, or spiritual troubles beset us, we realize how limited are the powers of life in this physical world. Our endeavor must be not only to acquire financial security and good health, but to seek out the meaning of life. What is it all about? When we are hit with difficulties we react upon our environment first, making whatever material adjustments we believe may help. But when we come to the point of saying, everything I have tried so far has failed, what to do next? We start to think hard about a solution. When we think deeply enough, we find an answer within. This is one form of answered prayer. Prayer is a demand of the soul. Prayer is a demand of the soul. God did not make us beggars, He created us in His image. The Bible and Hindu scriptures declare it. A beggar who goes to a rich home and asks for alms receives a beggar's share, but the son can have anything he asks from his wealthy father. Therefore we should not behave like beggars. Divine ones such as Christ, Krishna and Buddha did not lay when they said we are made in the image of God. Yet we see that some people have everything, seemingly born with a silver spoon in their mouth, whereas others seem to attract failure and troubles. Where is the image of God in them? The power of spirit lies within each one of us. The question is how to develop it. If you will follow the lesson in my experiences with God, you are bound to find the result you are seeking. In the past you may have been disappointed that your prayers were not answered. But do not lose faith. In order to find out if prayers work or not, you must have in your mind an initial belief in the power of prayer. Your prayers may have gone unanswered because you chose to be a beggar. Also, you should know what you may legitimately ask of your Heavenly Father. You may pray with all your heart and power to own the earth, but your prayer will not be granted because all prayers connected with material life are limited, 
they have to be. God will not break his laws to satisfy whimsical desires. But there is a right way to pray. The cat is said to have nine lives, difficulties have ninety-nine. You have to find the one sure way of killing the cat of difficulties. The secret of effective prayer is to change your status from beggar to child of God. When you appeal to him from that consciousness, your prayer will have both power and wisdom. In will power lies the germ of success. Most people become extremely nervous or tense when they are trying to accomplish something that means a great deal to them. Anxious, nervous actions do not draw the power of God, but continuous, calm, powerful use of the will shakes the forces of creation and brings a response from the infinite. The germ of success in whatever you want to accomplish is in your willpower. Though that has been badly battered by difficulties becomes temporarily paralyzed. The resolute man who says, My body may be broken, but my head of willpower remains unbowed, demonstrates the greatest expression of will. Willpower is what makes you divine. When you give up using that will, you become a mortal man. Many people say we should not exercise our will to change conditions, lest we interfere with God's plan. But why would God give us will if we are not to use it? I once met a fanatical man who said he did not believe in using will power because it developed the ego. You are using a lot of will now to resist me. I replied. You are using it to talk and you are obliged to use your will to stand or walk or eat or go to the movies or even to go to sleep. You will everything you do. Without will power you would be a mechanical man. Non-use of the will is not what Jesus meant when he said, Not as I will, but as thou wilt. He was demonstrating that man must learn to bend his will, which is governed by desires, to the will of God. Therefore right prayer when it is persistent is will. You must believe in the possibility of what you are praying for. If you want a home and the mind says, You simpleton, you can't afford a house, you must make your will stronger. When the can't disappears from your mind, divine power comes. A home will not be dropped down to you from heaven. You have to pour forth will power continuously through constructive actions. When you persist refusing to accept failure, the object of will must materialize. When you continuously work that will through your thoughts and activities, what you are wishing for has to come about. Even though there is nothing in the world to conform to your wish when your will persists, the desired result will somehow manifest. In that kind of will lies God's answer, because will comes from God and continuous will is divine will. Cauterize the cancer in your brain. A weak will is a mortal will. As soon as trials and failure cut it off, it loses its connection with the dynamo of the infinite. A behind human will is the divine will that can never fail. Even death has no power to deter divine will. The Lord will definitely answer that prayer behind which the will force is continuous. Most people are mentally or physically lazy or both. When they want to pray, they think instead of sleep, and when the head nods, they dive into bed, and that is the end of prayer. The will is buried. Mortal man's brain is full of cants. Being born in a family with certain characteristics and habits, he is influenced by these to think he can't do certain things. He can't walk much, he can't eat this, he can't stand that. Those can'ts have to be cauterized. You have within you the power to accomplish everything you want, that power lies in the will. Whoever would develop will power must have good company. If your desire is to become a great mathematician, and your customary associates all dislike mathematics, you will certainly be discouraged. But when you mix with accomplished mathematicians, your will is reinforced. You think if others can do it, I can do it. Don't immediately jump into big things in your eagerness to develop your will. Succeed first try out your will on some little thing you thought you could not do. If you work hard at it, you can be successful. I remember all the goals my friends and many others told me I could never accomplish, but I did. Such well-wishers can do much harm. God save us from their kind. Company has the greatest influence on will. If instead of coming here, 
You went to a drinking party every Thursday. You could not help but pick up something of that worldly vibration. Your will is definitely inspired or weakened by your company. To develop will by yourself is extremely difficult. You require an example before you. If you would be an artist, surround yourself with good paintings and artists. If you would be a divine man, surround yourself with spiritual company. Belief and experience are quite different. A belief comes from what you have heard or read and accepted as fact, but experience is something you have actually perceived. The convictions of those who have experienced God cannot be shaken. If you had never tasted an orange, I could fool you about its characteristics, but if you had already eaten one, I could not deceive you. You would know, you would have had the experience of it. Seek the company of those who strengthen your faith. Thoughts about God, success, healing, and so on lie in your brain in the form of tabloid tendencies. You should experience them. In order to experience your thoughts you must use will power to materialize them, and in order to develop the necessary strength of will, you must associate with those who have great will power. If you want healing by God's power, seek the company of those who strengthen your faith and your will. I traveled throughout India trying to find someone who knew God. Such souls are rare. All the teachers I met told me about their beliefs. But in spiritual matters I was determined never to be satisfied with words about God. I wanted to experience Him. What I am told has no meaning for me unless I experience it. Once I was talking with a friend of mine, a broker, about the saints of India. He did not share my enthusiasm. All these so-called saints are fakes, he said. They don't know God. I didn't argue. I changed the subject and we started to talk about the brokerage business. When he had told me quite a great deal about it, I said smoothly, Do you know there is not a single reliable broker in Calcutta? They are all dishonest. What do you know about brokers? He retorted angrily. Exactly, I replied. What do you know about saints? He couldn't answer. Don't dispute what you don't know about, I went on good-naturedly. I know nothing about the brokerage business, and you don't know anything about saints. The practice of religion has come to a point where very few try to make their spiritual thoughts a matter of experience. I speak to you only about my experiences. I do not care to lecture on what I know only intellectually. Most persons become self-satisfied about what they have read of truth without ever having experienced it. In India we do not seek spiritual guidance from someone just because he has a theological degree, nor do we seek out those who have only studied the scriptures without experiencing their truths. Spiritual victrolas who merely mouth truth do not impress us. We are taught to recognize the difference between a man's sermon and his life. He must demonstrate that he has experienced what he has learned. Assure your ultimate arrival in heaven. When you try to experience your spiritual convictions another world begins to open up to you. Don't live in a false sense of security, believing that because you have joined a church you will be saved. You yourself have to make the effort to know God. Your mind may be satisfied that you are very religious, but unless your consciousness is satisfied with direct answers to your prayers, no amount of formal religion can save you. Of what benefit is praying to God if he does not answer? Difficult though it is to obtain his response, it can be done. To assure your ultimate arrival in heaven, you must test the power of your prayers until you have made them effective. When I was just a little child, I made up my mind that when I prayed, my prayer had to be answered. That kind of determination is the way. Every test comes then, to break your will, but God's power to respond is unlimited. The persistent continuity of your willpower will bring his answer. You should learn to concentrate your thoughts. Therefore, it is important to have time to be alone. Avoid the constant company of other people. Most of them are like sponges. They draw everything out of you and you seldom receive anything in return. It is worthwhile to be with others only if they are sincere and strong, and if each one is conscious of the other's sincerity and strength so that you exchange noble soul qualities. Do not wall away your time in idleness. A great many people occupy themselves with inconsequential activities. 
Ask them what they have been doing and they will usually say, Oh, I have been busy every minute. But they can scarcely remember what they were so busy about. Too many diversions also weaken your mental powers. If you go every day to the movies, they will lose their attraction and you will become bored. Movies are all basically the same, lovers, heroes, and villains. We may enjoy a beautiful motion picture story, but life is seldom like that. If on the other hand it is too realistic, who wants to see more of life as it is when he goes to be entertained? Life is very tricky and we must deal with it as it is. If we do not first master it ourselves, we cannot help anyone else. In this seclusion of concentrated thought lies hidden the factory of all accomplishment. Remember that. In this factory continuously weave your will pattern for attaining success over opposing difficulties. Exercise your will continuously. During the day and at night you have many opportunities to work in this factory if you do not waste your time. At night I withdraw from the world's demands and am by myself an absolute stranger to the world. It is a blank. Alone with my willpower, I turn my thoughts in the desired direction until I have determined in my mind exactly what I wish to do and how to do it. Then I harness my will to the right activities and it creates success. In this way I have effectively used my willpower many times. But it won't work unless the application of willpower is continuous. It is a wonderful feeling to be able to say, and know my willpower, surcharged by the divine will, shall accomplish my aim. If you lazily leave everything to the divine power and neglect to use your God-given will, results will not be forthcoming. The divine power of its own accord wants to help you. You don't have to coax. But you do have to use your will to demand as his child and to behave as his child. You must banish the thought that the Lord with his wonderful power is far away in heaven and that you are a helpless little worm buried in difficulties down here on earth. Remember that behind your will is the great divine will, but that oceanic power cannot come to your aid unless you are receptive. Surcharge your will power through concentration. The way to become receptive is to sit quietly and concentrate your thoughts on a worthy wish until your mind and thought become completely dissolved in that idea. Then will power becomes divine, omniscient and omnipotent, and can be successfully applied toward realizing your goal. You can't just sit there and wait for success to fall into your lap. Once your course is set and your will is firm, you have to make a practical effort. Then you will see that whatever you require for success starts coming to you. Everything will push you in the right direction. In your divinely surcharged will power is the answer to prayer. When you use that will, you open the way through which your prayers can be answered. This is my experience. I used to attempt certain things just to test my will power, but I don't do that anymore. I know it works. Once long ago I saw that one of my students was going wrong. We're seeing the impending tragic results. I brought out every possible reason that might dissuade him from the course his life was taking, but I saw that no amount of my willpower helped him because he had made up his mind to follow the way of evil. All right, I told myself finally it is goodbye, let him go. But soon my great love and concern for him came to the fore again. I sat under a banyan tree and began to visualize him. Fervently and repeatedly I broadcast to him a mental message. God has told me to command you to return. By evening my body and mind were athrill with the intuition that he was coming. At last, there he was at the gate. The prodigal son had come back to the fold. He pronamed and said, All day long, wherever I went and whatever I did, I beheld your image. What was it all about? God was calling you through me, I replied. It was his call, not mine. There was no selfish motive in my desire, but I had made up my mind I wouldn't stir from this place until you came. That kind of determination can change the world. A marvelous power. So deep prayer does work. The best time to pray is at night when there are fewer distractions. If necessary, sleep a little in the evening so that you are wide awake when you have your prayers at night and have it out with God. At first it will seem hard, but as you keep on trying it will become easier. You will be surprised at the results. 
As soon as your will becomes powerful, God begins to answer. And when the infinite condescends to break his vow of silence, you will not be able to contain your joy. But if you have an egotistic desire to demonstrate to others the power of your prayers, or if you commercialize it, you will lose that power. God will respond to you no more, you will have frightened him away. He comes only when you are sincere, and when you love him for his own sake. When you are impressed with yourself and want to show off, he sees that you seek, not him, but fame and glorification of your ego, and he will not come. Who will persist until God answers? God is not a mute, unfeeling being. He is love itself. If you know how to meditate to make contact with him, he will respond to your loving demands. You do not have to plead, you can demand as his child. But which of you will spend the necessary time? Which of you will persist until you become so concentrated that you receive an answer from him? Suppose you have a mortgage on your home and you cannot meet it. Or there is a certain job you want. In the silence that comes after meditating deeply, concentrate with unswerving will on the thought of your need. Do not keep looking for the result. If you sow a seed in the ground, and then take it out every once in a while to see if it is growing, it will never sprout. Similarly, if every time you pray you look for a sign that the Lord is granting your wish, nothing will happen. Never try to test God. Just go on praying unceasingly. Your duty is to bring your need to God's attention, and to do your part in helping God to bring that desire to fruition. For example, in chronic diseases, do your best to help promote healing, but know in your mind that ultimately God alone can help. Take that thought with you into meditation every night, and with all your determination pray, suddenly one day, you will find the disease gone. First the mind receives the suggestion. Then the divine impregnates the mind with his power. Finally the brain releases the life energy to heal. You do not realize the power of God that is in your mind. It controls all the bodily functions. You can promote any condition in the body if you exercise that power of your mind. It is necessary first to learn the right method of meditation. Then you can apply its divinely empowered concentration to heal the body or to help you in any other difficulty. Every day undertake something that is difficult for you and try to do it. Though you fail five times, keep on, and as soon as you have succeeded in that direction, apply your concentrated will on something else. You will thus be able to accomplish increasingly greater things. Will is the instrument of the image of God within you. In will lies his limitless power, the power that controls all the forces of nature. As you are made in his image, that power is yours to bring about whatever you desire. You can create prosperity, you can change hatred into love. Pray until body and mind are completely subjugated, then you will receive God's response. I constantly find that my slightest wish is answered. Your greatest necessity is God. Between the eyebrows is the door to heaven. This center in the brain is the seat of will. When you concentrate deeply there and calmly will, whatever you are willing shall come about. So never use your will for evil purposes. To will harm to someone intentionally is a grave misuse of your God-given power. If you find your will going in the wrong direction, stop. Not only is it a waste of your divine energy, it will be the cause of your losing that power. You will not be able to employ it even for good purposes. Determine honestly whether or not your prayer is legitimate. Do not ask God for things that are quite impossible in the natural order of life. Ask only for true necessities. And know the difference between necessary necessities and unnecessary necessities. The best way to cure yourself of desires for unnecessary necessities is to reason them away. Dreaming of big buildings used to be a hobby of mine, but that interest is gone now. I have plenty of them and all the headaches that accompany their maintenance. Ownership is a worrisome responsibility. Cut out desires for needless possessions. Concentrate only on your real needs. Your greatest necessity is God. He will give you not only your necessary necessities, but your unnecessary necessities as well. He will satisfy your every desire when you are one with Him. Your wildest dreams will come true. 
When I was a little boy in India, I so much wanted a pony, but my mother wouldn't allow me to have one. Some years later, after I had started my school for boys in Ranchi, I brought home a horse for our use. One morning, I found she had given birth to a colt. Just what I had wanted in my childhood. Many such experiences have come to me. Long ago, while I was traveling in Kashmir, I saw this building in a vision. Years later, when I came to Los Angeles and saw this place, I recognized it as the building in my vision and knew that God intended it to be ours. Follow the rules of prayer. The first rule in prayer is to approach God only with legitimate desires. The second is to pray for their fulfillment not as a beggar, but as a son. I am thy child. Thou art my father. Thou and I are one. When you pray deeply and continuously you will feel a great joy welling up in your heart. Don't be satisfied until that joy manifests, for when you feel that all-satisfying joy in your heart, you will know that God has tuned in your prayer broadcast. Then pray to your Father, Lord, this is my need. I am willing to work for it. Please guide me and help me to have the right thoughts and to do the right things to bring about success. I will use my reason and work with determination, but guide that my reason, will, and activity to the right thing that I should do. This is how I have always prayed. Now, as soon as I ask God about some undertaking, I know whether I should do it or not, and I know what steps I should and should not take. Be practical and earnest about prayer. Concentrate deeply on what you are praying. Before you seek a job or sign a contract or do anything important, think of that power. Think of it continuously. Take time out of sleep. Your mind is habituated to resting at night from the day's duties and keeps urging sleep. You must answer with all your divine power of will, away with sleep. My engagement with God is more important. Then you will receive God's response. Chapter, Making Religion Scientific God is approachable. Talking of Him and listening to His words in the scriptures, thinking of Him, feeling His presence in meditation, you will see that gradually the unreal becomes real, and this world which you think is real will be seen as unreal. There is no joy like that realization. The joy of God is boundless, unceasing, all the time new. Body-mind, nothing can disturb you when you are in that consciousness, such as the grace and glory of the Lord and he will explain to you whatever you haven't been able to understand, everything you want to know. There is no use trying to know too much now. How many incarnations would you have to spend to learn all that is written in the book of nature? Millions of lives would not be sufficient. So why bother? All things you will find and understand in God. The masters of India have always said, first know him. Then whatever you desire to know, he will reveal to you. This is his kingdom, this is his knowledge. As life goes on, its illusions fall away, you see what it is all about. And when the illusions of childhood and youth are gone, what is there left? Only in the divine consciousness behind this door Paramahansaji here touched his forehead to indicate the location of the Christ center, seat of the spiritual eye can we find pure happiness. I cut the world out of my life because of its delusive influence, which makes unimportant things seem important. We are all living in a land of make-believe, trying to keep up with the Joneses, yet it is only by remaining in the consciousness of spirit that we can be happy. Try it. God is eager to bring you to his kingdom, for he craves something, too, that you spontaneously seek him and cling to him. Otherwise, he would not have created the universe and man. His perfection is not conditioned by this craving, but the one reason behind his creating us is his desire that we love him and return to him. He is looking forward to that time. In our love is his fulfillment. The Father has given us freedom to jump into the fire of world illusion or to return to his home. It is a question of what you would like. Let us all go home that we need not come back into this terrible world. We do not know under what conditions we will incarnate again. Certainly we do not want to be reborn in times of suffering and depression such as we are having now. These troubles are the result of man's selfishness and hate. The whole earth is groaning because God has been forgotten. 
Resolve now to go home to your father. You are fearfully wasting your time, and you can't afford to. You don't know how fortunate you are to have been born as a human being, and that you are blessed more than any other creature. The animal is not able to meditate and have God communion. You have your freedom to seek him and you don't use it. You sit a little while in meditation and your mind wanders away. But when the mind prays and prays and prays again, heaven opens. Then you will be given all the convincing experiences by which you shall know that God is. God is waiting for your invitation. I speak not from book learning but from perceptions of God. I could not speak of him this way if I didn't see or feel him, he wouldn't let me. As I speak to you I see before me whatever I am talking about, many times I don't even see you. I wouldn't tell you anything at all if I didn't know him. But I am here to tell you that the very joy you are seeking in sex money, wine, love, fame, that joy is within yourself. You don't have to go elsewhere. You don't have to beg or flatter God, but you have to ask. You have to pray to him sincerely and lovingly come to me. You are not determined enough. As the miser loves money, as the lover loves the beloved, so should you love God, then you will find him without fail. It is difficult, but if at night you sit long in meditation you won't know time. Even when I don't get any sleep, I never miss it. When God comes, where is sleep? Where is the body? Nothing matters but his intoxicating presence. You read in novels of ideal love, but it is nothing compared to the love of God. Hasten to him. To be ever conscious of him is the most wonderful existence. As I am talking to you again and again the whole world melts away and I feel only his bliss. Creation is meant to disillusion you. Science devises methods for your physical comfort, stimulating and catering to endless desires. But after a while creature comforts become burdens, pleasures no longer, because you find it is hard work to take care of them. Thus you pay for everything you get except divine blessedness. For that you have only to sit still and ask your heavenly Father. If I thought I had to earn God I wouldn't try, as a son I have a right to know him. If you ask your right from the Father, he will give it to you. To those devotees who urge, he comes. That is what he wants. His whole creation is intended to disillusion you and thus cause you to draw back to him. You don't know when you will be taken away from this earth. There is no law that you will enjoy a long life. This proves how foolish it is to waste time. I live from minute to minute, day to day. I know only the joy of living, inside complete resignation to him. A time will come when everything will be made or accomplished by will. Whatever you wish you will see done. This I have demonstrated again and again in my life. Development of the heavenly power of will for its divinely intended use, to know God, is the only purpose in human life. He has created each one of you, and he is throbbing in you, crying to enter your consciousness so that he may release you. I am sure he feels guilty for having created us. Every day I ask him why he did it. I talk to him about anything that comes to my mind. He likes it that I am after him. He knows his creation is anything but perfect. The Lord replies that you cannot make steel until you have made the iron white hot in fire. It is not meant for harm. Trouble and disease have a lesson for us. Our painful experiences are not meant to destroy us, but to burn out our dross to hurry us back home. No one is more anxious for our release than God. It is his voice that is speaking through me. If only one person responds and finds his freedom in spirit, my task is done. The salvation of one life is worth more than the conversion of thousands. I tell you of one master of this universe, one beloved who is waiting for you, crying for you. You don't know how he rejoices when a soul enters his kingdom. He gathers all the angels together and they celebrate that soul's entrance into heaven. What joy there is! For good reason you are not allowed to remember your past incarnations. Suppose you have been born ten times. You have therefore had ten mothers. How can you love them all the same? You are meant to learn that behind those ten mothers there is one mother, behind all friends one friend, behind all fathers one father, behind all loves one love. How wonderful is that recognition! 
it is as if you had been playing hide and seek in the corridors of incarnations, and then you find him. When I realized that one love I could not contain myself, my mind vanished into the infinite kingdom. It is so even now. The joy of spirit is endless. Seek a definite understanding of truth. In the physical sciences, everything is systematized into definite conceptions. Combine two particular substances, or two substances in a particular way, for a certain result. The great masters of self realization fellowship are telling you why you should seek God scientifically, and the scientific way to get to Him. Every effort you make to follow these instructions will bring to you a definite understanding. Some read a little about the spiritual laws and then put the book aside. That is not the way to self knowledge. You must make these truths a practical part of your life. Most people don't take religion seriously. They keep it in the realm of imagination and fancy. In India, we are taught the practical use of religion. We don't say, Well, I shall find out all about God in the hereafter. We want to know God now. Science and religion should go hand in hand. All the results of scientific investigation are definite and are connected by reason, whereas religion is often dogmatic. When Jesus urged his disciples to a faith, he didn't mean blind belief. It breaks my heart when I see blind dogmatism, for it is one reason why the majority of people have no real interest in God. Although there are nevertheless many who are interested in God, real seekers are few because hardly anyone tries to understand his way out of this dream drama. Few of his children appreciate the gifts of the Heavenly Father, and of those who do, fewer still try deeply or scientifically enough to know him. Those who want to seek him earnestly should learn how to do so scientifically. By yoga, religion can be made scientific. Yoga is definite and scientific. Yoga means union of soul and God through step-by-step -step methods with specific and known results. It raises the practice of religion above the differences of dogma. My guru Sri Yukteswar extolled yoga. He did not, however, indicate that realization of God thereby would be immediate. You have to work hard for it, he told me. I did, and when the promised results came, I saw that yoga was marvelous. Those who do not give time to their religion cannot expect to know all at once about God and the hereafter. Usually people don't make the effort or if they do the effort is not deep and sincere enough. Nighttime should be spent with God. You sleep more than necessary and thus waste many valuable hours. Night was meant to screen all the attractions of the world that you might the more intently explore the kingdom of God. He created darkness to obscure material objects, for he wants you to forget the world at night and seek him. Read the scriptures, read the lessons and meditate, the glory and the joy it brings. Nothing else can give you that experience. See if it isn't true. Remember, if you don't find God, you are not making enough effort in your meditation. Should you not find the pearl after one or two divings, don't blame the ocean. Blame your diving. You are not going deep enough. If you dive really deep, you will find the pearl of his presence. Unless we apply definite methods of science in practicing religion, it becomes little more than a salve for our conscience. Oh yes, I go to church every Sunday, people say, but they don't know why they go. And once they have said amen after the sermon, they forget all about church until the next Sunday. Isn't that foolish? If you do not commune with God there, why should you go? The saints say that if you coax God earnestly enough, you can see him. But you have to do it all yourself. It is good to meditate with a few others, but make the supreme effort alone at night, not just in church on Sundays. Get away from everyone. It is good for your health, your nerves, and your longevity not to mix too much with people. Most of them are thinking only of what you can give them. Hardly anyone thinks of your highest welfare except your spiritual teacher and God. The wise teacher will give you but one instruction. Think of God. And share him. There is no form of service greater than to speak of God. If you convince someone that the path of error leads to the valley of death, and that the path of meditation leads to everlasting life, you have given him something of more value than a million dollars. 
Money is perishable, but realization of God will go with us beyond the portals of the grave. Therefore whenever I see anyone striving and struggling with great intensity to know God, it gives me great joy. Although I am planning and doing things in the world, it is only to please the Lord. I test myself, even when I am working I whisper within, Where are you Lord? And the whole world changes. There is nothing but a great light, and I am a little bubble in that ocean of light. Such is the joy of existence in God. The experiences I have told you about are scientifically attainable. If you follow the spiritual laws, the result is certain. If the result doesn't come, find fault with your effort. Intensity in all your religious practices is the only way. Those who don't meditate regularly and deeply are restless whenever they do meditate and give up after a short effort. But if you make a greater effort day by day, the ability to go deep will come. I don't have to make any effort now. The whole world is gone instantly when I close my eyes and gaze into the Christ center. And I used to sit for hours trying to forget the body and the thoughts. I came to a point where I thought it was no use. But I saw it was my fault. Between the restless thoughts and God there is a wall. The ordinary person doesn't try, so he never gets over that wall. But the spiritual fighter goes on. When the mind becomes still, you are in the kingdom of the infinite. Those who have spent too much time on foolish things remain fruitlessly knocking outside. Communion with God is the only thing to live for. You will have to come to that understanding eventually, often after much suffering. Why not learn now? He is ready to welcome you. You can't fail to reach God ultimately. It is foolish to ask, will I be able to get into the kingdom of heaven? There is no other place you can stay, for that is your real home. You don't have to earn it. You are already God's child made in His image. You have only to tear away the mask of the human being and realize your divine birthright. Satan makes us think God is unattainable. So never say that you won't be able to get into the kingdom of heaven. Satan drops that delusive thought in your mind to keep you here. You are not a mortal being. When I heard that from my guru, I was overjoyed. Thereafter I refused to consider myself a sinner. Nor should you call yourself a sinner. It is a desecration of the image of God within you. Nor should you let anyone else call you a sinner. What does it matter what you were yesterday? You are a child of God now and evermore. Who can keep you away from the kingdom of God? That is how you should feel. You must scientifically pursue him. The science of religion is to make the effort in meditation until God becomes real to you, until you know that he alone is real. I used to go to the crematory grounds and pray to see through the delusion of the world. I cried in the woods, I closeted myself in the attic, praying unceasingly until that realization came. I beheld burning worlds steaming and fuming around the feet of my Divine Mother. In the light of her wisdom all my mortality was consumed. Meditation is the true practice of religion. The true practice of religion is to sit still in meditation and talk to God. But you don't get to that point of intensity, you don't concentrate enough, and that is why you remain in delusion. To teach the value of long, intense concentration on God, I instituted an all-day Christmas meditation just before Christmas each year. At first the devotees feel only how long it is, but as they go deep they become oblivious of time. Most churchgoers can't sit still for an hour unless there is something going on all the while to divert their minds. To be in the consciousness of God is entirely different. It comes when you sit quietly and say, One by one I close the doors of the senses, lest the aroma of the rose or the song of the nightingale distract my love from thee. And as you go on saying that with deeper and deeper concentration and devotion, you will see after a little while that you have forgotten all distractions. Before your inward gaze a light appears, or saints appear, or you are engulfed in a deep peace or divine joy. Any spiritual activity does good by keeping the thought of God alive, but what is ultimately necessary is this intensity of effort to know Him. There should be centers of meditation all over the world, where devotees come together to commune with God. 
When I come to the temple, it is for one purpose, to be with God and to tell you of God. And you come here for my words and to try by meditation to feel his presence. One moon dispels the darkness of the heavens. So is one soul who is trained to know God, a soul in whom there is true devotion and sincere seeking and intensity, and wherever he will go he will dispel the spiritual darkness of others. Those who are even thinking of God shine a little, but they are not able to give light to the world. Ordinary religious people are like stars, giving only a tiny light. Meditation provides the proof of God's existence. By scientific meditation become a true devotee that like the moon you dispel the darkness around yourself and others. Without realization through meditation religion is the most mysterious book of all, you will never be able to understand it. But by meditation you have the proof of God's existence. Go to your room and shut the door, make no fuss. Sit down and talk to God. Practice meditation. Let your mind become so intense that the next time you sit to meditate you won't have to make the effort. Your mind will be fixed immediately on Him. If you don't make a great effort to conquer physical and mental restlessness in the beginning, you will have difficulty every time you meditate throughout the years. But if you make that supreme effort at the start, you will soon be happy and free. When I utter the name God my whole being melts away in His joy. That I had to work for. Make the effort. I was not at first the devotional kind. My mind used to be very restless. But now it is just like fire. As soon as I put my mind at the Christ center, all thoughts are gone, breath, heart, and mind are instantly still and I am aware only of spirit. Make religion real by scientific methods. Science gives you definiteness and certainty. Sit quietly and practice the methods that have been given by great yogis of India, Mahavadar Babaji, Lahiri Mahasya Swami Sri Yutiswar. Find in yourself that supreme blessedness of which I speak to you, and when you do you will see that religion is no longer a myth, but a scientific certainty. Pray to him, Lord, you are the master of creation, so I come to you. I will never give up until you talk to me and make me realize your presence. I will not live without you. Intensity, secrecy, devotion and constancy are necessary. The great Indian Saint Sri Ramakrishna was worshipping a stone image of Kali, the Cosmic Mother, and praying for her to appear to him in reality. His spiritual anguish became so intense that he felt life was no longer worth living. At this moment his eyes fell on a sword that was kept in the temple, and like a madman he seized it, with the intention of ending his life. In that moment the Mother revealed herself in her cosmic form. Her devotee was engulfed in an oceanic bliss. In the very place where the saint had this experience, that same stone statue of the Divine Mother assumed a living form and spoke to me. If I hadn't spent hours seeking God in meditation, I would not have known that religion is a science. Intensity, secrecy, devotion and constancy are necessary. You don't know when death will come. Every minute keep your mind on God. Everything you want and need is right within you. Seek long and seek deeply. I meditate for hours. I see no one until I am finished. You must make up your mind that you are not going to be bothered by anyone or anything. Then you won't know time. In my Yagoda school in Ranchi, India, I used to spend all my spare time roaming around the grounds, here and there sitting a while to meditate, until my mind was drunk with God. That is the only way to find Him. Don't waste your time. When you are able to live in the divine consciousness, four to six hours of sleep are plenty. You will never feel tired. You will never miss sleep. Sleep is under my control. It is the same with eating. I have something infinitely greater, and God has proven that when He is with me all the necessities of life become unnecessary. In that consciousness you become more healthy than the average person, more joyous, more bountiful in every way. Don't seek little things, they will divert you from God. Start your experiment now, make life simple and be a king. Chapter, Understanding the Unreality of Matter 
The Hindu scriptures point out that belief in the non-existence of matter and the allness of spirit should not be founded on dogmatic, illogical, unintelligible, or inexplicable theories, but on scientific inner investigation and exact understanding. People generally identify themselves with the body, which is supported by food, but they fail to realize that the basic source of bodily existence is prana life energy. No food or other outer aid can revive a man from whom the cosmic current has withdrawn. The link between man's material body and his immaterial mind is prana. The ancient Hindu sages discovered the existence of prana and formulated the science of pranayama, life energy control. Lord Jesus fasted in the wilderness for forty days. He said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The word is cosmic vibration. The mouth of God is the medulla oblongata in the posterior part of the brain, tapering off into the spinal cord. This, the most vital spot in the human body, is the divine entrance mouth of God for the word or alm, the cosmic vibratory energy by which man is sustained. People who never fast do not know from experience that man can live, as Christ did for forty days, solely by the word of God. In the early stages of a week's fasting, hunger is present, but as the days go by, less hunger and a sense of freedom are distinctly felt. Why? Because denial of gross food to the body compels it to depend on immaterial food, the life current. Man's will power is the great generator of energy. Through will power and willingness one is able to draw quickly on the infinite store of inner strength. A person who is unwilling to perform his daily tasks experiences a lack of energy. A man who works hard but with willingness is borne up physically and mentally by the cosmic current. One who learns and practices the metaphysical methods of living by willpower and by consciously tapping the inexhaustible source of life energy is freed from many limitations of the body. The Hindu sages and yogis say that matter is materialized mind stuff. And some of them, like Jesus, have proved this truth by demonstrating the power to materialize and to materialize their bodies and other physical objects. The chemical elements of matter are electronic vibrations. Modern science shows that matter is composed of vibratory forces. The chemical elements, the structural factors responsible for all forms in the universe, from stones and stars to man, are nothing more than different forms of electronic vibrations. For example, in ice we find coldness weight form, it is visible. Melt the ice, it becomes water. Pass electricity through it, it becomes invisible hydrogen and oxygen, which analyzed further, are forms of electronic vibrations. One may therefore say scientifically that ice does not exist, even though it is perceptible to our senses of sight, touch, and so on. In reality its essence is invisible electrons or forms of energy. In other words, that which can be dissolved into invisibility cannot be said to have a valid existence. In this sense matter can be considered as not existing, but matter does have relative existence. Matter exists in relation to our mind and as an expression of invisible electronic forces that do exist, being unchangeable and immortal. Both water and ice are manifestations of invisible gases and have only formal, transitory existence. Similarly, both mortal mind and matter are fleeting manifestations of divine consciousness and possess merely formal existence. In reality, only cosmic mind exists. Just as a child is born through the instrumentality of parents, so matter is dependent on mind for its existence. Matter is born from divine mind and is perceptible to mortal mind. In itself and of itself, matter has no reality, no intrinsic existence. The blind or non-intellectual electronic forces of creation are nevertheless creative teleological agents because they contain within themselves the vibrations of the universal, conscious of itself life force or prana, which in turn issued from the fiat of divinity. God said, Let there be light, and there was light, that is, 
the projection of divine thought, and will become light or vibratory energy, the flowing forth of life current and electrons, which further vibrated more strongly and became the diverse subtle or unseen forces of nature, which in turn externalize themselves as the ninety-two principal elements of matter that constitute the universe. To human consciousness matter is both perceptible and real. The man had discovered through theoretical investigation, through logic, and through certain laboratory experiments, such as converting a visible piece of ice into invisible forces that a permanent and unalterable creative power must underlie all the transitory and elusive forms of the phenomenal world. This truth may be grasped just as we grasp the fact that the ocean exists though its waves have no permanent existence, being just passing, formal manifestations of one great substance. Waves cannot exist without the ocean, but the ocean exists with or without waves. These concepts can be intellectually understood but cannot be known until one has learned the method of converting matter into life force and life force into cosmic consciousness as Christ, Krishna, and other self-realized masters were able to do. To such enlightened ones, matter per se does not exist because they see that beneath the slight rippling waves of creation is the changeless ocean of spirit. The universe is God's dream. In the Vedanta and Yoga philosophies the universe is spoken of as God's dream. Matter and mind, the cosmos with its stars and planets, the gross surface waves and the subtle undercurrents of the material creation, the human powers of feeling, will and consciousness, and the states of life and death, day and night, health and disease, success and failure are realities according to the law of relativity governing this dream of God's. All the dualities perceived by the law of relativity are real to the dreamer, the mortal man who plays his little part in the great cosmic dream. To escape from Maya, illusion, the law of relativity, one must awaken from the dream into eternal God-wakefulness. We cannot change the lawful dream by imagination or by denying its existence or by accepting life but rejecting death, or by recognizing health, but ignoring sickness. One state is as much a part of its opposite state as are the two sides of a fabric. The dualities are inherently and essentially one. The truth seeker does not try to separate them in his mind, but to rise above them by wisdom. The man who considers his body to be different from his mind, and who wants to accept as real only the positive, happy, and beneficial aspects of a universe unalterably dual in its nature, is a man deeply asleep in the delusions of the dream world. Just as a person has dreams that seem real for a time, but lose their validity when he emerges into the waking state of consciousness, so it is possible for man to awaken from the dream of matter reality and to live in the changeless realm of spirit. Only the superman who has learned to expand and transfer his consciousness to the infinite can realize creation as a dream of God's. He alone can say with true knowledge that matter has no existence. By means of a long series of self-disciplinary steps, through following the scientific yoga path or any other way of spiritual perfection, whether that of love, wisdom, service, or self-effacement, the God-seeker dissolves the dualities and discerns the eternal oneness. Whosoever freed from delusion knows me thus as the Supreme Spirit knows all. He worships me with his whole being. Chapter Man's Greatest Adventure Life is the greatest adventure imaginable. Although some lives are without much interest and excitement, others are full of extraordinary experiences. I heard of a man who tried 32 times to commit suicide, and something happened every time to prevent him. Imagine what it would be like to know all about the lives of all the people who are now on earth, and those who are gone, and those who are yet to come. Such is God's power. Jesus said, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without the knowledge of your father. The lifetimes of experiences of all men are in God's memory. It is difficult indeed to conceive of a consciousness that is aware of everything that has ever happened. 
yet to fathom the nature of spirit is the greatest adventure in this universe. I will give you a picture of it as it is coming to me at this moment before my spiritual eye. Truths are more than imagination, they are real. Yet their origin is a thought in the mind of God. All of the different forms of atomic matter, for example, are but materialized thoughts of God. They can be reconverted into thoughts, and the thoughts can again be materialized into objects. Man also has the power to conceive ideas, but his imagination is not very strong. If his imagination became powerful enough, man could create material objects on earth. He has latent within him the same creative power by which God, even as he thought, materialized his mental creations in the world. But it has become next to impossible for man to materialize his thoughts because he has not utilized the free power, the divine power of thought, bestowed on him by God. When we try to imagine the consciousness of God, we wonder how he can remember all things, because we judge everything by the standard of our own mental capacity. We understand according to our own experience. A person whose memory is not strong tends to assume that everyone else's memory is the same way. Yet there are persons of exceptional memory who can recall a whole book, perhaps, just as easily as you can remember a few lines. Those who are forgetful find it difficult to realize that others can have an unfailing power of recollection. A jeweler remembers his jewels, a bookkeeper the figures in his books, so God is able to remember everything that he has created in this universe. Being gifted with almighty power, he has instant recall of everything that has ever happened. God does not need a limited physical brain to remember what has passed. His limitless consciousness is all-knowing. The origin and power of memory. Memory is a wondrous power. All human memory comes from God's tremendous memory. For example, you cannot tell me about all the motion pictures you have seen since birth, but if I were to show you one of those films again, you would instantly recall it. The divine underlying memory is right there within you, ever recognizing experiences that have passed. As soon as you see the opening scene again, the whole story comes back to you. Oh, I saw this picture before, you say. I remember how it ended. How is it that we can recognize a picture, every detail of it, that we have seen years ago? Because all happenings are recorded in the brain. As soon as you put the needle of attention on a certain record of experience, your memory begins to play back that experience. If I ask where you were sitting when we were here together last Thursday, you recall it and begin to remember other things as well. If I ask, what did I say? My words start coming back to you. The inner power of memory comes from God and is perfect. It never forgets. The ordinary man's memory cannot hold the consciousness of all experiences at one time, but the underlying divine memory retains everything simultaneously and permanently. Therefore, good or poor memory is a matter of conviction. You have convinced yourself that you have a weak memory and so you have a weak memory. However, it is not easy to jump from this belief to the opposite. Much effort is required to convince yourself that your memory is in actuality a manifestation of the all-recalling divine memory of God. The greatest human memory is not but a borrowing from the unlimited consciousness of God, in which are recorded all the adventures of all human beings and other life forms. Creation, Dual Adventure of God and Man The story of God's creation is marvelous, how he projected into existence all beings on this earth, and how he is working behind the scenes to bring us back to our real existence in him. It is almost impossible to describe in human language the cosmic adventure of God's creation, and its subtle intertwining with the individual life adventures of countless human beings. We find that human beings live on the average 60 years, the crocodile from 60 to 100. The redwood tree lives for 2,000 years, the dog only about 14, and the horse at most about 36 years. It is evident that someone has fixed these various life spans. Yet we hear of some great yo, is who have lived for hundreds of years. 
I know definitely that Mahavadar Babaji has lived for centuries and is still in his body in perfect youth. Palanga Swami is said to have lived for more than 300 years. Truth is more fascinating than fiction. It is possible to imagine that under favorable conditions and if there is no waste of vital essence and there is proper food and right thinking the human body could go on indefinitely. But the pressures on the body are terrific. When a mouse is caught in a trap, its heart beats many times faster than it does normally, and when you are unable to pay your bills, your heart does the same. Thus worry takes its toll. And there are other kinds of stress. I am told that the police commissioner of Chicago has demonstrated with instruments the possibility that if noise were taken away from the cities, their residents would live ten years longer. We are living in a wonderful world nevertheless. Those who exist only to eat, drink, and be merry, and to sleep have no idea of the wonders of human life. The adventure begins with the struggle the soul goes through to enter a womb at the time of conception. In the astral world there are millions of souls struggling to return to earth, to enter the mated sperm and ovum cells at the time of conception. Saint or sinner, unless you have attained final redemption there is a great desire to reincarnate again on earth. At the time of conception there is a flash in the ether and one soul enters as the sperm and ovum cells unite. You had to fight to get into the womb. Not only you but many souls rush to enter, and the ones that won are you, and you and I. It was not an easy victory. Prenatal Consciousness After you have entered the womb you ask, what have I done? I have been free from the confining mortal body for so long gliding along in a weightless body of light, and now I am caught again in a physical form. Nevertheless you become accustomed to these new conditions during the nine months in the womb. That is the punishment. It is nine months of living in a dungeon in which you have to breathe through someone else, eat through someone else, receive your blood, and the power for its circulation, through someone else. You are dependent. Your soul cries to the Lord, let me out of this prison. I can't see, I can't hear, I am bound. Here is a Hades or purgatory, it is those nine months in the mother's body, helpless in darkness, bound to one spot like a tree, with only occasional memories of the past coming in, and then lapses into sleep. It is when memories of the past life come that you struggle in the mother's body. I have transported my consciousness into these prenatal states and I know what I am saying. The baby's sleep and wakefulness in the mother's body do not depend on her sleeping and waking. The child's will to move is a memory coming from the soul's past. So he stirs restlessly in the mother's body until he tires and goes to sleep. Then he wakes up for a while and moves again. He feels hunger and through the nourishment in the mother's blood, the satisfaction of his hunger. The infant slightly hears the vibrations of the mother's heartbeat and circulation. By these sounds he is made conscious of his body and he wants to be free. Thus the soul's first adventure is the fight between two ideas, the wish to return to earth in a human form and the desire to feel the freedom of having no form. The soul's human encasement starts out as a fish-like form with a tiny tail. That form grows into an animal form, curled up in the womb. There comes an occasional memory of the past life, and the embryo stirs. Vogel becomes greater as the embryo begins to grow into a human form in the mother's body. The soul cries, let me out. When the will becomes very strong, the baby is born. Premature babies are souls who are very stubborn-willed. They don't want to remain nine months in the mother's body, and so they come early. The breath of life. The infant arrives in this world crying because the saints say the soul remembers its previous incarnations and does not like the thought of coming back to earth again to go through the struggle of life here. Related also to this memory is the attitude of supplication in which a baby usually holds its hands before it comes into the world. It is praying to God please don't give me physical birth again. The physiological explanation of the baby's crying is that the lungs must be opened up in order to start the breathing process, and the baby's first cry is an effort to activate the lungs and start the breath of life. When the baby is born, the breath goes in, 
and the soul that was semi-dormant becomes a living being with an independent life. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Many persons mistakenly believe that the soul enters the body at birth, but if the soul were not already there, the body would not have developed from the original tiny cells. Should the soul leave the embryo before birth, the infant will be born dead. Man's body is made of 16 basic material elements, supported and activated by 19 elements of subtle energy. These can be condensed into pure consciousness. Man became a living soul refers to the fact that the ordinary man's physical body, which is made of chemicals the dust of the ground, must breathe oxygen in order to be sustained on earth, as ordained by God when he first breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. When the baby is born, he blinks at the light, he hears sounds, he smells and tastes, and he breathes. He sees that conditions seem to be normal, he has a physical body again. His prenatal resistance to birth ends with his first breath, when may the cosmic delusion that existence depends on body and breath comes over him. He feels once more attracted to the physical world. As time goes on the baby struggles for control over his body. How often you see him repeatedly thrusting his hands and feet up in the air in an attempt at coordination. All these actions are directed by the subconscious mind through the soul's memory of the past. That memory is always there. You instinctively fear death because you remember the many times you have been through that experience. You are also afraid of pain because you have suffered many times before. When the baby grows into a little child he is surrounded by the influences of the mother's and father's guiding will, and the wills of other relatives as well. Each one wants him to be something different and his naughty friends want him to be still something else. The child has a great many struggles with these conflicting pressures. This is a miserable life, so it is good to give your children a little freedom. Young ones who are given too much freedom however may later lament, I wish I had been told long ago not to do this, then I would not be what I am today. Think of all the struggles physiological and mental one has to go through until he becomes a youth. At that time of life the senses become more active and the youth has a great inner battle with himself. The struggle with the senses is a tremendous contest. To conquer in this adventure of youth, to go victoriously through this thrill of living, is a great experience. Man should befriend himself. It is wonderful to be alive, but there are many agents waiting to kill us. An adventure with wild animals in South Africa is nothing compared to the adventure of life itself. No other tale in history is as interesting. Man with his intelligence knows how to protect himself against animals, but he doesn't know how to protect himself against his own bad habits and evil ways. The greatest of all enemies of man is himself. More than personal or national enemies, more than germs, bombs, or any other threat, man should fear himself when he is wrong. To remain in ignorance of your divine nature, and to be overpowered by bad habits, is to make an enemy of your own self. The best way to be successful in this adventure of life is to be your own friend. Krishna said, the self is the friend of the transformed self but the enemy of the unregenerate self. The subtle enemies. It is easy to picture ourselves starting off to explore some wild and unknown country. We are going by ship we want a lifeboat with us. Should steamer sink we know we can get into the boat and save ourselves. But in so many of life's experiences there seems to be a leak in our lifeboat no matter what precautions we have taken. In a jungle infested with animals you can take reasonable care against them, but subtle dangers are more difficult to overcome. How to protect oneself against a barrage of germs? Millions are floating around us all the time. We think we are safe when we take precautions against dangers we can see and hear, but we have only inadequate means to protect ourselves against germs. In your own blood stream the white corpuscles are constantly fighting these organisms. Drugs only numb them. The white corpuscles are the soldiers who move in and destroy them. If your blood is weak, the soldiers will not be able to help you. 
In the lungs of many unsuspecting persons lurk fierce tuberculosis bacilli, ready to destroy their host. Nature forms a restraining wall of cells around them, but it is effective only so long as the body can keep up its resistance. This struggle of life goes on constantly in the unseen jungle of life within. If you could examine your food under a microscope, you would not eat it. Germs are having a feast thereon, and you are swallowing them whole. The water you drink is alive with such organisms. There is no true vegetarian because everyone eats millions of germs each day. Shall man then stop eating? Prepare for every kind of battle. In order to go safely through this jungle of life, you must equip yourself with the proper weapons. You have to be a well trained soldier. The layman who doesn't know how to protect himself is soon killed. The wise man who is armed against all forms of warfare, against disease, against destiny and karma, against all evil thoughts and habits, becomes the victor in this adventure. It requires carefulness and, in addition, the adoption of certain methods by which we can overcome our enemies. As we progress, we learn better methods of vanquishing the causes of our physical, mental, moral, and spiritual disasters. When you have gone successfully through physical illnesses and accidents and inner struggles, then you can say that life was a sweet adventure. Jesus could say this. But before you have similarly conquered, it is premature to say that life is sweet. Until you have attained final ascension, liberation of the soul in God, life is not yet finished for you. You have not overcome the desire to be adventurous until you have ascended consciously in spirit. Seeing someone who is suffering, you feel thankful that you are not going through that particular adventure. But you may be next. The possibilities of harm to the body are numerous. So be equipped. The scientist says, eat nourishing food and follow health laws to protect yourself from germs. The politician says, be good soldiers to protect yourselves from outside enemies. We are living in strange times. Even women, the proverbial saviors of the world, are being trained as soldiers to kill others' children. Horrible. But once in a while some good comes from war, it removes cowardice from us. The importance of mind power. In this jungle of life surrounded by enemies, disease, poverty, suffering, bad habits and wrong desires, there are so many rules to be observed that life becomes intolerable when you try to keep them all in mind. You tire of them because each department of life is limitless in its potential for diversity. When you attempt to apply health rules you are nearly overwhelmed. There is no time to think about anything else. And everyone has a different set of health precepts for you to follow. We are under a great hypnosis. As I tried different methods this truth dawned on me. Mind controls the effectiveness of them all. God has given us one tremendous instrument of protection more powerful than machine guns, electricity, poison gas, or any medicine, the mind. It is the mind that must be strengthened. As for the body, I will do only the will of God. If he tells me to go to a doctor, it is all right, and if he tells me to suffer, it is all right. Whatever is his will is my will. An important part of the adventure of life is to get hold of the mind, and to keep that controlled mind constantly attuned to the Lord. This is the secret of a happy, successful existence. The ultimate protection is God communion. Even though you adopt physical methods of healing, do not put all your faith in the methods, but in the power of God behind them. If you have cut your finger, put iodine on it, but inwardly pray, Lord, help me not to be dependent on medicine, but to rely on mind power alone. You have not been taught how to attain that mental state. It comes by exercising mind power and by attuning the mind to God through meditation. In this way you should gain complete power over the mind before you try to deny matter and material remedies. Until then it is best to take common sense steps to help the body. When you can drink poison and remain unaffected by it, you can rightfully deny matter and say mind is everything. You must arrive at that consciousness first. God offers you an invincible weapon by which you can eradicate all your sorrows and suffering, wisdom which comes through God communion. 
The easiest way to overcome disease, disappointments, and disasters is to be in constant attunement with God. We are babes in the woods of life, forced to learn by our own experiences and troubles, stumbling into pitfalls of sickness and wrong habits. Again and again we have to raise our voices for help. The supreme help comes from tuning in with spirit. Whenever you are in trouble, pray, Lord, you are within me and all around me. I am in the castle of thy presence. I have been struggling through life, surrounded by many kinds of deadly enemies. I now see that they are not really agents for my destruction. You have put me on earth to test my power. I am going through these tests only to prove myself. I am game to fight the evils that surround me. I will vanquish them by the almightiness of your presence. And when I shall have passed through the adventure of this life, I will say, Lord, it was hard to be brave and fight, but the greater my terror, the greater was the strength within me given by you by which I conquered and realized that I am made in your image. You are the king of this universe and I am your child, a prince of the universe. What have I to fear? As soon as you realize you have been born a human being you have everything to fear. There seems to be no escape. No matter what precautions you take, there is always a misstep somewhere. Your only security is in God. Whether you are in the African jungle or at war or racked by disease and poverty, just say to the Lord and believe, I am in the armored car of your presence, moving across the battlefield of life. I am protected. There is no other way to be safe. Use common sense and trust fully in God. I am not suggesting something eccentric. I am urging you to affirm and believe no matter what happens in this truth. Lord, it is you alone who can help me. So many have fallen into ruts of disease and wrong habits and have not pulled themselves out. Never say you cannot escape. Your misfortune is only for a time. The failure of one life is not the measure of whether or not you are a success. The attitude of the conquering man is unafraid. I am a child of God. I have nothing to fear. So fear nothing. Life and death are only different processes of your consciousness. Everything the Lord has created is to try us, to bring out the buried soul immortality within us. That is the adventure of life, the one purpose of life and everyone's adventure is different, unique. You should be prepared to deal with all problems of health, mind, and soul by common sense methods and faith in God, knowing that in life or death your soul remains unconquered. You can never die. No weapon can pierce the soul. No fire can burn it. No water can moisten it. Nor can any wind wither it. The soul is immutable, all permeating, ever calm and immovable. You are eternally the image of spirit. Is it not freeing to the mind to know that death cannot kill us? When disease comes and the body stops working, the soul thinks, I am dead. But the Lord shakes the soul and says, What is the matter with you? You are not dead. Are you not still thinking? A soldier is walking along and a bomb shatters his body. His soul cries, Oh, I am killed, Lord. And God says, Of course not. Are you not talking to me? Nothing can destroy you, my child. You are dreaming. Then the soul realizes, this is not so terrible. It was only my temporary earth life consciousness of being a physical body that made losing it seem the end of me. I had forgotten that I am the eternal soul. The goal of our life adventure. True yogas are able to control the mind under all circumstances. When that perfection is reached, you are free then you know life is a divine adventure. Jesus and other great souls have proved this. Nothing could touch them. They enjoyed uninterruptedly the sweet romance with God. It is the only part of the adventure that has any purpose. Human love is meaningless unless anchored in the unconditional love of God. A boy and a girl fall in love, and after a time they fall out of love. Romance with human beings is imperfect. The romance with God is perfect and everlasting. You will finish this life adventure only when you conquer its dangers by your will power and mind power, as did the great ones. Then you will look back and say, Lord, it was a pretty bad experience. I came near failing, 
but now I am in the safety of your presence forever. We can see life as a wonderful adventure when the Lord finally says, All those terrifying experiences are over. I am with you evermore. Nothing can harm you. Man is playing at life like a child, but his mind grows stronger through fighting sickness and troubles. Anything that weakens your mind is your greatest enemy, and whatever strengthens your mind is your haven. Laugh at any trouble that comes. The Lord has shown me that this life is but a dream. When you wake up, you will remember it only as a dream of joy and sorrow that has passed. You will know you are everlasting in the Lord. Chapter Self-Analysis Key to the Mastery of Life Let us leave the confines of ego and wander in the vast fields of soul progress. As time is marching on, so must your souls march on to a greater expansion of your life and spirit. The initiative to undertake your most important duty in life is often buried beneath the accumulated debris of human habits. You must free yourselves from their stultifying influence and start to sow the seeds of the success that you desire. Life is worthwhile when you are accomplishing the most essential work, which is to find out the meaning and true values of your existence. Man should be instructed by this cosmic motion picture of life. It is not being shown without a reason. Each day we behold different scenes, and each day has a lesson to teach. You are meant to learn the lesson by concentrating on the supreme purpose of human existence, to know who is behind your life. Without self-analysis, man leads robot-like life. Millions of people never analyze themselves. Mentally they are mechanical products of the factory of their environment, preoccupied with breakfast, lunch and dinner, working and sleeping, and going here and there to be entertained. They don't know what or why they are seeking, nor why they never realize complete happiness and lasting satisfaction. By evading self-analysis, people go on being robots, conditioned by their environment. True self-analysis is the greatest art of progress. Everyone should learn to analyze himself dispassionately. Write down your thoughts and aspirations daily. Find out what you are, not what you imagine you are. Because you want to make yourself what you ought to be. Most people don't change because they don't see their own faults. Everyone is the product of his heredity and environment. If you were born in America, you reflect certain American characteristics. If you were born in China or England, you are likely to reflect the interests of those nationalities. Your environment is the result of your true heredity, the traits and desires acquired by you in past lives. This heredity of past incarnations has led to your being born in the particular family and environment in which you now find yourself. When we read about the families of important people, we often note that sons of great men are not necessarily of the same mental caliber as their fathers. This failure of biological heredity in man raises a great doubt in our minds. Why don't we find the same results in human life that we observe in the plant and animal kingdoms, where good pedigree usually produces good offspring? We must probe the inner life of man for an answer. Traits from past lives influence us now. In a literary family it is not unusual to find a boy who doesn't like literature at all. He has been brought up with literature-loving companions, yet has no affinity for it. Why? Environment or heredity in the ordinary sense does not explain it. But beyond these factors is reincarnation. We are born into a particular family because of certain characteristics that are similar. But every person in a family is an individual soul who brings his own distinctive traits from his past lives. Hence there are always some biological hereditary resemblances in families, yet each person is different in character. A man takes birth in a certain family, a particular social and national environment, owing to specific causes, his own past actions. Therefore man is the architect of his own destiny. One can almost predict what he will be in his next life by analyzing his dominant interests and habits in this one. Whatever you have done you can undo. So self-analysis is important for the progress of the soul. Let us suppose that tragedies have been your favorite reading for many years, and that you naturally feel you will continue to enjoy them for the rest of your life. 
But if you analyze yourself and see that you are becoming morose from constant reading of this type of literature, you will wish to form a new habit of perusing inspiring spiritual books. By doing so you will change the course of your life. We can alter ourselves very quickly with strong determination, but without it one does not change effortlessly or in a minute the habit patterns of years. To eradicate a habit of long standing you must apply the full strength of your determination in counter activity until the bad habit is worn out. Most persons don't have the necessary patience. But everyone should feel encouraged by this truth. Whatever you have created or done you can undo. When you analyze what you are, have a firm desire to banish your weaknesses and to make yourself what you ought to be. Don't allow yourself to be overwhelmed with discouragement at the revelation of your shortcomings that honest self-analysis usually brings. Thought produces everything in the universe. A theory has been advanced that thought is a product of the endocrine glands. Such a conception is unfounded. Flesh cannot produce thought. Mind is the architect of the microcosm and the macrocosm. As water by cooling and condensation becomes ice, so thought by condensation assumes physical form. Everything in the universe is thought in material form. The endocrine organ is just a physical structurization of a microcosmic thought blueprint. The physical and mental aspects of man are closely interrelated. It is commonly observed that a person whose liver is out of order becomes cranky. When you are bilious, you don't feel like smiling and saying peace to everyone. You feel unamiable. Your thoughts and emotions are affected by your physical state. A weakening of the organs has a corresponding weakening effect on mental power. Those who eat a great deal of meat are often surly and full of vexation. If I were to put you on a grape juice diet for a week, it is likely you would feel uplifted and harmoniously disposed toward all. I recently met a man who was wearing just a lightweight suit and no overcoat, although it was terribly cold. He said he was 70 years old and that he never feels cold. He didn't even wear socks. He had accustomed his body to chilly weather. Mind influences body more than vice versa, but the bodily chemicals do exercise a constant influence on the mind. Body and mind are interdependent. Dreams reveal the omnipotence of mind. For example, suppose I am dreaming that I am awake and in the kitchen and very hungry. I eat something and drink a glass of milk. My hunger and thirst are gone and I feel satisfied. What was the cause of my satisfaction? Was it the food? Remember I am dreaming. Is it not simply a change of thought that made me feel satisfied? Since I am dreaming, it is my mind that thought it had taken food. The hunger and the food and the milk were only ideas in my dream. All were made of the same mind stuff. When I wake up I realize that my experiences were nothing but a series of ideas. A mere change of thought removed the unpleasant sensation of hunger and substituted the pleasant sensation of eating food and drinking milk. So you see, thought by itself can do anything. Once I was traveling by train when the weather was extremely hot. The air felt as if it were coming from a furnace. Everyone around me was suffering, but I was smiling within because my mind was dissociated from the thought of the heat. I had said to myself, Lord, the same electricity that makes heat in a furnace makes ice in a refrigerator. Therefore, why shouldn't I be able to redirect that electricity of yours to produce cold right now? In that instant I felt as if a sheet of ice had enveloped me. Change your mental attitude. We should bear in mind, however, that it is not wise to disregard the body wholly. One should eat proper foods in preference to wrong foods. And if you must live with people who make you nervous, then once in a while you should change your surroundings. But it is better still if you can change your mental environment so that you won't be disturbed by others' actions. Change yourself, and you can then live anywhere in peace and happiness. Most of the world is like a mental hospital. Some people are sick with jealousy, others with anger, hatred, passion. They are victims of their habits and emotions. But you can make your home a place of peace. Analyze yourself. All emotions are reflected in the body and mind. 
Envy and fear cause the face to pale, and love makes it glow. Learn to be calm and you will always be happy. So remember, whatever type of ego you have, whatever personality you are trying to express, you should make an effort to analyze your true nature and to develop its best qualities. One may have a moral ego or a patriotic ego or an artistic ego or a businessman's ego and so on. If morality is your ideal, live uprightly and express your goodwill to all. That is real morality. It is pride that makes self-righteous persons so ready to judge those about them who are weak. True morality includes compassion for others and their ignorant wrongdoings. Those who are products of the material ego suffer much and needlessly. Such persons should learn self-control, otherwise they are just like pieces of matter in action. They have to smoke so many times a day, they must eat certain foods, they always get a headache, if they miss their lunch, they can sleep only in a particular kind of bed. It is all right to utilize creature comforts, but never be enslaved by them. If you are a cross between an intellectual and a materialistic ego, that is better. But unless you develop and maintain a balanced nature, intellectually, materially, and spiritually, you are not going to be happy. Your spiritual intuition tells you how to control your life so that you are not mastered by it. It is unwise to let the materialistic ego govern your judgment. Your conscience and intuition should decide. The conditions of happiness. Plain living, high thinking. Plain living and high thinking should be your goal. Learn to carry all the conditions of happiness within yourself by meditating and attuning your consciousness to the ever-existing, ever-conscious, ever-new joy which is God. Your happiness should never be subject to any outside influence. Whatever your environment is, don't allow your inner peace to be touched by it. Analyze yourself, make yourself what you should be and what you want to be. People seldom learn true self-control. They do things that are detrimental to their highest welfare and think they are making themselves happy, but they are not. To be able to do things when and because you ought to do them, and to refrain from doing what you know is injurious, these are keys to real success and happiness. Don't keep your mind engaged in too many activities. Analyze what you get from them and see if they are really important. Don't waste your time. To read a good book improves you much more than seeing movies. I often say if you read for one hour, write in your spiritual diary for two hours, and if you write for two hours, think for three hours, and if you think for three hours, meditate all the time. No matter where I go, I keep my mind continuously on my soul peace. You too should always point the needle of your attention toward the north pole of spiritual joy. Then no one can ever disturb your equilibrium. Remember if each day does not find you a better person than you were the day before, you are going backward, in health, in mental peace, and in soul joy. Why? Because you don't exercise enough control over your actions. You yourself made your habits and you can change them. If you have been thinking wrongly, make up your mind to be with good company and to study and meditate. A change of company can make a great difference to you. When you come here, even for these few hours, your mentality changes, you feel a refreshing peace. When you go to a dance or a party, your mind is often restless, nervous, and excited. Afterward, if you enter a different, calmer atmosphere, you feel more peaceful again. The greatest influence in your life, stronger even than your willpower, is your environment. Change that if necessary. Until you are mentally strong, you can never be what you want to be without a good environment to help you. When you are having difficulty in trying to change for the better, spiritual company and other uplifting influences are essential. Self-analysis is also essential to help you better yourself. If you can analyze yourself fearlessly, you will be able to stand the critical analysis of others without flinching. Those who like to dwell on the faults of others are human vultures. There is already too much evil in the world. Don't talk of evil, don't think of evil, and don't do evil. Be like a rose wafting to all the sweet fragrance of soul goodness. Make everyone feel that you are a friend, that you are a helper, not a destroyer. If you want to be good, analyze yourself and develop the virtues in you. 
Banish the thought that evil has any part in your nature, and it will drop off. Make everyone else feel that you are an image of God, not by your words but by your behavior. Emphasize the light and darkness will be no more. Study, meditate, and do good to others. Seclusion is the price of greatness. Seclusion is the price of greatness. Be alone within. Don't lead the aimless life that so many persons follow. Meditate and read good books more. There are so many inspiring things to know, and yet man spends his time foolishly. Happiness will never come if you don't concentrate and act on the wisdom of great men. Their thoughts are there to help you in the scriptures and other truthful books. So don't waste time constantly seeking new excitement. Once in a while, it is all right to go to the movies and have a little social life, but mostly remain apart and live within yourself. Happiness depends on meditation, on knowing great minds through their thoughts and books, and on surrounding yourself with people who are noble and kind. Enjoy solitude, but when you want to mix with others, do so with all your love and friendship, so that those persons cannot forget you, but remember always that they met someone who inspired them and turned their minds toward God. Chapter Healing by God's Unlimited Power There are three kinds of illness physical, mental, and spiritual. Physical sickness is due to different forms of toxic conditions, infectious disease, and accidents. Mental sickness is caused by fear, worry, anger, and other emotional inharmonies. Soul sickness is due to man's ignorance of his true relationship with God. Ignorance is the supreme disease. When one banishes ignorance he also banishes the causes of all physical, mental and spiritual disease. My guru Sri Yukteswarji often said wisdom is the greatest cleanser. Trying to overcome various kinds of suffering by the limited power of material curative methods is often disappointing. Only in the unlimited power of spiritual methods may man find a permanent cure for the dis-ease of body, mind and soul. That boundless power of healing is to be sought in God. If you have suffered mentally over the loss of loved ones, you can find them again in God. All things are possible with His help. Unless one really knows God, he is not justified in saying that only mind exists and that one does not need to obey health laws or to use any physical aids for healing. Until actual realization is attained, one should use his common sense in all he does. At the same time one should never doubt God, but should constantly affirm his faith in God's omnipresent divine power. Doctors try to learn the causes of disease and to remove those causes so that the illnesses do not recur. In their use of many specific material methods of cure, doctors are often very skillful. However, not every disease responds to medicine and surgery, and therein lies the essential limitation of these methods. Chemicals and medicines affect only the outer physical composition of the bodily cells and do not alter the inner atomic structure or life principle of the cells. In many cases, no cure of disease is possible until the healing power of God has corrected, from within, the imbalance of life drawns or intelligent life energy in the body. The two basic causes of disease are underactivity and overactivity of the life energy, prana, that structures and sustains the body. The improper functioning of any one or more of the five governing pranic currents, vayana circulation, udana metabolism, samana assimilation, prana crystallization, and apana elimination, adversely affects bodily health. When the natural harmonious balance of these subtle energies is restored by God's divine power, the atomic balance of the physical cells they nourish is restored. The healing is perfect and often instantaneous. So long as balanced vitality is maintained by right living, proper diet, and pranayama meditation life energy control techniques, the body's own life energy electrocutes disease before it can develop. Balanced development is essential. Injury and disease are more often the cause of death than is old age. Most people die before true old age has set in. 
In some cases, and they are exceptional, all parts of the body grow weak at once. Such persons die without pain, like ripe fruit that falls in due time from the tree. But the majority are plucked from the tree of life before they are really ripe for death. In most cases of death, one bodily part had ceased functioning before the rest. It may also happen that if one part is stronger or more developed than another, the resulting imbalance of the life force in the body may cause suffering and even death. For example, someone with a weak heart and a strong muscled body may injure his heart by overuse of his muscular strength. Sando, the strong man, died at 58 when a blood vessel in his brain burst as a result of his having raised a car single-handed. Overexercise that leads to unbalanced development may thus have harmful consequences. The Self-Realization Fellowship Energization exercises place the least strain on the heart and provide for a uniform development of the body. Simple outdoor exercise, such as walking, balanced diet and moderation in eating, and quiet meditation are all conducive to health. Obey nature's laws and have more faith in God. A master may ignore, without ill effect, dietary and other rules for health. The ordinary individual, however, should be careful to maintain physical well-being by right observance of the laws of nature. One's diet should be wisely chosen. The body requires for health certain amounts of starch, protein, and fat, but in excess they can be harmful. Very little starch is necessary. Bread is no longer held to be the staff of life. Too much starch in the diet, especially from white flour, causes an overaccumulation of mucus in the body. A certain amount of mucus is necessary, of course, to prevent the entry of harmful microbes into the mucous membranes. Eat abundantly of foods that contain a high proportion of mineral salts, such as fruits and vegetables. This type of diet prevents constipation, which, when present, predisposes the body to many diseases. Nature tries by reflex action to remove causes of physical distress. When dust gets into the eye, we involuntarily try to wink the dust away. When dirt or dust enters the nose, we sneeze. If we eat something unwholesome, we get rid of it by regurgitation. When disease attacks any internal organ of the body, nature provides many means by which the organ may protect, defend, and renew itself. However, owing to various habits of living that alienate most men from nature, their innate powers of recuperation and rejuvenation become impaired and are prematurely lost. Harmful microbes are ceaselessly attacking the body, Good ones are ceaselessly defending it, aided sometimes by diet, herbs, medicines, and other health measures. But an unlimited source of protection for man lies in his strong thought that, as a child of God, he cannot be affected by disease. Mind has much greater power than medicine. But to deny any power to medicine is unreasonable, because if drugs have no power, a man could take poison and not die. While one should not deny the potency of medicines and drugs, one should understand that continuous dependence on them will prove their limitations. A time will come when they will lose their former efficacy in restoring the body to health. The only infinite power of healing lies in man's mind and soul. Body cannot be healed by spiritual means if the mental power and faith are weak. Permanent healing comes through the boundless power of the mind and through God's grace. Fruits, vegetables, and nuts superior to meat. According to one school of thought, some diseases may be cured by eating the organs of animals. A savage devours the heart of a lion in the belief that his own heart will thus be invigorated. The tissues of chicken hearts are known to have a strengthening effect on the heart of man, and the liver helps those who are anemic. However, many health authorities state that iron and vitamin-rich foods such as eggs, cash, nuts, soybeans, molasses, dried apricots, dried lean, beans, dried peas, parsnips, spinach, and parsley may successfully be substituted for liver in overcoming anemia. Pepsin taken from animal organs is useful in cases of stomach ulcers, but papain, a substance very similar to pepsin, is present in the fruit of the papaya, which is a valuable healing aid to those who suffer from any form of impaired digestion.
When man is sick he may feel justified in eating anything that has healing value, but animal flesh is not actually necessary for this purpose. Indeed, it may increase the bodily burden by contributing toxins to the bloodstream. Thus, while flesh foods may aid in healing one illness, they sometimes create a condition whereby another disease may develop elsewhere in the body. That is why the safest diet for man is fresh fruits, vegetables, finely ground nuts and vegetable and dairy proteins. In certain cases the system may not tolerate raw fruits and vegetables, but the average person will benefit by including them daily in his diet. In vegetables and fruits God has infused medicinal power to help in overcoming disease. Even these, however, have but a limited potency. The organs of the body are essentially sustained by the energy of God, and the person who employs various methods to increase this energy will have at his command a greater power for healing than is afforded by any medicine or diet. Purify the body of harmful toxins. Three-fourths of the body consists of water, hence the bodily demand for water is much greater than that for food. Death by thirst is a suffering more acute than death by starvation. It is important to give the body plenty of water. Drinking unsweetened fruit juices also is good. In localities where water has a calcium content high enough to dispose toward hardening of the arteries in man, he should take, instead, fruit juices and watermelons, cantaloupes, and similar juicy fruits. Some health researchers say, however, that persons who have sinus trouble should not take citrus juices. Make it a point to drink plenty of liquids, and I do not mean soda water beverages, to wash away toxins in the body. But avoid drinking liquids with meals, as this can be injurious to digestion. One tends to wash down the food without chewing it properly. If starches are not partially digested in the mouth, they often do not digest fully in the stomach. To chew food well is important. The stomach has no teeth. Hasty eating is harmful, particularly if large amounts of liquid are taken with the meal, thus diluting the gastric juices. Also, drinking liquids with meals gives a tendency to obesity. It is important to keep the bloodstream healthy. Beef and pork may release into the bloodstream toxic poisons and microbes. The white corpuscles try to destroy the microbes, but if the latter are strong and if the white corpuscles are insufficient to resist them, toxic reactions set in. For meat eaters, fish, chicken, and lamb are preferable to beef and pork, which are highly acid producing. The most important principle in connection with eating is to avoid any form of overindulgence. As one learns to restrain himself, he becomes healthier. It may often happen that one's desire for a certain food is so great that he thinks he cannot resist it. His senses dictate to him, saying that he must eat that food, even when he knows it may be harmful to him. If he refuses to perpetuate his bad habits, he will find that he comes to dislike what is injurious and to like what is beneficial. Greedy people fill themselves and still they are looking for more food. By overreading, they dare to strain a heart pump that has been overworked for perhaps 40 years. Many persons thoughtlessly eat late at night. Usually sleep soon follows, during which man's internal machinery slows down. The food may lie in the stomach without being properly digested. Eating shortly before the nightly rest is therefore unwise. There is nothing worse for body and mind, however, than drinking intoxicating liquors. Under their influence a man may do things that in his right mind he would be ashamed to do. Violence, greed, lust for money and sex, even murder, may result from drunkenness. The belief that wine, sex experiences, and money will bring happiness is said by the sages to be the chief delusion that man must overcome in order to realize his true nature. Liquor increases man's desires for money and sex, and it is therefore the worst evil of the three. It is an unnecessary and extremely dangerous indulgence, because it stifles reason. A drunken man is no longer a true man. It is wisdom to strive to maintain only normal appetites. Increase your natural resistance to disease. Fasting is a natural method of healing. When animals or savages are sick, they fast. 
The bodily machinery thus has an opportunity to cleanse itself and to obtain a much needed rest. Most diseases can be cured by judicious fasting. Unless one has a weak heart, regular short fasts have been recommended by the Yo is as an excellent health measure. Another good method of physical healing is through suitable herbs or herb extracts. In using medicines, one often finds that they are not powerful enough to bring about a healing, or that they are so powerful that they irritate the bodily tissues instead of healing them. Similarly, exposure to certain types of healing rays will burn the tissues. There are so many limitations in physical methods of healing. Better than medicines are the rays of the sun. In them is a wonderful healing power. One should take a 10-minute sunbath every day. 10 minutes a day is better than only occasional exposure for longer periods. A short sunbath daily, reinforced by good health habits, will keep the body supplied with sufficient life energy to destroy all harmful microbes. Healthy persons possess a natural resistance to disease, and particularly to infections. Illness comes when the resisting power of the blood has been diminished by wrong eating or by overreading, or when overindulgence in sex has depleted the vital energy. To conserve the physical creative energy is to supply all the cells with vibrant life energy. The body then possesses a tremendous resistance to disease. Sexual overindulgence weakens the body and renders it vulnerable to illness. You can increase your lifespan. One naturally has a better chance to overcome sickness in youth than in old age. There are always exceptions, however, owing to karmic conditions. The average length of life today is 60 years. Many doctors agree that it is easily possible to increase one's lifespan by careful living. Mavadar Babaji and a number of other great masters have lived for several hundred years. Life may be prolonged indefinitely, not by food, medicine, exercise, sunbathing, and other limited means, but by contact with the immeasurable power of God. We should think not only of the body but also of the spirit. If we attain perfection in oneness with spirit, we shall find perfection in body also. Many persons are continually busy looking after their physical welfare, but neglect the development of their minds. The key to all power lies in the mind. If one fails to cultivate that power, when serious disease comes he may die without making any resistance, regardless of his age. The power of a smile. Conserve the vital energy, follow a balanced diet, and always smile and be happy. He who finds joy within himself discovers that his body is charged with electric current, life energy, not from food but from God. If you feel that you can't smile, stand before a mirror and with your fingers pull your mouth into a smile. It is that important. The healing methods I have touched on briefly in connection with food and the cleansing of the body by herbs or fasting are limited in their effectiveness. But when one is joyful within, he invites the help of the inexhaustible power of God. I mean a sincere joyfulness, not that which you feign outwardly, but do not feel within. When your joy is sincere you are a smile millionaire. A genuine smile distributes the cosmic current prana to every body cell. The happy man is less subject to disease, for happiness actually attracts into the body a greater supply of the universal life energy. There are many things to talk about on this subject of healing. The main idea is that we should depend more on mind power, which is illimitable. The rules for guarding against disease should be self-control exercise, proper eating, drinking plenty of fruit juices, occasional fasting and smiling all the time, from within. Those smiles come from meditation. You will find then the eternal power of God. When you are in ecstasy with Him you consciously bring His healing presence into your body. Permanent healing comes from God. Mind power carries with it the unfailing energy of God, that is the power you want in your body. And there is a way to bring in that power. The way is communion with God by meditation. When your communion with Him is perfect, the healing is permanent. When the causative power of God comes, the healing effect is instantaneous. 
no time is required for cause to ripen into effect. Many people in distress try to evoke that power, but when they are not healed at once they lose faith in the Lord instead of continuing to try to enlist His aid. The man who clings to the divine is bound to be healed, because God knows that the devotee is praying, and he cannot but respond. But when you give up, the Father says, All right, I see that you can do without me. I shall wait for you. The supreme power may be invoked by continuous faith and unceasing prayer. You should eat rightly and do whatever else is necessary for the body, but continuously pray to him, Lord, thou canst heal me because thou dost control the life atoms and subtle conditions of the body that doctors cannot reach with medicines. The external factors of medicines and fasting have a certain beneficial effect on the physical body, but they do not affect the inner force that sustains the cells. It is only when you go to God and receive His healing power that the life energy is directed into the atoms of the bodily cells and produces instantaneous healing. Wouldn't you rather depend more on God? But the attempt to change one's dependence from physical to spiritual methods should be gradual. If a man accustomed to overreading falls sick, and with the intention of trying to achieve a mental healing, abruptly starts fasting, he may be discouraged if success is not forthcoming. It takes time to change one's way of thinking from dependence on food to dependence on mind. To be responsive to the healing power of God, the mind must be trained to believe in divine aid. Out of that great power all atomic energy is throbbing, manifesting and sustaining every cell of the physical universe. As moving pictures are sustained by a beam of light coming from the projection booth of a movie house, so are all of us sustained by the cosmic beam, the divine light pouring from the projection booth of eternity. When you look to and find that beam, you will behold its unlimited power to rebuild the atoms and electrons and life drawns and all body cells that may be out of order. Coming with a great healer. Chapter. Eliminating the static of fear from the mind radio. Everything in the universe is composed of energy or vibration. The vibration of words is, by extension, a grosser expression of the vibration of thoughts. The thoughts of all men are vibrating in the ether. Because thoughts have such a high vibratory rate, they have not yet been detected there. But it is fortunate that we do not know the thoughts of all men. Through the instrumentality of radio, you can push a button and lo, you hear music and voices. If it were not for the intelligence in the ether, through which the radio waves travel to your receiving set, you might hear all the different broadcasts at once. God created the ether, and he planned that man would create radio and radio wave vibrations which could be transmitted and received through this medium. Radio waves depend on the ether for transmission and on electricity for amplification in broadcasting and receiving. The sounds of radio broadcasting are always present in the ether, but are inaudible to us without a radio instrument. The vibratory radio waves represent thoughts that are being transmitted through space into any receiving set that is tuned in. When you are near and dear to someone, you can feel the thoughts of that person, but you are probably not able to do this with anyone as far away as India unless you have developed range. Those of you who practice regularly the Self-Realization Fellowship lessons on concentration and meditation, and are very calm, will be able to feel the thoughts of others, even from a distance. Your mind will become more sensitive. We are all human radios. You receive the thought messages of others through your heart, the center of feeling, and broadcast your own thought messages through the spiritual eye, the center of concentration and will. Your antenna is in the medulla, the center of intuitive superconsciousness. Suppose you are away from home and you wish to perceive what is happening there. If your feelings are very calm and your mind quiet, you will be able to intuit the feelings and thoughts of your family at home. When you become capable of great concentration, your feeling can penetrate everywhere. Your perception becomes charged with energy, with electricity. The world is only a thought in the mind of God. There is in reality no space between India and here. But we are in America, and we think we have to allow 25 days for a steamer trip before we can reach India. 
according to material consciousness time is required to traverse such a distance. But energy cuts down space. If we go by airplane the trip takes but seven days. The distance is decreased by the increased energy of flight. The more energy the more reduction of space or distance. Suppose you're sleeping and you dream that you're going to India. You take the train to New York, board the boat, stop at various ports of call, and arrive in Bombay. All this can be done in minutes in the dream because in thought there is no space. Or suppose I am dreaming that I am dialing a radio and I tune in India. There is no space, it is all an idea in my brain. The whole world exists only in thought, such as the power of mind. Space is a mental concept. I can close my eyes and think of things that are 2,000 miles away, and yet all those miles are a mere expansion of thought. Space and time are merely differentiations of thought. What is the difference between ice cream and hot coffee in a dream experience? When you awaken you realize that in the dreamland ice cream was one thought and hot coffee another. They were merely two different ideas. Thought has omniscient power. The kind of thought I am speaking of is the thought of God. As he is omnipresent through thought so are we. Are we not already connecting the thought of America and the thought of India by radio? There is no space there. Often when you are trying to tune in a radio station static comes in and disturbs the program you are trying to hear. Likewise when you are trying to accomplish some personal transformation in your heart static may interrupt your progress. That static is your bad habits. Fear cannot enter a quiet heart. Fear is another form of static that affects your mind radio. Like good and bad habits, fear can be both constructive and destructive. For example, when a wife says my husband will be displeased if I go out this evening, therefore I won't go, she is motivated by loving fear which is constructive. Loving fear and slavish fear are different. I am speaking of loving fear, which makes one cautious lest he hurts someone unnecessarily. Slavish fear paralyzes the will. Family members should entertain only loving fear and never be afraid to speak truth to one another. To perform dutiful actions or sacrifice your own wishes out of love for another person is much better than to do so out of fear. And when you refrain from breaking divine laws, it should be out of love for God, not from fear of punishment. Fear comes from the heart. If ever you feel overcome by dread of some illness or accident, you should inhale and exhale deeply, slowly and rhythmically several times, relaxing with each exhalation. This helps the circulation to become normal. If your heart is truly quiet, you cannot feel fear at all. Anxieties are awakened in the heart through the consciousness of pain, hence fear is dependent on some prior experience. Perhaps you once fell and broke your leg, and so you learn to dread a repetition of that experience. When you dwell on such an apprehension your will is paralyzed, and your nerves also and you may indeed fall again and break your leg. Furthermore, when your heart becomes paralyzed by fear, your vitality is low and disease germs get a chance to invade your body. Be cautious but not fearful. There is hardly anyone who does not fear disease. Fear was given to man as a cautionary device to spare him pain. It is not meant to be cultivated and abused. Overindulgence and fear only cripples our efforts to ward off difficulties. Cautious fear is wise as when knowing the principles of right diet, you reason I won't eat that cake because it is not good for me. But unreasoning apprehension is a cause of disease. It is the real germ of all sickness. Threat of disease precipitates disease. Through the very thought of sickness you bring it on yourself. If you are constantly afraid of catching a cold, you will be more susceptible to it, no matter what you do to prevent it. Do not paralyze your will and nerves with fear. When anxiety persists in spite of your will, you are helping to create the very experience you are dreading. Also, it is unwise to associate more than is necessary and considerate with people who constantly discuss their own and others' ailments and infirmities. This dwelling on the subject may sow seeds of apprehension in your mind. Those who are worried they are going to succumb to tuberculosis, cancer, heart trouble, 
should cast out this fear, lest it bring about the unwelcome condition. Those who are already sick and infirm need as pleasant an environment as possible among people who have a strong and positive nature to encourage them in positive thoughts and feelings. Thought has great power. Those who serve in hospitals seldom fall ill because of their confident attitude. They are vitalized by their energy and strong thoughts. For this reason as you get older, it is best not to tell others your age. As soon as you do, they see that age in you and associate it with diminishing health and vitality. The thought of advancing age creates anxiety, and thus you devitalize yourself. So keep your age private. Say to God, I am immortal. I am blessed with the privilege of good health, and I thank thee. Therefore be cautious, but not fearful. Take the precaution of going on a purifying diet now and then so that any conditions of illness that may be present in the body will be eliminated. Do your best to remove the causes of illness and then be absolutely unafraid. There are so many germs everywhere that if you began to fear them, you would not be able to enjoy life at all. Even with all your sanitary precautions, if you could look at your home through a microscope you would lose all desire to eat. Techniques of Tuning Out Fear Whatever it is that you fear, take your mind away from it and leave it to God. Have faith in Him. Much suffering is due simply to worry. Why suffer now when the malady has not yet come? Since most of our ills come through fear, if you give up fear, you will be free at once. The healing will be instant. Every night before you sleep firm, the Heavenly Father is with me, I am protected. Mentally surround yourself with spirit and his cosmic energy and think, any germ that attacks me will be electrocuted. Chant down three times or the word God. That will shield you. You will feel his wonderful protection. Be fearless. That is the only way to be healthy. If you commune with God his truth will flow to you. You will know that you are the imperishable soul. Whenever you feel afraid, put your hand over your heart next to the skin. Rub from left to right and say, Father, I am free. Tune out this fear from my heart radio. Just as you tune out static on an ordinary radio, so if you continuously rub the heart from left to right and continuously concentrate on the thought that you want to tune out fear from your heart, it will go and the joy of God will be perceived. Fear ceases with the contact of God. Fear is constantly haunting you. Cessation of fear comes with the contact of God, nothing else. Why wait? Through yoga you can have that communion with him. India has something to give you that no other nation has ever given. I owe everything to my guru Swami Sri Yukteswar. He was a master in every way. It was by following his wisdom that I was able to succeed in my mission in the West. He said, whatever you do, try to do it as nobody else has done it before. If you remember that thought, you will succeed. Most people imitate others. You should be original and whatever you do, do well. All nature consciously communes with you when you are in tune with God. We often consider ourselves first, but we should always include others in our happiness. When we do that from the goodness of our hearts, we spread abroad a spirit of mutual consideration. If everyone in a community of 1,000 persons behaved this way, each one would have 999 friends. But if everyone in that community behaved like an enemy to the other, each one would have 999 enemies. Conquering the hearts of others by the power of love is the greatest victory you can win in life. Always try to consider others first and you will find the whole world at your feet. That was the greatness of Jesus. He lived and died for all. Men of great material power who live only for themselves are soon forgotten, but those who live completely for others are remembered forever. The King of Kings had no throne of gold during his brief span on earth, but he has reigned for twenty centuries on a throne of love in the hearts of millions of people. That is the best throne to have. A single thought may lead to redemption. When you came into this world you cried whereas everyone else rejoiced. During your lifetime work and serve in such a way that when it is time for you to leave this world, you will smile at parting while the world cries for you. Hold this thought and you will always remember to consider others before yourself. 
This vast world was made that you might use your intelligence to acquire knowledge of the spirit, knowledge about yourself. Just one thought may redeem you. You don't realize how effectively your thoughts work in the ether. How would you know human love if God himself didn't give it to you by planting his love in the heart of each being? And since God is so kind and so loving, then he should be the object of your search. He doesn't want to impose himself on you. But the mysterious working of your body, the intelligence he has given you, and every other wonder in life should be sufficient stimulus to make you determined to find God. Every human being would be redeemed if he would try. You must try. When I started in this path, my life at first was chaotic, but as I kept on trying, things began to clear up for me in a marvelous way. Everything that happened showed me that God is, and that He can be known in this life. When you find God, what assurance and fearlessness you will have. Then nothing else matters at all, nothing can ever make you afraid. Thus did Krishna exhort Arjuna to face fearlessly the battle of life and become spiritually victorious. Surrender not to unmanliness. It is unbecoming of thee. O scorcher of foes, forsake this small weak-heartedness. Arise! Chapter Nervousness, Cause and Cure Nervousness is a malady that can be overcome by a specific medicine, calmness. The disturbance of mental equilibrium, which results in nervous disorders, is caused by continuous states of excitement or excessive stimulation of the senses. Indulgence in constant thoughts of fear, anger, melancholy, remorse, envy, sorrow, hatred, discontent, or worry, and lack of the necessities for normal and happy living, such as right food, proper exercise, fresh air, sunshine, agreeable work and a purpose in life, all are the causes of nervous disease. Any violent or persistent mental, emotional or physical excitement greatly disturbs and unbalances the flow of life force throughout the sensory motor mechanism and the lamps of the senses. If we connect a 120-volt bulb with a 2,000-volt source, it would burn out the bulb. Similarly, the nervous system was not made to withstand the destructive force of intense emotion or persistent negative thoughts and feelings. Far-reaching effects of nervousness. Nervousness is no simple problem. It is a deadly enemy with far-reaching effects. Physically, it is difficult to heal any disease so long as it is aggravated by nervousness. Spiritually, an imbalance of life force in the body makes it extremely hard for the devotee to concentrate or meditate deeply enough to acquire peace and wisdom. But nervousness can be cured. The sufferer must be willing to analyze his condition and remove the disintegrating emotions and negative thoughts that are little by little destroying him. Objective analysis of one's problems and maintaining calmness in all situations of life will heal the most persistent case of nervousness. Realization that all power to think, speak, feel, and act comes from God and that He is ever with us inspiring and guiding us brings an instant freedom from nervousness. Flashes of divine joy will come with this realization. Sometimes a deep illumination will pervade one's being, banishing the very concept of fear. Like an ocean, the power of God sweeps in, surging through the heart in a cleansing flood, removing all obstructions of delusive doubt, nervousness, and fear. The delusion of matter, the consciousness of being only a mortal body, is overcome by contacting the sweet serenity of spirit attainable by daily meditation. Then you know that the body is a little bubble of energy in his cosmic sea. The victim of nervousness must understand his case and must reflect on those continual mistakes of thinking which are responsible for his maladjustment to life. When the nervous man once admits to himself that his disease is not mysterious in its cause, but the logical outcome of his own habits, he is already half cured. The Nervous System The nervous system is the telephonic outlet and inlet of the body, providing man with his response to outer and inner stimuli. Excitement upsets the nervous balance, sending too much energy to some parts and depriving others of their normal share. This lack of proper distribution of nerve force is the sole cause of nervousness. 
The calm man, he who avoids excitement because he is not overly attached to his ego and is aware that God, and not he, is running this universe, is always able to meet any situation in life because his nerve force is equilibrated. Lord Krishna said, the knower of spirit abiding in the Supreme Being with unswerving discrimination, free from delusion, is thus neither jubilant at pleasant experiences nor downcast by unpleasant experiences. This is the goal we must strive for and attain. The nervous system supplies life current to the brain, heart, and other parts of the body. It distributes energy to the five senses of sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. Nerves are our medium of contact with the outer world and the source of all our sensory reactions. How important it is, therefore, to keep the nerves in a state of perfect balance, not shocking one part of the body with too much energy and consequently limiting the supply to other regions. Not by restlessness or emotional reactions, but by calmness, by deep trust in God, we reach the yogic state of an equilibrated being. The yogis have special techniques by which one can revive tissues burned out by nervousness, by sending life energy into nerves partially destroyed by mistreatment. Each cell and tissue in the nervous system is a living, intelligent structure. Life energy can always renew it. Overcome nervousness by good company. Nervousness is of two kinds, psychological and mechanical, or superficial and organic. The psychological or most common variety is due to mind excitement. This condition, long continued in, and accompanied by association with uninspiring people and wrong diet and health habits, causes the chronic or organic manifestations of nervous diseases. The diet should be simple balanced and not too plentiful. Exercise should be regular. Too much sleep drugs the nerves, and too little sleep is hurtful to them. But all important is the choice of company. Tell me what kind of friends a man has, and I will tell you what he is. Flatterers do not help us. We should seek the society of superior men, those who tell us the truth and help us to improve ourselves. He is our best friend who humbly suggests how we may benefit our life by worthwhile changes. Strong criticism, delivered in a mean or heartless way, is like hitting a man on the head with a hammer. The power of love is infinitely more effective. Kind suggestions, given with love and understanding, can accomplish wonders. Mere fault-finding accomplishes nothing. One is fit to judge others only after he has perfected his own nature. Till then, judging oneself is the only profitable analysis. Association with calm, wise people is one of the quickest ways to banish nervousness and realize our innate divinity. Nervous people should stay away from those suffering from similar troubles. Calmness is the best cure. The best cure for nervousness is the cultivation of calmness. One who is naturally calm does not lose his sense of reason, justice, or humor under any circumstances. He can always separate sentiment or wishful thinking from fact. He is not led astray by the honeyed tongues of dishonest men with improbable schemes for acquiring unearned wealth. He does not poison his bodily tissues with anger or fear, which adversely affects circulation. It is a well-proven fact that the milk of an angry mother can have a harmful effect on her child. What more striking proof can we ask for that violent emotions will finally reduce the body to an ignominious wreck? Poise is a beautiful quality. We should pattern our life by a triangular guide. Calmness and sweetness are the two sides, the base is happiness. Every day one should remind himself, I am a prince of peace, sitting on the throne of poise, directing my kingdom of activity. Whether one acts quickly or slowly, in solitude or in the busy marts of men, his center should be peaceful, poised. Christ is an example of that ideal. Everywhere he demonstrated peace as through every conceivable test without losing his poise. God is everywhere controlling planets, galaxies, yet he is not disturbed. Though he is in this world, yet he is above this world. We must reflect his image and likeness. We must meditate often and hold on to the peaceful aftereffects. 
we must send out thoughts of love, goodwill, harmony. In the temple of meditation, with the light of intuition burning on the altar, there is no restlessness, no nervous striving or searching. Man is truly home at last in a sanctuary not made with hands, but with God peace. Chapter, The Physical and Spiritual Rewards of Fasting Physical results and spiritual experiences of fasting are wonderful. The spirit within becomes disassociated from the demands of the body as the body itself is freed from gross habits. I have just passed my thirtieth day of dieting and fasting, and it seems as natural as if I had never eaten. All of you who are able should go on a three-day fast, if possible, a longer one. You would begin to discover that you can live without food. Pains or aches in the body indicate that something is going wrong with its machinery. Repairs are needed. Think how conscientiously you keep your auto clean and in good repair. Much more complex than any car is the human body, and the Lord wants you to keep it clean and in good running order also, while at the same time depending more on Him. The secret of good health does not lie only in chemicals. One should rely even more on God's energy within. This life force within our bodies is in fact the source of life. It is a conscious power, the creator of the organs and the supplier of their vitality as well. Ordinarily, life force is continually reinforced by mind power and food. But if it has been too much misused, it gives up and refuses to work anymore. Power may grow dim in the eyes, for example, and then you cannot see well. No food gives strength. No change of air invigorates, nothing can restore energy to the body when its life force begins to diminish. Fasting gives rest to the overworked organs, the bodily engines, and also to the life force itself, relieving it of extra work. When you cease to make the life force feel it has to depend for its existence on external sources, food, water, oxygen, sunshine, it becomes self-supporting, independent. It is overeating for 365 days of the year that creates many kinds of disease. Undeviating regularity in eating, whether the system actually needs food or not, is also a curse to the body. The more you concentrate on the palate, the more disease you will have. To enjoy food is all right, but to be a slave to it is the bane of life. Why should you let nature hurt you? Nature cannot punish you if you are not attached to the body or bound by food. You must recognize that life force is the sustainer of the body. Without being fanatic, place the greatest emphasis on the mind, with the object of making its power more and more dependable. If you insist on making your mind a slave to your body, the mind will take revenge. It will relinquish its power, so that you will have to depend on someone or something else to help you, and no doctor or medicine can help any patient if the patient's mind has become so weakened that the disease has become chronic. Three-fourths of the cure lies in the mind. In India, we teach how to conquer the body so that one can rely to a greater degree on the mind. Those who constantly look to physical means for health and healing will be dependent on them always. But mental power is superior. One should learn gradually to make greater use of the mind. By doing so, you will realize that the mind is a superb instrument. Whatever you command, it will do. This I have seen in my own life. One day when I was giving a lecture in Milwaukee, it was terribly hot. My face was streaming perspiration, but I couldn't find my handkerchief. For a moment, I didn't know what to do. Then I put my consciousness at the Christ center and inwardly said, Lord, my body is cool. At once all perspiration disappeared and my body felt cool as could be. So it is good to try to depend more on mind. However, you cannot deny the body entirely. If you truly did so, you wouldn't think or eat or move. Some are interested in the power of mind over body principally to demonstrate health. But health is not the purpose of life. Communion with God is the purpose of life. You may feel well for a while, but a time comes when nothing avails. Then who will help you? God. Fasting is one of the great ways of approaching God. It releases the life force from enslavement to food, showing you that it is God who really sustains the life in your body. But the temptation of Satan is that as soon as the mind thinks food, you want to eat. 
Once, as a little boy in India, I had a cold and I wanted to eat some tamarind, which is considered very bad for colds. My sister strongly disapproved, but because of my insistence, she grudgingly brought me some of the fruit. I took one piece, chewed it, and spit it out. Without my swallowing the tamarind, the desire for its taste was satisfied. Since man all too often acquires the habit of greed, it is unfortunate for him that God didn't create the body in such a way that he could enjoy this sense of taste and let damaging excess or unhealthful food bypass the organs of digestion and assimilation. Self control, the sanest way to health and happiness. But in truth, the only way to health and happiness, and the sanest way, is self control. To be master of yourself, so that you are not overpowered by your senses, is one of the greatest blessings you can have. If you overload a wiring system with too much electricity, it burns out. And every time you load your digestive system with too much food, the life force burns out. When you refrain from overreading, and when you fast, the life force takes rest and becomes recharged. If your auto is not working properly, you send it to a garage. It runs better for a while, and then something else goes wrong and you send it back for further repairs. The same must be done for the body. The physical effects of fasting are remarkable. A fast of three days on orange juice will repair the body temporarily, but a long fast will completely overhaul it. Your body will feel as strong as steel. But if you want a permanent overhaul, then you must also watch at all times what and how much food you take into your body. Know the right way to fast. In fasting, you must know what to do. That is why proper supervision is necessary for a fast longer than three days. I don't advise anyone to make his first fast a long one, for he will become weak. A one day fast on fruit each week or a three day fast on orange juice each month are good ways to accustom oneself to fasting. The faster must be mentally prepared for those who will immediately begin to sympathize and tell him that he will become sick and die if he doesn't eat. It is true that on a longer fast you may feel weak during the first few days because the life force has been accustomed to dependence on food. But gradually, as the days pass, you no longer feel any weakness. Your life force and spirit become detached from food. You see that the body is sustained by life force alone. I know the secret by which one can fast and still not lose weight. The life force, when under one's conscious control, may be utilized to take off flesh or to keep the body at normal weight. Either way, it is effective. When this principle is applied, the normal temperature of the body does not go down, no matter how long one fasts. Drawing energy from the medulla, the mouth of God, the life force begins to rely more and more on its innate regenerative power instead of depending on outside sources. Human beings in a perfect state of suspended animation can be buried for 5,000 years or unto eternity and remain alive. Life is eternal. It depends not on breath, nor on food, water, or sunshine. Remember always that you are the imperishable spirit. This is the way to live. Our consciousness survives after death, but the ordinary man loses that feeling of continuity and so thinks he is dead. Every one of us is going to die someday, so there is no use in being afraid of death. You don't feel miserable at the prospect of losing consciousness of your body in sleep. You accept sleep as a state of freedom to look forward to. So is death. It is a state of rest, a pension from this life. There is nothing to fear. When death comes, laugh at it. Death is only an experience through which you are meant to learn a great lesson. You cannot die. Why wait for death when you can realize this now? The first lesson you have to learn is that life is not dependent on food. By fasting you can prove it to yourself. Function well under all circumstances. Everyone should develop his mental power so that he is able to function well under all circumstances, sleep or no sleep, food or no food, vacation or no vacation. Regularity is admirable and necessary. We must acquire the habit of regularity in order to obey the laws of God. But to be unable to deviate from that habit without ill effect is wrong. 
All the fundamental habits of a child are formed between the ages of three and seven. Good environment will help to guide his development, but to change if desirable the salient tendencies of a child, special training is required. In my school in Ranchi, India, I gave the boys rigid training of the body. They fasted often and slept on a blanket on the floor, never using pillows. Sometimes they meditated for hours. To help children by rigid discipline to be free from the tyranny of the body is to confer on them a lifelong blessing. One of the schoolboys sat for twelve hours in meditation without winking his eyes. If you had such poise, how much happier you would be! How much more peace you would have! The greatest training lies in scientific, balanced discipline of the body, mind, and spirit. And in that lies the heart of fasting. The metaphysical science behind fasting. There is a great metaphysical science behind fasting. Jesus reminded us of this truth when he said, Man shall not live by bread alone. Two things keep you bound to earth, breath and bread. In sleep, however, you are peacefully unaware of any need for either breath or food. Your spirit is detached from body consciousness. Fasting uplifts the mind in the same way. Through fasting, let your mind depend on its own power. When that power manifests, the life force in the body becomes increasingly reinforced with the eternal energy continually flowing into the brain and spine from the cosmic energy around the body, entering through the medulla. Becoming detached from dependence on outer physical sources of bodily sustenance, the life force sees that it is being supported from within and wonders how this is so. The mind then says, the solids on which the body used to depend are nothing more than gross condensations of energy. You are pure energy, and you are pure consciousness. Then whatever command the mind impinges on the consciousness of the life force, it will manifest accordingly. Anything can be done by mind power. So you see how unjust it is to the mind and to the all-powerful life force within you to say you can't live without food. Make your life and body impervious to suffering. Conquer yourself. By long fasting you realize that everything is mind. Every force and object in this universe is a product of the divine mind, in the same way that all the things you perceive in a dream are creations of your own mind. On the conscious plane also, if your mind creates the thought that the body will be weak from fasting, it will be weak, or if you have been fasting, and momentarily think it is making you weak, the body will actually feel weak. But if you make up your mind that the body is strong, it will not feel any weakness, rather it will feel great power. Most people do not know this because they have never tried it. The mind will not show its miracles unless you make it work. And it will not work so long as you continue to depend more and more on material things. That is why its marvels remain hidden from ordinary vision. But when, through fasting, you learn how to depend on mind, it will work in everything, whether conquering disease or creating prosperity or realizing the supreme goal of life, finding God. The self-governed yogi, he whose mind is fully under control, thus engaging his soul in ceaseless meditative union with spirit, attains the peace of my being, the final nirvana deliverance. Chapter Self-Realization criterion of religion. The temple God loves most is the temple of his devotee's inner silence and peace. Whenever you enter this beautiful temple here, leave restlessness and worries behind. If you do not let go of them, God will not be able to come to you. First establish in yourself a temple of beauty and peace. There you will find him on the altar of your soul. Sometimes one feels discouraged, thinking it is too late to find God. It is never too late. The Bhagavad Gita teaches that if one realizes that this world is false and only spirit is real, though it be in the last moment before death, he will enter a better world after his earth exit. Sooner or later each one of us will be taken away from this earth. Find out now what life is all about. The great purpose of your experiences here is to stimulate you to search out their meaning. Don't give importance to this procession of humanity. As time marches on, you must eventually realize that you are a part of the Great One. Make God-realization your goal. 
Mahavadar Babaji said that even a little bit of this dharma, righteous action seeking to know God, will save you from dire fears. The prospect of death or a failure or other grievous troubles awakens in man a great dread. When you are helpless to help yourself, when your family cannot do anything for you, when no one else can give you aid, what then is the state of your mind? Why allow yourself to be put in such a position? Find God and anchor yourself in Him. Before anyone else was with you, who was with you? God. And when you leave this earth, who will be with you? Only God. But you won't be able to know Him then unless you make friends with Him now. If you deeply seek God, you will find Him. Everything in creation is a temptation to lure you from God. But He is more tempting than any earthly temptation. If you attain even a glimpse of Him, you will realize this. And you can find Him by inner prayer and meditation and by strong determination. Your resolutions with God must be firm. He will not come so long as your mind is roaming elsewhere. He wants to come to you but you don't let Him. You would rather seek a little sense pleasure or spend your time on books or cocktail parties. So God says, All right, my child, play on. If God is seeking anything, it is our love. He knocks at every heart and asks us to come unto Him, but most persons don't want to go. Yet when they get into trouble or become sick, they are quick to call for Him. He who makes friends with the Lord while he is prosperous and happy will always find God near when he needs Him. But he who procrastinates in forming that relationship will have to fight his tests alone until, through wisdom and unconditional surrender, he finds the eternal friend. Out of this great mass of humanity only a few are deeply seeking God. Where are they who thought this earth was theirs two hundred years ago? All are gone, and from among them perhaps only a few understood the truth about life and became self-realized devotees of the Lord. Nevertheless, each succeeding generation thinks this life is real. For the little while you are here, you make much of this show. Don't become too involved in it. Find God. He is trying to draw us with His love. He is showing us all the miracles we could want to see, the wonders of growing things and the perfect routine in nature. He is right there behind the flowers. Seek Him out. The scientist didn't make his discoveries by the use of blind prayer. He followed the laws of science. If you apply scientific spiritual laws with sincere devotion, God will be with you automatically. Open your eyes of devotion, for by continuous ardor plus application of spiritual law you will find Him. Spiritual development must balance material advancement. Different nations have specialized in different arts and sciences. India mastered the scientific art of God-realization. I have come to teach you India's spiritual science. Unless a balance is created by developing spiritual realization along with advancement of the physical sciences, individuals and nations will be lost in misery and destruction. If today's world leaders were illumined by self-realization and worked together, they could within a few years banish war and poverty from the earth. Only spiritual consciousness, realization of God's presence in oneself and in every other living being, can save the world. I see no chance for peace without it. Begin with yourself. There is no time to waste. It is your duty to do your part to bring God's kingdom on earth. Many persons hesitate to seek God, imagining that life will then have to be gloomy. Not so. The unalloyed happiness I find in communing with the Lord no words can describe. Night and day I am in a state of joy. That joy is God. To know Him is to perform the funeral rites for all your sorrows. He does not require you to be stoic and morose. This is not the right concept of God, nor the way to please Him. Without being happy you will not even be able to find Him. The more peaceful you are, the more you will be able to feel His presence. The happier you are, the greater will be your attunement with Him. Those who know Him are always happy because God is joy itself. People try to find happiness in drink, sex, and money, but the pages of history are filled with tales of their disillusionment. The time I have spent in meditation has made my life unimaginably fruitful. A thousand bottles of wine could not produce the joy it has given me. 
and that joy is the conscious guidance of God's wisdom. When you are attuned with Him in this way, even though you unwittingly do wrong it will be righted by the Lord's omniscient direction. If you make a poor judgment, it will be corrected by Him. Wait no longer. Whoever hears this message, know that I am speaking truth. It is His voice, His power, His authority. If I were to display all the powers that God has given to me, throngs would come. But I do not seek that kind of following. Not powers, but the love of God must attract you, for only then will you change and make an effort to know Him. That is my aim. I could not preach about God in this way if I did not know Him. In the same way you can know Him. That is why I stress self-realization, which means you can know within your own consciousness that what I am saying is true. You don't have to believe, you can know. If I had a thousand mouths, I would speak through them all to convince you. My only wish is to give you a glimpse of God. You don't realize how much you miss God, because you have never known Him. Once you do contact Him, no power on earth will be able to turn you away from Him. My only wish is to give you a glimpse of God, because having Him, no other gain is greater. Satan tempted Jesus with dominion over the whole world, but he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus had that something which is infinitely greater. Knowing God is more satisfying than the fulfillment of any earthly desire. Every lesser wish of your heart will be taken care of when you have him who is your greatest treasure. This is my own true testimony. He fulfilled my every desire. I do not seek things now, they seek me. When God gives himself to you, he will fulfill your slightest wish. It is not necessary to ask. That is the state you want. But first you have to prove that you desire the Lord himself more than his gifts. Out of the abundance God has given me I have kept nothing for myself. I am always free for nothing belongs to me. I am working only for him and for all of you. Because of this in a time the thought of some need crosses my mind, God fulfills it. I have to take care what I mentally tell the Lord for it is sure to materialize. This state of satisfaction no worldly prosperity can give. God is seeking you, you must seek Him. Follow this self-realization way. It will bring you to Him more quickly than any other path. I have tried all methods, and I entered this path on the basis of reason, not emotion. Through the demonstration of their own realization, the great masters of self-realization fellowship have shown that by following their way you can find the Lord, you can be among the greatest of the spiritually great, just as by learning from a great scientist you can become a great scientist, if you apply yourself. Tarkal does not receive and reflect the sunlight, but the diamond does. Tarkal mentalities, full of doubts and negation and spiritual slothfulness, cannot receive God. But diamond mentalities, sincere and full of faith and perseverance, receive and reflect the wisdom of divine consciousness. It is necessary to understand the meaning of religion. To most persons religion is a matter of family tradition or social benefit or moral habit. They have no conception of the importance of religion. When I asked one man what religion he followed he replied, nothing in particular. I change churches according to convenience. Those who are not seeking God as the paramount necessity of life do not understand the meaning of religion. Why do all people seek money? Because they are conditioned to the thought that money is essential to supply the things they need for their well-being. They don't have to be told this, they simply know it. Why then do most people not understand the necessity of knowing God? Because they lack imagination and discrimination. Very early in life I saw that theological and even scriptural answers to certain questions could never fully satisfy the soul, unless their truth were experienced through realization and God communion. For example, when my mother died and when other loved ones began to be taken away from me, I rebelled inwardly against it, but no one could give me an explanation that satisfied me. I decided I had to go find the answer myself, through my own effort. I am not going to accept this blindly, I vowed. I am going to find the answer from him who is the maker of this universe. I sought directly from God the understanding of life's mysteries that I could not find in the teachings in the churches and temples. 
If religion could not satisfy me as to why some persons are born poor and some rich, some blind and some healthy, how could it convince me of the justice of God? The masters of India, by attaining God communion, found the answers to life's riddles through inner realization and showed us how we can do likewise. There are many kinds of religionists in the world, and each religion has its own cross-section of this diversity. There are those whose approach to religion is wholly emotional. When their feelings are played upon too much they become hysterical with religion. But in an extreme display of emotion one loses touch with God. Emotionally excitable types want pep in religion. When you lecture from the intellectual plane, they fall asleep. It is too dull, they say. But playing upon others' emotions is simply juggling with their minds, it is not giving them truth or God. The intellectual religionist delights in hearing about various theological or philosophical concepts, flattering himself that he is on a higher rung of divine understanding than the emotional religionist. But intellectual stimulation also is only another kind of drug, a different form of mental juggling that does not give the seeker what he really needs any more than does over stirring of the emotions. Religionists who cling blindly to dogma will often parrot what they do not really understand or have not realized. When you ask them questions, they quote scriptures and tenets like spiritual victrolas. It is useless to reason with them because they are so sure they know it all. True religion satisfies the demands of your soul. Dogmatic religionists are convinced that if you do not believe in a certain way you are doomed. Science does not teach you in that way. It proves its points. And true religion satisfies the demands of your soul, not by words but by proof. I wanted never to be so dogmatic that I would stop using my reason and common sense. When I met my guru, Sri Yukteswar, he said, Many teachers will tell you to believe. Then they put out your eyes of reason and instruct you to follow only their logic. But I want you to keep your eyes of reason open. In addition, I will open in you another eye, the eye of wisdom. Sri Yukteswarji gave me a teaching whose truth I could realize for myself. That is why I followed this path. No one can shake me from it. The liberalist is the other extreme of the dogmatist. He follows everything. In the belief that he is being broad-minded, he says, All spiritual paths are good. Therefore, I will not bind myself to any one of them. While respecting all, it is better to adhere to one path than to be a religious butterfly, flitting everywhere. Avoid both false liberality and blind dogmatism. Cling dogmatically only to wisdom, and you will find God. Every effort one makes for God will be noticed by Him. However, if one doesn't follow a proven scientific way to God, his progress is comparable to riding in an old bullock cart. Sincere seekers will receive some realization, no matter what path they follow, but with only blind belief in mechanical prayers it could take them incarnations to reach the Lord. Whatever religion you choose, give it a good test. Seek until you find the path most suited to the spiritual inclination of your heart and mind, and then be steadfast. Whatever you take up, give it a good test. In the same way, give the self-realization teachings a chance. Duelers can tell a good gem from a fake, and the genuine spiritual teacher can differentiate between sincere and idle seekers. There are some who take the self-realization fellowship lessons but do not study or practice them. Ask them what the teaching is about, and they reply vaguely, Oh, it is grand. If you ask what they have learned, they go on about what a good teaching it is, but I haven't practiced it. Those who practice know the blessings of this path. Seekers should be taught to find God first. To concentrate on money or health as primary objectives in following a religion is to become sidetracked. True, it is through God that one receives everything else, but he who seeks other things first will feel the bonds of limitations. A qualified spiritual teacher knows and loves the Lord. His supreme interest is in God. One teacher tried to persuade me to accept his spiritual guidance with a promise that I would have a great many followers. His offer did not attract me because I wanted God alone. Great teachers will always seek to interest you in knowing the Lord.
they will not take you up a blind alley. Without God communion, the lifeblood of religion is missing. Church is not the place for dances, movies, and frequent social gatherings. These divert people from God. One can find sufficient worldly entertainment in town. Go to church for one reason, communion with God. Divine communion is the criterion of religion. That is what my guru taught me, and that is why I have followed him unconditionally and wholeheartedly. As a result of his teaching I am enjoying that sacred communion with the Lord every moment of my existence. That is what religion must be. If I tell you of a wonderful fruit I have found and describe it to you in detail every day for a year without ever giving you a taste of it, you will be satisfied. Hearing about truth cannot relieve the soul's hunger. If you are content to hear truth without making any effort to know God, it has falsely satisfied you. You must hunger so deeply for God that you will seek Him out in earnest. The purpose of religious lectures and sermons is to awaken in you that irresistible soul longing for Him. Realizing God requires self-disciplinary effort. Once in a while, I meet someone in whom I see a little bit of real devotion for the Lord. But God realization is so much greater than that. The God-knowing devotee sometimes sees the whole world filled with His light, a wonderful experience. But it can't come to you in one minute. Realizing God requires long perseverance in the practice of those methods that lead to self-realization. The desire for happiness is the strongest desire of all. True and lasting happiness is found in God. When you discover Him, a great joy will come over you, a joy you will find nowhere else. Triyuktiswarji said to me, When your joy in meditation and communion becomes greater than any other joy, you have found God. If the whole world were given to you, you would not know what to do with it, you would only feel burdened worrying about everything. Study the lives of princes and men of the world, see how they were vexed. We are like puppets in the hands of destiny, but the man who is one with the light of the world, who has nothing and yet has everything, is a happy man. He who is one with God is not afraid of anything, even annihilation of the body. Jesus said, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The church has become a beggar. Ironically, money is needed in the development of all good works including those performed by the church. The dollar itself has no brains, it can serve both good and evil schemes. To seek money to spread God's work is righteous action. Money thus used is doing good. And the more one sacrifices for God's work, the greater will be his reward. All churches should be hives of God communion. Every church does good, and for that I love them all. They will truly fulfill their high calling when they become places of God communion. They should be like hives, filled with the honey of God realization. Unless this truth becomes more manifest in religion, you will see that the church as such will gradually disappear. Religion will be practiced in secluded spots out of doors, where God can come to those few devoted souls who really want to know Him. This has happened in India. Some of her temples have become not so much places of meditation for divine communion as mere gathering places for pigeons and people. Real seekers in India gather under the trees to meditate on God. More and more this will happen in churches everywhere. The dissatisfaction of real truth seekers with dogmatism and the emptiness of organization without individual self-realization will force a great world change in the concept of religion. Scientific methods needed to follow the first commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. These two commandments sum up the whole purpose of religion. If you sincerely love God, you will do only what is based upon truth. Your love will not allow you to err against Him. Bring in the light and darkness will vanish as though it had never been. Bring in love of God and the darkness of ignorance flies away. The science of yoga explains the truth behind the first commandment and gives definite scientific techniques that enable the devotee to attain the divine communion necessary in order to love God so completely. 
Behind each part of these commandments is a deep metaphysical truth. Love the Lord with all thy heart. It is God who has given you the power to love your family and friends. Why should you not use that power to love him as you love your dearest ones on earth? You should be able to say, My Lord, I love you as the father loves the child, as the lover loves the beloved, as the friend loves the friend, as the master loves the servant. I love you with the strength of all human loves, for thou art my father, my mother, my friend, my master, my beloved. When you truly love God with all your heart, you feel that love for him day and night. As I was leaving home to seek God, I was inwardly torn by the conflict of loyalties. My father had done everything for me, and the whole family was crying over my imminent departure. But the love of God was stronger, and I was able to overcome the limitations of familial love. Many human beings say I love you one day and reject you the next. That is not love. One whose heart is filled with the love of God cannot willfully hurt anyone. When you love God without reservation, He fills your heart with His unconditional love for all. That love no human tongue can describe. And with all thy soul, you cannot fulfill this part of the commandment unless you know your soul. You know it in an unconscious way each night, for in deep sleep you are aware only of existing. You have no consciousness of being either man or woman. You are soul. You can consciously know your soul, your true self, by meditation. And when you know yourself as soul you will have discovered the presence of God within you. The moon's reflection cannot be seen clearly in ruffled water, but when the water's surface is calm a perfect reflection of the moon appears. So with the mind, when it is calm you see clearly reflected the moon face of the soul. As souls we are reflections of God. When by meditation techniques we withdraw restless thoughts from the lake of the mind, we behold our soul, a perfect reflection of spirit, and realize that the soul and God are one. And with all thy strength, this aspect of the commandment is highly scientific. It means withdrawing all your strength, all your energies and consciousness, into their source which is God. Yoga teaches you how to control your life energies and transmute them from body consciousness into God consciousness. And with all thy mind, when you are praying to God, your attention and concentration should be wholly on Him. You should not be thinking about your Sunday dinner or your work or any other worries and desires. The Lord knows your thoughts. Krishna said, Whenever the fickle and restless mind wanders away, for whatever reason, let the yogi withdraw it from those distractions and return it to the sole control of the self. When I pray to God my mind stays riveted on him. If you develop that calm intensity of concentration, you will find that a time comes when no matter what else you are doing, days and nights pass with your mind inwardly absorbed in God. And thy neighbor is thyself. The ordinary man is incapable of loving others in this way. Self-centered in the consciousness of I, me, and mine, he has not yet discovered the omnipresent God who resides in him and in all other beings. To me there is no difference between one person and another. I behold all as soul reflections of the one God. I can't think of anyone as a stranger, for I know that we are all part of the one spirit. When you experience the true meaning of religion, which is to know God, you will realize that he is yourself, and that he exists equally and impartially in all beings. Then you will be able to love others as your own self. Self-realization converts conviction into experience. Truth alone should be the binding force of religion. Truth I have brought to you through self-realization fellowship. This work is spreading because of the wisdom and blessings of the God-realized masters behind it. All over the country I have seen wonderful students who are held to this spiritual path for one reason, self-realization. My only plan to hold people is by their own self-realization. That is the only way I wish to hold them. If there are hundreds in my class is all right. If there are empty seats it is all right. I never wish for anything. I would rather have a few real souls than hundreds without sincerity. The great purpose behind this movement is to give people their own self-realization. When people will realize that it is their duty and privilege to know God, 
then a new era will come on earth. Scriptures, sermons, and lectures eventually cease to satisfy the seeker who truly longs to feel the presence of God, but when he realizes truth, he knows life as it should be. Practice the truth you hear and read about, so that it is not just an idea but a conviction born of experience. If reading books on theology satisfies your desire for God, you have not grasped the purpose of religion. Do not settle for intellectual satisfaction about truth. Convert truth into experience, and you will know God through your own self-realization. Practice truth, meditate, for God communion. What is needed is spiritual experience. Only divine communion can remove the great boredom that exists when one is not following the spiritual path scientifically. What is necessary in order to have that spiritual experience? The habit of daily meditation. God is realizable. You can know Him now through meditation. Then without any question, without any doubt, without a speck of mental reservation you can say, I am with God. Why not? He is your own. Time has come for man to know truth for himself. That which I am giving to you is self-realizable. To some the self-realization fellowship lessons may seem just another course of philosophical study to be added to one's library, but those who practice them know their value. With every new spiritual instruction I received from Sri Yukta Swarji he said, You must know this truth. And I did. In the beginning of my spiritual search in India I had steadfastly refused to join any society because I didn't find in them demonstrable truth. But when I found my guru in this path, and saw through my own experience that it worked, I gave my life to this cause. Chapter, The Desire That Satisfies All Desires The glory of God is great. He is real and He can be found in this life. In men's hearts there are many prayers, for money, fame, health, prayers for all manner of things. But the prayer that should be first in every heart is the prayer for God's presence. Silently and surely, as you walk on the path of life, you must come to the realization that God is the only object, the only goal that will satisfy you. For in God lies the answer to every desire of the heart. When you have found it impossible to fulfill some urgent wish by your own effort, you turn to God in prayer. Thus every prayer that you utter represents a desire. But when you find God, all desires vanish, and there is no need for prayer. I don't pray. That may seem a strange thing to say, but when the object of your prayer is with you all the time, you no longer have need to pray. In fulfillment of the wish or prayer for Him lies joy eternal. Material desires come through certain mistaken conceptions about the purpose of life. This earth is not our home. The scriptures have told us we are children of God made in His image, and that it is the will of the divine that we return to our source. What man does not realize is that unless and until he goes back to the source, back to God, he will have to struggle to fulfill endless desires. Reflect on that. Man cannot help having desires, and it is not a sin to have them. But most human longings hamper fulfillment of the supreme desire to return to God, hence they are detrimental to man's happiness. Until he wants and has God, man will continue to long for whatever else he believes will make him happy. But to him who is God, instant fulfillment of all desires comes automatically. There are two classes of desires, those that help us to find God, and those that obstruct our finding him. For example, if someone hits you, you want to retaliate, but if you overcome that desire by using the superior power of love, you have applied the action that will help you to find God. All desires should be satisfied in the divine way. When you try to satisfy them in the worldly way, you only multiply your difficulties. If you learn to give every desire to God, He will see to it that your good desires are fulfilled and the harmful ones are overcome. There is no protection greater than your conscience and the divine quality of your good desires. If you but looked at your soul the all-perfect reflection of God within you, you would find all your desires satisfied. In that divine consciousness, having which no other gain is greater, you would be unmoved even if the whole world were given to you, 
neither would praise elate you, nor blame hurt. You would feel only the great joy of God within. God's children should not beg. Always seek the guidance of the divine in trying to fulfill your legitimate desires, because that is the supreme way to receive the answers to all your prayers. But one thing you must remember, cut out begging from your prayer. Change your old attitude of supplication. You should pray to God intimately as his child which you are. God does not object when you pray from your ego as a stranger and a beggar, but you will find that your efforts are limited by that consciousness. God does not want you to give up your own will power, which is your divine birthright as his child. Naturally, one should distinguish between reasonable and unreasonable prayers or desires. And bear in mind that, once you have made this discrimination, whatever good or bad desires you hold on to are bound to be fulfilled. If you cling to any evil desires, they will be granted, and you will find out what harm and unhappiness they cause. As time goes on, you will realize that even though your wish was fulfilled, your heart is still not satisfied, you will feel something within you rebelling. For example, suppose you have weak digestion, yet you want to eat fried foods. Not surprisingly, you suffer every time you do. Although you feel delight while fulfilling that desire, the aftereffect is pain. Thus you are made aware that you have done wrong. It is wiser to use discrimination to separate your evil desires from your good ones, and having done so, to avoid the fulfillment of those wrong desires. Learn to be guided by your conscience, the divine discriminative power within you. The danger of unfulfilled desires. Unfulfilled desires remain in the heart. And what is the harm in harboring them? It is this, Every desire consists of specific forces, either good or evil, or a mixture of both. And when you die, though your body is gone, those forces do not die. As mental tabloids, they follow your soul wherever it goes, and when you are reborn, these tabloids manifest as behavioral tendencies. Thus, a person who has died an alcoholic brings with him the tendency to alcoholism when he is reborn and it remains with him until he overcomes desire for alcohol. The behavior of even the smallest child reveals certain characteristics of past lives. Some children have terrible temper tantrums, others are moody. God did not make them that way. Unfulfilled desires of past lives fashion those psychological tendencies, and because of them, the soul, even though made in the image of God, appears as something different. If the image of God within you is distorted in this life by anger or fear, and you do not conquer such uncharacteristic qualities now, you will be reborn with them, and you will have the burden of these misery-creating tendencies until you overcome them in some future incarnation. It is better, therefore, to work out or overcome all your desires now. They would be finished immediately and for all time in the supreme joy of God's presence, but until you know him, your unconquered desires will remain to hound you. There are two ways of finishing your desires, by realizing through reason and discrimination or wisdom that only God can give permanent unalloyed happiness, and by fulfillment. In many cases desires lie hidden within the subconscious. You think they are finished, but they are not. Life is indeed a great mystery, but the mystery clears away when you dissect life with the scalpel of reason. If every day you sit quietly for a little while and analyze yourself, you will discover that you have many unsatisfied desires. They are like dangerous germs that you carry through life, and wherever you go, in this life or the next, they will go with you. The best course is to do away with all dangerous desires in this life by discrimination, and to concentrate on fulfilling your good desires. If you feel drawn to commit suicide or to do something evil, get rid of such desires now. Convince yourself, by reason and by good actions, that you are a child of God, made in His image and rise above your moods and bodily habits. Be more detached. In this way you will conquer. If you suffer from a chronic ailment, try mentally to separate yourself from the consciousness of the body. By discrimination you can conquer the senses. Discrimination is the fire that burns up desire. It is a general practice to store in the attic all of one's unwanted, unnecessary junk, 
and once in a while to have a good house cleaning. Similarly, hidden away in the attic of your subconscious mind are many potentially harmful desires that one day may give you great trouble. It is important, therefore, to analyze yourself. Perhaps you are a hateful or moody or angry type of person. If so, these stored traits are the result of your own past behavior. In order to clean out your mental attic of such unwanted furnishings, you must vigorously employ constructive, positive, loving action. Love thine enemies. Suppose that even though an old enemy dies, you continue to feel hatred toward him. In time that bitterness will produce ill effects in your own body and mind. It is better to concentrate on trying to behold God in your enemy, for by doing so you release yourself from evil vengeful desires that destroy your peace of mind. By heaping hatred upon hatred or giving hate in return for hate, you not only increase your enemy's hostility toward you, you poison your system, physically as well as emotionally, with your own venom. Conscience will tell you what you are. Sometimes one feels a desire to take it easy. This is not wrong. To get away from everything now and then gives a person a chance to think what life is all about. Most people are floating along on the current of custom and fashion. They have never actually lived their own life. They have lived the life of the world, and where has it gotten them? So it is wise now and then to remove yourself from everyday considerations, to calm your mind and try to understand what kind of person you are and what kind of person you want to be. And remember, the truest testimony you can find is the testimony of your own conscience, the discriminative voice of the soul. Whatever your conscience says, that is what you are. Think of the power of the conscience of Jesus. His accusers spat upon him and crucified him and yet he said, Father, forgive them. That kind of discrimination is the only power that will bring light on your path. Whenever there is an overwhelming desire in your heart to pray for a certain thing, use your discrimination. Ask yourself, is it a good desire or a bad desire for which I seek fulfillment? Man's lost treasure is God. There are many influences that nourish desire in you. When you see a new model car, you want one. When you see a new model house, you want one. Some new style of apparel comes out and immediately you yearn to wear that fashion. Whence do these desires come? I used to sit for hours pondering this. Can you classify all your desires? I sorted mine and kept only the good ones, and when I had the contact of God, I found all those good desires at once fulfilled. Today you wish for one thing and tomorrow you hanker after something else. Your mind, having descended from Almighty God, is not satisfied with the offerings of this world, and it will never be satisfied because you have lost your soul's richest treasure, which alone can satisfy all your desires, and that is God. It is true there are some good and necessary desires, and you should strive to fulfill them. But never forget while pursuing your little desires to satisfy first your supreme desire for God. Belief in the necessity of fulfilling lesser desires and duties first is man's greatest delusion. I well remember that during my training as a young disciple of my guru Swami Sri Yutiswarji, I kept promising myself daily, I will meditate longer tomorrow. A whole year slipped by before I realized that I was still putting it off. At once I made a resolution that first thing in the morning I would clean my body and then meditate long. But even then, as soon as I stirred about I became caught up in my daily duties and activities. Thereupon, I resolved to have my meditation first. Thus I learned a great lesson. First comes my duty to God, and then I take care of all lesser duties. Why not? God says, why should I open the doors of eternity to you, when you put other duties before me. If you are not soaring to the heights of spirit of what account are you? You have nothing to offer God or man. So seek him first. To give more importance to your earthly duties is false reasoning, because at any moment the angel Gabriel may call you, at any moment you may be taken away from here. Why then give so much importance to life? For life is very peculiar. You think you are quite secure. Suddenly a loved one dies, or you lose your health, and all security vanishes. 
how I loved my mother and thought she would be with me always and suddenly I found she was gone. Don't be afraid of death but be prepared for it. Life is not what it seems to be. Don't trust it for it is very tricky and full of disappointments. Perfection was not meant to be found here. I am not giving you a false picture of life. This is not the kingdom of God. It is God's laboratory, where he is testing souls to see if they will overcome evil desires by good ones and make him their supreme desire so they can return home to his kingdom. Take God, not life, seriously. Life is full of tragedy and comedy, a kaleidoscope of infinite variety. No two things are the same. Everyone's life is individual. Each person has a different kind of face, a different kind of mind and desires. We would become bored if we had exactly the same experiences every day. We would soon tire of life. Were heaven itself the same every day we wouldn't want it. We enjoy variety. The stereotyped conception of heaven is all wrong. If it were boring, all the saints would pray to come back to earth for a little change. Heaven is something infinitely different, ever pleasantly new, whereas earth is often unpleasantly new. Yet no matter how trying life is, most people become accustomed to it and assume there is no other way to live. Not being able to compare this life with the spiritual life, they do not realize how painful and boring earthly living is. Actually life is not real, it is only an entertainment. And just as old movies are shown over and over, so basically the same old incidents occur and recur in life. And although life will go on eternally, the same themes depicted in past films will be portrayed again and again. It is true that history repeats itself. We are all museum pieces. Whatever comes in life just take it joyfully and personally as you would a motion picture. Life is entertaining when we do not take it too seriously. A good laugh is an excellent remedy for human ills. One of the best characteristics of the American people is their ability to laugh. To be able to laugh at life is marvelous. This my master Swami Sri Yukteswar taught me. In the beginning of my training in his hermitage, I went about with a solemn face, never smiling. One day master pointedly remarked, What is this? Are you attending a funeral ceremony? Don't you know that finding God is the funeral of all sorrows? Then why so glum? Don't take this life too seriously. He taught me that one must be mentally above every crucifixion of earthly experience in order to find complete happiness in God. Krishna taught, even minded during happiness and sorrow, profit and loss, triumph and failure, so encounter the battle of life. Thus thou wilt not acquire sin. To remain even minded, no matter what comes, is one of the best ways to conquer delusive desires. This I learned from the example of my great master, even to the last, changeless. Christ also demonstrated that spirit. Even though Jesus was tortured, God's love was not taken away. He did not lose his divine consciousness. God's protection of our joy and peace is the greatest fortress possible. Throughout all trials and sufferings, remember the good things that God has given you. Your soul is a divine temple of God. The darkness of mortal ignorance and limitations must be driven out of that temple. It is wonderful to be in the consciousness of the soul, fortified, strong. Be afraid of nothing. Hating none, giving love to all, feeling the love of God, seeing His presence in everyone, and having but one desire for his constant presence in the temple of your consciousness. That is the way to live in this world. Those who have other desires will not know true satisfaction. Environment shapes our desires. Desires are formed according to one's environment. They are created by, and therefore limited by, your sense perceptions. Attending a country fair satisfies a desire for a little excitement. But after you have been to a world fair and viewed all the different exhibits, a small fair no longer holds any attraction. This illustrates the importance of having communion with God now, for the comparison with inferior earthly joys, then your desires will be of a much higher and more advanced nature. The desire to be one with God 
is the greatest of all. When you are through with any lesser desire, you soon pick up another, but when you have God, all other desires are satisfied completely. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Why not fulfill first this highest desire? For when he answers your prayer to know him, all other desires will be instantly fulfilled throughout eternity. Perhaps you feel that you have no desires. Well, I have often noticed what happens when people go shopping. They may have no particular desire to buy, but suddenly something catches their eye and they think I must have it. Day and night that object is on their mind, and finally they buy it, even if they have to borrow the money. Then after having it for a while, their happiness and it grows stale, and they want something else. We meet people who say, if only I could have a thousand dollars or a car or a swimming pool, and when that wish is satisfied, they yearn for something different. Human desires are not perfect, hence their fulfillment does not lead to perfect happiness. The world environment will try to prevent you from remembering that the only worthwhile desire is to have God. But every day you should remind yourself of this. And when you have made up your mind not to smoke, or eat unwisely, or lie, or cheat, be firm in these good desires, don't weaken. Wrong environment saps your will and invites wrong desires. Live with thieves and you think that is the only life. But live with divine persons and after having divine communion, no other desires can tempt you. All become stale. Therefore even a few moments of deep meditation, or the company of a saint, will be a raft of inspiration to carry you across this ocean of delusion to the shores of God. Be safe in the castle of God's presence. Joy lies in continually thinking of God. The longing for Him should be constant. A time comes when your mind never wanders away, when not even the greatest affliction of body, mind, and soul can take your consciousness from the living presence of God. Is that not wonderful? To live and think and feel God all the time? To remain in the castle of His presence, whence death nor aught else can take you away? On me fix thy mind, be thou my devotee, with ceaseless worship bow reverently before me. Having thus united thyself to me as thy highest goal, thou shalt be mine own. When you are proof against all desires, you are enjoying the presence eternal. This life is strange. Everything is subject to change. That is why one should not anchor his happiness on this life. Our time will pass on, what you are seeing now will be gone one day. Change is good if you don't let it hurt you. When it does hurt, the rebellion you feel is meant to show you that you should not have any desires. When you are anchored in that great spirit you are enjoying everything but without attachment. Therefore it is worthwhile to make the effort to know him. Otherwise life can horribly disillusion you. When I went back to India in 1935, I was looking forward to visiting some of the places I had enjoyed as a child, but upon my arrival I saw everything had changed. The stage was differently set. The greatest disillusionment came to me when I visited my old home in Ikapur, where I used to play and watch the birds. I was shocked. Only one remembered tree was left. That is the way life is, one by one, things familiar and dear vanish from our sight. I would have given anything then to have seen our home as it was in my childhood. Nevertheless I did see it later materialized in a vision. We swam in the pond, and I went upstairs in the house and lay on the bed and ate mangoes as I had done so many years before. Scrutinize your desires carefully now. Sort them and keep only good ones and let not even those good desires choke off the one important desire for God. That must not be stifled. You are in great delusion when you ask God for fulfillment of your earthly desires and never ask Him to make a gift of Himself to you. What would you think of a son who says, Mother, write a check for me, whenever he wants anything, but otherwise gives no thought to her? Don't be like that, never be ungrateful. When this book of life shall be closed, there will remain with you only the realization gained from those desires you have fulfilled in connection with God. So rid from whispers and then meditate before you go to bed each night. When you wake up, think of God. Pray not only before taking food, but when you are eating and afterward. 
When you are working, weave the thought of God around that activity. When you are in touch with God, you will see all your desires mysteriously fulfilled. You must seek Him first. He has given you everything, but only if you forsake all His gifts preferring Him, will He surrender Himself. When you show God that you are willing to sacrifice everything to know Him, He will come to you. Carry a portable heaven within. The hardest obstacle to overcome is yourself. When you sit to meditate at night, your nervousness and restlessness are still with you. Learn to control your mind and body. Be king of yourself. Carry within you a portable heaven, and in life or in death, in heaven or in Hades, that inner heaven will be with you. Pray deeply, sincerely, O oh God, I yearn to know you. You must answer me. And next morning pray again, Lord, you must come to me. And pray again the next night in the same way, in the language of your heart. If you keep on, he must respond. But when you pray half-heartedly, while thinking in the back of your mind about something else, he knows he is not first with you, and he does not respond. Have God first. Have God now. Don't wait because delusion is very strong. Before you know it, the time will have come for you to quit this world. Whenever you have a moment, sit down and meditate. No matter how many times your prayers have not been answered, don't worry, keep on praying. Pray with sincerity. Believe that your prayer is answered. In my life I have seen the most wonderful demonstrations of God's response to prayer. I urge you to pray not for little things, but for His presence. Only that prayer is worthwhile. If you are willing to sacrifice an hour or two of sleep for meditation every night, you will enter the kingdom of God. Don't watch the time. With deep sincerity pray, Lord, I want you alone. Bad habits and restlessness will try to shake you from your effort, but keep your mind on God, and you will find His presence with you. Desires for worldly joys create the magnetic attraction that draws man back to earth life after life. Reincarnation is no longer necessary for those who have fulfilled their desires in God. Whenever they want to fulfill any wish, they simply think of that object, and it is materialized before them. My mother appeared before me in flesh and blood, just as I see you here. How kind is God, how marvelous is God, that he materializes the objects of our desires to show us his love and gratefulness when we have given him first place in our hearts. To be able to demonstrate health or wealth or power or friends with God's help is fine, but if you can coax God himself to respond to your prayers, you are a man of destiny. So don't rest until you demonstrate God in your life. He will give you everything you ever wished for, and he will test you. The tests in the spiritual life are greater than in any other. But you who pass his test shall say, Lord, my greatest prayer has been answered. What else could my heart want or need but you? Chapter, In God is all happiness. God in his infinite mercy gives to us his joy, his inspiration, true life, true wisdom, true happiness, and true understanding through all the various experiences of our lives. But the glory of God is revealed only in the quietness of the soul, in the intensity of the inner effort of the mind to commune with him. It is there that we find truth. Outside, delusion is very strong. Very few people can get away from the influences of outer environment. The world goes on with its infinite complexities and diverse experiences. Each life is new and each life has to be lived differently. Yet underlying all life is the silent voice of God, ever calling to us through flowers, through scriptures and through our conscience, through all things that are beautiful and that make life worth living. The more you concentrate on the outside, the less you will know of the inner glory of the everlasting joy of spirit. The more you concentrate within, the less you will have of difficulties without. But most people do not understand this truth because of the influence of worldly company and environment and bad habits. Environment keeps you more or less engrossed, it never allows you to think of deeper realities. Even in this beautiful place in Encinitas I have seen that some students came without the pure intention of seeking spiritual development. If you choose to see God you can see Him everywhere. Habits are predatory, they destroy. You should learn to be happy with what you have. 
but wish for anything more than what is already coming to you. The Father knows what you need. The best way to be unendingly happy is to be conscious of the Father. Your paramount desire should be God-realization. The determination to be with Him should be supreme in your consciousness. I have given everything to God. There is nothing else that I can give any more. And I have already realized that the only purpose of life is to know God. Many people may doubt that finding God is the purpose of life, but everyone can accept the idea that the purpose of life is to find happiness. I say that God is happiness. He is bliss. He is love. He is joy that will never go away from your soul. So why shouldn't you try to acquire that happiness? No one else can give it to you. You must continuously cultivate it yourself. The forces of nature are constantly trying to give you the pleasures of the world, but such transitory satisfactions only end in sorrow and bitterness. Even the most favored person, one who appears to have everything, may not be happy. And you will never be satisfied for long with earthly things. They give only a false peace and contentment. The whole world has been plunged into chaos through greedy desires. Greed is creating war. Nothing else is causing it. He who conquers himself is the greatest victor in this battle of life. Money, fame, desires, everything that goes against this ideal is a detriment to our peace and happiness. If people would only learn to concentrate on the real values of life, they would find true happiness, but they are carried away by earthly desires. I find that no temptation can make me deviate from the path I have chosen. I could enthrall thousands with the powers God has given me, but that course would be a detriment to me, and in any case I do not seek to enthrall thousands. I love to see true devotees, those who are anchored in God. Souls who love God will come here, and those whose enthusiasm will last to the end of life will find Him. God must come to those who truly want Him. It is impossible to deceive the Lord because He is sitting right behind your thoughts and knows what you are thinking and desiring. If in your heart you truly renounce the world and seek inner communion with Him, He will come to you. He must know that you want Him and nothing else. Once that desire for Him is established in your heart, He must come. The only thing to live for is the contact of the Divine, the communion with God. That is why Jesus said, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Believe the words of Jesus who live truth. Has there ever been a greater example of godliness for us than when He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do? Everybody wants to have more money than the next person, and when he has it he is not satisfied, because he finds there is still someone else who has more than he. People live in a bedlam of misery, created by their own desires. Learn to be satisfied with what you have. The average person in America has much more than the average person in Europe or India, or in any other land. But still he is not happy. He is burning with anxieties and worries. God's way is the easiest way. It is best to go to the Father first and ask Him what is best for you. When you know that He is, and that He awaits you, why should you waste your time on lesser things? Have you ever tried sincerely to see if the Father talks to you or not? The Lord is speaking to all human beings. What more can He do to attract your attention? I don't want people to think that they can attain realization simply by listening to others or by reading books. They must practice what they read and hear. It is better to go to church than to stay at home and listen to idle chatter, but even in church you must feel Him within, and you must know the technique by which you can realize His presence. Emotionalism and intellectualism cannot give realization. When you resign yourself completely to God, when you are never tempted to pray for selfish ends, and when you are sure that God is your spirit, that He is your soul and everything else, then you are free. Think. A few decades hence, this existence of ours will have become a dream, and my sitting here and talking with you will have become part of that dream. All the great masters of the past have become dreams in the consciousness of mankind. But those great ones have attained. They are always conscious of what is going on. What a dream this life is. 
and yet when you look at your body now and see how it throbs with life, you become fully convinced again of the reality of this dream. You think you must have this or that and then you can be happy. But no matter how many of your desires are satisfied, you will never find happiness through them. The more you have, the more you want. Learn to live simply. His mind is full with contentment whose desires ever flow inward. That man is like a changeless ocean which is kept brimful with constantly entering waters. He is not a muni who bores holes of desires in his reservoir of peace and lets the waters escape. Seek God in solitude. You need to be guided by those who know God, those who commune with him. Jesus taught us to seek God in solitude. In the solitude of inner silence you learn about the Holy Ghost. The great masters of India also speak of this divine power. The true meaning of the Holy Ghost has first come in this land through self-realization fellowship. Everything in creation is vibration, which is guided by the intelligence of God. That intelligent vibration is the Holy Ghost. Everyone should learn how to contact the Holy Ghost through meditation. Self-realization teaches you how. In the silence of your soul, in the bower of your concentration, the romance with the infinite is endless. But you cannot have God and mammon together. You must give yourself to God wholly. He is the eternal lover, and he is begging for the love of you all. You must learn to use your will and concentration in order to seek God wholeheartedly. Your actions are dictated by your habits. You are always being forced by habits to do things that you don't want to do. You are your own enemy and you don't know it. You don't learn to sit quietly. You don't learn to give time to God. And you are impatient and expect to attain heaven all at once. You cannot get it by reading books or by listening to sermons or by doing charitable works. You can get God only by giving your time to Him in deep meditation. Look to God alone. You must make the effort to please God first. It is impossible to please all. I try never to displease anybody. I do my best and that is all I can do. My first aim is to please God. I use my hands to pray in adoration before Him, my feet to seek Him everywhere, my mind to think of Him as always present. Every throne of thought must be occupied by God. God is peace, God is love, God is kindness. God as understanding, God as compassion, God as wisdom. This is the only thing that I have come to tell you. Not else. Learn the self-realization technique of meditation. Keep good company. Don't look to others but to God alone. And every day speak of this work to others. Every day do good to some people. As long as there is money in my pocket I never cease to give. My bank is God. Last of all, you must know God just as the great ones know him. If you follow the technique, you will find him through your own efforts. One day I was walking outside the hermitage, thinking of my great Kiru, Sri Yukteswarji, and wondering about him. I felt sad that I was enjoying this beautiful ashram and that he could not be here to share it with me. Suddenly he appeared to me in the sky and said, You think you are the only one enjoying this place? I am enjoying it from all space. You must strive to be one with God. Practice meditation every day and learn to love Him deeply and to love your neighbors as yourself. This is the only way to avoid war. There must be spiritual cooperation. Without spirituality there cannot be happiness either national or individual. And happiness must start with the individual. God communion is the only answer to all problems whether they be physical, financial, matrimonial, moral, or spiritual. Happiness comes by feeling that you are one with God, that you are the child of God, a prince child of the king of the universe. You are not a beggar child. You have jailed yourself in the body because of ignorance of your father. You must free yourself from this jail. You must keep your mind riveted to God no matter what comes. Then you will find great peace and joy. Their thoughts fully on me, their beings surrendered to me, enlightening one another, proclaiming me always, my devotees are contented and joyful. Chapter, How to Be More Likable Some persons are born with a likable nature. Everyone is attracted to them. Some are never liked. Others are neither liked nor disliked. 
they are just ignored. Why? Impartial God is not responsible for the uneven distribution of attractive qualities. The differences in each man's character are of his own cultivation. He himself has created those pleasant or unpleasant qualities in this or in past lives. It would be a great injustice if God were responsible for starting off some children with the advantage of likable good qualities and others with a handicap of obnoxious bad qualities. But it is not he who has established bad tendencies in some children and good in others. Therefore we cannot hold God accountable. God creates all men equal made in his image. In order to see the justification of man's seeming inequalities, we must understand the law of reincarnation. Knowledge of this law was buried and forgotten during the Dark Ages. Jesus spoke of reincarnation when he said, Elias is come already and they knew him not. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. The soul appearing in one incarnation, as Elias Elijah had returned in another incarnation as John the Baptist. There would be no meaning to life if it did not afford us sufficient opportunities to develop our potentials and satisfy our desires. Without reincarnation, how does the divine justice operate for those souls who have no chance to express themselves because they are encased in the body of a baby that is born dead or of one that perhaps lives only to the age of six? Those souls could hardly be condemned to Hades because they have done nothing to deserve punishment nor could they go to heaven having had no opportunity to earn it. The answer is that this earth is a vast schoolhouse, and the law of reincarnation is the justice that brings each man here again and again until he has learned all of life's lessons. Lord Krishna referred to this truth. By diligently following his path, the yogi, perfected by the efforts of many births, is purged of sin karmic taint and finally enters the supreme beatitude. Man himself has cultivated his bright and dark qualities. Somewhere, sometime in this or other lives, the seeds were planted by his own actions. If he permits the seeds of harmful acts to grow, they will crowd out the seeds of good that he has sown. The wise cast out the seeds of evil from the garden of life. Attractiveness comes from within. One should learn to analyze himself and others to determine why some persons are liked by all and others are not. Even among children we find some whom everyone regards affectionately and others whom everyone avoids. One of the first conclusions from such analysis is that if a person is to become likable he must make himself more attractive from within. Sometimes even the most physically attractive person may be repellent because of the inner ugliness reflected in his speech and actions. At one time the secret of popularity was supposed to be it, a kind of physical appeal and magnetism. But having it does not necessarily make one likable. Our good or bad traits determine whether and by whom we are liked or disliked. Evil attracts evil, good attracts good. It is not what we should want but the kind of magnetism that will draw good to us, that will bring sincere friends and merited admiration. Can externals such as clothes and a pretty or handsome face give us this kind of attractiveness? No. It has to be created within. Avoid moodiness. There is no unpleasantness in being grave, but your expression is quite different when you are indulging in a dark mood. Your face is a mirror that reveals every change of feeling. Your thoughts and emotions like waves ebb and flow in the facial muscles continuously altering your appearance. Everyone you meet sees and reacts to these facial expressions of what you are inwardly thinking and feeling. You can fairly well control your eyes and your smile and thus conceal your feelings from some, but not from all. Lincoln rightly said, It is true that you may fool all the people some of the time. You can even fool some of the people all the time. But you can't fool all of the people all the time. In our eyes is the entire history of our life. It cannot be concealed from those who know how to read it. There are spiritual eyes, half-spiritual eyes, dishonest eyes, sensual eyes. What one does is written there. If I were to analyze what I see in a person's eyes, he would be astonished at my accuracy. Never do anything that taints your mind. 
wrong actions cause negative or evil mental vibrations that are reflected in your whole appearance and personality. Engage in those actions and thoughts that nurture the good qualities you want to have. If you conduct yourself in accord with the truths I am telling you, you will find your life beautifully different. You are judged largely by the way you conduct yourself. One is judged somewhat by his dress, but largely by the way he conducts himself. Always be clean and trim in appearance. Avoid overdressing, fussy clothes and accessories make one look like a museum piece. Clothe yourself simply and neatly, and as befits your personality. But first of all learn good behavior. Once you have developed your mind and cultivated appealing inner virtues, dress becomes less important. Mahatma Gandhi has proved that clothes alone do not make the man. He wears only a loincloth by way of identifying himself with the simple masses of India. There he once arrived thus clad for a party that was being given by an English governor. The servants would not let him in. He returned home and sent a package by messenger to the governor. It contained a suit. The governor called him at his home and asked the meaning of the package. The great man replied, I was invited to your party, but I wasn't allowed entrance because of my dress, therefore I have sent my suit instead. The governor of course insisted that he come. Even in London Gandhi went to call on the king and queen of England clad only in his loincloth. He had transcended the clothes personality. Now I am not recommending this mode of dress. Gandhi has a mission to fulfill, and this is a part of his role. If one becomes as great as Gandhi, he also may do as he sees fit. Point is one should not think all the time about the body, nor should he be careless of it. To give the body too little or too much attention makes one become unbalanced, fanatical. Look after the body in a reasonable way and remember always what is most important. Your mentality, your behavior. Give more attention to the mind, the springboard of your behavior, for that is what most persons respond to. When with others, be sincere and thoughtful. Be interested in others. When you are by yourself, you have a right to think and do what you want to, but when you are with others, you should not be absent, minded or uninterested. The company of a corpse would be preferable to that of an absent-minded person. The indifference of a corpse bears no insult. When you are in the company of others, be with them wholeheartedly. But when your interest in being with them lags, make a polite excuse and withdraw. You have no right to remain while your mind is absent. Be genuinely amiable when you are with others. Never be a sourpuss. You don't have to laugh boisterously like a hyena, but don't wear a long face either. Just be smiling, congenial and kind. Smiling on the outside when you are angry or resentful inside, however, is hypocrisy. If you want to be likable, be sincere. Sincerity is a soul quality that God has given to every human being, but not all express it. Above all, be humble. Though you may have admirable inner strength, don't overwhelm others with your strong nature. Be calm and considerate of them. This is the way to develop likable magnetism. Strive always to be understanding. Some people choose to be quarrelsome and to misunderstand us no matter what we say or do. They go about with a chip on their shoulder. To draw real friends, one must cultivate understanding. True friends understand one another no matter what they do. You should be like that. What is life unless you have the right kind of friends around you? There is a magnet in your heart that will attract true friends. That magnet is unselfishness, thinking of others first. Very few persons are free from self-centeredness. Yet one can develop the quality of unselfishness very easily if he practices thinking of others first. A mother usually has this quality. Her life is service. She gives to her husband and children first. Because she always thinks of others before herself, others think of her. That is the tradition in the homes in India. We are taught the same spirit in the ashrams of real spiritual teachers. Consideration for others is a most wonderful quality. It is the greatest attractiveness you can have. Practice it. If someone is thirsty, a thoughtful person anticipates his need and offers him a drink. 
Consideration means awareness of an attentiveness to others. A considerate person, when in the company of others, will have an intuitive awareness of their needs. Live for others, and they will live for you. There are those who would say, I am a devout man. Yet, if someone else sat in their church pew, they would be ready to take off the intruder's head. Once in a while, I see this sort of incident in my classes. If another person wants your seat, give it, even though you must stand. By your exemplary behavior, you will have someone else thinking considerately of you every day. When you learn to live for others, they will live for you. When you live for yourself, no one is interested in you. You can best attract others by your good actions. If you look around you, when you attend a party, you will almost always notice some guests who are openly envious of what others have. No one wants to be with thoughtless, selfish people. But everyone is glad to be with a tactful, considerate person. Practice consideration in your speech as well as in your actions. And when you feel tempted to speak harshly, control that impulse and talk calmly instead. Let no one hear harsh words from you. Be not afraid to speak truth when you are asked to do so, but do not force your thoughts on others. Remember also it may be truth to speak of the blind man as a blind man, or the sick man as a sick man, but it is better to avoid such bluntness. By the kindness and consideration of your speech you help to uplift others and make them better. It isn't always your words that others listen to, however, but the strength and sincerity behind them. When a sincere man speaks, the world moves. When he says something, others listen. Some persons talk on and on, hoping to convince the hearer by the steady barrage of words. But the captive listener is only thinking, please let me go. When you talk, don't talk too much about yourself. Try to speak on a subject that interests the other person. And listen. That is the way to be attractive. You will see how your presence is in demand. My mother was considerate in that way. Fathers and mothers should never talk against one another to the children. They should keep their troubles completely to themselves. My parents had that self-control. They were really like gods. Only once did I see trouble between my father and mother. All that we children knew was that a carriage was at the door and our mother was going away. Uncle came in and asked father, what is the matter? Father said, I have no objection to her spending money for her charities. I only ask that she not spend beyond my income. Uncle whispered something in father's ear. After a few conciliatory words from father, mother sent the carriage away. She never said a word against father. She was always thinking of others. It is a joy to live for others. When I am alone I have hardly any impulse to eat, but when I am with others I like to fix appetizing dishes for them. I saw that same characteristic in my guru Swami Sri Yukteswarji. During my first visits to his ashram I gained the impression that he always had savory food to eat. But once I went there when he didn't expect me, and I saw he was having the plainest meal imaginable. I questioned him about it. I don't have special dishes except when you come, he replied. I like to prepare them for you. Once a fellow college student accompanied me to the market to buy some pineapples. There were only two, one was larger than the other. I bought both of them and handed the large one to my friend. He was so surprised. He thought I had intended to keep that one for myself. A wonderful feeling arises within a person when he is considerate of others, thinking first of them. As soon as you are concerned for someone else, not only does he think of you, but God thinks of you too. If you are thoughtful, doing for others all the time, then even if you part with your last penny to help them, God will return even more blessings to you. Another thing to remember, each one of you has some special quality, a uniqueness that others have not. Also, each one is richer or poorer in some way than others are. If you are unselfish, good-tempered, understanding, you are richer than those who are selfish and angry and jealous. Perfect balance is the altar of God. Mankind is like a large zoo, so many people behaving so differently, most of them having no real control over themselves. But before one can realize the true goal of life, he has to have that self-control. He must seek balance. 
perfect balance is the altar of God. Strive for this, and once you have attained it, never lose it. Christ did not lose it when he was being nailed to the cross. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The ordinary person cannot bear his tests. When I started on the spiritual path, I supposed that only good would happen to me, but I found that many difficult experiences also came. Then I reasoned, because I love God so deeply, I have expected too much from him. From now on I will say, Lord, let thy will be done. Severe trials came, but I held to the thought, let thy will be done. I wanted to accept whatever he sent my way, and he always showed me how to be victorious in every test. Even death is nothing to the spiritually strong. I once dreamed I was dying. Nevertheless, I was praying to him, Lord, it is all right, whatever is thy will. Then he touched me and I realized the truth, how can I die? The wave cannot die, it sinks back into the ocean and comes forth again. The wave never dies, and I can never die. When you go to a clothing store, you try to find a garment that is suited to you, that brings out the best in you. You should do the same for your soul. The soul has no particular apparel, it can don any style it wants to. The body is limited, but the soul can put on any kind of mental dress, any kind of personality. If you think deeply about any person, study his history and consciously imitate his personality, you will begin to be like him. You will establish your identity with that personality. I have practiced this and I can take on any personality I wish. When I put on the personality of wisdom, I can talk of nothing but wisdom. When I adopt the personality of Sri Chaitanya, a great devotee of God, I can speak of nothing but devotion. And when I attune myself to the personality of Jesus, I cannot speak of God as mother, only as the Father as he did. The soul can adopt any mental dress it admires or desires and change that dress as often as it pleases. When you meet a wonderful person, don't you wish you were like him? Think of all the noble qualities that are in the hearts of great men and women. You can have them all in your own heart. You can be humble and strong or brave like a general fighting for a righteous cause. You can have the conquering will of Genghis Khan or the divine will and love and surrender of St. Francis. Seek God and be victorious in life. Above all, develop the will to seek God, no matter what the obstacles. Then you will be victorious in life. When I am trying to do something for the work and many trials come, I sometimes think, why should I have to go through this? I have found God. I don't need these things for myself. But then I tell him, I will accept whatever comes to me. I care not what people think of me, because one day they are with me, the next day they are against me. Your pleasure is my pleasure. Your assurance is my assurance. Emulate the consciousness of the Great One such as Christ. Realize His omnipresence. The Father gave Jesus that universal consciousness by which He knows all things. Even as I am talking, He knows what I am saying. Though you don't see Him, I see Him. He is right here, a great light transforming this temple. Everyone here is within that light which I see. We are like waves in the ocean of that light, the light of Christ consciousness, the light of God. When you see his light and his presence, then you know that this life is nothing more than a test that everyone must go through to reach God. If Satan's tests are conquered, then even Satan becomes the tool of God. Every trial is a blessing if it brings us nearer to God. This is what you should remember. And whatever you do on earth, do it for God. Each human being is unique, no two can be exactly the same. Think of yourself this way, my personality is the gift of God. What I am, no one else is. I shall be very proud of my divine individuality. I shall improve myself and don a personality of goodness. If you play your part well, you are just as good as the soul who plays the part of a king or queen. And so long as you play your part well, you will be attractive and loved by all. Your part well played is your passport to God. Abraham Lincoln was an accomplished actor on this stage of life. He was not afraid to play his difficult role. 
He was working for God and for what he believed to be right, the equality of man. That is why he is remembered and loved today. If you strive to serve God, you have served everyone. Seek to please him, not man. What you expect others to be, you be first. Practice these suggestions. Take one quality at a time and work at developing it. From today, for instance, practice peace. Then take cheerfulness. Try to smile even when you are unhappy. Then work at cultivating courage and fearlessness. Some persons are terrified of the dark. If you are one of these, practice going into a dark room until you get over this fear. Develop the consciousness that God is with you. You can be in an impregnable castle and still disease can get at you there. Yet you can be on the battlefield with bullets flying all around you, and if your time to leave the body has not come, nothing will hurt you. Practice perfecting sincerity, unselfishness, business ability, and so on. Work at it like the strong-minded martyr who never compromises his ideals. No matter what comes, do not let it bother or deter you. Be like that. Practice consideration and goodness until you are like a beautiful flower that everyone loves to see. Be the beauty that is in a flower and the attractiveness that is in a pure mind. When you are attractive in that way, you will always have true friends. You will be loved by both man and God. Chapter Developing Personality Personality and its development are generally considered only in the light of realizing some material goal, such as increasing one's business or social opportunities. The real nature of personality is rarely analyzed. What essentially is personality? It is the ego consciousness, not ego in the sense of inflated pride, but as the consciousness of existence. Each one of us knows I exist. Further, we are conscious of existing in a certain way as a man or a woman and with certain characteristic qualities. We think about ourselves in terms of our individual background, experiences, and environment. A housekeeper thinks of herself as a housekeeper. A lecturer thinks of himself as a lecturer. A scientist thinks of himself as a scientist. Yet when they are asleep they forget their daytime activities. In sleep the consciousness of existence remains, though the egoistic concept of the wakeful personality may fade away entirely. But as soon as one awakens he remembers and becomes reassociated with his environment, mental identity. Therefore the personality a man displays in his wakeful hours is merely a cultivated and partial individuality. The consciousness of existence is fundamentally a universal, unlimited state, but it becomes more or less bound by the personality traits that we hold to from day to day. Eventually we forget that our individual qualities can be expanded or contracted according to our behavior. Whence does our true personality derive? It comes from God. He is absolute consciousness, absolute existence, and absolute bliss. The Creator knows that He exists. He also knows that His existence is eternal and that His nature is ever new bliss. With the human mind we cannot know the infinite mind or perceive what ineffable spirit is, but through the superconsciousness of the soul we can taste the divine presence as bliss. The joy we receive from any experience flows from God, even though it may have been roused by some outward circumstance. By concentrating within, you can directly feel the divine bliss of your soul within and also without. If you can stabilize yourself in that consciousness, your outer personality will develop and become attractive to all beings. The soul is made in God's image, and when we become established in soul awareness, our personality begins to reflect His goodness and beauty. That is your real personality. Any other characteristics you display are more or less a graft. They are not the real you. The divine man, living in the cosmic consciousness of God, can assume any kind of outer personality he wishes. When I am conscious of my human personality, I have limitations, but as soon as I change my consciousness to the soul sphere, I see everything just as if it were a motion picture. 
A person concentrating on the beam by which images are shown on a movie screen can see that all those figures are scintillating by the current of light emanating from the projector. In the same way I see the world and all its creatures solely as the projected thoughts of God. Concentrate on matter and you see everything in terms of matter. But as soon as you lift up your consciousness to the state of divine awareness, you see the oceanic current of God's light flowing behind all matter. You see everything in terms of spirit. Though the unity of God is reflected in everything, it appears diversified in cosmic nature. His creative life flows throughout the earth, put a seed in the ground and it begins to grow. Metals express a certain power and beauty of God. In the vegetable kingdom he changes his personality again. The active expression of life is more visible in plants. Still, the study of creation reveals that every metal, every plant, every animal has a distinctive personality, and in man we find an even more expanded individuality, for man knows that he is a living, conscious being. But all these different personalities have been borrowed from God, he is the only life. O oh, Arjuna, I am the self in the heart of all creatures, I am their origin, existence, and finality. Thus the Lord describes himself in the Gita. And in the Bible we read his declaration, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Intuition develops one's true personality. Our soul intuition is a faculty of God. He has no mouth, yet he tastes everything. He has no hands or feet, yet he feels the whole universe. How? By intuition, by his omnipresence. Man ordinarily relies upon his senses to supply him with information about himself and the world in which he lives. His mind doesn't know anything except what his five senses tell him. But the superman relies upon intuition, his sixth sense, for knowledge. Intuition doesn't depend on the senses or the power of inference for its data. For example, you feel certain that something is going to happen, and it does happen exactly as you foresaw it. Each one of you has probably had some such experience. How did you know without any inferential or sense data? That direct knowing is the soul's power of intuition. The ancient Indian sage Patanjali tells us that scriptural authority is not in itself proof of truth. How then can you know that the Bible and the Gita are true? The data relayed by the senses and the power of inference cannot give final proof. Truth is ultimately understood or proved solely by intuition, soul realization. Your true personality begins to develop when you are able, by deep intuition, to feel that you are not this solid body but are the divine eternal current of life and consciousness within the body. That is how Jesus could walk on the water. He realized that everything is composed of the consciousness of God. Human personality can be changed to divine personality. Banish the consciousness that you are a bundle of flesh and bones. Every night God makes you forget that delusion. But as soon as you wake up you are back again in the seeming confinements of the body. Man can be whatever he wants to be. Man can change his outer and inner nature by concentration. A person of strong mind can be whatever he wants to be. The limited human personality can be greatly expanded by meditation. When you close your eyes and feel the vastness of the soul within you, and when you can make that consciousness enduring, then you will have the personality that God intended you should have. The experience of the wakeful state has become predominant in your consciousness. But at the time of deep sleep, when man is granted freedom from the limitations of the flesh, you are in touch with truth, with your real personality. Your attitude changes with the subconscious and superconscious realization, I am infinite. I am a part of everything. As your consciousness expands with divine understanding, your personality becomes increasingly attractive and powerful. When your character grows in a spiritual way, you can assume almost any shade of personality you desire. Mind is illimitable, and as you develop spiritually and your inner life becomes separate from body consciousness, you no longer feel any egoistic attachment to the flesh. You are aware of ineffable freedom. 
You shouldn't identify yourself as any particular type of individual. Rather be able to change your personality whenever you want to. I have done many different things in my life just for the fun of it. I have invested money. I have done the work of a musician, of a contractor, of a cook. Truly, you can accomplish anything if you do not accept limitations by identifying yourself with your present personality. When you say to me that you can't do this or that, I don't believe it. Whatever you make up your mind to do, you can do. God is the sum total of everything, and His image is within you. He can do anything, and so can you if you learn to identify yourself with His inexhaustible nature. No matter if you have health and wealth and everything else you want of the world, still there will always be some disillusion that will bring grief. Nothing of the earth is lasting, only God is lasting. When you develop the individuality that is an expression of His presence within you, which is your true self, you will be able to attract anything you want. Any other personality you try to develop, whether that of an artist or a businessman or a writer, will bring disenchantment in its wake, because all human expressions have their limitations. You may go after success or money or fame and achieve it, but always some flaw, lack of health or insufficient love or something else, will hurt you. The best course is to pray, Lord make me happy with awareness of Thee. Give me freedom from all earthly desires, and above all give me Thy joy that outlasts all the happy and sad experiences of life. Never forget your true nature. Remember that as a child of God you are endowed with greater strength than you will ever need to overcome all the trials that God may send you. Often we continue to suffer without making an effort to change. That is why we don't find lasting peace and contentment. If we would persevere we would certainly be able to conquer all difficulties. We must make the effort that we may go from misery to happiness, from despondency to courage. It is necessary first to feel the importance of changing our condition. This attitude stimulates our will to action. Let us resolve that we will always make an effort to improve our self-knowledge and thus continuously better our existence. India's spiritual scientists explored the kingdom of the soul. They have given to mankind for its benefit certain universal laws of meditation by which real seekers, those who wish to find a good life by changing themselves, may scientifically control their minds and attain self-realization. When you develop your divine nature you become completely detached about the body. You no longer feel identified with it. You look after it as you would attend to a little child. As you realize your true self more and more by meditation, you become freed from mental and physical pains. You cast off your lifelong limitations. That is the best way to live out your days on earth. Awaken your divine personality. Remember that it is not harmful to own things, but it is harmful to be owned by them. It is difficult to have the right balance. Struggling too hard for money, you may neglect your health. You will find that everything will betray you if you betray your loyalty to God. So let not one drop of oil fall from the lamp of your attention in the sanctuary of inner silence as you meditate each day and as you carefully perform your duties in the world. That is the personality you want to develop, dutiful in carrying out your obligations in life, but aware that your real home lies within. What is the use of developing a personality based on worldly values, which are ever changeful and fleeting? Rather strive for a personality that is derived from your living in the continuous consciousness of God. Bhagavan Krishna said, when a man completely relinquishes all desires of the mind and is entirely contented in the self by the self, he is then considered to be one settled in wisdom. Awaken that meek yet thunderous divine personality, strong as the lion, gentle as the dove. When you make up your mind that you will meditate and follow this path, nothing will be able to take you away from it. Perform your worldly tasks faithfully, without forgetting for a moment your highest duty to God. Chapter, The Divine Art of Making Friends Friendship is the noblest human expression of God's desire to show His love to man. God showers affection on the baby through the father and mother. Their feeling for the infant is inborn, because our Creator has ordained that our parents can't help but love us. 
but friendship comes to us as a free, impartial expression of his love. Two strangers meet, and by an instantaneous choice of their hearts they wish to help each other. Have you ever analyzed how this happens? The spontaneous mutual desire to be friends comes directly from God's divine law of attraction. Cumulative mutual acts of friendship between two souls in past lives gradually create a karmic bond that irresistibly attracts them to each other in this life. So long as it is uncontaminated by selfishness or attraction to the opposite sex, this impulse is pure. But often it is tainted. Friendship grows on the tree of our innermost feelings. It is desecrated by unwholesome desires and selfish actions. If you put the wrong kind of fertilizer on the roots of a tree, the fruit that develops will be poor, and when you feed the tree of human feeling with the emotion of selfishness, your unworthy motives will blemish the fruit of friendship. To feel interested in someone just because he is rich or influential and can do something for you is not friendship. And to be attracted to someone primarily because that person has a beautiful face is not friendship. When that face loses its youthful attractiveness, the friendship will evaporate. Develop friendships from the past. It is true that you cannot find friendship everywhere. Some persons you see every day and never know, and others you feel you have known always. You should learn to recognize that inner cue. Wherever you are, always keep your eyes open, and if you feel divinely attracted to someone, you should develop friendship with that person because he has been your friend in some life before. There are many friends whom we have known in past lives, but those friendships have not yet been perfected. It is better to start building on a foundation that has already been laid than to dig for a foundation on the sands of temporary acquaintances. It is easy for one to think he has many friends until they do something hurtful to him, and then he feels deeply disillusioned. Many people make mistakes in choosing friends because they are deluded by outer appearances. The only way to recognize real friends is to meditate more. You should try to find friends the divine way, and that is to purge your consciousness of all thought of facial or other appearances as factors in determining your feelings about others. If you do this one day, you will be able to discover true friends all around you. You will feel God's friendship through those humble human channels that do not resist Him. Through the pure of heart the divine light of friendship will flow to you. To attract friends improve your character. You cannot attract true friends without removing from your own character the stains of selfishness and other unlovely qualities. The greatest art of making friends is to behave divinely yourself, to be spiritual, to be pure, to be unselfish, and to start friendship where the foundation of friendship has already been laid in a past life. Friendship should exist in all human relations, between parents and children, between husbands and wives, between men and men, between women and women, and between men and women. It is unconditional. When you have the impulse to befriend others, it is the presence of God that you feel. Friendship is a divine impulse. God is not satisfied to look after his human children only in the guise of parents and other relatives. He comes as friends to give us opportunities to express unconditional love from our hearts. The more your human shortcomings drop away and divine qualities come into your life, the more friends you will have. Was not Lord Jesus a great friend to all and Lord Buddha and Lord Krishna? To be like them you must perfect your love for others. When you can convince others of your friendship, when you are sure through the tests of time and many shared experiences, that a person really feels for you from the soul, and you feel for that person in the same way, not for any gain, but solely because of the divine impulse of friendship, you will behold in that relationship the reflection of God. Give friendship to all as God does. Do not allow your friendship to remain locked up in one person, but gradually establish this divine relationship with others of noble ideals. If you try to build friendship with a wrong-minded person, you will be disillusioned. Be friends first with the truly good, then go on being a friend to others until you can feel friendship toward everyone, until you can say, I am a friend to all, even my enemies. Even toward those who were crucifying him, Jesus felt only friendship, 
exemplifying in his final ordeal that which he had always taught. Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. True friendship is divine love, for it is unconditional and it is real and lasting. Emerson beautifully expressed this ideal in one of his essays. The highest compact we can make with our fellow is, let there be truth between us two forevermore. It is sublime to feel and say of another, I need never meet or speak or write to him. We need not reinforce ourselves or send tokens of remembrance. I rely on him as on myself. If he did thus or thus, I know it was right. You can talk freely with a friend without being misunderstood. But friendship can never develop if there is any hint of demand of one on the other. Friendship can be built only on a basis of freedom and spiritual equality. Therefore you should treat everyone in that divine light in the consciousness that each person is an image of God. If you mistreat someone you will never know friendship with him. Many people go through life without friends. I can't imagine how they are able to carry on. Real friends seldom misunderstand us, and if they do, it is only for a little while. Should someone abuse your trust, go on giving love and understanding just the same as you would hope to receive it. But if that person continues to behave spitefully and goes on slapping the extended hand of friendship, then it is better to withhold your hand for a time. Universal friendship starts at home. Friendship should start at home. If in your family there is one who is particularly in harmony with you, develop friendship with that person first. Then if you feel drawn to someone of similar ideals among your acquaintances, develop that relationship. Banish all desires born of selfishness or sex compulsion. In giving pure friendship you will see the guidance of God. Develop friendship with good people, and the more you meditate the more you will recognize friends of the past. Meditation awakens sleeping memories of friends once more to be. Many persons whom I had seen in vision, I later met, and here in America I have found many whom I saw in vision on the ship as I was first coming to this country in 1920. Friendship is a great universal force. When your desire for friendship is strong enough, though an unknown person who is spiritually attuned to you be living at the South Pole, the magnetism of friendship will nevertheless draw you together. Only selfishness can destroy this magnetism within us. He who thinks of himself all the time wrecks friendship. Such persons cannot attract friends because they are unable to expand and receive the good in life. God gave you a family so that you may learn how to love others and then give that kind of love to all. Our dear ones are taken away from us by death and other circumstances that we may learn not to love persons in merely human relationships, but to be in love with love itself, which is God, the being behind all human masks. When a man beholds all separate beings as existent in the one that has expanded itself into the many, he merges with Brahman. Friendship means investing your love where there is no prejudice of human relations. In married life there is the compulsion of sex, and in family life there is the compulsion of hereditary instincts. But in friendship there is no compulsion. Let us give our love to all. Let us pray that we meet our friends of the past and prove our friendship with them, so that we can finally understand and merit the friendship of God. Unless we are united with all of His children through a spirit of friendliness, we will not be united with God. I know no strangers. What a great state of happiness and joy. Even the worst enemy cannot make me feel that I am not his friend. When that awakening comes, you are in love with all. You see that everyone is your father's child, and the love you feel for all beings never dies. It grows increasing until you realize, in the love of friends, the divine love of God. Chapter, The True Experience of Spiritual Ecstasy God has given us the power of spiritual inspiration, realization of the pure bliss of His presence within us. But the evil force in creation has invented spurious imitations. The temporarily exhilarating effects of alcohol and drugs are counterfeits of true spiritual experiences. 
The use of alcohol and drugs frequently leads to overindulgence in sex, which shuts out the power of spiritual inspiration by tying the mind to intense body consciousness. Many people take wine to banish sad or unpleasant memories and worries, but that kind of forgetfulness robs man of his native soul wisdom. The very power by which he was meant to overcome his trials and to find lasting happiness. God being joy itself wants us to seek and to find within our souls his ever new bliss. The counterfeits are harmful, for they are the lures of Maya, the cosmic delusive force that is ever trying to mar all the beautiful expressions of God in this universe. Throughout creation we see the dual forces of good and evil opposing each other. God created love, the satanic force created hate. God created kindness, the satanic force created selfishness. God created peace, the satanic force created disharmony. Knowing this, you should realize that alcohol and drugs are detrimental to your happiness. They obliterate the real joy and intelligence of your soul. Even one drink or one indulgence in drugs may start a permanent habit, because there may be such a tendency already embedded in your subconsciousness from past lives. What is evil should always be shunned as evil. The wine of spiritual ecstasy is incomparable. Once you have tasted the wine of spiritual ecstasy, you will find that no other experience can compare with it. Ever strive to establish the divine consciousness in your children by teaching them to meditate, that they be not tempted to play with the fire of delusive counterfeit joys. Sacred bliss is never ending, but the pleasures that come from alcohol and drugs are short lasting and ultimately bring misery. Every night in sleep you have a taste of peace and joy. While you are in deep slumber, God makes you live in the tranquil superconsciousness in which all the fears and worries of this existence are forgotten. By meditation you can experience that holy state of mind when you are awake and be constantly immersed in healing peace. When the divine joy comes, immediately my breath is stilled and I am lifted into the spirit. I feel the bliss of a thousand sleeps rolled into one, and yet I don't lose my ordinary awareness. This is universally the experience of those who go deep in the superconscious state. When the profound ecstasy of God falls over you, the body becomes absolutely still, the breath ceases to flow, and the thoughts are quiet, banished every one by the magic command of the soul. Then you drink of God's bliss and experience an intoxication of joy that not a thousand drafts of wine could give you. As the ordinary person drowses on the borderline of sleep, he feels a little happiness, but he quickly loses that awareness and is fast asleep. Sleep is not total unconsciousness, for when you awaken, you always know whether you slept well or not. There are various kinds of sleep, some light and some deep. But more intoxicating than even the most blissful slumber are those spiritual experiences one may have consciously with God. Beyond the mysteries of the sleepland lie all these divine joys. I can remain in any state I wish to. Often I stay between the sleepland and the awareness of the world, in the superconscious state. Consciousness has a limitless span. Your mind has a vast, a limitless span, but you do not realize it. I can go into the depths of sleep and enjoy the sleep state and at the same time be with the world. Or I can sleep and dream, and at the same time also hear everything that is going on around me. Sometimes I sleep just as the ordinary person does, and again I can sleep and consciously watch myself sleeping. In this superconscious state you can see that your body and mind are sleeping and yet have total awareness of all happenings. This is possible only when you have developed the ability to enter at will the superconsciousness and return at will to the ordinary state of mind. You need never worry that by meditation or by imagination or by the practice of inner silence you may go out of the body and fail to return. That idea is entirely false. The Meyer-induced attachment to the body is so powerful that you can't escape from it that easily. Even if your ordinary waking awareness is obliterated, so long as your subconscious mind remains tied to the body you cannot leave it permanently. What is the proof of self-realization? If you imagine something very strongly, 
it becomes visible as a hallucination having no intrinsic reality. You should understand the difference between imagination and self-realization. The essential proof of self-realization, of God's consciousness in you, is to be truly and unconditionally happy. If you are receiving more and more joy in meditation, without cessation, you may know that God is making manifest His presence in you. If there is a break in the flow of divine happiness, then there is something wrong in your consciousness, some kink that needs to be removed with the help of your guru. By maintaining steady communion with Him, through daily meditation and by following His precepts, the sad henna He has given you, He will straighten out that kink for you. You cannot be with the Lord just by thinking you are divinely enlightened. You must improve yourself, you must perfect yourself. There is a lot of difference between the potential realization of God and the actual realization of God. You can never know Him except through humbleness, wisdom, and devotion. The humble man is the one who will know God. Those who go deep in the superconsciousness automatically develop unusual spiritual powers and control over natural forces. But no man of true God consciousness ever uses his powers unwisely for egotistical display. Sages realize that the Lord is the sole doer and humbly return to him the extraordinary gifts he has bestowed on them. Is not everything in the universe a miracle? By his mere existence is not man a miracle? If human beings are not satisfied with all the wonders that God has created, why should his saints perform further miracles? They never do unless, for some special reason, often an unfathomable one, the Lord so commands them. Beyond the kaleidoscope of subconsciousness, I will illustrate how the superconsciousness differs from the subconsciousness. The superconscious is that state in which you can consciously, during wakefulness or sleep, produce any sensation in your body at will without any external stimulus. That is the proof. In the subconscious dreamland you can drink a glass of hot milk, but this experience comes to you unbidden. In the superconscious state you can create that or any other experience consciously and at will. Unless you are able to do this, do not delude yourself that you have reached superconsciousness. Millions of devotees never get beyond the kaleidoscope of the subconscious mind, which manifests its wonders mostly during sleep. But in this superconscious state you can see or know anything that you wish to, not by imagination but in reality. I can sit in this chair and transfer my mind to India and see exactly what is going on in my old home there. The advancing devotee progresses through three stages of spiritual awareness, the sacred trinity. First he experiences superconsciousness, oneness with the creative power and creation, Aum, God the Holy Ghost. Next comes Christ consciousness, merging in the infinite intelligence within creation, Tak, God the Son. Finally he attains the highest cosmic consciousness, the truth beyond creation, the ineffable absolute, Sat, God the Father. Sometimes a devotee dwells in the subconsciousness, sometimes he is lifted to superconsciousness and to Christ consciousness, and a few great souls are able to go beyond Christ consciousness into cosmic consciousness, the realm of causeless spirit. In Christ conscious state you don't have to visualize things first in order to experience them. You don't have to picture India, you are there, you are aware of all creation. That experience is an endless expansion of consciousness. You are in the blade of grass and on the mountain top, and you can feel every cell of your body in every atom of space. But cosmic consciousness is beyond even that. When you can feel your presence in all creation, and also know the joy that is beyond creation, then you are a godlike being. Chapter 3 Paths to Cosmic Consciousness so long as even a little tremor of thought and mental restlessness is present, you cannot reach cosmic consciousness. The self-realization technique of concentration helps greatly to improve the quality and power of one's concentration. Its practice will save the earnest seeker from years of fruitless wandering on the subconscious plane. That land you want to avoid, it is full of illusory and imaginative spiritual experiences. 
One must reach the superconscious state to have real spiritual experiences and realizations of truth. The world has a habit of much teaching and little practicing. You may hear a lecture on sugar a hundred times, but you will not know its flavor until you have tasted it. Neither can the glory of any true teaching be known except by practice. You have to live the teachings of the prophets and the great ones. Then their truths become your own, and you realize that truth is demonstrable and universal. When you practice truth, whether you call yourself a Christian, a Hindu, a Buddhist, or a devotee of any other religion, Christ will claim you and so will Krishna, Buddha, and all other divine incarnations of truth. Follow the path of truth steadfastly. Remember that out of thousands, only a few seek God, and out of those seekers, perhaps only one really knows Him. He who is persistent will realize God. So try your best to make meditation a regular experience in your life. May you never forget God and never be satisfied until you have Him. Be able to say, behind this finite frame I feel the infinite. I never come to class until I know He is with me. I never teach unless I have made that complete communion. And I know that when I talk from that plane students will not forget what they have learned. Concentration, a requisite for finding God. To be able to concentrate is essential for spiritual progress. Without concentration you shall never find God. Learn how to shut out of your consciousness all sounds and other earthly distractions. As soon as your consciousness is right, God is there. He isn't hiding from you, you are hiding from Him. When in deep meditation you see any inner light, try to hold it and to feel you are inside it, one with it. That is where God is. Try to realize you are that light of God. The more peace you feel during concentration and the longer you concentrate, the deeper you will go in God. The time given to reading books about spiritual truth were spent in meditation. You would have far greater advancement both mentally and spiritually. Sleep less and give more hours to meditation. The rest you will enjoy is a hundred times more refreshing than sleep. Unless you can cut off sounds from your consciousness you cannot reach God. That is why saints have sought the seclusion of caves and forests. Plunge into the inner silence again and again by practicing the methods of concentration and meditation I have given you, and you will find great peace and happiness. The Gita says, free from ever hoping desires and from cravings for possessions, with the heart waves of feeling controlled by the soul by yoga concentration, retiring alone to a quiet place, the yogi should constantly try to unite with the soul. The silence of deep meditation should be practiced more in all churches and temples. Everyone should talk less. During my hermitage training in India my guru Swami Sri Yukteswar would lecture to us only once in a while. Most of the time we sat around him without any talking and concentrated within. If we even stir he would reprove us. A real teacher possesses more than book knowledge, and in spiritual life it is necessary to learn wisdom from such a teacher, one who knows and knows that he knows because he has experienced, not merely read about, truth, the invisible source of visible worlds. Space is divided into two parts or aspects. On one side of space is creation. On the other side is God alone. Creation is completely absent. That is the world of the darkless dark and the lightless light. In the Gita the Lord says, Where no sun or moon or fire shines, that is my supreme abode. The same duality is true of human consciousness. Your being has two sides, one visible, the other invisible. With open eyes you behold objective creation and yourself in it. With closed eyes you see nothing, a dark void. Yet your consciousness, even when dissociated from form is still keenly aware and operative. If in deep meditation you penetrate the darkness behind closed eyes, you behold the light from which all creation emerges. By deeper samadhi your experience transcends even the manifested light and enters the all-blissful consciousness, beyond all form, yet infinitely more real, tangible, and joyous than any sensory or supersensory perception. God has given you the opportunity to observe in your own consciousness the operation of the same laws that govern the universe. 
The state of consciousness without form that is experienced with closed eyes may be compared to the endless region of darkless dark and lightless light, where God exists without any of the forms, qualities, and dualities that characterize the sphere of his material creation. In this boundless stretch of eternity behind creation, God alone lives in the unqualified consciousness of ever-existing, ever-conscious, ever-new bliss. No world or any other created thing exists in his consciousness, in that part of infinity where he reigns as the Absolute. But on the other side of space he is aware of everything, all creation in himself. In the invisible is the factory of the universe. Einstein said that space looks very suspicious because everything comes out of it and everything disappears into it. Whither do electrons vanish in whole worlds? Any time you become fascinated by some material creation, close your eyes, look within and contemplate its source. You see nothing, feel nothing. Yet all visible objects have come out of that invisible. The light shineth in darkness. If you keep peering into the darkness, you will find that great light. Behind the darkness is the Christ consciousness. Behind the darkness is the teeming life of other worlds. In my Father's house are many mansions. Right behind space is intelligence. And right behind you is God. Live no longer in ignorance of His presence. Turn the darkness with your meditation. Don't stop until you find Him. There is so much to know. So much to see within. The answer to every problem will come to you straight from the infinite. The truths that I perceive within by meditation reveal the basis of physiological laws that science is discovering by other methods. When I close my eyes, I can see the subtle life currents flowing in my body. In the quietness you experience when your eyes are closed, don't feel you are alone. God is with you. Why should you think he is not? The ether is filled with music that is caught by the radio, music that otherwise you would not know about. And so it is with God. He is with you every minute of your existence, yet the only way to realize this is to meditate. And those of you who do meditate should go deeper. Don't fall asleep at night until you actually feel some expression of the presence of God within you. Peer into that darkness until you discover its wondrous secrets. For your encouragement, I tell you of an experience I had today in the superconscious state. I was sitting in the library at M.T. Washington. It was about four o'clock. Suddenly my breath disappeared. My limbs became rigid. I found myself watching the process of death. Breath and movement had left my body, yet I was conscious. This experience of death was wonderful. I saw my body and all nature as a cosmic motion picture created from God's light. Joyously I cried, There is no death, Lord. This whole world is nothing but a movie. A ruler on his throne may say, Ah, I am king. But let death give one knock and he is gone. He is a real king who feels God in all forms in creation. Death shall not frighten him, because he beholds it as a portal to the divine kingdom. First path to cosmic consciousness. Of the three ways to expand human consciousness into cosmic consciousness, the first is the social way, wherein you shut out self and live for all. Be loyal to your friends and feel love for everyone. God gave you a family that you might expand your consciousness by caring and doing for others. In family life we learn love and self-sacrifice for our loved ones, and thus attain some expansion of consciousness. But this is not enough. Love that becomes personal is exclusive, confined, when love becomes impersonal, it expands. Develop impersonal love. Be able to give everyone the same love that you bestow on your family, and to do for others exactly as you would for yourself. The social way to cosmic consciousness is to behave toward everyone in this way. God loves all his children alike. They are all his divine family, and his love is impersonal. His children should give that same kind of love to one another. This is the divine plan. To forget it is to suffer. The whole world attitude should change. You are everyone because your true nature is omnipresence. 
I enjoy giving things to others. I feel the greatest happiness in seeing their joy. When we feel for and love others, we find that all of creation responds to us. Jesus, who gave up his body as a ransom for many, showed us the social way of attaining cosmic consciousness. Christ-like, you too should serve all men as yourself. The man of cosmic consciousness is a happy man. He doesn't limit his love to a few excluding everyone else. So should you make the whole world your own family. Will you remember? This consciousness is with me every moment. I have no caste, no country. I feel that all are mine. Love all men as your brothers. Love all women as your sisters. And all older people as your parents. Love all human beings as your friends. The second path. The second way to cosmic consciousness is the way of self-discipline. Do not be a victim of immoderation. Enjoy things but don't be attached to them. Be free. Be pleasant and self-controlled. Avoid becoming a slave to wrong habits and act only according to your righteous convictions. To attain cosmic consciousness, it is necessary to possess self-control and to rise above dualities heat and cold, pleasure and sorrow, health and sickness. Learn to endure all things without any excitement or disturbance of mind. He who is everywhere non-attached, neither joyously excited by encountering good, nor disturbed by evil, has an established wisdom. Third and highest path. Lastly is the way of meditation, the metaphysical path. If while meditating you are still conscious of the breath, you are tied to body awareness. To enter cosmic consciousness, one must free himself from the bonds of the body through guru-given meditation methods. If you put a sealed jar of water in a tank of water, that which is in the jar is separated from that which surrounds the jar. But if you remove the lid, the water in the jar and the water in the tank can mingle. Similarly, ordinary people shut out God because their consciousness is sealed in by the lid of ignorance. When that lid is removed by right methods of meditation, one feels the peace of God inside and outside the body. As you increase the length and depth of your meditations you will find more and more peace and an ever new joy. Whatever else you may try, it will not produce the divine consciousness that comes from meditation. The Lord is all around but you don't feel Him. And you cannot feel Him within or without until you remove the lid of ignorance and merge your consciousness with His to discover Him within yourself. If you sink in material desire, you will suffocate. If you sink in the ocean of God, you will live forevermore. Once you have found God, you experience real and lasting satisfaction. Human friendships may be severed, but God will never leave you. Though everyone else forsake you, if you have him, you have everything. Chapter, Be a Smile Millionaire The real smile is the smile of bliss that comes when you meditate, when you feel the joy of God's presence. That is the smile on Lahiri Mahesaya's face. He is seeing the world partially, but seeing God fully. My smile comes from a joy deep within my being, a joy that you also may attain. Like a fragrance it oozes out from the core of the blossoming soul. This joy calls others to bathe in its waters of divine bliss. The average man is familiar with four states of mind. When a desire is fulfilled, he is happy. When a desire is denied, he is unhappy. When he is neither glad nor sorrowful, he is bored. When these three emotions, these three states of mind, pleasure, pain and boredom, are sloughed off, he has peace. Beyond peace is bliss. Peace is the absence of the alternations of sorrow and pleasure, and the absence of boredom. It is a very desirable state. After a tumultuous ride on the crests of pain and pleasure, with frequent dips into the troughs of boredom, you enjoy floating on the calm sea of peace. But greater than peace is bliss, bliss of the soul. It is an ever new joy that never disappears, but remains with your soul through eternity. That joy can be attained only by perceiving God. If you place a pot of water under the rays of the moon and then agitate the water, you create a distorted reflection of the moon. When you still the waves in the pot, the reflection becomes clear. 
the time when the water in the pot is quiet and clearly reflecting the moon, is comparable to the meditative state of peace and the still deeper state of calmness. In the peace of meditation, all waves of sensations and thoughts are absent from the mind. In the deeper state of calmness, one perceives in that stillness the moon reflection of God's presence. Peace is a negative state, being merely the absence of the waves of pleasure, pain, and indifference, and so after a little while the meditator is attracted once more by the desire to experience the waves of motion. But as meditative peace deepens into calmness and the ultimate positive state of bliss, the meditator experiences a joy that is ever new and all satisfying. When you sleep, you still thoughts and sensations passively. When by meditation you still thoughts and sensations consciously, you experience first the state of peace, and the muscles of your face will form a smile that reflects the peace of your heart. But you must look beyond peace in order to behold, undistorted by sensory stimuli and motor reflexes from sense-associated thoughts, the purity of your soul. The state you feel then is ever new bliss. Saints always have this joy in their hearts. Secure in the divine inner assurance, they are unshaken by anger or fear. Using the scalpel of reason or intuition, they can dissect their own or others' thoughts on the operating table of the mind and remain unmoved. In soul bliss all grief is annihilated. Indeed, the discrimination of the blissful man soon becomes firmly established in the self. Smile with the love of God. Most smiles are born of good emotions arising out of doing good or out of feeling sympathy, love, kindness, or mercy. But the most wonderful way to smile is to fill your heart with the love of God. Then, you will be able to love everybody, you will be able to smile all the time. All other forms of smiles are evanescent because emotions flicker and pass away, no matter how good they are. The only thing that can last is the joy of God. When you have that, you can smile all the time. Otherwise, when you are feeling merciful towards someone and he returns your kindness with a slap, you won't be able to feel mercy toward him any longer. A man I knew made a great show of his distress when his wife died. I saw through his emotionalism. You will marry within a month, I told him. He was so angry at me he would not see me after that, but he did remarry within a month. He thought his love for the first wife was so great, but you see how quickly he forgot her. I shall never forget how much my guru, Sri Yukteswarji, taught me when he told me this little story about his life. When I was a little boy I took a notion that I wanted an ugly little dog belonging to a neighbor. I kept my household in turmoil for weeks to get that dog. My ears were deaf to offers of pets with more prepossessing appearance. I wanted only that dog. The same sort of fixation seizes people in so-called romance. Lovers become hypnotized by a face, they can't forget it. But the real beauty we should seek in others is not outward but inward. When your soul is filled with joy you are attractive. I like only divine smiles because without them human beings are like puppets. Today they are saying they will love you forever, tomorrow they are in the grave. Where is their great love then? Where is the promise I'll love you forever? But if you can make God say even once to you I love you, it is for eternity. Why do you waste your time for a little human love and money and this and that when in God you can find everything, all the love that is in the whole world, all the power in creation? But don't seek him for power, seek him for love. Then you will discover the chink in his armor. When you give him your unconditional love, he can no longer refuse you himself. Find bliss meditate. Meditate more. You do not know how wonderful it is. It is much greater to meditate than to spend hours seeking money or human love or anything else that you can think of. The more you meditate, and the more your mind stays centered in the spiritual state during activity, the more you will be able to smile. I am always there now, in that bliss consciousness of God. Nothing affects me, whether I am alone or with people, that joy of the Lord is always there. I have retained my smile, but to win it permanently was hard work. The same smiles are there within you. The same joy and bliss of the soul is there. 
you don't have to acquire them but rather regain them. You have merely lost them temporarily by identifying yourself with the senses. If you think that objects of sight, hearing, taste, smell, and touch will give you supreme joy, you are mightily mistaken. They will only take it away. If you put conditions around your joy, without the sight of that face I cannot be happy, you will never find unalloyed bliss. Because no sense produced pleasure is permanent. Time relentlessly works its havoc on physical beauty. Everything in the material world is subject to change. Therefore if you could see all the beautiful faces in the world, if you were to hear all the music and touch everything that you desire to, you would still not have found real happiness. You may imagine you are happy, however. Sometimes after you have dug and dug to get at some object of desire, you find no happiness in the object itself, yet you derive a certain satisfaction from the labor you have put into getting it, and you therefore think you are happy. But such satisfactions are short-lived. So do not seek your happiness in the senses. Find joy within and express it in your face. When you do that, wherever you go a little smile will surcharge everyone with your divine magnetism. Everybody will be happy. But remember it is the Lord alone who changes each heart. We must not at all ascribe to ourselves the power to do good. The only one who does good is God. It is his world. If you feel him as the indweller of this body, that it is he who works in everything, and if you give everything, both good and bad actions, to him, you will be surprised to see how all your actions gradually will be changed to good. You will not be able to do anything wrong when the consciousness of God is with you. Give your life to him. And all you do say it's you Lord, not I. Not I Lord. Destroy ego. It is a great obstruction to this liberating realization. You are not the doer. Can you lift your hand if the Lord quenches the little beam of life in your medulla oblong? Kata? How to banish external impressions. Once I was sitting outdoors at Encinitas, and it was very cold. I turned my consciousness within, and in a twinkling I couldn't feel the cold at all. Joy came over me. Once in a while I saw my surroundings melt into one light like the beam of a motion picture. If I concentrated on the picture, I saw the picture. If I concentrated on the beam, the world vanished. You cannot see anything without your consciousness. So if you have full mastery over your mind and you look within at your soul, even though your eyes are open you will see only that great light of God and feel his great joy. Only as you look outward through the eyes will your consciousness perceive the outer world. It is all God's motion picture. I could see that day in Encinitas, on one side the sensations and thoughts that were dreams of my consciousness which came from God, and on the other side, as I retired within, no sensations at all, just pure joy. And though I was sitting in that extreme cold, clad only in swim trunks, I could feel the cold and the scenery disappear and joy alone come. Later I felt the slight impressions of sensations together with that great joy. Practice this, practice the presence of God. Don't be satisfied with a little prayer or seeing a little light, and then going to bed. Sleep is a drug. If you can fairly control sex, if you can fairly control all the senses, and if you go after God with all the power of your soul, he will come to you. Even if you are a great moralist and a spiritually inclined person, without the perception of God you have very little. So do not deceive yourself. Meditate more, unceasingly and sincerely. Tell God, I know my weaknesses. But Lord, they belong to you because you created me. I have no wish for anything except to be with you, because you are the one who is showing this movie. You are free from its dual aspects of comedy and tragedy. So am I free because I am your child. Don't call yourself a sinner, nor call yourself righteous and be proud. Say rather that the Lord is with you and that he, no one else, is working through you. Then you will see a different world. Without the consciousness of God this world appears full of struggle, violence and terrible disappointments but with him it is a haven of happiness. When I was watching the motion picture, Song of Bernadette, 
I was so deeply touched by some of the events in the saint's life that I cried. At last I said, What's the matter with me? I looked at the picture again and saw only shadows and light. I lost the consciousness of drama. I couldn't cry anymore. A great joyous state came over me. The motion picture of creation. In a second God can duplicate the form of any person who has gone out of the world, He wants you to know that. He wants you to understand that this creation is a show. If you take the show seriously, you are going to get hurt and you won't like it, you won't be able to stand life with its sorrow and disease and pain. Whenever anything hurts the body, I put my mind at the seat of spiritual awareness at the point between the eyebrows, then I feel no pain at all. But when I concentrate on the hurt, I feel the delusion of pain. If you can keep your mind centered in the spiritual consciousness of your soul you will not suffer when the delusive shadows of sorrow appear on your mental screen. Pray to God unceasingly to reveal himself as the sole joyous reality. You have already lost so much time. Death may take you away at any moment, and then you won't have time to know him. You must realize him before you go out of the body cage. Tell him I want to feel your presence. But he won't let you out of this hospital of delusion permanently until you cure yourself of the disease of desires. Do everything for God. Working for him is just as important to your spiritual progress as meditation. Meditate on the Lord at night until you are uplifted in him and feel locked in his joy. And when you come down to perform activities during the day bring and keep with you the remembrance of that state. Then you will be all the time with God. And you will always be able to smile and say, A little bit of sorrow or a little bit of pleasure or a little bit of peace cannot create any tumult in the ocean of ever new bliss that fills my soul. Laugh at my delusion. Watch life as a cosmic motion picture, then it cannot work its delusive magic on you anymore. Be in God bliss. When you can stand unshaken midst the crash of breaking worlds, you shall know that God is real. He doesn't mean to hurt you. He has made you in his image. He has made you already what he is. That is what you don't realize because you acknowledge only that you are a human being. You do not know that this thought is a delusion. When you are suffering from cancer it is not fun. Yet St. Francis suffered from diseases and at the same time he was healing the sick and raising the dead. His divine joy could not be taken away. So by all means get to God. But he won't receive you until you prove to him that you do want him and that you have no desire to get mixed up in his show. Don't question God, love him. Nor should you question God. You will reap only doubt. You will not be able to understand his laws until you become one with him. So why waste time trying to understand them by an intellectual approach? If you are reading a novel in which the hero is being mistreated, the villain is winning, and each chapter seems to contradict the preceding one, you will feel frustrated and angry with the author. But when you read the last chapter you are satisfied, and you think how wonderful that novel was because it was so complex. So God is the master novelist, and one is wonderstruck at the paradoxes and intricate plot of his creation. Don't try to solve these riddles, you will be lost. When you find him in that last chapter, he will give you the solutions to all the enigmas of human life. And you won't be able to question his wisdom when you hear his replies. That I know. Live with God in your heart and have no fear in the world. Fear will be afraid of you. You will be free from this cosmic delusion. Then you will smile. I know at last the mystery of it all. But don't try to know first, love God first. Then he will tell you everything. And you can smile an eternal smile. Your thoughts, your words, your writings and everything you do will be impregnated with the joy shining in that smile. Wherever you meditate you will leave behind a fragrance of smiles, and whoever will come there will also be moved to smile with God. You can smile all the time when you dwell in his ineffable bliss. Chapter, Lord, possess us with thy love. Each of us is a child of God. We are born of his spirit in all its purity and glory and joy. That heritage is unassailable. To condemn oneself as a sinner, committed to the path of error, is the greatest of all sins. The Bible says, 
Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Always remember, your Father loves you unconditionally. But because he has given you freedom to go away from him, or to approach him, he is waiting for you to express your desire for his love before he comes to you. Once when I was meditating I heard his voice whispering, Thou dost say I am away, but thou didst not come in. That is why thou dost say I am away. I am always in. Come in and thou wilt see me. I am always here ready to greet thee. Deep sincerity is necessary in the spiritual path. In guilelessness comes the birth of spirit. Jesus said, Thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Before God our human wisdom is nothing. The only way we can coax him to surrender himself to us is by offering to him the same unconditional love that he gives to us. Everyone will eventually find salvation, but those who tarry on the way fall into the ditch of indifference. Indifference prevents man from realizing how important it is to find God now in this moment. Our great whirling planet, our human individuality, were not given to us merely that we might exist for a time and then vanish into nothingness, but that we might question what it is all about. To live without understanding the purpose of life is foolish, a waste of time. The mystery of life surrounds us. We were given intelligence in order to solve it. God is the lover behind all love. I have realized by searching for lasting love that it was someone else who cared for me through all human loves. The divine has loved me as mother, as father, and as friends. I search for that one friend behind all friends, that one lover whom I now seek glimmering in all your faces. And that friend never fails me. God is behind everything. Honor thy father and thy mother, but love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. You should understand the importance of cultivating divine friendship with him, and of not wasting any more time. How do you know when you go to sleep whether or not you will wake up? One by one we leave this earth. But there is nothing to grieve about. When we die, we are required to be reborn on earth, starting another life where we left off in this one. I behold life and death like the rise and fall of waves on the sea. At birth a wave rises from the surface, and at death it sinks into sleep in the bosom of God. I have realized this. I know I can never die, for whether I am sleeping in the ocean of spirit or awake in a physical body, I am ever with him. That supreme happiness cannot be found in the world, but we need not run away to the jungle to seek him. We can find him in this jungle of daily life, in the cave of inner silence. It doesn't matter how many mistakes you have made, they are only temporary. You are formed in the image of spirit. The Lord created this delusory motion picture of earth and all its pleasures for but one purpose, that perchance you would see through his play of Maya and forsake it to love him alone. This is the truth, it cannot be otherwise. Why are we made to feel love for our family members, only to watch them slip away one by one? These events take place to help us realize that it is He who is loving us behind all loved ones. The difficulty about this motion picture of life is that all unrealities seem real, and all realities seem unreal. Each night in sleep the world is made to disappear from our consciousness, so we might understand that the material universe is not real. This lesson of sleep comes not to frighten us, but to make us seek the reality of God. The soul can never be satisfied with anything but him and his love. His spirit is the reality that nothing else can match. Don't waste time. So many years are gone from our lives already. And only so many years, weeks, days and hours are left. Don't waste time. In your heart tell him night and day, Lord, I want thee. Never be insincere about that. Never reason, tomorrow I will seek God. Today let me have a good time. Always say, Today, my Lord, today I want thee. Just now I see the great light of God spread everywhere, such joy, such light. Lord, I bow to thee on this beautiful occasion which thou art born in us in new glory. May I always be blessed with awareness of thy presence, and may each one of us here be thus blessed, that we may all know thou art seeking to be born anew in our consciousness. 
Love him, talk to him every second of your life in activity and in silence with deep prayer with the unceasing desire of your heart, and you shall see the screen of delusion melt away. He who is playing hide and seek in the beauty of flowers, in souls, in noble passions, in dreams, shall come forth and say, You and I have been apart for a long time because I desire that you give me your love willingly. You are made in my image, and I wanted to see if you would use your freedom to give me your love. I pray that God give you the imperishable gift of his love. But without effort you won't find him. If you make 25% of the effort, the rest of it will come through God and Guru. This evening has passed like a moment, for he has been with me every second. This is what I wanted to feel, that you are showing appreciation to me merely to express your appreciation of him who sent me. May his blessings be ever with you, may his consciousness never leave you. May you realize, within and without, the fullness of his presence. Call God your own. God doesn't readily respond to us, because we are shy before him, we fail to show how much we want him. Don't be afraid of him. Call him your own and pursue him unceasingly, in thought and in action, and you shall find him to be the greatest haven of safety. I offer the bouquet of these souls to thee, O Father, that they may adorn the altar of thy presence. Be thou unceasingly with them. Father, thou art the head of this family. We are thy children gathered together to sing the glory of thy name. Banish the darkness of ignorance with thy light. Drive away all gloom from the shores of our minds with the expanding light of thy presence. Naughty or good, we are thy children. Reveal thyself unto us. Bless everyone here. Heal their kind thoughts for me. All kindness, honor, respect, and love given to me, I offer to thee, O Father. Thou art my love, my all. Bless us with thy grace. Destroy our desire for anything but thee. Be thou the king sitting on the throne of all our ambitions. Let the light of thy glory spread over the vast world. Bless us all, saturate us with thy presence. May we realize more and more that Thou hast always been ours. Thou art ours now, Thou wilt ever be ours. We thank Thee for the benediction and love Thou hast bestowed upon Thy family assembled here. May we all someday celebrate Thy birth in us in eternity, in immortality, and in unceasing joy. Pray with me, our Father, bless us that when we are free we may gather in heaven to celebrate Thy birth within us. Manifest thyself within and without. Unite us all, in the light of that union may we find thy one presence. With all the devotion of our merged hearts, of our united souls, we fall at thy feet of omnipresence. Bless us that we never be indifferent to thee. May an undying fire of love possess our hearts. We bow to thee, our Father, our very own. Thy presence be with us now and forever. Chapter, Controlling Your New Year's Destiny if you saturate with devotion a thought of God, and by your concentration impress that thought deep within you, then in the temple of superconsciousness the Lord of the universe will come to receive that loving thought. Ask God to help you fulfill all the good thoughts and resolutions that you are making now for the new year. Resolve that you are going to do just what you think you should do, and that under no circumstances are you going to be cowed into doing otherwise by your old bad habits. There was a great lesson for me in the book I have been writing. I used to write without ever reading over the manuscript, a task I always avoided. But I had to go over and over every bit of my autobiography. The Lord disciplined me, yet in a noble way, because I have enjoyed reliving those wondrous experiences as I read the account again. I have ventured many projects in this life. I have lectured, designed and built buildings, done artwork, played musical instruments, planted gardens, founded a school, but always the secret of my success was willpower. I can truthfully say that destiny is what you make it. Analyze yourself. What happened to your good intentions and noble ambitions of the past year? Did you let them die for want of dynamic will to accomplish? Make a strong determination to avoid repetition of old errors in this new year. Plan your time. Resolve that you are not going to be an automaton run by the world and by your own habits. That is not the way to true happiness. You must change. You must be able to change. 
Vague desire to improve is not enough. You have made yourself what you are now, and you can become whatever you want to be, but you have to use willpower. More confining than stone walls are the prison bars of habit. You carry this invisible prison with you wherever you go. But you can be free. Determine now to break out of the jail of habits and race for freedom. How frightful life is, that from the age of three we are limited by habit. As soon as I realized I was caged in by habit, I broke through all the bars. I would not permit myself to be bound by habits that made me say, I can't do that, or I have to do this, or don't do that to me, it makes me nervous, or I can't stand the cold, and so on. Why are these habits so strong from early childhood? Because they have been carried over from previous life experiences. Our moods are ink marks traced on the graph of life by the karma of the past. Wrong habits and moods are more offensive than the odor of the skunk. Why behave like a human polecat, making everyone else uncomfortable and punishing yourself as well? At one time or another we all have done so because we all have carried with us obnoxious peculiarities. Reclaim your lost divinity. But we can overcome undesirable traits. The human mind is elastic. If you pull it gradually it will yield to your tugs. Yet you don't even try. God has given us more than enough power to overcome all the trials and shortcomings of our lives. St. Francis, though ill and sightless, could heal the sick and raise the dead. Outwardly blind, inwardly he beheld the great light of the universe. God puts his true children such as St. Francis to greater tests than he gives to ordinary people. But no one passes through the gates of freedom until he has passed all God's tests until he has learned to live like a true son of God. Why should you think of yourself as a weak mortal? You are potentially a son of God. You do not have to acquire anything. You have only to know. To try to be a millionaire in this incarnation is really much more difficult than to be a true son of God. Earthly environment is so limited that many people die without having become what they want to be. But to know God is possible in one lifetime because you don't have to acquire Him, He is already your own. Even if everyone were to pray day and night to become as rich as Henry Ford, their prayers could not be granted because earth is not a place where everybody can be a Henry Ford. But everyone can be rich in spirit, for God has given everyone equal power to become like Him. When you claim your divinity, everything belongs to you. A Henry Ford might lose his wealth or his health, but a Jesus Christ can create health or wealth or anything else he wants at will. So don't long to be as rich or as healthy as someone else, have only one desire, to be like God. Jesus never claimed that he was the only Son of God. The Father loves you, his child, just as much as he loves Jesus. And God won't deny you anything if, like Jesus, you establish your true status with him. Meditation is the way to reclaim your lost divinity. Habits are graphs on our real nature, which is ever free spirit. In my childhood, I used to get very angry, but when I made up my mind not to, I never again gave in to anger. If I hadn't used my will, I wouldn't have been able to accomplish that or anything else in this life. You too can use your will. The errors of a lifetime can be corrected today. Make a resolution in this new year to realize the truth that although as a mortal man you have certain habits, as a divine being you are free. Why should you lie to yourself? Why should you ascribe to yourself the faults of the past? You must destroy them. Otherwise they will become grafts on your tree of life. You must not allow that. Affirm again and again, I am a child of God. I am one with God. Apply will and discrimination to resolution. Every strong resolution you make with great determination can become a habit at once. Why should you not be able to do what you wish guided by reason? You must try. Away with all your faults. Review your actions of the past year. See what troublesome habits you may have displayed. Perhaps you fight with people where you eat too much or you are jealous. Make up your mind today and know that you are never going to do those things again. Just say to yourself, Paramahansaji said he had an aversion to editing, but he became an editor, and if he could make himself an editor, I can do this. Why couldn't you? 
Everything I have tried to do with willpower has worked. And I give you hope that if you make up your mind, you too will succeed. God has given you the power to dynamite your troubles. Beware, O ye mountains, stand not in my way. Your ribs will be shattered and tattered today. Those words are from a song by a great Swami. In another part he sang, I hitched to my chariot the fates and the gods. The Romans used to tie prisoners to chariots and drag them on the ground, a terrible practice. Yet in it is a lesson for us, for we allow our habits to treat us in the same way. We should make habits our prisoners rather than our captors, hitching them to the chariot of our will. We should drive them instead of letting them drag us. To be able to do whatever we know we should do, not merely that which we whimsically want to do, is to be really free. Learn to discriminate in this new year. Examine every impulse that comes to see if it is the right thing for you to act on. And when your reason tells you to do a certain thing, let neither the fates nor the gods stand in your way. But if you find out that you are wrong, be able to change your mind. Some people are so stubborn, they do not want to admit they are wrong. But one should be guided by reason, not by blind will. If after calmly reasoning, you make up your mind that what you have set out to do is right, then nobody should be able to stop you. If I had no job, I would shake up the whole world until people would say, give him a job to keep him quiet. I do not say these things out of personal pride, but that you may learn from my experiences. Work of any kind, if done in the right spirit, gives you victory over yourself. You may clean bathrooms, but if you do it with the thought of serving and helping people, you are showing the right spirit of a man of God. The attitude with which you work is what counts. Mental laziness and working unwillingly spoil one. People often ask me, how do you do so many things? It is because I do everything with the greatest pleasure and spirit of service. Inwardly I am all the time with God. And though I sleep very little I always feel fresh because I perform my duties with the right attitude, that it is a privilege to serve. You must realize that you are a child of God. Make up your mind that you are not going to be run by that old habit-bound self. The temporary limitations and imperfections of the body and brain cannot hold you back. As soon as you give the verdict and strongly will to be a new person, you will change. You have been a prisoner of your habits and it has not been good for you. It is because of wrong habits of thinking and acting in this and in other lives that your bodily kingdom yields now to invasions of disease, troubles, moods, and ignorance. From now on you must say, I am not the slave of the body. I am the dictator of my own kingdom. My thoughts are going to be exactly as I wish them to be. Once you have changed your habits, you will say to yourself how simple it was to do it. How unkind I have been to myself by not exchanging my soul stultifying habits for those that bring happiness. Are you a psychological antique? Habit-bound people can best be described as psychological antiques. They are the same year in and year out. They say the same old things, do the same old things. Converse with them just a little while and you can anticipate exactly what their next remark will be. Take a look in the mirror of introspection and see if you are a psychological antique. Most people are. But why should you be one? Change your habits. Cast out moods. Try to be better every day. Let people be able to say, what a wonderful change has come over him. The man of self-realization has achieved mastery over the old habit dulled self. Recognizing such mastery in Jesus, the officers who had been sent by the Pharisees to arrest him came away marveling instead at his assurance, saying, Never man spake like this man. A master's nature is infinite. It cannot be contained in the narrow confines of human conceptions. Every time I thought I had succeeded in categorizing my guru Swami Sri Yukteswarji, I found him to be different, greater, non-classifiable. Sometime you have to break the habit of attachment to the mortal body and get back to God. There is no alternative. You are a prodigal son here on earth. Your infinite nature must be rediscovered. You will never be happy so long as you remain habit-mired in ignorance of your eternal soul nature. It does not matter who you are, 
the only way you can find lasting joy is to go back to God. You do not have to leave earth's shores and put on wings. You must learn rather to be happy here and now, under all conditions, and to include others' happiness in your own joy. Go out of your way to make others happy. You cannot please everybody, but to those souls who cross your path, give kindness and love. There is no more liberating action than sincerely to give people kindness in return for unkindness. Why not be like a flower that gives fragrance even when crushed in the hand? The Gita teaches, he who is free from hatred toward all creatures is friendly and kind to all, is dear to me. If people criticize you, do not ignore them. See if you have the fault they ascribe to you, and if you do silently correct your error. But it is seldom necessary to confess your faults to others, often it is unwise. Should they become angry with you, they might unkindly hold your confession over your head as a threat. To a God-realized spiritual teacher or guru you can tell your faults, but not to someone who cannot help you and who might instead hurt you by broadcasting your flaws to others. A stream of divine power. Learn to mix with good people. The faces of many of you who come here have become more spiritual. And the more you are in tune with me and refrain from fussing about little things, the better you will be. A steady stream of divine power will flow to you for the Great One sent me here. When I am gone you will realize this truth with greater impact. I am here only to deliver their message. Little by little a spiritual change will come to the true followers of this path, and their influence will spread over the world. Self-realization is one of the greatest spiritual movements ever sent to help mankind. It has been blessed by the Great Ones, Mahavadar Babaiji, Lahiri Mahaseya Sri Yukteswar, in communion with Christ and Krishna. The grace of these masters is not gone from the earth. They are waiting to help you and to help the world, but they can work only through the free choice of man. The world has gone mad with hate and war, but Jesus' way of brotherly love is the solution to the world's problems. We can make this world proof against war by following his teachings as he meant us to. On this last meditation day, Christ came to me several times, first as a little child, then as a grown man, and finally as he looked before his crucifixion. I had been thinking that I would have to meditate long before he would come to me. And he surprised me. God was showing me through this experience that no further effort is needed once you have convinced him that you want him more than all the gifts of the world. Then he takes away the screen of mystery and comes to you as Christ or Krishna or Babaji or as any great incarnation in whose form you desire to behold him. Make up your mind that in this new year you are going to be more Christ-like in your behavior. You must make the effort now. You must meditate more. Self-realization fellowship was not brought into existence merely to give glimpses of God through words, but that you might know him through your own experience. We teach that true fellowship with man can come only after one has gained experience of God. If you contact God within yourself, you will know that he is in everyone, that he has become the children of all races. Then you cannot be an enemy to anyone. If the whole world could love with that universal love there would be no need for men to arm themselves against one another. By our own Christ-like example we must bring unity among all religions, all nations, all races. We must train ourselves to plain living and high thinking. It would be good if each family had a small garden in which to grow some of their food. Live more simply so that you can find time to enjoy the little pleasures of life. Man races through his span, working, eating, sleeping, and that is about all he accomplishes. Eliminate any habit or activity that disturbs your mental peace and happiness. In this new year, resolve to cast out from the temple of your mind all the devils of bad habits, to plan your life so that you can do all the things you want to do. If it is happiness you want have it, there is nothing that can stop you. You are an immortal child of God, and all the difficulties that visit you are meant only to stimulate you to higher achievements. The best resolution, give more time to God. Choose which habits you are going to destroy in the new year. Make up your mind about them and stick to your decision. Resolve to give more time to God, 
to meditate regularly every day and on one night each week to meditate several hours so that you can feel your spiritual progress in God. Resolve that you are going to practice Kriya Yoga regularly and that you are going to control your appetites and emotions. Be a master. Make up your mind strongly now. Think of the good resolutions you have made in the past, that you are not going to be dictated to by your old habits and thoughts. But have you kept them? It is an insult to your soul and to God to give in to your weaknesses. Be master of yourself, captain of your destiny. Danger and you were born together, and you are the elder brother, more dangerous than danger. Do not lose the courage and determination that you feel as you listen to me now. Pray with me, Heavenly Father, give us the strength to carry out all our good resolutions in the new year. May we always please thee by our actions. Our spirits are willing. Help us to materialize all our worthy wishes in the new year. We will reason, we will will, we will act, but guide thou our reason, will, and activity to the right thing that we should do in everything. Alm. Peace. Amen. Chapter, How to Outwit Temptation. Satan or cosmic delusion is always snaring us through our ignorance. That is how he obstructs God. The Lord could easily destroy Satan, but prefers to overcome him by love. Whenever we choose the divine offerings of eternal joy instead of the passing pleasures of the senses, the adversary is robbed of his dark power. So it is up to us to cooperate with our Heavenly Father, that the devil may be vanquished. Whenever you are slothful and careless, you help Satan to pull you toward his side. Jesus prayed, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Temptation is not our own creation. It belongs to the world of Maya, and all men are subject to it. But to enable us to free ourselves, God gave us reason, conscience, and will power. To give our approval to sinful activities is to find ourselves in trouble. When by our wrong thoughts we fall into the pit of error, we should pray, Father, leave us not here, but pull us out through the force of our reason and will. And when we are out, if it is thy will to test us further, first make thyself known to us, that we may realize that thou art more tempting than temptation. So long as you feel unwilling to deny yourself some particular pleasure that is detrimental to your welfare, you are in the region of Satan. The evil results of succumbing to harmful sense lures will at one time or another overtake you. But if you are convinced that temptation is dangerous to you because it promises happiness and in the end gives sorrow, you can outwit the devil. Why sense experiences are alluring. Temptations are alluring, there is no doubt about that. Our sensory powers are all directed to the outer world. There is a current of life energy flowing from the brain through the nerves into the eyes, ears, nose, tongue and skin. The sensations we experience through these instruments are the result of this outward flowing current, and we tend to like the feeling. That is the appeal of the senses. Overindulging them is dangerous. Until a man is established in wisdom, the outgoing energy leads him into sense bondage. By the five-rayed searchlight of the senses, we perceive and explore the world of matter. Through the senses we learn to like things that are pleasing to see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. The desire for a particular sensation becomes a habit. The trouble is most people have not had any experience of the spirit, which is hidden behind matter. Hence they have no standard of comparison between the exciting, pleasurable perceptions of the senses and the unknown ineffable bliss of the soul and there is no chance to compare until one has renounced or become mentally insusceptible to all sense enticements. The only way to avoid the trap is to realize by reason or experience that there are higher joys. Habit is a pitiless dictator. Commandments to refrain from harmful experiences are generally futile. Whenever you order a person not to do something, he immediately wants to do it. The taste of forbidden fruits is sweet in the beginning, but in the end bitter. Yet no matter how much suffering people experience, they go on doing the same self-harming things. Once you have established a liking for a certain sensory experience, 
the habit sits like a dictator in the brain and commands you to indulge yourself, even though it is against your best interests. You don't want to repeat an act and yet you do it. Try never to let yourself reach a point where you become such a victim of wrong habits. You must be the master of yourself. Do not let any habit control you. Whenever the desire for a particular sensory experience becomes habitual, it is time to stop that practice. I used to be fond of ginger ale because it reminded me of our lemonade in India. Some students arranged to have this beverage on hand for me wherever I went. One day I found my supply was all gone and I missed it. Mr. Ginger Ale, I said, you have gone too far and I hadn't even realized it. Goodbye. The next day I purposely drank a little ginger ale as a test and it tasted terrible. My thought of the previous day had been so strong that the desire was banished immediately. I never miss anything that is taken away from me or that I voluntarily give up. No physical comfort can bind me. I have tried it out. You must be able to pass through all experiences of life without attachment. Lord Krishna said, the man of self-control, roaming among material objects with subjugated senses and devoid of attraction and repulsion, attains an unshakable inner calmness. Any time you have to have something, a soft bed, a pillow, or whatever, remember that you are putting yourself into slavery. And when your will and discrimination are held captive by binding sense attachments, you will lose the infinite kingdom of God. Jesus is still enjoying the transcendental ecstasy that he experienced when he resurrected himself in the Lord. But those who exist in ignorance, subject to the pressures of desires, will continue that way life after life until they resist worldly seductions. You should be careful not to let anything hurt your true happiness. Corroding emotions of anger, greed, and jealousy, and overstimulation by sex, alcohol, or drugs are extremely detrimental to you, for they prevent the realization of soul joy. Never abuse the sensory powers by overindulgence, if you would be really happy. Ever fed, never satisfied. Never fed, ever satisfied is a true axiom about unwholesome sense experiences. Wisdom is man's best protection. Hit yourself within the fortress of wisdom. There is no greater safety. Complete understanding will bring you to a point where nothing can hurt you. But until you have attained wisdom, when temptation comes you must first stop the action or urge, and then reason. If you try to reason first, you will be compelled in spite of yourself to do the thing that you don't want to do because temptation will overcome all reason. Just say no. And get up and go away. That is the surest way to escape the devil. The more you develop this will power during the intrusion of temptation, the happier you will be, for all joy depends on the ability to do that which conscience tells you you should do. Don't let your environment and sensory desires control you. Virtue and spiritual living are far more charming than sensual indulgence, but the habit chains of temptation hold people fast. If the Lord once tempted you with his love, you would want nothing more. Nothing else would interest you. When you are convinced that he is the most desirable treasure, nothing on the material plane can ever again tempt you and overcome your power of discrimination. To know God is the only worthwhile ambition to have, because he is happiness everlasting. We should want him because he is the panacea for all our suffering. He is the answer to all our needs. The very things that our hearts cry for, love, fame, wisdom, everything else, we find in communion with that complete one. Even if you are the most famous man in the world, death will be the end of your awareness of fame. You will not know then that people adore you. But Jesus is aware that his devotees love him, because his consciousness is one with the consciousness of God manifesting throughout creation, the Christ intelligence, omnipresent, omniscient, ever-living. So why strive hard to have something you will lose just as you cross the portals of the grave? Money, fame, prestige, sense indulgence, material comfort. These are all pseudo-pleasures offered by Satan in place of the real joy of divine communion. Remember that temptation is powerful only because you have no sense of comparison with anything better. 
When you are strongly tempted, your wisdom is momentarily a prisoner of your desires and habits. But the highest way to freedom is to be so merged in the inexhaustible joy of God that you are able to relinquish all worldly pleasures in an instant. If you find true joy in this life, you will have it now and in the afterlife too. Which do you want? God's eternal bliss, which may be yours by denying yourself a few pleasures now, or worldly happiness now, which will not last. Convince your heart by comparison. Every effort that you make to climb upward will be recognized by God. Even if you are the greatest sinner, forget it. Don't think of yourself as a sinner. You are a child of the Heavenly Father. No matter if you are the greatest sinner, forget it. If you have made up your mind to be good, then you are no longer a sinner. Even a constant evildoer who turns away from all else to worship me exclusively may be counted among the good because of his righteous resolve. He will fast become a virtuous man and obtain unending peace. Tell all assuredly, O Arjuna, that my devotee never perishes. Start with a clean slate and say, I have always been good, I was only dreaming that I was bad. It is true, evil is a nightmare and does not belong to the soul. Temptation is sugar-coated poison, it tastes delicious but death is certain. The happiness that people look for in this world does not endure. Divine joy is eternal. Yearn for that which is lasting, and be hard-hearted about rejecting the impermanent pleasures of life. You have to be that way. Don't let the world rule you. Never forget that the Lord is the only reality. The real love of your cosmic Father is playing hide and seek with you in your heart. Your true happiness lies in your experience of Him. Man is sunk in a dream of ignorance, imagining that he is suffering with illness and sorrow and poverty. Once when King Janaka, a great Indian saint, was deep in prayer, he suddenly exclaimed, Who is in my temple today? I thought it was myself, but I see the Eternal is there. And the little self, this body bundle of bones, is not I. It is the infinite that is in my body. I bow to myself. I offer flowers to myself. Someday that realization will come to you, and you will no longer think you are a mortal, a man or a woman. You will know that you are a soul made in the divine image, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. The soul is bound to the body by a chain of desires, temptations, troubles and worries, and it is trying to free itself. If you keep tugging at that chain which is holding you to mortal consciousness, Someday an invisible divine hand will intervene and snap it apart, and you will be free. Protect yourself against temptation and sorrow by reason and by communion with God. In the Bhagavad Gita the Lord says, The ignorant, oblivious of my transcendental nature as the maker of all creatures discount also my presence within the human form. Meditation is simply reminding yourself again and again that you are not the limited physical body, but the infinite spirit. Meditation is arousing the memory of your real self and forgetting what you imagine you are. If a drunken prince goes into the slums and forgetting entirely his true identity, begins lamenting, how poor I am, his friends will laugh at him and say, wake up and remember that you are a prince. You have been likewise in a state of hallucination, thinking you are a helpless mortal, struggling and miserable. Every day you should sit quietly and affirm with deep conviction, No birth, no death, no caste have I, father, mother, have I none. Less spirit I am he. I am the infinite happiness. If you again and again repeat these thoughts day and night, you will eventually realize what you really are, an immortal soul. Fix your mind in the divine consciousness of meditation. Temptation, greed, attachment to people and possessions, slavery to the senses, ignorance of your spirit nature, idleness and mechanical living are the worst enemies of your happiness. Be busy working with your mind fixed in the divine consciousness that is cultivated by meditation, for then you will be really happy and you will be really living. When I started meditating, I could not imagine that I would ever find such joy in it. But as time went on, the more I meditated, the greater became my peace and bliss. If you are getting tired of the life you are leading, 
and yet you go on filling it with more possessions and more desires for new experiences, you are on the wrong road. The surest way to avoid temptation is to lead a natural life, a life in harmony with God. Don't lead an unnatural existence, restlessly seeking happiness from a world that is powerless to bestow it. Life is too precious. Every day I pray to Him, take everything away from me if it is your desire. I am trying to do my best, Father, but know this for certain. Above all, I want to please you. I will try to please others, too, but more than anything else, I want to please you. When you pray like that, you may suffer many tests of desires. But as you go on fighting wrong habits and tendencies, he begins gradually to come upon you. Finally, you will see that like a great flood, he has swept away all your undesirable traits. Krishna said, The man who physically fasts from sense objects finds that the sense objects fall away for a little while, leaving behind only the longing for them. But he who beholds the Supreme is freed even from longings. Banish all darkness by his light and evil thoughts by good thoughts. Eliminate temptation by discovering God's superior attraction in meditation. That is the best weapon against temptation. Any time you feel that your will is being overpowered, meditate until you feel the Divine Presence. Chapter Curing Mental Alcoholics The individual who drinks too much forms a pernicious habit. If he makes no effort to curb his indulgence in liquors, he may become an alcoholic and helplessly suffer from an overwhelming desire to drink without any limit, without rhyme or reason. Such unfortunate people often spend all their money on drink. They eat very little and seem to get some nourishment from the liquor itself. The normal sense of responsibility toward maintaining good health and an honorable standing in the family, society, and the world is lost. They may eventually lose all sense of pride and be picked up dead drunk anywhere, in a ditch or in the middle of the street, exposed meanwhile to the dangers of being robbed or run over. The foregoing description of liquor alcoholics serves to illustrate what I mean by mental alcoholics. The latter may be individually classified according to their particular psychological extreme which might be chronic anger, fear, sex, sadism, gambling, stealing, jealousy, hate, greed, moods, craftiness, or stupidity. When from the very beginning of life a person displays extraordinary tantrums of anger, fear, jealousy, or any other of the aforementioned characteristics, then one may know that he has acquired those abnormal mental habits in a previous existence. Parents who notice any such evil psychological tendencies in their child, even in its infancy, should get busy and take some steps to prevent the child from becoming a psychological alcoholic, if possible by placing him in another environment under the good care of spiritual teachers. Through continued good company and proper environment for many years, a mental alcoholic may become free from the octopus grip of the inborn evil. While the mental alcoholic is receiving thoughtful care in a good environment, the evil consequences of his bad habits should be explained to him, and he should be encouraged to reason with himself about them and to make a distinct effort not to display them under any circumstances. Each indulgence in a prenatally acquired mental habit makes it stronger and stronger until the possessor becomes literally a slave to it. A false conception. The angry man, the sexual man, the greedy man forgets his own position and his relations with society and commits great blunders that ruin his life and the lives of others. Many of these mental alcoholics think that if they give expression to their psychological habits, they will feel somewhat relieved. But the self-indulgent habit of giving in to harmful impulses is extremely pernicious, for it is by repetition of such evil expressions that a person becomes a chronic mental alcoholic, making a fool of himself anytime and anywhere. If children are exposed to an evil environment while their minds are in a plastic state, they will develop wrong habits that unchecked may lead to chronic mental alcoholism. Parents who notice a sudden change in a child, perhaps a calm-natured boy suddenly turns into a repeatedly angry boy, should immediately take care of this. The causes of his frustrations should be determined and removed, and new avenues for constructive use of his energies sought. 
Those who habitually display any of the foregoing traits are mental alcoholics. They recklessly ride down the Niagara Falls of continuous bad habits, smashing their happiness to pieces as they helplessly but willingly indulge in uncontrolled expression of their worst traits. It is not good to remonstrate with mental alcoholics who frequently display violent moods of disgust and boredom with the world. Their attitude is a result of their continuous repetition of wrong habits. They should be treated as psychological patients suffering from chronic mental diseases. Counteractive Influences A change of company is the best remedy for acute mental alcoholism of any kind, for the will of the mental alcoholic has become a slave to habit, hence he has no resistance whatsoever to evil. The most effective cure is to move him immediately to an environment that will be a specific antidote to his toxic mental condition. If possible, the angry mental alcoholic should be placed with one or more individuals who do not become angry even under irritating circumstances. The sexual person ought to be surrounded by self-controlled people. The habitual thief needs the society of honest people. Chronically timid can be helped by association with the brave and by reading stories of men who are heroes. Moody or scornful or sour puss types should have the companionship of habitually cheerful people. A mental alcoholic should remember that poor elimination, and eating meat, beef and pork especially, will aggravate his psychological malady, fixing it even more firmly in his brain. An abundance of fruits and vegetables in the daily diet, and each week a one-day fast on fruit juices, with a longer fast occasionally, will greatly help to change the cerebral grooves that entrench the pernicious habits. Sexual excess impairs the nervous system and the brain cells, which in turn aggravates anger in a mental alcoholic. Overindulgence in sex destroys willpower also. Hence all mental alcoholics should learn control over the sex impulse, that they may practice moderation in marital relations, as nature intended. Petty Dictators Often we find that the breadwinners in a family, father or son, or sometimes mother or daughter, display a tendency toward mental alcoholism because of the consciousness that they are in a position to dictate. Such little dictators and families should not freely unload their moods on innocent, harmless dependents, and thus lose the inner respect of those around them. When a family dictator thinks he can get away with doing what he pleases at home, he gradually begins to do what he pleases in expressing unpleasant moods or evil traits outside the family. Eventually he does this any time and anywhere. If petty family tyrants don't check their indulgence in these sadistic habits, they gradually become mental alcoholics, behaving immaturely and causing untold trouble to those who are closely or even casually associated with them, as well as to themselves. If you are a mental alcoholic, try to cure yourself, but meanwhile refrain at least from trying to infect or influence others. For whether or not you succeed, you will probably cause yourself added trouble. Think what pandemonium would break loose if suddenly somebody dropped a skunk in your peaceful home where you had been sitting quietly meditating or reading a book by the fireplace. You and those around you would no doubt try to evict the skunk and in so doing be drenched with its malodorous chemicals. Both the family and the skunk would suffer. So it is not wise for a human skunk to enter an environment where he is unwanted. He is likely to cause trouble for everyone around him, and in the end may suffer harsh treatment. Please remember that a human skunk carrying a mental vibration of terrible moods, and the reflection of it on his face, creates incalculable harm in peaceful environments. This biped is unwanted anywhere. It is better even to hide mental alcoholism than to give in to its influence in public. Continued shameless indulgence is the soil in which prenatal or postnatal tendencies thrive. The individual who is prenatally disposed to mental alcoholism must be doubly careful not to live in an environment that waters the innate psychological seeds of his bad habits or moods. Of course, when you meet a person who treats you formally and with a galvanized smile says, How do you do? I am awfully delighted to see you while inside he is thinking, I could cheerfully chop off your head for disturbing me, 
you sense his inner feeling and you don't like it. I myself like to know where I stand with people. I prefer blunt treatment to hypocritical behavior. No one likes to risk having the snake of insincerity dart out at him from under a rosebush of smiles. However, it is better for a mental alcoholic to be friendly toward people, even if hypocritically, than to vent on them his evil moods. Self-control practice daily, even in insignificant matters, will help the mental alcoholic to come out of his drunken indulgences little by little. Chapter, Overcoming Malignant Moods Moods are not easily defined, but you know what they are. When you are in a mood, your behavior is not natural, you are not the person you should be. The end result is that you feel wretched. And how foolish it is to be unhappy through your own doing. Nobody likes misery. Why not analyze yourself next time you are in a mood? You will see how you are willingly, willfully making yourself miserable. And while you are doing so, others around you feel the unpleasantness of your state of mind. Wherever you go, you tell about yourself without speaking because your whole mood carries its vibrations in your eyes and anyone looking at you is aware of the negativity recorded there. Seeing the dark feelings reflected in your eyes, others are repelled. They want to stay away from those discomforting vibrations. You must remove moods from your mental mirror before you can remove their reflection from your eyes. We live in a glass house. You are living in the glass house of this world, and everyone else is watching you. You cannot pose, you have to live a natural life. So why not behave in such a way that others will look up to you? Why should they not see joy in your face? All your good qualities are covered up inside by your moodiness. Not only are others observing how you conduct yourself, you also are studying how they behave. Because you tend to make comparisons as a result of constantly watching those around you, you fall into moods. Or you may become moody over the endless difficulties one encounters in this world. Moods are often a result of environment, mental influences. Each one of us is affected in different ways by the world about us. But you should not allow yourself to indulge in moods over external conditions. Why should you take on the effects of your environment? There are people who resort to moods in an attempt to avoid facing some problem. But moodiness is neither an escape nor an emotional safety valve. It is natural now and then to fall momentarily into a mood, but don't hold on to it. Each type of mood has a specific cause, and it lies within your own mind. To remove a mood you must remove its cause. One should introspect each day in order to understand the nature of his mood and how to correct it if it is a harmful one. Perhaps you find yourself in an indifferent state of mind. No matter what is suggested, you are not interested. It is necessary then to make a conscious effort to create some positive interest. Beware of indifference which ossifies your progress in life by paralyzing your willpower. Perhaps your mood is discouragement over sickness, a feeling that you will never regain health. You must try to apply the laws of right living that lead to a healthy active and moral life and pray for greater faith in the healing power of God. Or suppose your mood is a conviction that you are a failure and can never succeed at anything. Analyze the problem and see if you have really made all the effort you could have. Consider the hard work of the President of the United States. He has to try to please all the 48 states and other nations as well. We have to marvel that it is possible for a man to understand so much and undertake so much. And as there is such a difference between the working capacity of the ordinary man and that of the President, how much greater the difference between that of the President and God, who is infinitely busier. God is managing the whole universe, down to the most minute detail, and we are made in His image. Therefore we cannot make excuses for failure to succeed. Don't be afraid of hard work, it has never hurt anyone. However, one should learn to work and to think calmly. When you are calmly active you can accomplish anything you set out to do, for the mind is clear. In addition to not working hard enough for success, most people are not mentally active enough. They spend too much time not thinking. It is considered to be relaxation. However, in true relaxation one is calmly active mentally. He may reflect about God, 
or about a beautiful peaceful scene, or about some pleasant experience. Calm, positive mental activity is revivifying. Yet many people wrongly associate creative effort with strain and go about it with a tense, nervous attitude. Moods get their grip on a vacant mind. Creative thinking is the best antidote for moods. Moods get their grip on your consciousness when you are in a negative or passive state of mind. The time when your mind is vacant is just the time it can become moody, and when you are moody, the devil comes and wields his influence on you. Therefore, develop creative thinking. Whenever you are not active physically, do something creative in your mind. Keep it so busy that you have no time to indulge in moodiness. Creative thinking is marvelous, like living in another world. Everyone should develop this power. I think hardly a word of my lecture before I come here, but I get into the consciousness of my subject and my soul begins to tell me wonderful things. When you are thinking creatively, you don't feel the body or moods, you become attuned with spirit. Our human intelligence is made in the image of his creative intelligence, through which all things are possible, and if we don't live in that consciousness, we become a bundle of moods. By thinking creatively we destroy those moods, and by thinking creatively we will find all the answers to our problems and to the problems of others. Moods are like cancer, they eat into the peace of the soul. That is why the moody man cannot rid himself of his troubles. Remember, no matter how wrong everything has gone for you, you have no right to be moody. In your mind you can be a conqueror. When bested, the moody man admits defeat. The man whose mind remains unconquered, though the world be in cinders at his feet, is yet the victor. Do you want to be a prisoner or a conqueror? By binding yourself so tightly in moods, you render yourself incapable of going on with the battle of life. As soon as you allow a mood to enwrap your mind, your will becomes paralyzed. Moods befog the brain and hence impair judgment so that your efforts are wasted. Moods are the brakes on your wheels of progress. You can conquer your moods no matter how terrible they seem. Make up your mind that you are not going to be moody anymore, and if a mood comes in spite of your resolve, analyze the cause that brought it on, and do something constructive about it. Don't go on doing things in a state of indifference, if that is your attitude, for indifference is the worst of all moods. At such times remind yourself that you are not your own creator, God created you, and he is running this universe for you. Whatever your work do it enthusiastically for him. Busy yourself in creative activities, for he has given you infinite power. How dare you make yourself a mental failure by indulgence in the intoxicant of moodiness. Free yourself from these devastating mental states. They are the real brakes on the wheels of your progress. Until you release them, you cannot move on. Every morning remind yourself that you are God's child, and that no matter what the difficulties, you have the power to overcome them. Heir to the cosmic power of spirit, you are more dangerous than danger. An intelligent boy does not care to work on simple problems, he enjoys the challenge of difficult ones. But many people are afraid of life's problems. I have never feared them, for I have always prayed, Lord may thy power increase in me. Keep me in the positive consciousness, that with thy help I can always overcome my difficulties. Think constructively about a problem till you cannot think any more. When I am solving a problem, I go to the NTH degree to cover all possible steps toward its solution, until I can honestly say, I have done my best, and that is all I can do. Then I forget it. A person who keeps the worry of a problem in his consciousness becomes moody. Avoid that. When a problem comes up, instead of dwelling on it, think of every possible avenue of action to rid yourself of it. If you are unable to think, compare your particular trouble with others' similar troubles, and from their experiences learn which ways lead to failure and which ways lead to success. Choose those steps that seem logical and practical, and then get busy implementing them. The whole library of the universe is hidden within you. All the things you want to know are within yourself. To bring them out think creatively. Magical effect of sincere love. 
Moods blunt one's feelings and understanding, making it impossible to get along with others. Domestic life should be a temple of heaven, but moods can make it a Hades. A husband comes home and finds his wife in a sullen mood and he can't reason with her. Or he returns from work in a nasty mood and she can't reason with him. So much trouble comes to people because of moods. When someone else in your family is seething with anger, or is wholly indifferent, you are affected immediately by his mood. Or perhaps you go to someone in great joy, but he is moody and quarrelsome and finally he gives you a slap. Immediately your joy vanishes and you want to retaliate. Do not put on the mood of another. The Bible tells us that if anyone smites us on the left cheek, we should turn the right cheek. How many do that? More often, the person slapped wants to give his assailant twelve slaps in reprisal, and perhaps a kick or even a bullet. It is easy to strike back, but to give love is the highest way to try to disarm your persecutor. Even if it doesn't work at the time, he will never be able to forget that when he gave you a slap, you gave love in return. That love must be sincere. When it comes from the heart, love is magical. You should not look for the effects, even if your love is spurned, pay no attention. Give love and forget. Don't expect anything, then you will see the magical result. Do you realize that within you in your soul is a superb garden? A wondrous garden of thoughts, fragrant with love, goodness, understanding and peace and more beautiful than any earthly flowers that grow. You cultivated a fragrant blossom whenever someone in anger misunderstood you and you continuously gave love to him. Isn't the aroma of that love and understanding more lasting than that of any rose? So always think of your mind as a garden and keep it beautiful and fragrant with divine thoughts. Let it not become a mud pond, rank with malodorous hateful moods. If you cultivate the heavenly scented blooms of peace and love, the bee of Christ consciousness will steal into your garden. As the bee seeks out only those flowers that are sweet with honey, so God comes only when your life is sweet with honeyed thoughts. Resolve that in your garden of good soul qualities you will not allow the evil stinkweed of anger to grow. The more you develop flower-like divine qualities, the more God will reveal to you his secret omnipresence in your soul. He who is tranquil before friend and foe alike, and in encountering adoration and insult, and during the experiences of warmth and chill and of pleasure and suffering, that person is dear to me. By continuously giving love to those who are unkind, peace to those who are harassed by worries, sweetness to those who are bitter, joy to those who are laden with miseries, and by constantly setting a better example for those who follow the path of error, you destroy moods by keeping the mind creatively busy. If you can't be busy outwardly, be constructively busy inwardly. Live in a world of wonder. I often say, if you read for one hour, write for two hours, and if you write for two hours, think for three hours, and if you think for three hours, meditate all the time. God is the repository of all happiness, and you can contact him in everyday life. Yet man mostly occupies himself in pursuits that lead to unhappiness. Meditation is the best way to destroy moods and live in a world of wonder, a world such as Narada, a great Rishi knew when he said, Lord, I was singing thy praises and became lost in thee. When I came back to this consciousness, I saw that I had slipped from my old body and you had given me a new one. A similar story is told in India about another saint. A young man had just died. His body had been carried to the cremation grounds and the mourners were preparing to light the fire when suddenly an old man came running, crying out, Stop! Don't do it, I will use that body. As soon as he said this, the man's aged body dropped lifeless to the ground, and the young man got up from the pyre and ran off toward the forest. The old man was a great saint. He had simply not wished to interrupt his devotions by taking rebirth in an infant's helpless body. Fear enters when God is shut out of life. There are so many wondrous things to know about life and death, and meditation is the way. Learn to live in this world as a son of God. Death holds terror for man because he has left God out of his life. All painful things frighten us, because we love the world without understanding its mystery and purpose. 
but when we behold everything as God we have nothing to fear. We are constantly born in life as well as death. The word death is a great misnomer, for there is no death. When you are tired of life, you simply take off the overcoat of flesh and go back to the astral world. Death means an end. A car whose parts are worn out is dead. It has come to an end. And so at death the physical body comes to an end. The immortal soul cannot be dead. Every night in sleep, the soul lives without any consciousness of the physical body, but it is not dead. Death is only a greater sleep, wherein the soul lives in the astral body without the consciousness of the physical body. If loss of physical body consciousness signified death for man, then the soul would die when we go to sleep. But we are not dead when we are asleep, nor are we completely unconscious because when we awaken, we remember whether we slept well or not. So, in the after state of death we do not die. Those who allow their minds to ossify are truly dying. To solve the mystery of life you must be born anew every day. This means you must strive daily to improve yourself in some way. Above all, pray for wisdom, because with wisdom everything else comes. Be controlled not by moods but by wisdom. And with that wisdom, develop creative thinking and activity. Keep busy doing constructive things for your own self-improvement and for the benefit of others, for whoever would enter God's kingdom must try also to do good for others every day. If you follow this pattern, you will feel the mood dispelling joy of knowing you are advancing mentally, physically and spiritually. You will surely reach God, for that way leads to the kingdom of heaven. Drive continuously to overcome moods, for as soon as you feel moody, you are cultivating seeds of error in the soil of your soul. To indulge in moods is to die gradually, but if you try daily to be cheerful in spite of any upsetting experiences, you will have a new birth. Until this human birth becomes transmuted into a highly spiritual birth, you cannot be born again in God. Moods are catching, and at times of general depression can affect large numbers of people. Man should not take life's unhappy incidents so seriously. It is better to laugh a little than to make a tragedy of every misfortune. The Gita teaches, he who feels neither rejoicing nor loathing toward the glad nor the sad aspects of phenomenal life, who is free from grief and cravings, who has banished the relative consciousness of good and evil, and who is intently devout, he is dear to me. To have an optimistic disposition and try to smile is constructive and worthwhile. For whenever you express divine qualities, such as courage and joy, you are being born again. Your consciousness is being made new by the manifestation of your true soul nature. This is the spiritual rebirth that enables you to see the kingdom of God. Chapter Reincarnation can be scientifically proven. If one believes in the existence of a just God, then a belief in reincarnation can follow very readily, as the two concepts are really dependent on one another. But what about the skeptics and the atheists? Can the truth of reincarnation be scientifically proven to their satisfaction? Can the theory of reincarnation be in any way scientifically experimented with, so as to furnish not only hope, but actual proof of its reality? Material scientists claim that they have not found any actual proof of the existence of a god, and hence cannot offer any proof of the existence of his just law giving equal opportunity to all life to improve through reincarnation. To such scientists, the sufferings of innocent babies and other inequities of life seem inexplicable and point to the absence of a just creator. Scientific Law On the other hand, most of those who do believe in a just God base their convictions on belief only and have no scientific proof to offer to unbelievers. They do not dare, for the most part, to scrutinize or deeply question their faith for fear of losing it or of creating some social inharmony. They are not aware, in other words, of the existence of a scientific spiritual law that can prove their beliefs to be truth. But why should not spiritual law be investigated by the same methods of experimentation used by the material scientists to discover physical truths? This question was asked centuries ago by the Hindu savants, 
and they set about the task of answering it. Their experiments resulted in scientific methods that could be followed by anyone to discover the reality of spiritual law, and hence of reincarnation and every other great cosmic truth. Since the means of proof do exist, no one has a right to say that reincarnation and other spiritual laws do not operate, until he has tried the methods and seen the results for himself. A doubting physical scientist is entitled to express his opinion, but it remains an opinion only, not a fact. In physical science, certain procedures must be adopted and followed in order to prove the truth of any given theory. Germs are not visible to the naked eye, one must use a microscope to detect their presence. If a person refuses to look through the microscope, he cannot be said to have scientifically tested the theory that germs are present. His opinion is therefore valueless since he has not followed the prescribed rules for arriving at the truth of the theory. So it is in spiritual matters. The method has been discovered, the rules laid down, and the result is open to anyone who is interested enough to experiment. In the Western world, owing to lack of this scientific approach to spiritual law, the value of religion has been greatly diminished as a vital factor in the life of man, and spiritual doctrines are believed in or rejected simply on the grounds of personal bias, rather than as a result of scientific investigation. How were the spiritual laws discovered? How did the spiritual scientists rishis of ancient India discover these unalterable cosmic laws? Through experiment on the life and thought of man, in the laboratories of their hermitages. To find the truth of physical things, we must experiment with physical substances. So to find the truth of reincarnation or the passage of the same soul through many bodies, it is necessary to experiment upon the consciousness of man. These scientists of old found that the human ego persists through all changes of experience and thought during the states of wakefulness, dream, and dreamless sleep during one's lifetime. The cognitive experience is changed, the environment, sensations, thoughts, and bodily states changed, but the sense of identity of I did not change from birth to death. The Hindu experimentalists argued that through concentration on the self, through a constant, conscious, aloof, unidentified introspection or watching of the various changing states of life, of wakefulness, dreaming, or dreamless sleep, that one could perceive the changeless and eternal nature of the self. Ordinarily, one is conscious of his waking state, and sometimes he is conscious also of his dreaming state. It is not uncommon during a dream for a person to be aware that he is dreaming. Through certain methods and practices, one can maintain conscious awareness during every state of his being. Wakefulness, dreaming, dreamless sleep, and turiya, deep sleep, the ever-awake superconsciousness, the unrestricted region of mind beyond dreamless subconsciousness. Relaxation in sleep. During sleep, there is involuntary relaxation of energy from the motor and sensory nerves. Through practice, one can produce this relaxation during the waking state also at will. In the big sleep of death, there is total relaxation the retirement of energy from the heart and cerebrospinal axis. By deep meditation, this complete relaxation may be produced consciously in the waking state. In other words, every involuntary function may be accomplished voluntarily and consciously by practice. The rishis of ancient India analyzed death as the withdrawal of the electricity of life from the bulb of human flesh with its wires of sensory and motor nerves that lead to the different channels of outward expression. Just as electricity does not die when it is withdrawn from a broken bulb, so life energy is not annihilated when it retires from the involuntary nerves. Energy cannot die. It withdraws upon the occasion of death into the cosmic energy current withdrawn. In sleep the conscious mind ceases to operate, the current is temporarily withdrawn from the nerves. In death the human consciousness permanently ceases to express itself through the body, it is as though one had a paralyzed arm. He is mentally conscious of that arm, but cannot function through it. Medical records describe the case of a clergyman who once fell into a state of suspended animation. 
He heard everyone around bewailing his apparent death, but could not express his awareness through his physical organs. His body motor had stalled and refused to respond to his mental commands. After he had passed 24 hours in this state and was about to be taken away for burial, he made a supreme effort and was able to move. This instance illustrates the constancy of the awareness of Ines or personal identity, even though the body is seemingly lifeless. The Rishis taught that one must learn to separate the energy and consciousness from the body consciously. One must consciously watch the state of sleep and must practice conscious voluntary withdrawal of energy from the heart and spinal regions. Thus he learns to do consciously what death will otherwise force upon him unconsciously and unwillingly. An amazing case. There is a case on record, in the files of French and other European doctors, of a man named Sadhu Haridas, in the court of Emperor Ranjit Singh of India, who was able to separate his energy and consciousness from his body, and then connect the two again after several months. His body was buried underground and watch was kept over the spot, day and night, for months. At the end of this time, his body was exhumed and examined by the European doctors, who pronounced him dead. After a few minutes, however, he opened his eyes and regained control over all the functions of his body, and lived for many years more. He had learned by practice how to control all the involuntary functions of his body and mind. He was a spiritual scientist who experimented with prescribed methods for learning the truth of cosmic law. As a result he was in a position to demonstrate the truth of the theory of the changelessness of personal identity and the eternal nature of the life principle. Those who want to prove for themselves the scientific truth of the doctrine of reincarnation should first prove the principle of continuity of consciousness after death by learning the art of consciously separating the soul from the body. This can be done by following the rules laid down many centuries ago by the Hindu savants. Learn 1. To be conscious during sleep 2. To be able to produce dreams at will 3. To disconnect the five senses consciously, not passively as during sleep and 4. To control the action of the heart, which is to experience conscious death or the suspended animation of the body but not of the consciousness that occurs during the higher states of superconsciousness. Follow the practices. Bhagavan Krishna taught, The ego is continuously conscious of itself in childhood, youth and old age. The embodied soul is uninterruptedly conscious not only of these states but also of attaining another body after death in the long series of lives and deaths that are the ego's alternations between the physical and astral worlds. By following the practices that lead to the four states outlined above, we can follow the ego in all states of existence, we can follow it consciously through death, through space to other bodies or other worlds. Those who do not learn these things cannot retain their sense of personal identity, of awareness or consciousness, during the big sleep of death, and hence cannot remember any previous state, or even the deep sleep states during one life. By adopting the methods of the ancient Hindu scientists who experimented with such laws, and who thereby gave the world a knowledge that is priceless and demonstrable, one may come to know the scientific truth of reincarnation and all other eternal verities. Chapter Reincarnation The Soul's Journey to Perfection Reincarnation is the progress of a soul through many lives on the earth plane, as through so many grades in a school, before it graduates to the immortal perfection of oneness with God. Souls that are living in an imperfect state unaware of their divine identity with spirit do not, upon the death of the physical body, automatically enter a state of God-realization. We are made in the image of God, but by identification with the physical body, we have put on its imperfections and limitations. Until this imperfect human consciousness of mortality is removed, we cannot become gods again. A prince ran away from his palatial home and sought shelter in a slum. As a result of intoxication, and of mixing with persons of bad character, he gradually lost sight of his true identity. Not until his father found him and took him home to the palace did he remember that he was actually a prince. 
Similarly, we are all children of the King of the universe who have run away from our spiritual home. We have kept ourselves locked up in human bodies for so long that we have forgotten our divine heritage. As often as we have come on earth, we have developed new imperfections and new desires. So we come back here again and again until we fulfill all desires, or until, through increase of wisdom, we banish those desires. We must satisfy our desires, or by cultivating wisdom, do away with them altogether. Very few persons get off the wheel of birth and death by trying to satisfy their desires, however. It is the nature of desire that each time one satisfies it, the craving to repeat the experience simply increases its hold unless one's mind is very strong. It is better to satisfy small or unimportant desires because in that way we can get rid of them. But it is necessary to do so with wisdom and discrimination. Otherwise even small desires may come back in a stronger way, reinforced by experience. People who feel a desire to drink, for example, often reason thus, I will have all I want today, and tomorrow I will do without. After several repetitions of this experience, the usual result is that they find they have instilled a habit, and then it is difficult to get rid of it. The same thing may happen with any other desire. God is not a dictator who has sent us here and is telling us what to do. He has given us free will to do as we please. We hear a great deal about the importance of being good. But if we all go straight to heaven when we die as some claim, what is the point in trying to do good while we are here? If there is the same reward for everyone at the end of life, why not be a greedy, selfish person, since the path of evil is often the easiest one to take? There would be no use in emulating the lives of great saints if when we die we all, the good and the bad alike, become angels. On the other hand, if God has it in his plan for us all to go to Hades again, there would be no use in worrying about how we behave in this life. And would there be any value in watching one's actions if our lives are like automobiles? Once they become old they are cast on the junk pile and that is the end of them? If that is all there is to man's life there is no point in reading the scriptures or in exercising self-control. The importance of time. If, however, there is a lofty purpose in living, how may we explain the seeming injustice in a baby's being born dead? What about those who are born blind or dumb or crippled, or who live only a few years and then die? Only the one who lives long has time to struggle against innate wrong tendencies and desires, and to try to be good. If there is no other chance in a future life for the little child who dies at six months, why did God give that child a mind and no time in which to develop the potentialities of that mind? The time element is most important in our progress. One life span only may not afford sufficient time. If a child dies early in life, there is a reason for that death, and because he did not have enough time in which to express his potential, human or divine, he will be given another opportunity in which to do so. Such a person is like a boy who is sick and cannot go to school. The boy does not leave school forever. As soon as he is well he goes back to school to start his lessons where he left off. So it is with life. If we don't have a chance to learn our lessons in this life, we shall have opportunities to learn them in some other. When you can see behind the scenes you will realize that life on earth is a puppet show. It seems real to us now. But what we are experiencing at this moment will have a dreamlike unreality to us a few years hence. And what we are experiencing now would have seemed unreal to us five years ago had it been described to us then. Last Sunday most of you sat in other seats in the temple and had other thoughts in your mind. Today we are seeing a different picture show. Reflect on how many people you have known who are now vanished from this earthly stage. The concept of life as a changing, passing show is not pessimistic. It should teach us not to take life seriously at all. Maya cosmic delusion makes us feel that the body is so real, such a necessary part of our being. Yet in a moment the body may be taken away from the soul by death, and the separation is not painful at all. When that operation is over, you have no need of time, dress, food, or shelter, for you no longer have to carry this bodily bundle of flesh. You are free of it. And you are still you. 
Have you ever sought to reason out why this truth is hidden? Or where may be now the millions of people who have gone away from our earth? Have you ever wondered if we are like so many chickens in a coop when we are gone from the coop we are replaced by another flock? Is there no way to find out? How we live this life determines what we are in the next. We have been given the power to reason out where we go and whence we have come. But we don't take enough pains to analyze ourselves and our lives. Otherwise our common sense would tell us that whatever our character is today will continue to be after death, perhaps a little better or a little worse, depending on how much effort we are making to improve ourselves. You go along 365 days a year year after year, and perhaps you have made some progress, but your nature will be the same after death as it was before death. You will not become an angel just because you die. Only the body changes. Death makes no difference otherwise. Death is like a gate you will pass through. Your body will be gone but you will be in every other respect the same. If you have a violent temper, you will not leave it behind at death with your physical body. Your violent temper will remain with you until you conquer it. If in your present life you have observed the laws of healthful living, in your next incarnation, you will possess a healthy body. The last portion of life is more important than the first, because what you are at the end of this life is what you will be at the beginning of the next. The first part of life is usually stupidly misspent, in a sort of bewildered state. Then romance comes and finally disease and old age. The struggle with the body starts. I have coined a phrase, patchwork living, to describe how one has to keep on patching and repatching the body to keep it going. The body is a trouble most of the time. A spark plug is missing or the tires give out. You have headaches or a cold where the stomach goes wrong. There is difficulty with the teeth and so on. Always trouble, trouble. That is why it is so necessary to your happiness that you realize you are not the body with all its aches and pains, but an immortal soul. I don't take life seriously at all. I say, Lord, in a time you want to remove this body from the soul, it is all right. So long as you keep me here, all right. But if I am to be free of the body, that is all right too. It is not necessary to die in order to claim freedom from attachment to the body. If you commune with God, you will see that you are already free. You are not the body. You are eternal spirit. Is there any way to find out what we were in our last incarnation? Most certainly we can detect basic tendencies of thought and capabilities by analyzing what we are now. The Hindu scriptures say that it takes a million years of harmonious, disease-free living for the soul to be liberated. Therefore, comparatively little change is to be expected in the ordinary man from life to life. But one's spiritual evolution may definitely be hastened by determined effort in right living and by the help of a true guru. The sages of India have analyzed mankind as belonging to four basic types. The sudras, those capable of offering service to society through bodily labor, the Vaisyas, those who serve through mentality, skill, agriculture, trade, commerce, business life in general. The Kshatriyas, those whose talents are administrative, executive and protective, rulers and warriors. And the Brahmins, those of contemplative nature, spiritually inspired and inspiring. Qualitatively, Sudras are those who see in life no greater purpose than the satisfaction of wants and desires of the body. Such persons eat, sleep, work, multiply, and finally die. Millions today live life in the sudra or laborer state, concerned merely with the comfort and pleasure of the body. The man in the vasya or mentally active state is always busy getting things done. Some people of this class think of nothing else but business. They live only to earn money, which they usually squander on sense enjoyments. The best Vasya type of businessman is much more evolved and creative in nature. The third or Kshatriya class are those who, after having had the experience of earning money and of creating something along business lines, begin to understand what life is all about. They strive by self-control to win the battle with the senses. The Vasya man doesn't engage himself in such effort for inner improvement. 
He simply earns money and produces children and seldom thinks about the meaning of life except in terms of business. But the third or Kshatriya class takes life more seriously. Such a man asks himself, should I not struggle with and destroy my bad habits? He feels a desire to overcome evil tendencies and to do what is right. The last and highest state is that of the Brahman, nor of Brahma or God. Analyze yourself to see how you should change. To recapitulate the four basic types of consciousness in man, Sudra is the sense-bound state of existence, Vizya is the business or creative stage of man. Kshatriya is the warrior state when man desires to do battle with his senses and to conquer his attachment to them. Brahman is the wisdom state attained by man when he has overcome all attachment to the senses and remains consciously immersed in Brahma, God. Every human being fits into one of these four classifications, and if you analyze yourself you can find your class. Think over your life from childhood days and try to reason out in which of the four classifications you belong. Reflect on whether you have been living for sense pleasures, only catering to the senses and earning money, or perhaps just working without thinking or acting creatively. Analyze yourself and see if you have been creative from your childhood. Some children, for example, think readily along mechanical lines and want to open up and take apart things so that they can put them together again. Others show the greatest pleasure in drawing or in playing or listening to music. It is not necessary to be an expert or a prima donna in order to consider that one has shown signs of creativity in this life. Even a nonsensical song such as Yes, We Have No Bananas is a product of a creative mind. Anything one creates, whether it is expertly done or not, is an expression of creative talent. A flair for writing novels or for acting or for wood carving or for painting or for music or for working with machinery, if exhibited early in life, indicates that you were probably in the Vasya state in your past life. Husbands and wives should not ridicule each other's or their children's creative tendencies. It is a sin against the evolutionary process of God to try to suppress another's creative spirit. Ask yourself if from childhood you have always tried to perform actions in accordance with the guidance of your conscience. Were you constantly watching your actions and trying to correct yourself when you were wrong? Did you have that struggle within from childhood? That reflects the third or Kshatriya state. But if from childhood your thoughts have always been of God, you have entered the fourth or spiritual state of the Brahman. Recognition of your belonging to one of the less advanced of these four types of mental attitude should not discourage, but encourage you. If upon self-analysis you find that you have not yet attained to the highest state, do not think yourself helplessly unfortunate. The idea is that if you haven't changed yet, it is now time that you should. Otherwise, you will carry your present state into the next life too. When death comes you want to feel that you have passed that particular grade of life and that you are free to go on to higher grades. Therefore you should change your life now. Analyze yourself and learn what you were before. Then you can begin to remold your life more ideally. Learn to check your moods. The violent feelings you may experience in the present were all created in the past. If it were not so, why is it that some children are jealous from the very beginning while others in the same family are calm and loving. There are children who would strike you if you were to tell them not to do a thing. Others are quietly obedient. Another child may steal. Why? These traits are simply outcroppings of prenatal tendencies created in former lives. I was once given a little baby to hold. I almost dropped it, for God suddenly revealed to me that that baby had been a cruel murderer in a previous life. But ordinarily the past is a closely guarded secret. You may discover the true details only if the Lord wishes you to know them. Discern between inner worth and outer position. Once in New York, a woman who was helping with self-realization fellowship office work confided to me that she had met a marvelous man, a psychic, who had told her wonderful things about herself, including the revelation that in a former life she had been Mary, Queen of Scots. I did not believe she had been that queen, and I silently uttered a little prayer that God would banish her delusion. 
A few days later a student came to see me and with great excitement said, I have just met a famous psychic the same one the office worker had mentioned who told me that in a past life I was Mary, Queen of Scots. I asked the office worker to come into the room, and placing the two queens face to face I asked which one of you is the real Mary, Queen of Scots? The ladies happily realized their mistake which was one of undiscriminating credulity and of readiness to confuse true inner worth with conspicuous outer position. The truth is we love to be flattered. Unscrupulous persons thus may take advantage of us now and then. But who you were in a previous life and whether or not you were important in the eyes of the world is of little consequence. It is best to be born as a divine or Brahman type, regardless of worldly position. All of you have something of that divine type in you otherwise you would not be here this morning. Exchange of souls between East and West. Out of millions of people, you have been drawn to this temple because you have had something to do with the Orient and its spiritual teachings before. Now that you are an Occidental, outwardly other Occidentals may laugh at you for going to what may seem to them a heathen church. Those who feel a prejudice against the East did not recently come from there. But those who feel a leaning toward the East were probably born there in a recent past life. By such indications one can distinguish Oriental and Occidental souls. Did you from early childhood enjoy the fragrance of incense and stories and pictures of the East? Such inclinations would show that you had been quite recently in contact with the Orient. Many souls from the East have reincarnated now in America. Desiring material perfection, they have been born here to enjoy the fulfillment of that desire and to help encourage American spiritual ideals. Similarly, many souls that formerly were born in America have since reincarnated in India in order to benefit from her spiritual riches and to help India in the development of the material side of her civilization. I hope that many of you may go there to help India, and that many in India will come here to serve in America. This world is God's family. He is trying to improve all nations. He has no preference for one over another. Another test of your past is your preference for certain sensations. Some people like heat all the time. They have become accustomed in other lives to warm climates. Others like cold better, which shows that they had been born in cold climates before. If you have always had a special feeling for the mountains or the sea, you may be certain you brought that attachment from another life. There are people who become lonely if they are out of the city and cannot stand quiet places. That attitude too was cultivated in the past. Those who have a driving ambition throughout life were important men before. To have that tendency and not develop it is to suppress oneself. In the proper environment such a person could become a great man. There are others who remain unsuccessful no matter what they do to get ahead. This indicates they have carried a failure tendency from the past. But they should not give up the battle to overcome it. Such persons must conquer wrong tendencies now or they will manifest those faults in the next incarnation. George Eastman once told me that in the early years of his Kodak company he offered stock for 25 cents a share. Still it wouldn't sell. The family of the girl he wished to marry objected to the match. The adverse circumstances were such that it seemed he would never become a success, yet after a while, everything opened up for him. Why? Because he had been creative and ambitious before, and he kept on cultivating those tendencies in this life. From childhood I wished for large buildings and many people about me, and for shady trees and water wherever I might go. And these are what I attract. I also knew from childhood that I would have such things, that when I wished and worked for it, these places would come easily to me. When I talked about it people sometimes laughed skeptically. Nevertheless such environments have materialized. At our Ranchi school we have a big pond, our Dakshines where headquarters faces the Ganges River, our Encinitas Hermitage overlooks the Pacific Ocean. So through analysis of your present strong tendencies you can pretty accurately surmise what kind of life you led before. Past associations influence present affinities. You may find that you have a strong affinity to certain foreign languages and that you are able to learn them quickly. 
Madame Galley Kersey, for example, amazed me by the ease with which she learned many phrases in Bengali. A love of certain languages is the result of past life associations. You are attracted to German or French or Chinese or Bengali because you have spoken them before. Recently I met a young American girl who told me I have never studied any Oriental language, but lots of times I hear strange words in my mind. I can say them, but I don't know what they mean. She forthwith said about nine words in Bengali. She had never in this life studied the language, nor had she known anyone who spoke Bengali. Yet she knew these words and pronounced them correctly. In traveling, you begin to like certain scenes more than others. If some place stands out above all the rest in its attraction for you, you have probably been in that vicinity before. So by these various clues you may discover certain general ideas about your past lives. From this point on, meditation can bring about a deeper knowledge of what you were before. Occasionally it happens that you go for the first time to a certain place where you seem to recognize certain scenes, but the people whom you once associated with those scenes are gone and sometimes you meet people you feel you knew before. With me, recognition has always been instant, especially of those who had been disciples before. The following authentic case of remembrance of a past life experience became world famous. A little girl, born in a small village in India, began inexplicably to pine away for a village in another part of India. Her condition became so serious that a doctor advised that she be taken to the distant village. This was done, and to the amazement of her companions, from the moment she entered the outskirts of the village she began to describe in detail everything in it. She knew people by their names, although she had never before been to this village, and went directly to a certain home where she called a man by name, saying that he had been her brother in her previous life nor did she stop there. She explained that in her past incarnation she had hidden some gold pieces in a brick wall of the same house, but that she had died without ever having told anyone about it. The little girl went to the place in the wall and lo, the gold pieces were there still. She described her clothes and how they had been packed away and they were found to be exactly as she had said. In the face of such evidence, we are not justified in doubting the genuineness and significance of her experience. There is another case of a saint in India who went to a certain temple on a river bank and said, My temple was near here. It is now in the river. Divers went down and found under the water a very old temple. This man had been in a previous life, the saint to whom the now submerged temple had been dedicated. A pure heart, a clear insight. If you keep above the consciousness of sex and make your heart pure, so that when you look at others, you will not be conscious of whether they are men or women, you will be able always to recognize at once those souls you have known before. If you have cultivated that impersonal consciousness, you can instantly recognize people you knew before. Suppose you see a six-month-old baby, and then do not see it again until many years have gone by and the baby has become a man. You probably do not recognize that baby in the man. Yet certain features are the same, you would discover if you had known that baby long enough to fix those features firmly in your mind. So certain features of our past life remain with us. The eyes especially will be like they were before. Eyes hardly change because they are the windows of the soul. Those whose eyes reflect anger or fear or wickedness should try to change to remove unlovely qualities that hide and hinder the expression of the beauty of the soul. Owing to the change of environment and company, your mind and body change somewhat. But the eyes change little. You are reborn with the same expression in them. You can also tell by your inclinations if you were a man or a woman in your past existence. Many women are mannish and many men want to be like women. Both man and woman are equal in importance. Reason and feeling are present in both men and women. But in man reason predominates, and in woman feeling predominates. It is easier to influence a man by appealing to his reason than to his feeling. A woman responds more readily to an appeal to her emotions. By God communion you bring about the harmony or balance of these two qualities within yourself. I never acknowledge myself to be either man or woman. 
I feel for others with the love of a mother, but no one can dissuade me by an appeal to my emotions if my reason, or fatherly nature, does not concur. To achieve a divine balance of reason and feeling should be the purpose of both man and woman. Man usually has to cultivate more feeling, and woman has to cultivate more logic. We must perfect love in at least one relationship. There is a deep reason why God does not usually allow us to recall our previous lives. It is because we would be very clannish with those we knew before, instead of expanding our love to encompass others. God wants us to give friendship and love to all, but we must perfect it in at least one relationship. When you meet old friends again, you can perfect your love and relationships with them. A disciple means one in whom the Guru perfects the state of divine friendship. Those who follow the Guru's wishes are his disciples. The wishes of a true Guru are guided by divine wisdom, and if you tune in with his wishes you will become free, as he himself is free. Above all, you should learn the most you can from this life, and strive to pass to the highest grade of spiritual development in the school of life. Coming with God. When you can do that, the deficiencies of all lesser grades of living are forgiven. To free yourself from karma that binds you to the lesser duties of life, develop wisdom and God consciousness. Chapter Will Jesus Reincarnate Again? Many persons predict a second coming of Christ. Others think that the real Christ has yet to come a first time. But Jesus did come on earth, and he went away. These are facts. Had his life been only a myth, as some say, his influence would not have survived for so many centuries. Even though he was crucified, his mission was taken up by people all over the world, because he lived for God. Behold he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Because of this passage in the Bible, many sincere persons believe that Christ is literally going to descend out of the clouds to us. The real explanation is metaphysical. When you close your eyes you behold darkness, but behind that darkness is the inner light. The contrast epitomizes the difference between this world and the kingdom of God. When I close my eyes and concentrate my will, I see Christ in that light, and every true devotee who is able to penetrate the spiritual eye shall see him. In that inner light I behold Jesus just as clearly as I see another person in this world. Everything perceived in that light is much finer. Wonderful visions of saints come, if you are in earnest and if you have developed spiritually. Such experiences are not given to those who meditate just for a few minutes and then concentrate on something else. When you really mean business with God, and above all, love Him, when you willingly lose sleep in order to persist in your search for Him, then you begin to see divine visions. They are not hallucinations. True visions are emanations of reality. Divine justice and the law of reincarnation. You may or may not believe in the law of reincarnation, but if this life is the beginning and the end of human existence, it is impossible to reconcile the inequalities of life with the divine justice. Why is one man born in a rich family, whereas another child arrives in a poverty-stricken home, only to die of starvation? Why is one person healthy enough to live one, hundred years and someone else sick all the time? Why are Eskimos born in the cold north and other peoples in moderate climates, where the struggle to survive is easier? Why are some babies born blind or dead? Why? 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 If you were God, would you do such unjust things? What is the use of reading and living according to the scriptures, if life is predestined by a whimsical God who deliberately creates beings with bodies or brains that are imperfect? According to the law of cause and effect, every action creates a commensurate reaction. Therefore whatever is happening to us now must be a result of something we have done previously. If there is nothing in this life to account for present circumstances, the inescapable conclusion is that the cause was set in motion at some prior time. That is, in some past human existence. Your strongest moods and character tendencies did not begin with this birth, they were established in your consciousness long before. 
Thus we may understand how some persons show from early childhood certain definite talents or weaknesses and so on. We may understand, too, how the perfect life of Jesus on earth was the result of several previous incarnations in which he had developed self-mastery. His miraculous life as Christ was the result of many past lives of spiritual schooling. He became an avatar, a divine incarnation, because in previous lives as an ordinary human being he fought the temptations of the flesh and conquered. His example gives the rest of mankind definite hope. Otherwise, what chance have we? If God had sent angels to teach us, I would say, Lord, why didn't you create me as an angel? How can I emulate beings who were created perfect and who have had no experience with the tests and temptations that you have given me? We need for our ideal a being who is essentially like us. Jesus had temptations to face. Get thee behind me, Satan, he said. That he conquered. Had he never known temptation, his saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, would have been play-acting, and how could that inspire us? Although he had already conquered the flesh and other lives, he had to feel its weaknesses again in his incarnation as Jesus, to show humanity by his mastery how high he had grown spiritually, and to give heart to all men by his example. Jesus was a Lysias in his former life. Jesus attained most of his perfection in his former incarnation as a Lysias Elisha. I know for certain that he was a Lysias in a past life, and that Jesus Kuru John the Baptist was Elijah Elias in his former life. Elysias later incarnation as Jesus was foretold several hundred years before the event, because he was destined to fulfill a divine plan of God's. That prophecy is told in the book of Isaiah eight centuries before Christ. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. St. Matthew, recording the event of Christ's birth, stated, Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Jesus had learned all of life's lessons in the school of many incarnations and had demonstrated his complete victory over material consciousness. That is why the Heavenly Father said of him, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus was sent on earth as an example, that God's other children might know one who had overcome the delusions of this world. Great as he was, Jesus nonetheless said humbly, I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me. His entire love was for God. His whole consciousness was absorbed in the Father. We are all children of God. Many incarnations ago he created us as he created Jesus. In the Gospel of St. John we find Jesus himself declaring, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are God's? Jesus was made in the image of God, as are we and he conquered delusion, showing us how to do likewise. If you conquer delusion in this life, you will go back to God and reincarnate no more. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. But will Jesus come again? Metaphysically, he is already omnipresent. He smiles at you through every flower. He feels his cosmic body in every speck of space. Every movement of the wind breathes the breath of Jesus. Through his oneness with the divine Christ consciousness he is incarnate in all that lives. If you have eyes to behold, you can see him enthroned throughout creation. One who is liberated as Jesus is becomes one with spirit. Yet he retains his individuality. For once God has created a human being, he keeps in his cosmic consciousness a permanent record of that creation. Every thought and action of every creature is recorded in the consciousness of God. Jesus referred to this when he said, Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings and not one of them is forgotten before God? Christ comes in vision and in the flesh to his devotees. Jesus as an individual personality can reincarnate in two ways, in vision and in the flesh. If you have great devotion you can see him inwardly exactly as he appeared when he lived on earth. 
A number of saints have thus beheld him and have relived with him various events of his life. Jesus can reincarnate again at any time, in the physical body or in the inner light, according to your devotion and power of concentration. Reincarnation is forced upon most of humanity, but because Jesus has freed himself, he can come or not as he wishes. He can appear to you in flesh and blood right now if you have that complete devotion which is necessary to attract him, but he will not come so long as your devotion is even 1% less than that. Years ago when I was living and teaching in Boston, I once became so busy that I forgot God for three days. The thought of continuing like that was intolerable. I was preparing to pack up everything and leave America. But just then a student of this path came by and asked to meditate with me. As we sat there in meditation, I began to pray, Lord, I love your work here in America, but I love you more than the work, and if I am going to forget you in this country I will leave. Inwardly I heard the voice of God, What do you want? Impulsively I said, I would like to see Krishna and Christ with all their disciples. Instantly I beheld them on a sea of gold, just as clearly as I am seeing you, and I worship them. But in a little while my mind began to doubt. This is not real, I thought. So I prayed again, Lord, if the vision is true, let the other devotee in this room also see it. My friend suddenly cried out, Oh, Krishna and Christ on a sea of gold. Then a new doubt arose, was it only thought transference? But even as this idea crossed my mind, the voice of God said, When I leave, the room will become filled with the fragrance of the lotus, and whoever comes shall notice it. Each person who later visited me in that room unfailingly asked, What is this strange fragrance of flowers that I smell? For most of his followers, Christ exists as an ideal personage they have read about in the Bible. But to me he is much more than that. He is real. Once, eight years ago, he came alone and meditated with me all night long. During that time I saw a vision of the hermitage. Many other times I have seen him in visions and talked with him. And that same Christ you too can see. You must be prepared to give up everything for communion with God. He will test you. When you pray and pray and meditate and still you don't see him, but say, Lord, it doesn't matter, you know that I am praying and I am not going to stop until you come then he will respond. One saint said, I don't care when he comes, I know he will come. That is the attitude one must have. When you make up your mind to work to attain the Christ consciousness that Jesus had, God will help you to fulfill that desire. But first you must attain self-mastery, even as Jesus did. God does not bestow great spiritual powers on devotees until they show him they have conquered their human weaknesses. Otherwise they might hurt other persons, even destroy whole nations by misuse of the divine might. Jesus had sovereign power. He could easily have saved himself from crucifixion, but during the agony in the garden he only said, Father, not my will, but thine be done, and on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In those final tests he showed he had wholly conquered all ego impulses. When you have unlimited power as Jesus did, and when everyone spurns you and still you do not retaliate, you are a conqueror indeed. All great avatars will come again. Every saint who has come on earth has contributed toward the fulfillment of God's desire for the spiritual upliftment of all his human children. The great ones come with two purposes. To inspire and enlighten a certain number or a large mass of people and to train real disciples, those who pattern their lives after the masters. The latter are the members of the saint's true family, constituting an inner group in whom he plants his spiritual life. Jesus had twelve such disciples, and others too, but one of the twelve betrayed his love and trust. The most difficult task for every God-ordained spiritual teacher is to produce others like himself, but Jesus made genuinely Christ-like disciples. Every spiritually enlightened teacher tries to enable many devotees to come you with God. Yet each great master nevertheless leaves some unfinished symphony. Because it remains unfinished that teacher has to come back again, but the time depends on God's will. What I am telling you is not in any book, nor is it anyone else's idea, but it is true. 
Jesus often healed others, but they didn't always appreciate it. And he tired of healing their physical ills. He wanted men to know God. He sought only their highest good, but they crucified him, and so not all of his desire for their spiritual development was fulfilled. That is why he has to come back again. Great ones such as he returned to earth to take more souls to God. Even though they have attained their own perfection, their desire for others' happiness and perfection has not been fulfilled. They want to bring their lost brothers back to God. When you pray to Jesus, he feels your prayer. Free souls such as Jesus are aware of the calls of their devotees. You may not know they are receiving the vibrations of your feelings, but they are. And when your demand is very strong, the great ones come to you. Their desire is to redeem the whole earth, because every saint of God realization knows there is no death for him. He is living in that eternal joy. Yet such saints are aware of the world's grief. They say to the Heavenly Father, People are killing one another and suffering in many other ways. Why must this be? And God says, I will send you back sometime to help them. The God-ordained saviors of mankind have to return to earth again, but when they will come, no one can say. Thus many people believe in Christ's second coming, but when it may happen depends on the will of God. The great ones come only with the permission of the Heavenly Father. In some cases when the time is set, the prophets speak of it, but other avatars come unannounced. Just the same they come. I too wish to come, again and again. I want to ply my boat many times across the gulf after death and return to earth's shores for my home in heaven. I want to load my boat with those waiting, thirsty ones who are left behind and carry them by the opal pool of iridescent joy where my father distributes his all-desire quenching liquid peace. It will be a wonderful thing to come to help all and that is the way everyone should want to live on this earth. Why seek selfish gain? We are known to God, we become known to his children, for in God we are all one. It is so important that we find him. For our own sake we must know his love and be immersed in him. Night and day one continuous joy, unending happiness. Great souls will reincarnate again. God gave them individuality and a divine role to play for him. They have to do their work because they love God. They will come because there are hosts of brothers in this world who are stumbling in the mud of delusion and suffering. The great ones have to come again, as Jesus too will come again, to take more souls to the kingdom of heaven. Chapter, The Dream Nature of the World It is only when we wake from dreams that we know we have been dreaming. Similarly, this life may be realized as a dream only when we awake in cosmic consciousness. During waking consciousness, the thought of a beautiful landscape does not carry with it an immediate power of materialization. But in sleep we have a heightened creative power of visualization and manifestation. Our thoughts swiftly erect the various structures of a dream. The projection of dream images requires both thought and energy, just as the projection of moving pictures requires both film and the electrical energy of light. In sleep, life energy is released from various bodily demands and retires to the brain cells, in which are stored the thought films of all past experiences. The enlivening action of the energy on the stored up thought films in the subconscious mind results in the projection of the mental motion pictures we call dreams. Dreams are actually lessons in the working of cosmic consciousness. They come to man for a reason. Their purpose is to awaken in him a realization of the dream nature of the universe and of the method of its operation. The sages of India since ancient times have spoken of the universe as a materialization of the thought of God. It is easy to say, of course, that this universe is a dream. But the verisimilitude of life in our everyday experiences makes it nearly impossible for us to believe that the world is nothing more than a cosmic dream. It is necessary that we first develop mind power in order to be able to realize that the universe is actually made out of the thought of God and that, like a dream, it is structurally evanescent. We know that thoughts are invisible. But in dreamland they may be made visible by the force of energy. So originally this whole universe, in the form of God's thoughts, was invisible, hidden within the cosmic stream of consciousness. 
only when those thoughts were crystallized by God's cosmic intelligent vibration or energy did they become visible to us as the material universe. So, although it is difficult to realize that this cosmic dream universe is merely a dream, we should endeavor to think along this line. Many practical benefits will come to us from such a true understanding of the physical world. To illustrate, let us say that a sleeping man dreams he is a great and powerful warrior, that he goes to war, is shot, and lies dying. Just as he is feeling very sad, he suddenly wakes up. He laughs at his dream fears as he realizes he is not really a warrior, nor is he dying. In real life, one may have the same kind of experience. A soldier who goes to war and is mortally wounded suddenly wakes up in the astral world and realizes that the war experience was all a bad dream, that he has neither broken bones nor a physical body. Nevertheless, he is still conscious of life and of his individuality. In order to realize that all the happenings of this world are dream experiences, we should learn how to visualize our thoughts, how to recharge them with the energy of concentration until they become visible manifestations. Proper visualization by the exercise of concentration and will power enables us to materialize thoughts, not only as dreams or visions in the mental realm, but also as experiences in the material realm. Matter originates in thought. Starting with the power of his creative imagination, man has built wonderful scientific devices and a marvelous material civilization. Inventions are the result of the materialization of human thought. Many people try to achieve something in the realm of thought, but they give up when difficulties arise. Only those persons who have visualized their thoughts very strongly have been able to manifest them in outward form. Everything on earth had its birth in the factory of the mind, either in God's mind or in man's mind. Actually, man cannot think an original thought. He can only borrow God's thoughts and become an instrument to materialize them. Hear me with your thoughts. Try out your strongest thoughts on your body. See if you cannot overcome undesirable habits and persistent ailments. When you are successful, you may apply your thought to make changes in the world around you. The relationship between thought and matter is very subtle. Suppose you see a wooden pillar and try by the power of thought to remove the pillar. You cannot do that. In spite of what you think, the pillar is still there. It is a materialization of someone's previous thought. It will not go away merely by your thinking it is not there. Only when you realize it as a materialization of thought may you dematerialize it to your consciousness. As you learn by experimenting with overcoming habits, pain, and so on, you will begin to understand that the entire design of the body and all its processes are controlled by thought. One may gather great wisdom by cultivating the consciousness that this world and everything in it is only a dream. First of all, do not take your earth experiences too seriously. The root cause of sorrow is in viewing the passing show with emotional involvement. If you continually think to yourself, I haven't lived as I ought to have lived, you only make yourself miserable. Rather do your best to be better, and no matter what difficulties come ever affirm it is all a dream. It will soon pass. Then no trouble can be a great trial to you. No happenings of this earth can in any way torture you. Consciousness of pain also has to be overcome if you are to know that the world is only a dream. When I was a child I was hurt frequently when playing football, and whenever I dreamed of playing football I always dreamed that I was hurt. That fear thought of being hurt had become rooted in my subconscious mind, so that I suffered dream injuries even in sleep. So one should not take his troubles too seriously, lest they darken the subconscious mind. Difficulties come to us in order to awaken us to the realization that this life is a dream. This lesson we all have to learn then we can understand why there is so much difference in everything in the world. Some people are poor, some are rich, some are healthy and some are sick. Although it may seem to be a terrible and cruel game, the justification of the complications of life is that all of it is only a dream. Take it as such. Think of the many aspirations and hopes you entertained as a child and as a youth. They have gradually left you, but do not be discouraged. Always believe that whatever is coming, 
it will simply be another scene in the dream movie of God that is being shown in the playhouse of our minds. We have to behold dream tragedies and dream comedies that we may be variously entertained. If you can go to a movie and see a picture of war and suffering and afterwards say, what a wonderful picture. So may you take this life as a cosmic picture show. Be prepared for every kind of experience that may come to you realizing that all are but dreams. Each human life constitutes a drama, and the events of each day represent a drama. You are living a fresh one each of the year's 365 days. The thought that you are merely a player in these dramas is very comforting. Realize that the acting out of whatever part you are called upon to play does not affect your real being. At the end of every earthly incarnation you are the same, the immortal soul, untouched by sickness, sorrow, or death. He who cannot be ruffled by these contacts of the senses with their objects, who is calm and even-minded during pain and pleasure, he alone is fit to attain everlastingness. Pride is the greatest barrier to wisdom. The experiences of my life have intensified my conviction that human pride is the greatest barrier to wisdom. Egotistical pride must go. It is a blind that prevents our seeing God as the sole doer, the director of the cosmic drama. You are playing different parts in this cosmic movie house, and you may not foresee what part will be assigned to you tomorrow. You should be prepared for anything. Such is the law of life. Why sorrow then over life's experiences? If you take every happening as you would if you were seeing someone else playing it in a motion picture, you will not grieve. Play your three. 165 rolls each year with an inward smile and with the remembrance that you are only dreaming. Then you will never again be hurt by life. You have played many roles through many incarnations. They were all given to entertain you, not to frighten you. Your immortal soul cannot be touched. In the motion picture of life you may cry, you may laugh, you may play many parts, but inwardly you should ever say I am spirit. Great consolation comes from realization of that wisdom. You cannot expect to wake up from the delusion that earth life is real merely by running away into the forest. You have to play out to the end the part that is given you. Each human being is contributing to the enactment of the motion picture of the cosmos. If you want to be happy you should play out your part with dignity, assurance and happiness. When you are awake in God he will show you that you are unchanged even though you have played countless parts in his earth drama. Dissociate yourself from your experiences. Think of it. Of the 1500 million people who have died every hundred years, each one has played a definite part in this cosmic motion picture. In fact, each human being has played in addition a separate home movie, his own private motion picture. If you were to multiply all the motion picture lives portrayed by those millions of beings, you wouldn't be able to count them. But this show has a purpose, that you learn how to play the various parts of the life movie without identifying yourself with your role. It is important to avoid identification with pain or anger or any kind of mental or physical suffering that comes. The best way to dissociate yourself from your difficulty is to be mentally detached, as if you were merely a spectator, while at the same time seeking a remedy. Don't expect to attain unalloyed peace and happiness from earthly life. This should be your new attitude. No matter what your experiences are, enjoy them in an objective way as you would a movie. You have to find true peace and happiness within yourself. Your outer experiences should be only fun. You can convert all of them into miserable ones if you allow your mind to do so. You may have good health and not appreciate it at all. But if you become unwell, then you will appreciate what it is to have health. Show gratitude to God for what he bestows on you without waiting for reverses to make you grateful. You are a child immortal. You have come on earth to entertain and to be entertained. This is why life should be a combination of both meditation and activity. If you lose your inner balance, that is just the time when you are vulnerable to worldly suffering. Don't disgrace the name of God, the one in whose image you are made. Awaken the innate fortitude of the mind by affirming, no matter what experiences come, they cannot touch me. I am always happy. When I look back and compare, 
I find that life was much simpler at the time we started our first hermitage in a little mud hut in India that we had rented for one rupee than it is now, when we have the responsibility of maintaining this large institution. Yet, I preserve my mental balance no matter what trials come. Learn to laugh at difficulties by remembering that you are immortal. Killed many times I yet live, born many times I am yet changeless. Whether you are suffering in this life or smiling with opulence and power, your consciousness should remain unchanged. If you can accomplish even-mindedness, nothing can ever hurt you. The lives of all great masters show that they have achieved this blessed state. In order to be able to say with realization that all things are in the mind, you must first develop an inner consciousness of divine peace that remains unruffled by the experiences of this earth. Accept them as you would dreams, and the time will come when you will find that, just by the power of your strong thought, whatever you think will materialize. This is very difficult to do, but it can be done. A scientist must busy himself with going through several experiments in order to arrive at one fact. But the spiritually developed man is able to perceive the fact without going through a physical process. If you first become one with God, then whatever you think can be materialized. This truth was demonstrated many times by Jesus. He had realized his unity with God. Concentrate first on God. One's first concentration should be on union with God. Every day as you go through various earthly situations, mentally practice your oneness with God. If a pain comes along to disturb that consciousness, you should reason, well, if I were asleep I wouldn't feel this pain. Why should I be aware of it now? All experiences are fleeting dreams. Practice overcoming all trials in this manner. The first state of concentration is to be able to see in your mind's eye anything that you wish. For example, I can keep looking at this room and concentrating upon it until, when I close my eyes, I can still see the room exactly as it is. This is the first step in deep concentration, but most people haven't the patience to practice it. I had the patience. As you continue to practice visualization you will find that your thoughts become materialized. The cosmic law will so arrange it that whatsoever you are thinking of will be produced in actuality, if you command it to be so. Suppose I am thinking of an apple, and the apple appears in my hand. That would be a demonstration of the highest power of concentration. The great ones can materialize anything right before your eyes, as did Babaji when he materialized a palace at the time of Lahiri Mahasaya's initiation in the Himalayas. That was an expression of the power of concentration in its highest form. Nothing worthwhile may be gained without effort and without concentration. Don't be sensitive about the body and material concerns, nor let anyone hurt you. Keep your consciousness aloof. Give good will to all but develop a state of consciousness wherein nobody can ruffle you. Try to make others happy every day. Share your wisdom with others. Do not permit yourself to lose interest in life. Learn everything about one thing and something about everything. Realize that the more you seek, the more you will find. The realms of thought are infinite. The moment you think you have attained everything, you have circumscribed yourself. Search on and on continuously, and in the valley of your humbleness will gather the ocean of God's wisdom. The greatest thing you can do to cultivate true wisdom is to practice the consciousness of the world as a dream. If failure comes, say, it is a dream. Then shut off the thought of failure from your mind. In the midst of negative conditions, practice opposition by thinking and acting in a positive, constructive way. Practice titiksha, which means not to give in to unpleasant experiences, but to resist them without becoming upset mentally. When sickness comes, follow hygienic laws of living without permitting your mind to be disturbed. Be unruffled in everything you do. If you try hard to cultivate the dream opposite of whatever trials you may be going through, you will be able to change a nightmarish situation into a beautiful experience. That freedom of mind will come when you realize that solids, liquids, and all other forms of matter are expressions of God's thought. The best way to find true freedom is to meditate deeply. You can learn how to meditate by studying the truths in the Self-Realization Fellowship Lessons. 
No one else can convey to you the taste of sugar. You have to taste it yourself. Yesterday, I was sitting in my room, looking back over my life, and I realized that everything in the outer world that had promised great happiness had deceived me. But one thing has never deceived me: my inner peace. Indescribable billows of happiness surge over my soul as I pass through various experiences over the years. That unchanging inner peace has been proof to me of the existence of God. I was just thinking this when suddenly I saw a great light. Everything else vanished. There was feeling. That was all. My hand was not a hand, but a feeling. When I touched my hands together, there was no flesh there, only feeling. Then I understood that I had become thoughts. Everything around me, the light in the room, and the weight of the body, all were nothing but thoughts. It was a delightful experience. Gone were the sorrow and sadness I had felt for things past, and in their place a great sense of freedom. That consciousness of God peace is never ending. It is the only real state of happiness. Everything else will fail you. Nothing else can make you happy because only the joy of His presence is real. It is not necessary to go through every kind of human experience in order to attain this ultimate wisdom. You should be able to learn by studying the lives of others. Why become helplessly involved in an endless panorama of events in order to discover that nothing in this world can ever make you happy? One may learn the truth in two ways: by undergoing many good and bad experiences, or by cultivating wisdom. Choose which you prefer. Krishna said, "The attainment of wisdom immediately bestows supreme peace." Jesus said. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. If you are seeking something else first, you will surely be disillusioned. Each man rationalizes while others have been deceived, but I won't be. Nevertheless, he will be deceived. The only experience that is real, the only experience that brings happiness, is awareness of the presence of God. Chapter: God's nature in the mother and the father. Part one: The mother. Today, let us hold a grateful thought for all good mothers who have nurtured their children with affection. If children would reflect on the love shown them by the mother, they would feel a desire to give similar affection to all the children of the world. May all sons and daughters who have been nurtured by a mother's love be themselves filled with a mother's affection, which is unconditional love, and express it toward others. Thus shall they solace the world with peace and bring heaven on earth. The mother's love is not given to us to spoil us with indulgence, but to soften our hearts, that we may in turn soften others with kindness and free struggling souls from the hard knots of bondage to the world. Those who are helplessly shackled by sin and dire difficulties need our tenderness and love. My sincere and complete devotion to my earthly mother was the first cause of my love for the divine mother. Thus, it was my great love for my mother. That led to my illumination. In India, we like to speak of God as Mother Divine, because a true mother is more tender and forgiving than a father. The mother is an expression of the unconditional love of God. Mothers were created by God to show us that He loves us with or without cause. Every woman is to me a representative of the mother. I see the cosmic mother in all. That which I find most admirable in woman is her mother love. Those who think of woman as an object of lust perish in that fire, but those who look upon all women as incarnations of the Mother Divine find in them a sacredness that is inviolable. When you can see every woman as your mother, as some of our God-realized masters in India did, universal love comes into your heart. Certain skeptical followers of a great saint wanted to test him, and sent to him some beautiful prostitutes. He quickly jumped up and cried. Mother divine, in these forms you have come to me. I bow to you all. The women knelt before him and were ashamed. From that moment, they were spiritually changed. Every man who looks upon woman as an incarnation of the immortal mother will find salvation. A husband should see in his wife the pure beauty of the mother divine. Looking upon the wife as the mother, he will find in her a holy essence not discerned before. Mothers would not be able to love their children if God hadn't implanted that love in them. 
Yet credit belongs to the instrument also, because the flood of divine love passes through the human mother. All the great masters have shown honor to their mothers. Swami Shankara, after the death of his mother, disregarded the monastic injunctions against performing ceremonial family rites and cremated her body in a divine flame that he caused to emanate from his hand. A home is made gracious by the presence of the Divine Mother in the form of the Human Mother. Isn't that a thought to remember? Do not forget it. Love for the Mother must be constantly cultivated in your heart, so that whenever you see a woman, you behold her as your mother. If you look upon woman without lust of the eyes, you will be able to draw from her store of spiritual treasures. Why was the mother given such love? That she might love her child unconditionally. Loving one's own child is only a practice of the love divine. The mother thinks it is her own child, but it is the child of God. The child will be taken away as soon as the divine spirit calls. So every mother should extend that love she feels for her child unto all the children of the earth. A mother is expected to look after her son, and a son is told to honor his mother. But I say that a son should not only love his mother but should look on all women as expressions of the Divine Mother. Each mother should remember that the Divine unconditional love is passing through her and she is blessed. She should realize that it is not her own love she gives, but the love of the Mother Divine in her. She should be proud of her children, but should not limit herself by bestowing love only on her own sons and daughters. A mother should give divine, unconditional love to all. This is my message for you today. Mothers, be proud that the Divine Mother took your form to give love tangibly to the world, not only to your children but unto all children of the earth. Then you will be really blessed, and instead of thinking that you have one child or five children, you will realize I have many children all over the earth. In that awareness you are one with the Divine Mother. The mother who looks upon all God's children as her own is no longer a mortal mother. She becomes the mother immortal. This is what all women saints are. One day they realize, the great love that I feel for my child I now feel for all. Now I know that I am not this body, but an expression of the cosmic mother. Think what you can do, from an ordinary woman to divine mother. And why not? The Universal Mother made you in her image and you should manifest that image by bestowing on all beings her illimitable love. Part 2 The Father On this Father's Day we affirm our fealty to the Heavenly Father. While the human father's love is not always unconditional, still his love is guided by wisdom, regard for law, and the will to protect others. The Divine Father of Wisdom, Law, and Protection who is represented in all good human fathers we honor today. A father should remember he is not just a human parent, he is a representative of the Heavenly Father. To that Cosmic Father I pay tribute. It is he who is behind all fathers. Each father should therefore realize that he has a responsibility to behave properly for the transparent light of spirit cannot flow through him if his mind is darkened with delusion and erroneous thoughts. He must keep himself pure, for it is through him and through all other fathers that the Heavenly Father looks after the children of earth. A human father's body and mind ought to be a temple of the Divine Father. As an instrument of the Divine Being, the Father plays his greatest creative role when he implants in his children thoughts that will lead to God-realization. To produce offspring is not a unique accomplishment, the animals do that. But to produce children on the plane of divine love and in a spiritual consciousness is an important achievement. Even animals may be bred to order, yet many human children are born out of passion and accident, emotion and evil. How can they be pure and perfect? The perpetrators of thefts and other crimes are usually children who were born out of passion, although sometimes there is a good soul here and there. Example is the best teacher. Character building should be taught in schools and colleges, but fathers should realize that example is more important than schooling. One should not tell his children, do not do as I do, but do as I say. If you do not want a child to smoke, you yourself should not smoke. If you want a child to be mild and noble of speech, 
you should not talk to your wife impatiently because the child notices your example. Be kind in word and thought because it is the Heavenly Father who has taken your form to look after the child. Let every father remember, when tempted to speak to a child with dictatorial harshness, because my voice is meant to be used by the Cosmic Father, I should never allow Satan, the father of ignorance, to speak through me with mean, unreasoning sternness. I should always guide my children with the loving persuasiveness of truth. My mind should be a transparent glass through which shines the Heavenly Father's light of wisdom. We should use the wisdom of the Father God and the love of the Mother God to bring peace on earth. A good father could never bring himself to kill his children. And if all fathers filled their hearts with the love of the Divine Father, who cares for his children of all nations, how could there be any war? Love is the spiritual weapon with which to end all war. To the Lord I have dedicated my voice, my eyes, my hands, my feet, my heart, my body, my feelings, my will, my being. I say to all fathers, when you destroy the ego, you will realize the protecting nature and wisdom of the Heavenly Father working through you. Chapter, Looking at Creation with Seeing Eyes Marvelous indeed is the Lord's universe. Within it he is working all his wonders of creation. Do not be a walking dead man in this world. Observe, analyze, and appreciate what God and his aged man have wrought here. How intricate is the universal mechanism? Reflect on the way we are made and in what orderly fashion the whole machinery of creation runs according to cosmic law. We all see the flowers and enjoy their beauty, but who knows what is causing the flowers? Anything one uses or sees every day, be it a handkerchief, a musical instrument, a house, or a tree, he should question and ponder by what means of what substance it is made. Cars are taken for granted, but if you were to visit the factories in which they are produced, you would realize how complicated automobiles are. Consider too what went into making the paper for the daily news and the intricate machinery that imprints it. No human hand could operate so fast. And if the creation of everyday man-made objects can be so complex, how vastly more complicated the creation of plants, animals, and human beings. It takes ten years' study of medical science to understand the composition, functions, and requirements of the seemingly simple human body. Even a casual analysis reveals much to wonder at, though I sometimes think God could have made a few improvements. When a plant is growing in water in a glass jar, one can see that its roots are like hairs. Through the God-given intelligent energy in the roots the plant draws from soil and water the food it requires for growth. Like an upturned plant, man similarly absorbs through his hair electric currents helpful to the body. Is it not amazing that the sap which feeds the leaves of the plant flows upward against the pull of gravity? When the skin of the plant is removed, one can see the intricate network of tubes that channel this sap. That which carries on this process of sustenance and growth is the mystery called life. When I am in the ecstasy of God consciousness, I behold this life in even a blade of grass. Little did I dream that I would be able to see such hidden marvels of creation. To concentrate on these marvels is to stand in awe of what the Lord has done. With calculated precision God has ordained the structural form of each living thing and the requirements for maintaining that form in good working order. If there is any deficiency in those requirements, food for example, plants, animals and human beings suffer. The average person draws from his food all the various chemical elements his body needs, but there are many dietary transgressors whose meals do not contain all the required elements or the correct balance of them. Improper nourishment is one of the main causes of all sickness in man. The effects of dietary deficiency can be seen almost immediately in a plant when some necessary chemical is omitted from its food. There are vital exchanges between man and all other living things. Rayon's India has had the custom of cremation and scattering the ashes of the dead. In this and other ways man feeds Mother Earth, and her plants in turn feed man. The reciprocity between man and trees is well known. Man inhales oxygen and exhales carbon dioxide. 
Trees absorb and store carbon dioxide and water, which they break down by photosynthesis to create carbohydrates food. In the process they give off oxygen, essential to man. Photosynthesis being dependent on sunlight stops at night. However, through another process called respiration, trees continuously release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, particularly at night when the counteracting influence of carbon absorbing, oxygen producing photosynthesis is not present. As night air is usually still, the heavy carbon dioxide gas settles near the ground. In part for this reason the custom of sleeping on beds, that is above ground level, came about. The limitations of the physical senses. Science has taught us a great deal about the intricate mechanisms of our universe and about the substances of which we are all made, but there is still vast knowledge to be uncovered. We could perceive more and appreciate more if we develop the underlying powers of our sensory organs. Things we should see with our eyes we do not see, things we should hear with our ears we do not hear, because our senses are too habituated, too attached to experiences of the limited gross physical world. Freedom from that attachment is not negation of sensory enjoyment. It permits a broadening of the God-given sensory powers to their fullest spiritual potential. On the material plane man has discovered various ways to increase his seeing power. The unaided physical eye receives only limited impressions of color. However, under ultraviolet light, drab-looking pieces of rock in which certain minerals are present will show forth luminescent colors. Remove the ultraviolet light, and the rocks assume their original dull hue. Many colors in the physical world, such as the blue of the sky, are really optical illusions caused by the reflection of light on various kinds of particles. Because your eyes register only a limited degree of the creative vibration that makes up everything in creation, you do not see the subtle astral colors which are hidden in everything around you. Could you but see, you would be amazed at their beauty. Even the most gorgeous shades on earth appear ugly, gross, and wild in comparison to the magnificent hues of the astral world. So neither your eyes nor your ears register everything possible. You cannot smell astral fragrances, nor perceive with your other physical sense organs the myriad finer forms and impressions passing through the ether. Even if St. Francis were here at this moment in his astral form, you would not be able to see and hear and touch him. Yet it is possible to advance beyond ordinary sensory limitations, for I have seen him. Often man does not cognize even things that his senses are able to perceive. Those persons who have perceptive eyes enjoy beauty everywhere. Others act as if they had no eyes, even in a beautiful place they fail to see anything. When I visited Mexico and saw the floating gardens of Lake Xochimilco, their loveliness filled my heart with awareness of the divine artist. Another man standing nearby seemed equally engrossed. However, something told me he was not seeing what I was seeing, so I asked his reaction to the picturesque scene. I was thinking of how to drain off the water and make more land, he replied. An engineer, he was seeing the lake in his own way. So we view things according to our different mentalities and moods. Every soul is encased in a composite vibration of sensations, thoughts, feelings, all the factors that make up a person's being or consciousness. Each one has a different composition, a different vibration. All the things you have done since childhood are stored in tabloid form as tendencies in your brain. They make you what you are. Because we do not see this tabloid pattern, we wonder why people behave as they do. Some become suddenly elated or inexplicably angry or moody, even they don't know why. Some are always busy criticizing or gossiping about others, when there is plenty of house cleaning to do in their own home. The invisible tabloid tendencies in the brain compel each one to behave in certain ways. They bury the soul preventing the expression of one's true self. How complex is man? each one in himself a full-length novel. The infinite potential of thought. Man is supposed to get something out of this life besides eating, sleeping, and working. Thinkers begin to wonder about life. They observe and question why things happen, 
or do not happen in a certain way. We have a first and then a second set of teeth, why not a third? What causes this regulation? Because of man's unquestioning acceptance of many delusive thoughts of physical limitation, he allows them to control his present sphere of existence. Thinkers do not accept the inevitable, they turn their efforts toward changing it. This is the ingredient that makes progress possible. I am thrilled when I see the great manufacturing centers, the remarkable inventions, and other exceptional human accomplishments. How much has come from the brain of man? and the brain itself is infinitely more intricate than anything it has produced. There is a story about a certain king who showed such affectionate regard for his prime minister that others in the court, noticing the monarch's obvious preference, were jealous. Realizing this, the king wanted to show them why the minister was his favorite. Some music sounded in the distance, and the king turned to one of his courtiers, saying, Please find out what is going on. After some time the man returned with the information that it was a marriage procession. Who is going to be married? inquired the king. Courtier didn't know, so another courtier was sent out. The man returned with a reply to the king's latest query, but when the sovereign asked another question he could not answer. The result was the same with courtier after courtier. Finally the king called for the prime minister and asked him to go and find out what was taking place. When the minister returned, the king plied him with questions, every one of which the alert and thorough prime minister was able to answer satisfactorily. A great many persons are dull-minded like the uninformed courtiers. They are not necessarily stupid, just too mentally lazy to make any effort beyond obvious necessity. I can condone physical laziness there might be a justifiable physiological cause, but there is no excuse for mental laziness. The mentally idle do not like to think, because even that seems too much work for them. Thought is fascinating. No one will ever be able to tabulate all the tendencies and perceptions of the mind, its capacity is infinite. Yet the mind cannot think an original thought, there is not a single idea that God has not originated already in conceiving his past, present, and future creations. Therefore, if you think deeply enough about a subject, the answer to any question about it will come. You must feel as well as think. If you do not have feeling along with your thoughts, you will not always be successful in reaching the right conclusion. Feeling is an expression of intuition, the repository of all knowledge. Feeling in thought or reason must be balanced. Only then does the divine image of God within you, the soul manifest its full nature. Hence yoga teaches one how to balance his powers of reason and feeling. One who does not have both equally is not a fully developed person. In God consciousness everything becomes beautiful. In my younger days I used to go sightseeing, but my interest was only in temples. As my consciousness changed with the practice of meditation I began to look at the world differently. Everything seemed transformed and interesting to me. Now I see behind all creation the kingdom of my Father. It is enchanting beyond any dreams of this world. And sometimes I see the beauties of his kingdom showing through the gross physical creation. As you progress spiritually and draw closer to God, he reveals to you more and more wonders of creation. Even in the dead and ugly looking stalks of a wheat field after the harvest you will see life. It played its part there and to the ordinary eye it is gone, but with the divine eye you will see, even in the outer desolation, the beautiful colors of dancing electrons and protons. Behind every material object is an astral blueprint of colored light. In the astral world everything is motion, everything is living, there is nothing called dead. Even in the physical world death, is not cessation of life, only a change into a different form. Life is still throbbing in the lifeless object. In the bones of dead animals I have beheld rich colors and vibrating light. You see only the gross material products coming from God's hidden factory behind creation, but if you went into the factory itself, you would behold in what marvelous manner everything in this world has been brought into manifestation. The factory behind creation is beyond imagination, 
the whole universe is a single thought in the mind of God. So simple, yet the galaxies are guided by mathematics inconceivable by man. Everything runs in perfect order. What tremendous intelligence is manifested in creation. The infinite is working in everything. All the different eddies of motion called life are controlled by that cosmic intelligence. Every hundred years a billion and a half persons leave this earth, and more than that many are born. What complexities of supply and demand are created thereby? Even so the divine intelligence has given ample food to take care of human needs. Man alone is responsible for lack and misery on earth. By this time we could have had a millennium, everyone healthy and supplied with all of life's necessities, living in a happy and peaceful way in a wisely governed existence. But man's selfishness and power in the hands of the inept destroys such a possibility. Abraham Lincoln expressed the highest ideal of government when he said it should be of the people, by the people, and for the people. He was a deeply spiritual man. Even so, he had to suffer because of the ignorance of a few. This world is a temporal place. It is natural to wonder where exceptional men such as Lincoln and departed dear ones once so tangible have gone after death. Such questions arise in the mind, not to discourage you, but to awaken in you a realization of the temporal dream nature of life. The Bhagavad Gita tells us, that which is night of slumber to all creatures is luminous wakefulness to the man of self-mastery. The seeming state of wakefulness of the ordinary man is perceived by a sage to be, in reality, a state of delusive sleep. Thus most people are sleeping soundly throughout this dream life. Only the man of realization is awake. He is not interested in the activities that engross the ordinary man who busies himself seeking wealth and sense pleasures, and wasting time in shallow social engagements. Man makes a nervous wreck of himself pursuing the fleeting attractions of this world, whereas the joy and wonder of God, which is beyond description, would give him so much more. Happiness and fulfillment unending. Only a little while you live as an individualized image in God's dream world. You are dreaming your mortal existence. It is part of God's cosmic dream. Every day you are living in this dream of physical being. Every night in deep sleep it is gone. And one day, when you awaken in God, who is your real self, the dream will be gone forever. Seek the Lord who is hiding behind creation. Use your time rightly to discover the factory of the divine behind this world. Once for an entire day I beheld in vision the infinite wonders of creation, and I prayed, O oh Father, when I was blind I found not a door that led to Thee. Thou hast healed my eyes. Now I discover doors everywhere, the hearts of flowers, the voices of friendship, memories of lovely experiences. Each gust of my prayer opens a new entrance to the vast temple of thy presence. Be adamant, strong, and unflinching in your determination to discover the one who is hiding behind this creation. Snatch yourself away from the demands of the world, and do not go to bed at night until you have consciously communed with God. I seldom retire before four o'clock in the morning. Only during the night can I find freedom from my responsibilities and be holy with God. The ordinary man with his everyday responsibilities can be just as busy as the President of the United States. Busy, busy, busy. That is life's demand. You have to reserve time each day to get away from the world and be with God. Control your life and set aside time to practice meditation for communion with Him. Then everything in this world will be a wonder to you. As scientists made their discoveries by following certain disciplines and physical laws, so will you find God without fail when you scientifically follow spiritual laws. You are helping yourself in the highest way when you study and apply these laws as set forth in the Self-Realization Fellowship teachings. Forget not the things I have told you. A word to the wise, those who are spiritually awakened, is sufficient. Yet Jesus said, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. If you receive these teachings and practice them, you will realize every truth I have told you. It is not complicated. 
I have given only those spiritual techniques that will enable you to perceive and commune with God. No matter how unpleasant your circumstances in this world, when you discover God, you will see Him working through you and manifesting in everything, and you will be filled with His love and joy. India's rishis remind us that health and prosperity, material accomplishments and possessions are not lasting. Why concentrate only on goals that are perishable? What is lasting is the ever-new joyous contact of God and the attainment of self-realization, finding out who you are knowing that the image of God is within you. When you have that realization, you will be a satisfied person. The scriptures of India describe one who attains this state as a Saita, successful one. When I was teaching congregations of hundreds and thousands I was often called successful. That did not impress me. One may be recognized by the whole world and yet be unknown to the only one whose attention matters, and he who attracts the notice of God may be entirely unknown to the world. Which would you prefer? I wanted only the recognition of my father. The acclaim of the world can be so intoxicating that man forgets to cultivate the all-fulfilling approbation of the Lord. It is natural for man to yearn for the role of king on this earthly stage, but if all were kings there could be no play. Your part is just as important as anyone else's. The point is that you must play your role according to the divine director's wish. When you live your part to please God, you will be successful. This should be the constant prayer in every human heart. My Lord, work thou through my hands. They were made to serve thee and to pick flowers for thy temple. Mine eyes were made to behold thy presence in the flickering stars in the eyes of soulful devotees. My feet were made to take me to thy temples everywhere to sip the nectar of thy sermons to seeking souls. My voice was made only to speak of thee. I taste wholesome food that I may be reminded of thine all-nourishing goodness. I inhale the perfume of flowers that I may breathe thy fragrant presence there. I dedicate my thoughts, feelings, and love to thee. All my senses are in harmony with thy celestial orchestra of fragrance, beauty, and joy playing their refrain in the eternal symphony of the cosmos. Lead me from darkness to light. Lead me from hatred to love. Lead me from limitations to thine inexhaustible power. Lead me from ignorance to wisdom. Lead me from suffering and death to everlasting life and enjoyment in thee. Above all, lead me from the delusion of human attachment into realization of thy love eternal, which plays hide and seek with me in all forms of human love. Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, reveal thyself unto me. Leave me in ignorance no longer. All delusion I cast from the sacred shrine of my soul. Be thou the only king sitting on the throne of my ambitions, the only queen in the castle of my love, the only deity in the temple of my soul. Keep me awake in thy consciousness, that I may pray and demand unceasingly until thou dost open all doors into thy home of wisdom, and there receive me, thy prodigal child, and entertain me with the fatted calf of immortality and eternal joy. Chapter, The Invisible Man It seems preposterous to think of man as invisible. We are visible to ourselves every day as a physical body. But there are many ways in which we manifest our essential invisibility. For example, close your eyes. Your form is invisible to you. How do you know you exist? You are aware of the body's weight. You can hear, smell, taste, and touch. Nevertheless, you are real to yourself only in terms of ideas. You are an invisible nucleus around which many thoughts are revolving. Now open your eyes. Are you the form that you see, or that inner being you were just now conscious of with eyes closed? The visible man is of little importance. The invisible self or soul is of utmost importance. During sleep you are unaware of the visible man, but you are aware of yourself, for when you wake up you know whether you slept well or poorly. Therefore your invisible self is real. Take that away and your outer visibility is meaningless. Without the invisible self the body would be as worthless as a corpse. The invisible man within is the real one. A strange to say man doesn't try to analyze what that invisible self is. He is so interested in the form he can see, 
thinking constantly about his physical appearance and well-being, he doesn't stop to reason out that the inner unseen self is the reality. Within the physical body, yet invisible to physical eyes, is an identical body of light, the astral encasement of the soul. If one of your fingers has been cut off, you still feel as if that finger were there. Anyone who has lost a limb knows this sensation. There is an invisible astral counterpart for all the bodily parts. Behind your physical heart is an invisible heart. Without it, your visible heart would not beat. You have invisible organs of sight and hearing, an invisible brain, invisible bones and nerves. These parts, tissues of light and energy, constitute the astral body of the invisible man. The astral body looks exactly like the visible one, except that its form being made of light and energy is exceedingly subtle. If you are physically afflicted you should not say my sight is gone or I have lost a hand. Your invisible eyes and hands are still present. Though your physical arm may be paralyzed, your invisible arm is not disabled. Never believe that the invisible organs are in any way affected by disease of the physical organs, because your negative thought would impede the flow of intelligent life energy into the physical body parts. Electrical currents are passed through a wire. Which is more important, the wire or the electricity? The wire exists merely for the passage of the electricity. The electricity does not exist for the wire. So the body exists for the use of the invisible man, the soul, not he for the body. However, the physical body must be in a certain condition for the invisible self to remain there. What a pity that this invisible self is tied to the body. If it were not, we could go walking on the water and fly in the sky and come back into the physical body again. The astral body of the invisible self has sensory perceptions much greater than those of its physical counterpart. Man has invented machines that in some ways are better than the physical body, which has many limitations. But when your consciousness of the invisible astral body is developed, you will realize that it can hear what the physical ears cannot hear, and see what the physical eyes cannot see. It can also smell, taste, and touch objects far beyond the range of the physical senses. And you can make it large or small at will, just as pictures on a movie screen can be made large or small by the man in the projection booth. Investigate the electricity that lights the body bulb. You are always looking after the physical body bulb. Have you never thought how wonderful it would be to investigate the electricity that lights the bulb? Visible man is composed basically of 16 elements, chemicals that can be purchased in a store. Your body is worth only about 90 cents, in depression times even less. Why not cultivate a better acquaintance with the invisible man? It is he who has power and friends and love. Without him, visible man has nothing but the chemicals of which he is made. Turn the spotlight of your attention inward, away from the limited visible man. The physical body has backaches and stomachaches. It suffers deterioration in old age. It is the nastiest little animal, always crying and whining for something. The visible man cannot bear a bad fall, and he sometimes shrinks at even a pinprick. The invisible man is unhurt by anything. He is free. He can banish all the troubles of the physical body. The invisible man within you is what you are. The one who pervades all things is imperishable. Nothing has power to destroy this unchangeable spirit. You think you are the body, but you are not. A piece of ice can be melted into liquid and then made to disappear by evaporation. The process can be reversed, condensing the vapor into liquid and freezing the liquid into solid form as ice once again. The ordinary man has not yet learned to perform similar transformations with his bodily atoms, but Christ showed that it could be done. Man's body is composed of 35 thoughts of God. The human body of 16 material elements is nothing more than a shadow of the invisible man, who has two bodies, an astral form made of electrical currents, and a causal form made of ideas. Your astral form of light consists of 19 elements and your invisible causal form is made of 35 thoughts. 
the 19 ideas that produce the 19 electrical elements of your astral body, and the 16 ideas that produce the 16 gross material elements of your physical body. God first created the iron and potassium and other chemical elements in idea, then he materialized them to make your physical body. The real you is invisible because even your physical body as well as everything else in creation was first conceived in thought. So your body is essentially a causal form of 35 thoughts within an astral body of 19 elements of light and energy, which in turn is encased in a physical body of 16 chemical elements. When you die the visible physical body will vanish, but the astral body of the invisible self within will be real to you. You will be aware of your astral form. By higher spiritual advancement, you will see that your subtle astral body can be reduced to 35 thoughts, and that your consciousness behind those 35 thoughts is the reality, for your consciousness, or soul, is a spark of the cosmic consciousness of God. When you are viewing a motion picture you see many figures on the screen, but if you look up you see only one beam of light projecting those images. Similarly, from the brain flow five currents of energy, the vibratory creative elements of earth, water, fire, air, and ether which condense to materialize this physical body on the screen of creation. Motion pictures used to be silent. Now there is sound, and they are experimenting with odors, so that when you see a garden on the screen, you will also smell the fragrance of the flowers. When those light-produced forms can be made true to touch and taste also, you will have produced the fivefold aspects of God's creation. The five senses by which man apprehends creation have their correspondences in the five elemental electricities, ether sound, air touch, fire sight, water taste, and earth smell, from which creation was materialized. Someday the whole world will appear to you as a kind of motion picture forms of light that are true to the five sensory perceptions. The terrible things that are happening in the world now are distressingly real, but when you are able to behold them as creations of light and shadow, you will understand that they are only a show, a part of God's play. You are only dreaming that you have a body of flesh. Your real self is light and consciousness. You are not the physical body. The visibility of the body deludes our material consciousness. If you cultivate superconsciousness, awareness of your real self, the soul, you will realize that the body is simply a projection of that invisible self within. Then you can do anything with the body. But don't try just yet to walk on water. In the motion picture house, you are engrossed in the images on the screen. They look so real. You are not conscious of the light overhead by which the images are being projected. But if you look up you can see that the visible is proceeding out of the invisible. The forms on the screen are all proceeding out of that one light from the projection booth. What is the difference between the light and the pictures? If there were no light could pictures have been materialized? Similarly if there were no invisible man, there would be no visible man. When the invisible man leaves the physical form, the body disintegrates. Those who understand the subtle relationship between the visible and the invisible man can dematerialize and materialize the physical body at will. We are coming to that evolutionary period during which we will realize increasingly that we are really invisible beings or souls. The invisible man is free from suffering and death. To live only in the consciousness of this visible body of flesh is spiritually retarding, for the body is subject to the sufferings of disease, injury, poverty, hunger, and death. We should not desire to think of ourselves as this visible, vulnerable, destructible body. The invisible man within us cannot be hurt or killed. Should we not strive more to realize our unknown immortal nature? By increasing our knowledge of this invisible self we will be able to control the man visible, as great masters do. Even when the visible man is in distress, he who is aware of his divine powers as the invisible man within can remain detached from physical suffering. How will you gain such control? First you must learn to live more in silence. You must learn to meditate. It may seem uninteresting at first, 
you have kept so closely in touch with this visible body that you have difficulty in thinking about anything except its ceaseless troubles, desires, and demands. But make the effort. Keeping your eyes closed, repeat again and again, I am made in the image of God. My life cannot be destroyed by any means. I am the invisible man everlasting. Everything is the result of an idea. That invisible man is made in the image of God, free as the Spirit is free. In the visible man lie all the troubles and limitations of the world. Whenever we are conscious of our bodies, we are tied to the body's limitations. Hence the great masters teach us to close our eyes and remind ourselves by meditation on the invisible self that we are not restricted to what our physical bodies can do. I used to affirm with deep conviction, I am not limited by my physical body. Wherever I want to go, I am instantly there. You may say that is only a thought. Well, what is thought? Everything you see is the result of an idea. You could not visualize anything without thought. Invisible thought gives all things their reality. Therefore, if you can control your thought processes, you can make anything visible. You can materialize it by the power of your concentration. Suppose you are sitting in silence and I ask you to concentrate on this temple in which we are gathered. Again and again you try until your mind has gone very deep. Then you will see the temple just as it appears now to your physical eyes. Invisible thoughts can be materialized into visual experiences. If you close your eyes, you cannot see your body, yet it is real to you. Why think that the invisible self is unreal just because you cannot see it? In meditation you peer into the darkness behind closed eyes and center your attention on the soul, the invisible self within you. Learning to control your thoughts and interiorize your mind by scientific cure-given techniques of meditation, you will gradually develop spiritually. Your meditations will deepen and your invisible self, the soul image of God within, will become real to you. In this joyous awakening of self-realization, the limited body consciousness that was so real becomes unreal, and you know that you have found your true invincible self in its oneness with God. Realize your immortality now. You will also understand how the invisible man is tied to the physical body, by attachments, the mental and emotional cords of desires for certain experiences on the physical plane. When by deeper meditation you can untie those cords, he will be free and you will know that you are a real image of God. Seek out that invisible man who is held captive in the jungle of physical sensations and matter. If you once understood the invisible man and the miracle of his outer physical body, his secondary body of light, and his inner body of ideas, you would realize what a wonderful creation you are. Concentrate on that invisible you. The visible man is a delusion. The invisible man within is real. When you know this you will know that you are not bones and flesh, you are the indestructible invisible man. You cannot die. Well no more on thoughts of growing older and being ready for the grave. You are only getting ready for your immortal state. Nothing dies. The ideational blueprint of your body is always present in the ether. You feel that your loved ones who pass on are gone forever because you haven't the power of concentration necessary to behold them in their subtle forms in the astral world where they are. Keep your mind on these truths, repeating them to yourself whenever you have a quiet moment, I am a prototype of God's thought. I am eternal ever roaming in the kingdom of God. You are that deathless invisible man and ever will be. Why not realize your immortality now? Your two physical eyes deceive you into thinking that this world of duality is real. Open your spiritual eye and behold your invisible form. If in the inner silence your spiritual eye is open, the invisible becomes visible. Whenever you are thinking, dreaming, or concentrating deeply, you are that invisible man. He is real, the visible man is the shadow. Forget the shadow and remember the real. Be one with the invisible man the reflection of God. Chapter, What are Ghosts? 
There are all kinds of tales about ghosts, devils, witches, vampires, and not a few persons have claimed to have had various experiences with such creatures. Of the several cases that have come to my attention, most of the persons involved suffered from overly strong and diseased imaginations. One of them, a woman, had chanced to read a book about vampires, and her imaginings were so vivid that she believed one of them was sucking her blood away each night. Whenever she visited me, she became well, but the idea of the nightly presence of a vampire was so strong in her that after a time she would become ill again. She died prematurely, destroyed by her own thoughts. In the sixteenth century, belief in witchcraft was widespread, and hundreds of persons suspected of being witches were falsely accused of being in league with the devil and were put to death. Joan of Arc was burned at the stake as one bewitched. Even Jesus Christ, who was healing the sick and doing only good, was accused of being in touch with Beelzebub. It is true that at various times evil spirits and possessed persons recognized Jesus and spoke to him, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Jesus himself spoke of Satan and of evil spirits, which he exercised for many persons, in one case casting the evil spirits into the bodies of a herd of swine. There is another world, the astral, hidden behind this universe. Its inhabitants are garbed in an astral form made of light. Lacking a physical body, they are ghosts invisible to us. Ordinarily, they are confined to their own sphere, just as we are limited to our own physical world. If it were a simple matter for the ill-intentioned among astral beings to penetrate the earth plane and hurt us, we would be living in terror all the time. There is enough horror already on this earth of ours. Are not millions of deadly germs floating around? Certainly God would not add the interference of spooks to our sufferings. There are, however, a few astral beings known as tramp souls. They are earthbound because of strong attachments to the world and are desirous of entering a physical form for sense enjoyments. Such beings are usually unseen, and they have no power to affect the ordinary person. Tramp souls do occasionally succeed in entering and taking possession of someone's body and mind, but only when such a person is mentally unstable or has weakened his mind by keeping it often blank or unthinking. It is like leaving a car unlocked with the key in the ignition. Some vagrant may get in and drive off. Tramp souls want a free ride in someone else's physical body vehicle, anyone's, having lost their own that they were so attached to. It was in such cases of possession that Jesus exercised the vagrant spirits. Tramp souls cannot stand the high vibration of spiritual thoughts and consciousness. Sincere seekers after God who practice scientific methods of prayer and meditation need never fear such beings. God is the spirit of all spirits. No harm from negative spirits can come to one whose thoughts are on God. The triune nature of man. To understand better what astral beings are, let us first understand what we are. When God created us, we existed first only as consciousness. We were a creation of his mind. Is it not true that whenever you create something new, the initial step is to visualize a model of it in your mind? Then you gather together the materials and finally you construct the tangible image of your idea. In the same manner, we and everything in creation are triune. Mental the idea, astral the building material, and physical the gross end product. The physical body is made of 16 elements. How God combined the chemical materials of physical elements to express intelligence is a marvel. Nevertheless, this body is anything but perfect. We can conceive of a much better one. I would like to create a body that would be like asbestos, able to go through fire and not burn, one in which there could be no broken bones, no unpleasant coughing. A physical body has pains and aches. Its spark plugs are often missing. First one part and then another gives out, and finally the heart fails. Americans like to get a new car every year, but they have to keep this old body model 60 or 70 years. 
Yet even when it is falling apart, still you want to hang on to the model you have until finally the Lord says, Come on, get out of it. Then you spring from the worn-out physical form and see that you are encased in a luminous body, an astral body of light and energy. You rejoice to find that you can hear, you can see, you can touch, and that your new form possesses no bones to be broken, no flesh to be hurt. Our astral body is composed of 19 elements, which are mental, emotional, and lifetronic. These are intelligence, ego, feeling, mind, sense, consciousness, five instruments of knowledge, the subtle powers behind the physical sense, organs of sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch, five instruments of action, the powers for the executive abilities to procreate, excrete, talk, walk, and exercise manual skill, and five instruments of life force those empowered to perform the crystallizing, assimilating, eliminating, metabolizing, and circulatory functions of the physical body. These are all subtly made. We can hear, smell, taste, touch, and see in the dream world through the power that is in the five senses. And in the astral world, even without the physical organs of the ears, eyes, nose, tongue, and skin, we still have with us the power of all five sense perceptions. The astral body is weightless and travels as light travels. You can at will make the astral body very small like an atom or you can make it very large. Why not? God, the divine operator of the cosmic movie of creation, can enlarge or reduce the size of the picture on the screen. He is the projectionist running the film from the booth of eternity. You are an individualized expression of his infinite light. Your astral body is therefore much freer from the cosmic limitations that so strongly bind the physical form. But God had first to think of what materials he wanted to put into the physical and astral bodies before he actually created them. We therefore have also a causal or idea body of 35 elements. The 16 ideas that go to make up the elements of the physical body and the 19 ideas that constitute the elements of the astral body. From the causal thought forms the astral body's five instruments of life force make visible the astral body of light and the physical body of gross matter. The following experiment illustrates the idea. Close your eyes and visualize a horse on the left. At first your concept is fuzzy, but if I suggest a white horse, you can more easily visualize it. Now think of a black horse on the right side. You are creating mental or causal images. Switch them about so that the white horse is on the right side. If you can visualize a little more strongly, you will be able to see these thought forms as real images. That is what you do in a dream. Your mind is more concentrated than causing your thought forms to become visible to you. Dreams and visions are astral in essence, being composed of light and energy. Could you actually make the astral images of the black and white horses true to the physical senses, you would have materialized a physical creation. So essentially we are made of 35 ideas which make up the ideational or causal body of man. Encased within the 35 thoughts is the Spirit of God, which is called the soul. Just as one flame emerges from the tiny openings of a gas burner as many individual flames, so are we all one light, flowing from God into many bodies. At death we are still encased in the astral and causal bodies. When you die, your physical body of 16 elements disintegrates, but the 19 elements of your astral body remain intact. Where then are all those souls who have left this earth? They are roaming in the ether. That is impossible, you say. So let us make a comparison. If a primitive tribesman came here and I told him that music is audible in the ether, he would laugh at me or perhaps become frightened. But if I then brought a radio and tuned in a station where music was playing, he would no longer be able to deny the truth of my statement. I could similarly show you right now that astral beings are roaming in the ether, and you couldn't deny it. The astral world is right here, just behind the gross vibration of the physical cosmos. If you were to behold the multitude of astral beings in the ether around you at this moment, many of you would be afraid, and some of you would try to seek among them your departed loved ones. 
If you concentrate deeply at the spiritual eye, you can view with inner vision that luminous world in which are living all the souls who have gone on to the astral plane. In human beings the heart acts as a receiving instrument and the spiritual eye as a broadcasting station. Even if you cannot see your lost beloved ones, if you can calmly concentrate your feeling on the heart, you can become aware of the reassuring presence of those dear to you who are now in astral form, enjoying their freedom from flesh thraldom. I see many astral beings who have left the material plane, but they cannot see me. I don't make myself visible to them, but I can behold them if I so desire. Therefore, we are not fully released at death when we depart from the physical form. Our souls are still encased in the subtle astral and ideational bodies. It is only when man dons a physical form that he becomes a visible being in this world. After the death of his physical body, he remains in the astral form as a ghost, an intelligent, invisible being with essentially the same mentality and characteristics he had on earth. Inhabitants of the astral realms can, of course, see one another in their luminous bodies. But astral beings are not ordinarily visible to us on earth unless we know how to perceive the astral world through the spiritual eye. When souls shed the astral body and go into a mental form in the causal world, they are not non-entities, but they do become truly invisible, even as ideas are invisible. Jesus said, Destroy this body temple and in three days I will raise it up. He meant that he had to divest himself of the physical, astral, and mental bodies by casting out all vestiges of attachment to a form to become one with spirit. It took three distinct efforts to do this. If a departed soul has unfinished desires created while on the earth plane, it continues to feel in the astral those desires and the wish to express itself through a material body. And so that soul in its astral vehicle is drawn again into a united sperm and ovum cell and is once more in a physical form. The intelligence in prana creates the physical body. The prana that permeates the physical body is intelligent life force life drones. The electricity that illuminates the light bulb does not create the bulb but the electricity or life force in the united human sperm and ovum cells guides the embryonic and subsequent development of the entire human body, manifesting as the aforementioned five life forces of the astral body. It is an intelligent or consciously directed force. It is unwise to ascribe to yourself permanently any defect of your body. Suppose you have lost an arm in this life and the thought of that loss becomes so impinged on your consciousness that you think you can never again have the use of that arm. When you are reborn the next time, you bring with you that consciousness of a missing arm, and if that negative thought is strong enough it may inhibit the creative action of the intelligent life force that grows the arms of your new body. You should therefore never identify yourself with the flaws of your physical form. They do not belong to you, for you are the pure, perfect image of God, the soul. So you see, before you took on this physical form you were a ghost, and when you die, you will become a ghost again. We are also ghosts when we sleep, for in sleep we are not aware of ourselves as a physical body at all. Since you are a ghost when you are asleep, and you will be one after death, why be afraid of ghosts? That is what you were and that is what you are going to be. The only difference is that when you enter the astral world at death, you cannot create at will a physical body like the one you now have. Only great masters who have attained oneness with the divine creator can do so. Spiritually advanced souls can condense the subtle vibrations of the astral vehicle into a tangible body. Death should not be feared. We fear death because of pain and because of the thought that we may become obliterated. This idea is erroneous. Jesus showed himself in a physical form to his disciples after his death. Lahiri Mahasa returned in the flesh the next day after he had entered Mahasamadhi. They proved that they were not destroyed. Just because instances of those who have mastered the cosmic laws are few, one should not say that their testimony is not true. You should not ignore the divine demonstrations of Jesus in my param param Baiji nor can I put aside the evidence of what I have seen. My resurrected guru Sri Yukteswarji, 
or what I have experienced in myself. This soul in essence, the reflection of the spirit, never undergoes the throes of death or the pangs of birth, nor having once known existence, is it ever non-existent. This soul was never born, it is everlastingly living untouched by the Maya magic of change. Soul is ever constant through all cycles of bodily disintegrations. Many times when some disciple living far away has been ill or dying, he has drawn my astral body there through his devotion. One such incident happened here. Zevadivi was a very devoted student. She became extremely ill, but she never complained about it to anyone. She knew her time had come to leave this earth. One day when I visited her in Los Angeles she said to me, Please don't hold me here. Later on I was staying in the Self-Realization Fellowship Hermitage in Encinitas for a time. I had been given a radio and was waking up early in the mornings to listen to broadcasts from India. One morning I suddenly felt intuitively the subtle astral vibration of Seva Divi. She drew my astral body to her through her devotion. My physical body was as dead. I was told later that Seva Divi exclaimed, just before her passing Swamiji is here. She was aware of being consciously ushered by me into the other world. Some time afterward I saw her glowing astral form. She was sitting in one of my classes, just as real as she used to appear in life. If anyone had touched me at that time, he would have seen her too. However, one who is in that state of astral consciousness does not usually allow others to touch him. We have passed through death and rebirth so many times, why be afraid of death? It comes to free us. You shouldn't wish for death, but be comforted in the realization that it is our escape from so many troubles, it is a pension after the hard work of life. I am making death very charming. People also fear death because they have been in this cage of flesh so long that they feel timid about leaving its security. But it is foolish to be afraid. Just think, no more repaired tires on the body vehicle, no more patchwork living. Since it is the Lord's desire that we should have this old model until death comes, we have to keep it and take care of it. But I wish the Lord would give everyone the ability to go into Samadhi and change his bodily vehicle as easily as did Rishi Narada. He was singing of God and divine ecstatic communion, and when he returned to ordinary consciousness, he saw he had shed his old body and had reincarnated in a fresh new youthful form. That is the highest form of transmigration. There is in India a story of a dying youth who, hearing the sobs of grief around him, cried, Insult me not with your cries of sympathy when I soar to the land of eternal light and love. It is I who should feel for you. For me disease, shattering of bones, sorrow, excruciating heart takes no more. I dream joy, I glide in joy, I breathe in joy evermore. You don't know what is going to come to you in this world. You have to go on living and worrying. Those who die are pitying us, they are blessing us. Why should you grieve for them? I told this to a woman who had lost her son. When I finished explaining she dried her tears immediately and said, Never before have I felt such peace. I am glad to know that my son is free. I thought something awful had happened to him. It is possible to enter and leave the body consciously. Many spiritually developed persons can see their own astral body. St. John says in the Bible, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. When your astral body ascends or leaves the body at death, you see your physical body as dead. That same experience occurs when advanced yog is transcend the physical body at will. Thus, John, though living, saw his material form as dead during the samadhi he describes. It is fun to get in and out of the body this way. But many persons who think they can do so are only imagining it. Just because you think it is so doesn't make it so. You have to know the technique. One man in New York came to me and assured me that he could travel astrally. I don't think you can, I said. You are only imagining you can do so. Still he insisted that I test him. All right, I agreed, go downstairs astrally and tell me what is in the restaurant there. He was quiet for a moment, then he told me there is a big piano in the right-hand corner. I knew he was imagining it, 
for I had observed that his breathing was normal and so was his pulse. On the contrary, I said, I think you will find there two women sitting at a table. He laughed at me. Then we both went down into the restaurant. No piano stood in the corner, but two women were seated at a table there. At last he understood that he had been fooled by his own imagination. Often I see with the inner astral vision happenings in the war in Europe, but it seems like a picture show. The world was meant to entertain us, not to torture us. God has made his motion picture of creation very complex, full of contrasts of good and evil. When you go to a movie you like to see lots of excitement. Think how many times you have gone to view a murder mystery, and when the movie ended you said to yourself that was a good show. Learn to look upon this movie of life with the same sense of detachment and enjoyment. There is a lesson to be learned from the fact that we are now encaged in the human body, and that at night and when we die we become ghosts. We must learn to know our ghostly nature, our invisible, powerful nature. But you cannot do so if you are always concentrating on the body, I have a headache, I want this and that, I dislike spinach. Preoccupation with material concerns is what you must overcome. How can you do this? Make God the first thought in your life. So long as you keep him in second place, he will not come to you. Gold, wine, and sex were created to hold you to this world. The Lord uses them as tests to see whether you prefer them to his love. The power of black magic is in your thought. In addition to the fear of ghosts, some people have a dread of black magic and other black arts. Many people tell me that somebody they know is using black magic on them. I say to them, you are sitting in the castle of God. No one can harm you if you truly believe in God. But when you believe in the negative thought that somebody is injuring you, you give him the power to do so. Suppose someone is sending you a wrong thought and you accept it, it will hurt you. But you do not have to accept evil ideas. Don't be afraid of malicious persons. No one can affect you unless you are fearful. Fear and keeping the mind blank allow evil to enter. But when you say, God is with me, nothing but good can come to you from the thoughts of others. Wrap yourself in the thought of God. His holy name is the power of all powers. Like a shield it deflects all negative vibrations. The cosmic war of good and evil. Why be concerned about the negligible threat of the powers of trans soul ghosts or practitioners of the black arts? At every moment a far greater danger to our happiness and well-being exists right within us and around us. Two forces are fighting, the one to save us and the other to hurt us. We are caught in the cosmic war between good and evil. This world is ruled by invisibilities or ghosts. God the Father, Christ Consciousness, the seven spirits before the throne of God, and Satan and his legion of evil powers. The seven spirits before the throne of God are the principal intelligent forces of creation. Holy Ghost the prime creative vibratory power of God, Alm, or Amen and its six individualized creative powers that structure and maintain the physical, astral, and causal universes and the physical, astral, and causal bodies of man. Originally, Satan was an archangel. He was given the power to create the world according to God's plan. After he had completed his assignment, he was to go back to God, as God intended all creation to return to him. But if this intelligent power, personified in the scriptures as Satan, were to retire into spirit, creation would disappear. To prevent this, Satan implanted evil that is, material desires in man, fulfillment of which would necessitate man's return to earth again and again, thus keeping the machinery of creation going. In this way the devil tries to see to it that man doesn't get a chance to go back to God. There is a great tug of war between the devil and God. One cannot dismiss the problem by thinking that Satan is a mere delusion. God would be very ignorant if he didn't know about the evil in the world. And why did Jesus say, Get thee behind me, Satan, and deliver us from evil if there is no Satan? Why is it necessary to pray to God at all if there is no devil? Evil does exist. When the Lord created man, he created the devil too. Satan, with his power of Maya, exists in order to test the children of God. 
Unless fire melts iron, steel cannot be forged. When disease or suffering comes, you should realize that it is a test of God's maya. You must pass these tests. You must not be upset by them. Though Jesus was suffering on the cross, he surmounted that divine test. Many great souls have died of terrible diseases and suffering. St. Teresa of Avila was afflicted with tuberculosis and yet she said, I don't want the Lord to shorten my trials. I want to suffer bravely and work as long as I can. And when her body died, she was lifted up in Christ. This creation is the Lord's hobby. But I constantly plead with him, Why do you have such a hobby? Why do you give us such troubles? Our earth is one of the worst places in creation. There are far better dwelling places than this. Though God allows troubles to exist, he also tries to help us out of them. God and his angels and millions of good spirits are trying to establish their order of divine harmony on earth. Every beneficial quality is created by a good spirit. Good spirits are constantly casting the seeds of helpful thoughts into the soil of your mind. At the same time, Satan, the king of darkness with his evil spirits is creating disorder and trouble in the world. Who but Satan created disease germs? There have been various plagues, then tuberculosis, and now the latest destroyer is cancer. All diabolical methods of torturing human beings. But God is inspiring many researchers to find new ways to banish disease. The temptation of Adam and Eve. To hold man to earth life, Satan created sex. That temptation has been with man since the beginning of time. The Lord created man and woman by will power. Their bodies were materializations of his divine wisdom and love. Man and woman originally had the same power as he to create children by mental fiat. Adam and Eve were empowered by him to propagate the species by immaculate or divine means. As my guru Sri Yukteswarji explained, the evil force, Satan, tempted Eve to taste the fruit sex in the midst of the garden body. God had said that the original man and woman were to enjoy all the sensations of the tree of life astrospinal centers of consciousness and energy that enliven the body and the senses except the experience of sex which is in the midst or center of the body garden. The serpent that tempted Eve is the coiled up spinal energy that feeds and stimulates the sex nerves. When the emotion or Eve consciousness in any human being is overpowered by the sex impulse, his reason or Adam also succumbs. Sexual pleasure is a delusive counterpart of God's bliss. Thus when sex is divorced from faithful love and used only to gratify lustful instincts, it becomes a tool of the devil to keep man's consciousness locked in the senses, unable to experience God consciousness or realization of the self as spirit, ever existing, ever conscious, ever new joy. Sex and desire for wine and money, these are the counterfeits created by Satan to displace the ecstasy of the soul. When Adam and Eve tasted of the sex sensation, they fell from paradise. They lost that divine consciousness by which they could feel their oneness with God and soul ecstasy, and they were forced out of the Garden of Eden. Ever since, human beings have had to reproduce their kind of sexual way like the animals. Women give birth in a troublesome and painful manner. Then two husband and wife have to accept what they get. If a bad child comes, they must rear it. Originally they were able to create what they wanted, through the power of mind, just as God does. What happy days of pristine innocence! Listen only to the voice of God. In the ultimate sense even Satan is really a tool of God. Satan fails to keep his promises to man, and then the disillusioned person seeks the faithful Lord. Why wait for disillusionment? I urge you not to put all your eggs of happiness in one basket. When you are physically strong and well and reasonably contented, suddenly pain comes and you think, my goodness, what is this? Self-realization fellowship teaches you not to put all your hopes for happiness in the frail basket of your body and the pleasures of this world. How? By teaching you to master the body, and above all by teaching you to meditate. Listen to the voice of God through your good thoughts. 
God and his angelic spirits are creating these good thoughts. The devil is creating his own kind of thoughts. Every time a bad thought comes, cast it out. Then Satan can't do anything to you. But as soon as you think wrongly, you go towards Satan. You are constantly moving back and forth between good and evil. To escape, you must go where Satan will be unable to reach you, deep in the heart of God. Chapter Jesus, a Christ of East and West. Jesus Christ is a liaison between East and West. That great master stands before my eyes, telling Orient and Occident, Come together. My body was born in the East, my spirit and message travel to the West. In Christ's birth as an Asiatic, and his acceptance by Western peoples as their guru, is a divine implication that East and West should unite by exchanging their finest distinctive features. It is part of the drama of God that the West was meant to have material power, and the East spiritual power, so that amity might come through an interchange of their characteristic qualities. Spiritual freedom of the East overrides material suffering. The West needs that kind of spiritual freedom. God's Western children, being more fortunate physically and materially, need to develop spiritually and to receive the spiritual illumination of the East. And the East needs Western material development. God's Eastern children should welcome the help of the West, that they may industrialize Asia, and thus enable her to develop and use her resources to fullest advantage. The American way of living progressively plus the spirituality of India, you cannot beat that combination. India is the melting pot of religions, America the melting pot of nations. America became great because of her love of liberty and because she welcomed all races to her shores. She absorbed the best of all nations. No other country was founded on and has grown on such wonderful ideals, the freedom and exceptional way of life that have been created in America by these ideals must never be lost. Many in the West believe that Easterners are materially poor because they are spiritually wealthy. This is not true. And many Easterners believe that Westerners are spiritually poor because they are materially rich. This is not the case either. The truth is that we human beings become too one-sided. We need to seek a balance by drawing the best from one another. Jesus is a divine colossus standing between Orient and Occident, telling East and West to exchange their better qualities. Can you see him there? I see him. He urges the West to spiritualize itself and the East to industrialize itself, the East to accept the Western missionaries of science and industry, and the West to accept the Eastern missionaries of the Spirit. To the West he says, Love your Eastern brothers. I came from the Orient. To the East he pleads, Love your Western brothers. They have received and loved me an Oriental. Isn't that a beautiful thought? It would make a magnificent picture. Christ is not the property of either East or West, and East-West bond is manifested in his life. He belongs to both and to all the world. His universality is what makes him so wonderful. Jesus took the body of an Oriental, so that in being accepted as guru by the Occidental he would thereby symbolically draw East and West together. Those in the West who have adopted Christ as their own should remember that he was an Oriental. Love and sympathy for Jesus should be expanded into love and sympathy for all Orientals and for all the world. God does not prefer Orientals or Occidentals. He loves those who manifest his spiritual qualities. Why then was it ordained by God that Christ, a great Savior of mankind, came out of the East? God wanted to come with the downtrodden, to show the transcendence of spirit over matter. We should not conclude that it is necessary to be poor to be Christ-like. If Jesus had come in a prosperous country, it would be equally foolish to reason that Christ's consciousness can be attained through material things, or that God favors the materially rich. A balance between spirituality and material development is necessary. The ideals of Christ are the ideals of the scriptures of India. The precepts of Jesus are analogous to the highest Vedic teachings, which were in existence long before the advent of Jesus. 
This does not take away from the greatness of Christ. It shows the eternal nature of truth and that Jesus incarnated on earth to give to the world a new expression of sanatan dharma, eternal religion, the eternal principles of righteousness. In the book of Genesis, we find an exact parallel of the older Hindu concept of the genesis of our universe. The Ten Commandments of Moses, many of the biblical legends and figures and rituals, the miracles performed by Christ, the very basics of Christian doctrine, all have concomitants with the earlier Vedic literature of India. The teachings of Christ in the New Testament and of Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita have an exact correspondence. The true nature of the Star of the East. The parallelisms of Christ's teachings with Yoga Vedanta doctrines strongly support the records known to exist in India, which state that Jesus lived and studied there during fifteen of the unaccounted for years of his life. No mention is made of him in the New Testament from his twelfth to thirtieth year. Jesus' journey to India to return the visit of the three wise men from the East who came to pay homage to him at his birth. They were guided to the Christ child by the divine light of a star, not a physical luminary, but the star of the omniscient spiritual eye. This third eye can be seen within the forehead, between the eyebrows, by the deeply meditating devotee. The spiritual eye is a metaphysical telescope through which one can see to infinity in all directions simultaneously, beholding with omnipresent spherical vision whatever is happening in any point of creation. The spiritual eye has been mentioned in the teachings of India and Jesus referred to it too. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Brought thus to the stable in Bethlehem by the guiding light of the spiritual eye, the wise men recognized and honored the infant Christ for the great soul and divine incarnation that he was. During the unknown period of his life Jesus repaid their visit. Even in the name and title of Jesus we find Sanskrit words with a corresponding sound and meaning. The words Jesus and Issa pronounced Isha are substantially the same. Is Issa and Iswara all refer to the Lord or Supreme Being? Jesus derives from the Greek form of the name Joshua or Jeshua, a contraction of Jehoshua, help of Jehovah or Savior. The title Christ is also found in India. It was perhaps given to Jesus there. In the word Krishna, which sometimes I purposely spell Krishna to show the correlation. Christ and Krishna are titles signifying divinity, meaning that these two avatars were one with God. While residing in physical form their consciousness expressed oneness with the Christ consciousness Sanskrit he tastes the Chaitanya, the intelligence of God omnipresent in creation. This consciousness is also called the only begotten Son of God because it is the sole perfect reflection in creation of the uncreated infinite. To understand what Christ consciousness means, consider the contrast between your consciousness and that of a little ant. The ant's awareness is limited by the minuscule size of his body. Your consciousness resides throughout your relatively capacious form. If anyone touches any part of your body you are aware of it. Creation is the body of God, and his consciousness omnipresent therein is called the Christ consciousness. He is aware of whatever we do within his universal form, just as we are conscious of our little selves. Through oneness with that Christ consciousness Jesus was able to know without being told that Lazarus was dead. The wonders of God's creation cannot be discovered by a cow. It is the unique potential of human beings to attain the omniscience of oneness with Christ consciousness. I ask those who do not believe in God. Whence came the intelligence in man and in the universe, if it is not produced in some divine factory hidden behind the ether? Such mysteries prompted Einstein to say that space looks very suspicious. Space is concealing God. His intelligence is hidden there, for out of the nothingness of space comes everything. Being one with this intelligence, which guides every atom in creation, Jesus could materialize his form anywhere he wished. And he can still do so, just as he used to appear every night to St. Francis in Assisi. Jesus was conscious not only of his microcosmic physical form, but also of all creation as his macrocosmic body. 
he could truthfully say, I and my Father are one. He experienced his presence in all atoms, even as does his Father. Jesus alluded to the omnipresent Christ consciousness when he said, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without the sight of your Father. Christ came at a critical time in history, when the world was sorely in need of spiritual hope and regeneration. His message was not intended to foster multifarious sects, each claiming him as their own. His was a universal message of unity, one of the grandest ever given. He reminded mankind that it is written in the scriptures, Ye are gods, and St. John voiced the inspiration and spirit of Christ's teaching when he said, But as many as received him the Christ consciousness manifested in Jesus and in all creation, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Was there ever a greater message? Jesus assured the downtrodden, the white and the dark man, the oriental and the occidental, that they are all children of God. Whoever is pure in heart, no matter what his race or color, can receive the Lord. The charcoal and the diamond receive the same rays of the sun, but the diamond reflects their radiance. So both in the Orient and the Occident, those who have diamond mentalities shall reflect God and be called the sons of God, and those who keep themselves dark with evil qualities shall not be able to reflect his light. Train your heart to feel the brotherhood of man. All mankind should open its heart to Jesus' great message. God hath made of one blood all nations of men. That is the Christ inspiration I love so much. I want to make that message a living reality, to give it a practical application. Color prejudice is the most foolish of all man's displays of ignorance. Color is only skin deep. God gave darker skin pigment to races that originally lived under climatic conditions requiring greater protection from the sun, a purely practical measure. Therefore white, olive, yellow, red, or black skin is nothing to be particularly proud of. After all, the soul wears a bodily overcoat of one color in one lifetime and other hues in other incarnations. So the color of one's complexion is a very superficial thing. To have any color prejudice is to discriminate against God, who is sitting in the hearts of all the red, white, yellow, olive, and black peoples of the world. Besides, it is well to remember that whoever hates any race will surely reincarnate in that bodily form. Thus does the karmic law force man to overcome his soul-stifling prejudices. Train your heart to feel the brotherhood of man. That is most important. Although Jesus' teachings were preordained to establish their strongest foundation in the West, he chose an incarnation in an oriental body, and in the Jewish race, which has had a long history of persecution, because he wanted to demonstrate the folly of judging others according to distinctions of race and color. True Christianity must be lived, racial divisions must be banished. Prejudices and lack of real brotherhood are causes of war and disunion among God's children. We must work at eradicating all incitements to war, in hate and prejudice lie bombs and misery. Jesus warned, For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. It is not the sword, but the practice of Christ's principles that shall ultimately free the world. In the highest sense, God alone protects you. You can best help this world by ideal living as taught by Christ and all spiritually enlightened ones. Above all else love God, don't you see that the whole answer is in his hands? When you will push aside the screen of mystery, you will see the answer to all that was there tough or obscure and unfathomable. Some Westerners consider the Hindus heathens. They don't know that many Hindus consider Westerners heathens also. Ignorance is 50-50 everywhere. I am sometimes asked if I believe in Jesus. I reply, why such a question? We in India reverence Jesus and his teachings perhaps more than you do. In order to love Christ you must live what he taught, you must follow the example of his life. Jesus said, whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. India has practiced this teaching more than any other nation. Many who call themselves Christian do not even apply it. They say that it is a beautiful philosophy, but if you were to slap them they would return twelve slaps, a kick, and maybe a bullet. 
Anyone who so retaliates is not a true Christian or lover of Christ, for that is not the spirit of the all-forgiving Jesus. Every time you see the symbol of the cross it should remind you of what it stands for, that you must bear your crosses with right attitude, even as Jesus did. When you mean well and still you are misunderstood or mistreated, instead of being angry you should say, as did Christ, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Why forgive one who wrongs you? Because if you angrily strike back, you misrepresent your own divine soul nature. You are no better than your offender. But if you manifest spiritual strength, you are blessed, and the power of your righteous behavior will also help the other person to overcome his misunderstanding. Those eternal principles of truth and righteousness taught by Jesus we take very seriously in India. We take them literally without rationalizing them to suit our purposes. Jesus said, And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. That spirit of renunciation for God is all pervasive in India. Especially in olden days it was the ideal of every man to give at least one part of his lifetime to God alone. God does not like to be forgotten. Complete renunciation is not necessary for everyone, but if you forget God while fulfilling your material duties, God will not like it. Give time to Him alone without work. I always save time in the morning and night for God, and the rest of the day I serve Him wholeheartedly. The Lord says in the Gita, Whatever actions thou dost perform, dedicate them all as offerings to me. Thus no action of thine can enchain thee with good or evil karma. You on this earth for God. It is his world, not yours. You are here to work for him. Life will very much disappoint and disillusion you if you labor only for yourself, because eventually you will have to leave everything. You will be forced to practice renunciation then. The message of Christ is one of compassion and forgiveness, renunciation in spirit, if one cannot do it in actuality, morality, brotherly love and unity and equality, and supreme love for God. Remember Jesus' admonition, and why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? The authenticity of the life of Christ has been questioned by many agnostics. Some have propounded the theory that Jesus was legendary, his life a mere fictitious drama. I know that Christ is real, for I have seen him many times. Jesus was not as fair-complexioned as most of you in the West. He had dark skin. And his eyes were not pale blue, as many artists paint them, they were dark. Nor was his hair blonde, it also was dark. A vision of Christ at the Agoda School in India. One day at my school in Ranchi, I was sitting with the young boys when I saw someone coming toward us from behind the boys and wondered who it was. Then I saw it was Jesus, his feet were not touching the ground as he approached. He came very close to us and then vanished. A few years later in Boston, I again saw Jesus. I was meditating and deeply praying to God because I felt that for three days I had forgotten him. I had been so engrossed in fulfilling the responsibilities he had given to me. I told the Lord, I am going to walk out of this work. The right attitude is to love God and love his work because of him. Those who do missionary service, but never make the effort to meditate or commune with God, never find him. Because I felt that the activities of my ministry had taken me away from God, I prayed, Lord, I will go away. I will not remain in America and do your work unless I know you are with me. Then a voice came through the ether like a beam of light. What do you want? You cannot go. Many times in my life God has thus prevented me from carrying out my desire to run away from my duties to this cause, to be only with him. I replied to the divine voice, Let me see on a sea of gold Krishna and Jesus and their disciples. Even as I made this inward request, I saw those divine ones coming toward me. It is a hallucination, I thought. If the person meditating with me sees this also, then I shall believe. Instantly my companion exclaimed aloud, Oh, I see Christ and Krishna. Then I rationalized, This is thought transference. 
I was doubting and praying to God to help my unbelief when the voice said, When I leave, the room will become filled with the fragrance of the lotus, and whoever comes shall notice it. As the vision vanished, the whole room became permeated with a marvelous lotus essence. Others entering the room even hours later noted the aroma. I could doubt no longer. Mavadar Babaji ordained that I come to America to interpret the teachings of Christ for the purpose of showing their parallelism with the yoga teachings of India's Lord Krishna. In the immortal truths expressed by these two avatars lies the answer of the ages. That is why Babaji, who is in divine communion with Christ, gave me the special dispensation of carrying this message to the West. So long as breath will be in the body, I will try to bring East and West together to fulfill the purpose for which Christ came on earth in an oriental body. His soul in the West, his body in the East, bringing soul and body together unites East and West. Truth is a universal experience. Help to spread the message of self-realization fellowship. There is nothing vague or mystical about self-realization teachings. You can realize these truths for yourself. Truth is truth, and it is a universal experience. After I heard my guru, Sri Yukteswarji, teach, I could see the blemishes in the talks of those who tried to make me understand something they did not understand themselves. A salesman should never try to sell something he does not believe in. One should teach only those things he has practiced and experienced. Devotees of this path should sincerely study the self-realization lessons and meditate deeply each night before going to bed. Jesus promised to send the Holy Ghost, the Great Comforter. Through the practice of the self-realization techniques of meditation, the faithful student is enabled to realize the fulfillment of that promise. Worshipping Jesus is not truly meaningful until one can expand his consciousness to receive within himself the Christ consciousness. That is the second coming of Christ. Unless you do your part, a thousand Christs come on earth would not be able to save you. You have to work for your own salvation. Then Christ can help you. The first two lines of Rudyard Kipling's poem became famous, East is East and West is West, and never the twain shall meet. But just because I eat curry and you eat apple pie, why should there be division between us? Division is imaginary lines drawn by small minds. It is the result of superiority complexes and is the cause of wars and pernicious troubles. We must destroy division. Look to the example of the great Christ who came in the East and stands as a lofty ideal before both East and West, telling them, Here am I in the midst of you. Learn from one another, balance your spirituality and material development. There he stands, a Christ of East and West, linking the two hemispheres with this message of unity. Can you not see him? Chapter, Christ and Krishna. Avatars of the One Truth. He is a master whose consciousness has been refined to receive and reflect perfectly the light of God. The sun shines equally on a piece of charcoal and a diamond, but only the diamond reflects the sun's light. God's light also shines equally on all stages of life, but the reflection is greater from some than from others. The divine light is fully reflected by the man of realization. Every human being is essentially a soul, covered with a veil of maya. Through evolution and self-effort man makes a little hole in the veil, in time he makes the hole bigger and bigger. As the opening enlarges, his consciousness expands. The soul becomes more manifest. When the veil is completely torn away, the soul is fully manifest in him. That man has become a master, master of himself and of Maya. The great ones are not specially manufactured by God. They became masters through their own efforts. They had to work and fight for liberation just as all the rest of mankind is struggling toward the light of soul freedom. Divine incarnations such as Jesus Christ and Yadava Krishna had somewhere, sometime, developed that spiritual stature which fortissed in their birth as avatars. Such beings are free from the karmic compulsions of rebirth. They return to earth only to help liberate mankind. Even though liberated, the Divine Ones play, at God's behest, their human roles in the seeming reality of the earth-life drama. 
They have their weaknesses, their struggles and temptations, and then through righteous battle and right behavior they attain victory. In this way they show that all men can be and are meant to be spiritually victorious over the forces that would keep them from realizing their inherent oneness with God. A Christ and a Krishna created perfect by God, without any effort of self-evolution on their part, and merely pretending to struggle and overcome their trials on earth, could not be examples for suffering humans to follow. The fact that the Great Ones too were once such mortals, but overcame makes them pillars of strength and inspiration for stumbling mankind. When we know that divine avatars, in order to make themselves perfect, once had to go through the same kinds of human trials and experiences that we do, it gives us hope in our own struggle. A God-realized master is known by his spiritual deeds. Miracles are not the most important of these. Some of the miracles that Christ performed can be duplicated in other ways by scientists today. On the spiritual side, Christ himself said, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do. Miracles such as you have heard about I have seen demonstrated many times by the masters, but these are not the criterion of their greatness. The power to perform miracles comes naturally to those who know God, because they are in tune with his cosmic laws, but those who become attached to miracles will lose him. God alone must be the goal of our hearts. A master's most important spiritual accomplishment is the conquering of Maya, delusion, the attainment of that realization which makes God supreme in one's life, more important than life itself. Christ performed his greatest miracle when he allowed himself to suffer on the cross, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He could have retaliated with spiritual power and saved himself. His victory has immortalized him as an example for the ages. If he was able to overcome his mortal consciousness to express divinity, other men can do the same. The manifestation of God in the life of divine beings is sometimes measured in terms of the quantitative and qualitative good they do. But great ones who fully manifest God are equally one with him. So it is impossible to make comparisons between the masters or avatars and foolish to try, because being one with God they are all the same, they are all equal before him. But to me Krishna and Christ stand supreme. By the greatness of his loving sacrifice, Christ has influenced the whole world. Krishna manifested a different aspect of the Infinite Father. In contradistinction to Christ, who was a renunciant, Krishna was a king, and I bow to one who can be a king and remain a divine one at the same time. To be in the world but not of the world is very difficult, for you live in the midst of temptations and desires and yet must remain untouched by them. Krishna came on earth much earlier than Christ about three thousand years before, some scholars say. The lives of Christ and Krishna have not only a great spiritual concomitance, there are also parallels in the personal stories that come down to us. Both Jesus and Krishna were born of devout, God-loving parents. Krishna's parents were persecuted by his wicked uncle, King Kansa. King Herod's threats tormented the mother and father of Jesus. Jesus has been likened to a good shepherd. Krishna, during his early years in hiding from Kansa, was a cowherd. Jesus conquered Satan. Krishna conquered the demon Kaliya. Jesus stopped a storm on the sea to save a ship carrying his disciples, Krishna, to prevent his devotees and their cattle from being drowned in a deluge of rain, lifted him tea, gowered him over them like an umbrella. Jesus was called King of the Jews, though his kingdom was not of this world. Krishna was an earthly king as well as a divine one. Jesus had women disciples Mary, Martha, and Mary Magdalene who helped him and played a vital role in his mission. Krishna's women disciples, Radha and the gopis milkmaids, similarly played divine roles. Jesus was crucified by being nailed to a cross. Krishna was mortally wounded by a hunter's arrow. The destinies of both were prophesied in the scriptures. These two avatars, both Orientals, are generally recognized in the West and East respectively as the supreme incarnations of God. Jesus Christ and Bhagavan Krishna gave to the world two of the greatest books of all times. 
The words of Lord Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita and of Lord Jesus in the New Testament of the Bible are sublime manifestations of truth, great models of spiritual scripture. These two Bibles give essentially the same teaching. The deeper Christianity that was preached by Jesus has been lost sight of today. Christ taught devotion and yoga, as did Krishna. And it was my Param Param Guru Mahavadar Babaji who first spoke of showing the unity of Christ's teaching in Krishna's yoga philosophy. Fulfill this mission is the special dispensation given to me by Babaji. The Universal Consciousness I am glad that Christianity was not called Jesusism, because Christianity is a much broader word. There is a difference of meaning between Jesus and Christ. Jesus is the name of a little human body in which the vast Christ consciousness was born. Although the Christ consciousness manifested in the body of Jesus, it cannot be limited to one human form. It would be a metaphysical error to say that the omnipresent Christ consciousness is circumscribed by the body of any one human being. Dadava Krishna is the Christ of the Hindus. These two great avatars, Jadava and Jesus, fully manifested the Christ consciousness, the Kitesa Chaitanya or divine guiding intelligence that is in every atom of creation. But as many as received him the universal Christ consciousness, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Jesus said, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without the sight of your father. God's consciousness is everywhere. He knows simultaneously everything that is going on in the world. You are aware of whatever is happening in any part of your body, and in the same way God feels everything that is going on in his body, the cosmos. When you can feel his omnipresent consciousness in your fingertips, in your heart and head and wherever there is any vibration of creation, when you can feel yourself in every speck of space, when your sympathy and love have spread everywhere and you feel oneness with everything, you are in Christ consciousness. Both Jesus and Yadava were one with the omnipresence of Christ consciousness. If you put some salt water in a bottle and cork it, and then place the bottle in the ocean, the water in the bottle cannot mix with the water of the ocean. Remove the cork and they become one, being composed of the same ingredients. So when we remove the cork of ignorance from the bottle of our consciousness, as did Dadava Krishna and Jesus Christ, we become one with the vast universal consciousness. From Christ and Krishna, we learn that the purpose of religion is to expand human consciousness and unite it with the omnipresent Christ consciousness. How? The social way is by cultivating divine love for everything that is. To love all impartially is to know Christ consciousness. Incidental way is by direct communion with the Christ consciousness through yoga meditation. The body continuously reminds you that you are flesh. Yet every night in sleep God banishes your consciousness of the flesh to show you that you are not the body. You are not the wave but the ocean behind the wave. You are not this mortal consciousness but the immortal consciousness behind it. Jesus declared, I and my Father are one. He who knows God becomes one with God. The consciousness of such a devotee is not only in the body, he feels oneness with the spirit behind his body and mind. When the wave dances on the sea it thinks it exists as a separate entity. But once it realizes, I cannot exist without the ocean, the wave sees that it is the ocean, that the ocean has created a little wave out of itself. Similarly, God can manifest himself as a soul within the form of man, but he cannot be limited by that form. The Bhagavad Gita says, The Supreme Spirit, transcendent and existing in the body, is the detached beholder, the consenter, the sustainer, the experiencer, the great Lord, and also the highest self. Jesus understood that the Father has become myself. This truth is also brought out in the Hindu scriptures, Tat Twamasi, that thou art. Concepts of God and Trinity agree. Hinduism as well as Christianity believes in one God. A few misunderstanding Westerners who have visited India have brought back stories that prejudice others against Hindu religious practices. 
I could similarly go back to India and say that I found America to be a place of murderers, racketeers, and drunkards, but I realize that such persons do not constitute the whole of America. There are defects in India as there are defects in America and everywhere else. Some Indian teachers instruct their followers to concentrate on an image representing a particular aspect of the infinite spirit. The visible image helps devotees to increase their concentration and devotion in prayer to the unseen spirit. Uninformed Westerners conclude that Indians as a whole worship idols. But we worship only Brahman spirit. The concept of one God is the same in Hinduism as in Christianity. The concept of the Trinity is also exactly the same in the Hindu and Christian scriptures. The Trinity is not a negation of the one God. It illustrates a metaphysical truth that the one became three when God made this creation. In the beginning, when there was no creation, there was spirit. The spirit wanted to create, and by his wishful thought he projected a great sphere of light or cosmic energy which became the universe. That cosmic energy is the Holy Ghost. Ghost means something invisible and intelligent. Holy Ghost refers to the spiritual vibration or energy of creation in which the intelligence of God is immanent as Christ's consciousness, the only begotten Son, God's pure reflection in creation. This Christ intelligence holds the universe in balance. God the Father is the intelligence beyond creation. The Son or Christ consciousness is His intelligence in creation, and the Holy Ghost is the intelligent vibration of creation itself. Long before Christ spoke of it, the Trinity was described in the Hindu scriptures, Am Tat Sat, Cosmic Vibration, Christ Intelligence, and God the Father. The Bible tells us of Jesus Christ's promise that when He was gone from this world He would send the Comforter, the Holy Ghost. Every vibration emanates a sound. The Holy Ghost is the cosmic intelligent vibration, whose sound is the Aum or Amen heard in deep yoga meditation. St. John spoke of it when he said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. That sound is the Holy Ghost. In its vibration is our comfort. We are living in a new age in which God's voice of cosmic vibration, a vow and amen can be heard from the two ends of the two hemispheres in the scriptures of Krishna and Christ. It was in the land of India that Krishna spoke of the Aum sound, and it was another Oriental Christ who spoke of this same vibration, calling it Amen or Holy Ghost, as the means of communing with God. By attuning your consciousness within in meditation, you can hear and commune with the Aum or Amen vibration in which you meet the Great Comforter. In communion with the Holy Comforter you realize the immanent Christ Consciousness. In deeper communion with the Christ Consciousness you realize you are one with God. As soon as you know the Holy Ghost you know Christ Consciousness, and when you know Christ Consciousness you know that you and your Father Cosmic Consciousness are one. The Divine Christ Consciousness hidden in every atom of creation is the same as the Cosmic Consciousness of the Father beyond creation. First you must know how to commune with the Trinity. Through such communion, you become one with Spirit. Then there is no longer a Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are seen to be the one Spirit. The pitfalls of body consciousness. Consider the limitations of this physical body. Looking outward you see disease, suffering, pain, and heartaches. But on the other inner side of this body in the subtle centers of spiritual consciousness, is the Comforter. When your mind follows the stream of ordinary outward consciousness, you will know Hades, but when by meditating on Aum your mind follows the stream of the inner consciousness, you will find the great heaven that exists behind this body. That is why Jesus said, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? As soon as you become concentrated on the limited physical body, you will fall into the pit of misery. It is popular in these times to seek prosperity, but you may become ill and unable to enjoy your abundance. Therefore Jesus warned that we should seek the kingdom of God first. Your consciousness must be with God. 
This is man's highest duty. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Health or no health, power or no power, seek God first. When you seek with that determination, all things shall be added unto you, not before. Christ would even further. There is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the world to come eternal life. In these words Christ teaches physical renunciation as the highest way of attaining God. Isn't it foolish not to renounce a few material things in order to realize the kingdom of heaven? Tell them to even devout Christians follow what Christ said here. Not many are able to follow this path. Yet renunciation is not self-punishment. It is the investment of a few temporal trinkets in order to gain the eternal treasure, God. Worldly persons have left God for perishable acquisitions, but I have left perishable things for God. The Gita also advises renunciation. Krishna says, Forsaking all other dharma's duties, remember me alone. I will free thee from all sins accruing from non-performance of those lesser duties. The shame and trouble and misery that will arise from forsaking worldly duties God will forgive you. But the Gita says more. The sages call that man wise whose pursuits are all without selfish plan or longings for results, and whose activities are purified cauterized of karmic outgrowths by the fire of wisdom. Relinquishing attachment to the fruits of work, always contented, independent of material rewards, the wise do not perform any binding action even in the midst of activities. Therein Krishna declares that it is not necessary to forsake all things outwardly to find God if everything you do is without selfish motive and done only to please Him. To forget God for worldly duties is to show colossal ingratitude, for we cannot do our duty to our family and others without the power borrowed from Him. In India hundreds go away into the forest just to think of God alone. That is the way that Christ taught when He called to His disciples, Follow me. They left their work and their homes and forsook all, even their lives, for God. Significance of Krishna's life for modern man Lord Krishna says in the Gita, that what man really needs to do to find the kingdom of heaven is to renounce the fruits of action. God has sent man into this life so circumstanced with hunger and desires that he must work. Without work human civilization would be a jungle of disease, famine, and confusion. If all the people in the world were to leave their material civilizations and live in the forests, the forests would then have to be transformed into cities, else the inhabitants would die because of lack of sanitation. On the other hand, material civilization is full of imperfections and misery. What possible remedy can be advocated? Krishna's life demonstrates his philosophy that it is not necessary to flee the responsibilities of material life. The problem can be solved by bringing God here where he has placed us. No matter what our environment may be, into the mind where God communion reigns, heaven must come. A heaven without thee, O oh God, I want not. I love to work in the factory if I can but hear thy voice in the noisy wheels of the machinery. A material life without thee, my Lord, is a source of physical misery, disease, crime, ignorance, and unhappiness. To avoid the pitfalls of the two extremes, renunciation of the world, or drowning in material life, man should so train his mind by constant meditation that he can perform the necessary dutiful actions of his daily life and still maintain the consciousness of God within. All men and women should remember that their worldly life can be freed from endless physical and mental ills if they add deep meditation to their daily routine of living. A balanced life of meditation and activity, without attachment to the fruits of action, is the example set by Krishna's life. The message of Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita stands as the doctrine best suited to our modern busy life of many worries. To work without the peace of God is Hades. 
To work with God's happiness ever bubbling in the soul is to carry a portable paradise within you wherever you go. To be constantly worried even in pleasant surroundings is to live in Hades. To live in the inner, boundless soul peace, even though housed in a rickety shack, is real paradise. Whether in a palace or under a tree, we must carry with us always this inner heaven. The yogi enjoys everything with the consciousness of God. But at the same time he can say, if I don't see the face of food I shall never miss it. The conditions of the world should not bother you. Be not attached to anything. Jesus fasted for forty days and kept his mind always on God. If you are in the world and have no attachment to it, you are a real yogi. To remain in the candy store and not touch the candy is true renunciation. However milk will not float on water unless you make butter of it. The only way to find happiness and emancipation is to seek God and live by his laws. Jesus said, If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. That kind of determination is needed. You must realize in your heart and soul this truth, Lord, you alone are mine. I am here just to please you. Renounce not only outwardly but mentally too. Jesus did not mean that man should not eat or put on clothes. He himself ate food and wore clothing. He did mean that one should be mentally non-attached to dress and food. He was teaching that renunciation must be accomplished mentally as well as externally. Take no thought, for your body means don't worry too much about food and clothing and the demands of the body. It is more important to be clean inside than outside. If you can be pure within and also clean without, that is even better. Moral doctrines universal in the scriptures. We find the main moral doctrines of religion in both the Bible and the Hindu scriptures. The message of the Gita includes the precepts of the Ten Commandments of Christianity, and also the reason why it is wrong to break them. The Gita wisely warns, He who ignores the scriptural commands and who follows his own foolish desires does not find happiness or perfection or the infinite goal. You can be moral without being religious, but the principles of morality are a necessary beginning in the practice of religion, for true religion is deeper than morality, it is contact with God. You should not concentrate on your faults nor think of yourself as a sinner. Affirm that you are a child of God and dwell on what Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Reincarnation in the Gita and the Bible Reincarnation, so beautifully expounded by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, is one of the most helpful and inspiring spiritual doctrines. Without it we cannot understand the justice of God. Why would a baby be born crippled? Why would God send to a family two babies who are strong and whole, and one who is lame? We are all made in God's image, where is the justice of this? Only reincarnation can explain it. The crippled baby is a soul that in some past life transgressed God's laws and as a result lost the use of his legs. As it is the mind that molds the body, and this soul had lost the consciousness of having healthy legs, it was unable to create a perfect pair of limbs when it came back again in this life. And so we must come and come again, until we regain our lost perfection. He who becomes perfect shall not have to return to earth any more. Those who have overcome desire shall be one with God. Jesus spoke of this when he said, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. The Gita similarly promises, O Arjuna, this is the established in Brahman state. Anyone entering this state is never again deluded. Even at the very moment of transition from the physical to the astral, if one becomes anchored therein, he attains the final, irrevocable, state of spirit communion. When you overcome physical desires, you shall go no more out of God. Desire brings you back to this earth. We have been prodigal children, and unless we forsake desires we cannot go back to God. Suddenly we have to leave this earth with desires still in our hearts, we must come here again until we work them out. It is necessary to regain self-perfection before we can return to God. When the storm is on, the wave rises out of the ocean, but as soon as the ocean is calm again, the wave can sink back into the sea. So it is with us. 
As soon as this storm of material desires is over we can melt again into the ocean of God. Early Christianity taught reincarnation. Jesus had revealed his knowledge of this truth when he said, Elias has come already and they knew him not. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. When he said, Elias has come already he meant that the soul of Elias had reincarnated in the body of John the Baptist. Christ born an Oriental to unite East and West. God made Jesus Christ an Oriental in order to bring East and West together. Christ came to awaken the divine consciousness of brotherhood in the East and West. It is true also that Christ lived in India during the 18 unaccounted for years of his life, studying with India's great masters. That doesn't take away from his divinity and uniqueness, it shows the unity and brotherhood of all great saints and avatars. The great ones come on earth to show that the Christ consciousness they have attained is what all who live here must seek. You must expand your consciousness and banish your suffering. Eating food doesn't make physical pain go away. Acquiring possessions doesn't stop mental suffering. Reading spiritual books doesn't satisfy the soul. The masters of India say that the purpose of religion is not to create certain doctrines to be followed blindly, but to show mankind the perennial method of finding everlasting happiness. As the businessman tries to alleviate the suffering of others by supplying some need, as every man is an agent of God for doing some good on earth, so Christ, Krishna, Buddha, all the great ones, came on earth to bestow on mankind the highest good knowledge of the path to eternal bliss, and the example of their sublime lives to inspire us to follow it. Someday you will have to leave the body. No matter how powerful you are, the body will eventually have to be buried beneath the sod. There is no time to be wasted. The yoga methods taught by my beloved Christ and my beloved Krishna do destroy ignorance and suffering by enabling man to attain his own self-realization and union with God. In the name of the originator of Christians and Hindus, let us break down the walls of suffering and ignorance and worship God truly. Too often in his name the demons of avarice and prejudice have danced in God's temples. We must restore to his altars the Lord of peace and joy. Let us behave on earth not as Americans or Indians with conflicting customs and beliefs, but as children of one Father. Christian and Hindu are only names. Let us live as a great divine family in a united world of oneness, knowing within and without the harmony and bliss of spirit. Chapter, The Ten Commandments Eternal Rules of Happiness The sudden cataclysms that occur in nature, creating havoc and mass injury, are not acts of God. Such disasters result from the thoughts and actions of man. Whenever the world's vibratory balance of good and evil is disturbed by an accumulation of harmful vibrations, the result of man's wrong thinking and wrong doing, you will see devastation such as we have recently experienced. The world will continue to have warfare and natural calamities until all people correct their wrong thoughts and behavior. Wars are brought about not by faithful divine action, but by widespread material selfishness. Banish selfishness, individual, industrial, political, national, and you will have no more wars. When materiality predominates in man's consciousness, there is an emission of subtle negative rays. Their cumulative power disturbs the electrical balance of nature, and that is when earthquakes, floods, and other disasters happen. God is not responsible for them. Man's thoughts have to be controlled before nature can be controlled. Rama, an avatar who was one of India's great Hindu emperors, reigned over the kingdom of Ayodhya, whose inhabitants all lived righteously. It is said that during the golden era of Rama's rule no accidents or premature deaths or natural disasters disturbed Ayodhya's perfect harmony. There will be more harmony and health in every home as the individual members of the family live more rightly. When family members selfishly take away from one another, the house naturally will be filled with disharmony. So also with the nations, only when mankind lives rightly will the kingdom of God come on earth. Time is short. You are here today and tomorrow you are gone. 
As a human being, it is your highest privilege to seek God. You should use the freedom He has given you in this life to prove by experiment the eternal spiritual truths. Sin is that which causes you suffering. Virtue is that which makes you lastingly happy. If there is no spiritual harmony in your mind, even a new house and a new car cannot make you happy. You will have your Hades with you just the same. Real happiness can stand the challenge of all outer experiences. When you can bear the crucifixions of others' wrongs against you and still return love and forgiveness, and when you can keep that divine inner peace intact despite all painful thrusts of outer circumstance, then you shall know this happiness. He who ignores the scriptural commands and who follows his own foolish desires does not find happiness or perfection or the infinite goal. Therefore, take the scriptures as your guide in determining what should be done and what should be avoided. With intuitive understanding of the injunctions declared in Holy Writ, be pleased to perform thy duties here. Those who are inwardly content are living rightly. Happiness comes only by doing right. Be happy here and you will also be happy in the beyond. Death is not an escape. You must be good now if you want heaven in the future. According to the law of cause and effect, you are after death exactly what you were before. So make hay by gathering wisdom, while the sun of opportunity shines. The Ten Eternal Rules of Happiness The Ten Commandments might have been more aptly named the Ten Eternal Rules of Happiness. The word commandment is an unfortunate choice, because few persons like to be commanded. As soon as you tell a child not to do a thing, he at once wants to do it. These Ten Commandments are being broken every day, everywhere. Unless their spiritual meaning is understood, people will always rebel against them. The Ten Commandments are eternal rules of conduct that have been set forth in all the great world religions. However, the scriptures for the most part do not explain the psychology and utility of these commandments. People accept them in church but do not act upon them outside of church, rationalizing that these precepts are impractical. Yet the breaking of the Ten Commandments is the primary source of all the misery in the world. What is the utility of the commandments? In the Bhagavad Gita we are told to forsake all else and remember God alone. Absorb thy mind in me, become my devotee. Resign all things to me, bow down to me. Thou art dear to me, so in truth do I promise thee. Thou shalt attain me. This corresponds to the first of the Ten Commandments given to Moses. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. God realization should be the goal of living. Material duties cannot be performed without power borrowed from God. To perform one's ordinary duties and forget Him is the highest sin. Sin means ignorance acting against one's highest good. How many times have you felt a burning sorrow in your heart? Why? Because you didn't act rightly, because God was not first in your heart. The Gita says, Forsaking all other Dharma's duties, remember me alone. I will free thee from all sins accruing from non-performance of those lesser duties. There should be no other God in your life who means more to you than God. Even though Jesus was one with the Father, he said, I do not know all the things that my Father knows. As soon as man begins to worship possessions name fame, anything less than God, he finds unhappiness. Those who worship lesser gods, O Arjuna, they go unto them, my devotee comes unto me. Only God can fulfill man's dreams of lasting happiness. No diversion should be allowed to replace worship of the Supreme Lord. If you study the Hindu scriptures, you will see how they correspond with the Ten Commandments of the Bible. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Symbol worship is all right for a few, but it is more bad than good results. To worship the cross of Christ and forget what the cross stands for is to worship a graven image, because you have lost sight of its significance. When a great spiritual teacher passes on, his image or some symbol of his life is usually kept and venerated, and this is all right provided you remember and emulate his qualities. But if you worship an image without conscious regard for what it represents, then you have forgotten the infinite. To have a picture or a statue of Jesus is acceptable, 
if it helps you to dwell on his divine qualities. Then you are not worshipping a graven image, but the ideal the image represents to you. Whatever worship ritual you perform with the consciousness of spirit is pleasing to the Lord. But in Moses' time many worshippers had forgotten God. They were venerating mere objects, even sacrificing goats to them. In India, it is customary to make a picture or statue of a saint, or perhaps to fashion an image symbolic of a specific manifestation or quality of the divine and place it in a temple. The people offer flowers to God or to the spirit of the saint represented by the picture or statue and meditate on the divine qualities it symbolizes. Such worship is acceptable in God's eyes. True devotees do not allow their consciousness to dwell on the object, but concentrate with deepest love and attention on the spirit behind it. A great saint of India used to go into samadhi ecstatic communion with God whenever he offered his devotion before the image of the Divine Mother in the temple where he worshipped. I was placing flowers at the feet of a stone symbol, he said, when suddenly I beheld that untouched by my body, I was one with the sustainer of the universe. I began placing flowers on my own head. If you can do so, it is much better to concentrate inwardly on God than to focus your attention first on an external intermediary symbol and then transfer that concentration to the Spirit. God is infinite. How could an image encase Him? This is the reason behind the second commandment. We should not worship an image as God because He is infinite. Being infinite, God cannot be limited to any form, human or stone, yet He is manifest in all forms. One can rightly say that God manifests in every man as well as in great saints, for He is present in all. The sun shines equally also on a piece of charcoal and a diamond. But the diamond receives and reflects the sun's light, whereas the charcoal does not. Similarly, all people are exposed to the light of God, but not all receive and reflect that light. To do so, they must purify themselves by meditation and by following the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. When you say the name of God, you must be inwardly aware of what you are saying. Were it possible to look into others' minds when they are praying, you would see that a great many are thinking about almost anything but the Lord. They are taking the name of God in vain. When we pray we should try our utmost to concentrate our whole attention on God, instead of saying God, God, God and letting our minds dwell on something else. An aunt of mine had the habit of saying her prayers on beads. She could almost always be seen busily fingering her beads. But she approached me one day and confessed that although she had been doing this for forty years, God had never answered her prayers. No wonder. Her prayers were hardly more than a nervous physical habit. Don't think of anything but the Spirit when you are praying. Try your utmost to be sincere. The use of beads in prayer and japa, repetition of the name of God, are good when practiced with devotion and concentration. But these all too often become mechanical. They are lower forms of worship. But to whisper God in your heart on beads of love, that is true worship. It is insulting to God also if you sing hymns or chant to Him with an absent mind. The Bhagavad Gita similarly stresses the importance of a concentrated mind while worshipping God. When you pray, your heart and your mind should be filled with the love of God. He attains the supreme effulgent Lord, O Arjuna, whose mind, stabilized by yoga, is immovably fixed on the thought of Him. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Out of a week of seven days, how few people devote even one to God. To keep apart one day for Him is in the best interests of your own welfare. Sunday is the sun's day, the bright day of wisdom. Many never use it to think of God, though to do so is the highest wisdom. If on that day, you could just be alone and quiet for a little time, enjoying that stillness, you would see how much better you feel. Observe the Sabbath in this way, it will be a salve to the lacerations of the preceding six days. Everyone needs one day a week in the spiritual hospital to heal his mental wounds. Don't observe the Sabbath as a forced duty, enjoy it. When it becomes for you a day of peace and joy and contentment, you will look forward to it. 
Seclusion is the price of greatness. You may be surprised at what seclusion with God will do for your mind, body, and soul. In the early morning and before retiring, you should immerse yourself in His peace. India's sages counsel not only a regular day for seclusion, but stress the need for quiet meditation during four specific periods every day. In the early morning before you get up or see anyone, remain calm feeling peace. At noon be quiet for a while before taking lunch, and before your evening meal, have another time for peace. Before going to bed, go into that silence again. Those who faithfully observe silence and seclusion during these four times of the day cannot but feel in tune with God. Whoever cannot manage four times a day should observe each morning and evening the period devoted to God. By doing this you will have a different happier life. If you continually write out checks without depositing anything in your bank account, you will run out of money. So it is with your life. Without regular deposits of peace in your life account, you will run out of strength, calmness and happiness. You will finally become bankrupt, emotionally, mentally, physically, and spiritually. But daily communion with God will continually replenish your inner bankroll. Four times a day sit quietly in meditation and think with all the love and longing of your heart, I am with the infinite now. Father, reveal thyself, reveal thyself. Strive to feel the peace of his presence. Bathe your mind and body in that peace, and you will be much more successful in life. A man doesn't make mistakes. When thousands of others are failing, he succeeds. You must be calm to be successful. Those who do not observe the Sabbath by feeling this divine peace develop great moodiness. They become nervous automatons. Through the portals of silence the healing sun of wisdom and peace will shine upon you. The Sabbath should be a day of rest and cultivation of divine peace. However, activity that expresses wisdom and peace is also appropriate on the Sabbath. Honor thy father and thy mother. The human father and mother should be honored as the representatives of God, the supreme parent who has empowered them with his gift to create man. The mother is God's unconditional love incarnate, because a true mother forgives when no one else does. The Father is a manifestation of the Heavenly Father's wisdom and protection of His children. One should not love father and mother apart from God, but as representations of His protecting love and wisdom. The Supreme Spirit becomes the father and mother to help each child. Therefore honor Him in your parents. Thou shalt not kill. The meaning is that one should not kill for killing's sake, for then you become a murderer. One should not take another's life in a moment of violent emotion. But if your country is attacked and goes to war, you should fight to protect those whom God has given to you. You have a righteous obligation to defend your family and your country. Thou shalt not commit adultery. The ideal of sexual union should be the creation of children made in the image of God and the expression of the pure love of the soul that is felt between marriage partners who behold only God in each other. Those who live solely on the physical plane, never thinking of love or the high purpose for which the sex sense was intended, are in the spirit of this commandment, committing adultery. One is then no better than the animal who has his sex and goes his way. Except for the purpose of procreation, and the expression of mutual true love in the holy state of matrimony, the creative urge is intended by God to be transmuted into energy and divine realization. Insofar as you can absorb the sexual power, you can develop great mental powers to write, paint, or express yourself creatively in a thousand other ways. As you ultimately control and spiritualize the creative energy, you will feel great peace and love and bliss in God. Saints who have thus spiritualized the sexual energy are very powerful, able to demonstrate wonderful achievements in the world and in the interior search for truth. Thus the highest use of sex is the sublimation of its power in order to manifest spiritual thoughts and ideals and wisdom. It is detrimental to your mental and physical well-being if you concentrate on sex apart from the expression of marital love or the procreative purpose of married life. One should not dwell on sex thoughts or act promiscuously on sex thoughts. 
When you can exercise this restraint, you can develop the right attitude towards sex and its wholesome divine purpose. The universe and man were immaculately created by God's will. In the beginning, man also was empowered to create immaculately by will as God did. Man lost this power when he was tempted to concentrate on sexual rather than spiritual expression of the divine creative power. To be enslaved by sex is to lose health, self-control, and peace of mind. Everything that man needs to be happy. Thou shalt not steal. If all the people in a community of one thousand steal from one another, each will have nine, hundred ninety-nine enemies. Therefore one should not unfairly take from others their property or love or peace or any other possession. If you feel no desire to take what does not belong to you, that which you need or wish for will come to you. Dealing begins in the mind when you begin to covet what others have. The seeds of desire must be removed from the mind. Spiritual unselfishness is the way, then one automatically attracts abundance. Unless material selfishness is abandoned, there can be no happiness in the world. Happiness will come only by spiritual cooperation, when all men begin to feel for others' necessities as for their own, and to work for others as earnestly as for self. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. To harm anyone through distortion of truth is another way of disrupting social happiness. If you want to be treated well, you should treat others well. It is important to speak the truth at all times. To be always truthful one must understand the difference between fact and truth. You're truthfully pointing out that a man is lame only hurts, it does no good. Therefore one should not speak unpleasant facts unnecessarily. To tell a truth that would betray another person, and to no worthy purpose, is also wrong. One should not speak untruth to avoid speaking truth, but rather remain silent. Never carelessly or maliciously reveal information that could embarrass and hurt others. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Covetousness is the source of discontent. Learn to differentiate between necessary necessities and unnecessary necessities. The more you covet what others have, the more unhappy you will be. You will spend your life in misery and never find contentment. Seek spiritual riches within, which you are as much greater than anything or anyone else you have ever yearned for. God is manifest in you in a way that he is not manifest in any other human being. Your face is unlike anyone else's, your soul is unlike anyone else's, you are sufficient unto yourself, for within your soul lies the greatest treasure of all, God. Chapter, How to Read Character By studying the character of others, one can become alert to ways in which he can improve his own nature. To study character in a negative way, however, is not right and has a devastating effect. Everyone shuns a character detective who exposes others' faults. Many people who enjoy criticizing cannot themselves stand criticism and may even have the same flaws they so righteously deplore in another. Character study is important primarily in this respect. One needs constantly to take note of virtues in others and to implant those good traits in himself. I study character when I choose people with whom to work, but I have an entirely different standpoint for choosing. Sometimes I let a person that I know is bad be with me in the hope that he will change. If he responds to my spiritual thought for his welfare he becomes better, and if he doesn't, well I take that chance. I am like a medical doctor who risks exposure to a disease in order to help a patient. All doctors have to take that chance because their desire is to serve. So it is with a spiritual doctor. He undertakes to judge others and show them their defects in order to help them improve. Jesus said, Judge not that ye be not judged. He condemned that criticism of others which is done solely out of desire to hurt. Such behavior is unkind and spoils friendship. Criticism has no use whatsoever unless it is given with sincere love, and only when wanted. It should be offered with a loving desire to help the other person. Those who have learned self-control have the right to help others. 
From that point of view, character study is worthwhile. Physical appearance and index of character. One type of character study is based on physiognomy. It is said that the salient characteristics of man are revealed in his body, a very sweeping statement. Not all one's physiological characteristics do tell the real tale of the inner life. Aristotle studied physiognomy as a guide to character. Hindu teachers go deeper. They say that the main thoughts of all one's incarnations are reflected in the eyes. Though the eyes reveal the whole story of the soul, not only of this life but of past lives, still it requires a master's mind to analyze the revelation of your past lives reflected in this life. Once in a while you are walking along and suddenly notice something in the eyes of a passerby, and you think I don't like him, or as the case may be, I like him. Eyes tell the whole story. Fear, anger, jealousy, greed, generosity, love, courage, spirituality, all these qualities, good and bad, cause corresponding reflections in the eyes. Detectives can control their facial muscles so as not to betray by their expressions what they are thinking, but they cannot hide the suspicion in their eyes. A yogi has calm eyes because he is thinking of the tranquil spirit. Facial and bodily features have been studied, even the bumps on the head have been analyzed, but physical appearance does not always tell the story, and different cultures draw different conclusions from their observations. Some say that fat people are luxury-loving and don't like to work, and that thin people are more spiritual. Yet in India fatness in a spiritual person is viewed favorably. Caesar was wary of Cassius' lean and hungry appearance, in which he saw a threat to his power. Some writers have theorized that those who are thin think too much, hence flesh doesn't build up on them. A study of history shows that both lean and stout people have been good rulers. If you are persistently fat now, you were fat many times before, or if in this life you are chronically thin, you have been thin for several incarnations. You have inherited the tendency from the past, and no matter what you eat, that thought pattern tends to manifest itself. Physiognomy as a revealer of character is true if one takes into account the fact that all the thoughts that have passed through a particular mind during many incarnations show in the body. But it takes the intuitive power of a master to read one's physiognomy completely and correctly. For example, Socrates was very ugly. He met a great astrologer who said, Socrates, you are the most evil and wicked person I know. Socrates' students were very angry at the astrologer, but their teacher replied, You are right. I have been all that in the past. But though I have overcome it by wisdom now, still the things I did then are registered in this body, making it appear ugly. No two faces are the same. Each is different because of characteristics that have manifested themselves in this life and in past lives. So it is not a matter of simply judging people as bad or good because their present looks are repellent or pleasing. St. Francis was not physically attractive, whereas his disciple brother Massius was a handsome man. But Massius did not possess as great a spiritual beauty as St. Francis. Emotions as a clue to character. There is another branch of investigation related to physiognomy, that of pathognomy, the study of man's feelings and emotions through the outward signs of his facial expressions and bodily movements, and through study of his emotional reactions to various incidents in his life. Feelings and habits indicate one's characteristics, but some people have cultivated the ability to hide their true feelings because they don't want to expose themselves to others. Two husbands heard the news that their wives had drowned. One was showing great grief and the other was not saying anything, but the one who showed sorrow outwardly felt less love for his wife than did the husband who didn't reveal by his facial expression any pain at all. So pathognomy, finding out the true feelings and reactions of people, is a very deep study. You can analyze people more surely according to their feelings and according to their physical appearance. I combine the two methods for the most accurate analysis. All those who come to me for training I place in certain situations to see how their minds and feelings will react. If they respond adversely I try to correct them, 
but I don't do this unless the person has asked to be corrected and has given me the authority and permission to guide him. Some people are emotionally stirred at the slightest thing. Musicians in this country are as a rule very emotional, and most of your music is emotional because it is written around the theme of human love. In India music centers around the thought of God. That is why it tends to quiet the storms of emotion and to bring out deep spiritual calmness. Not all Western musicians are emotional, of course, nor are all Indian musicians spiritual, though for the most part they are. The Sanskrit word for musician is Bhagavathar, he who sings the praises of God. In dealing with emotional people you can seldom bank on their stability. Today they are enthusiastic about you and tomorrow they leave you. I have seen such persons come to the ashram, and within a few days they would make me feel they were going to be as firmly loyal as the disciple John. Next month I would find they had gone. If anything hurts me, it is when an avowal of friendship is withdrawn by a breach of that trust. When I give my friendship to anyone, I never take it back. Even-mindedness a key to development. One can easily tell the difference between the motor type and the thoughtful type of man. The former always wants to work, and the latter wants to think things through. Both types are needed. Motor types like to act at once. They should be taught to direct their energies into spiritually rewarding activities. In order to help each type to create a harmonious balance, I advise motor types to meditate and think more, and thoughtful types to meditate and work more. People addicted to bad habits, overeating, smoking, drinking, have to be carefully handled. Any obstruction of desire causes anger. If you take food away from a greedy man he will be wrathful. It is useless to try to help such sense slaves until they themselves indicate a real desire to improve. Swami Shankara said that even minded people will know God. The master of the universe sits on the altar of even-mindedness. By even-mindedness man enjoys the perfect equilibrium of peace. One of the three basic qualities predominates in every man, according to Hindu philosophy. Sava is the quality of those who have spiritual tendencies. They eat properly, cultivate good habits, and are devoted to the Lord. The Raja's quality is manifested in those who are active. Such persons keep busy with work until they die. Those in whom the Thomas quality is uppermost fill their lives with quarreling, anger, jealousy, sensuality, and laziness. Any habit that holds you from spiritual attainment should be overcome. You must be the master of your thoughts and actions. It is better to be the active Rajasic type and to have your habits under control than to be the Tamasic type, but the Savic type in whom goodness manifests itself is ideal. Those who want to improve themselves should mix more with savic types. Very few people know in what lies their own good. By this one criterion you can judge anyone. 99% of all people fail under this test. Tell a person for his own good to do a particular thing and he will do exactly the opposite. Why? Because he can't help himself, his materialistic habits are too strong. Very often people won't do what you suggest, even though they know it is good for them just to prove that you can't influence them. Those who really want to improve should mix more with those who are calm and self-controlled. Try to mix with people who are normal, and better still, with people who are supernormal. The weak should seek out the strong, and the strong should seek out those who are even stronger. A wrestler will never increase his strength unless he works out with a stronger man. Animal Characteristics in Man After judging the mental qualities of Sattva, Rajas and Tamas and others, you can analyze their physical behavior. Some say that women are catty. But men can be just as catty. The cat eats the tame canary, and then sits as calmly as any yogi in order to feign innocence of his unwelcome act. Some people enjoy being destructive to others' peace and happiness. Their whole purpose is to disturb and upset, like predatory wolves, they go about in society and seek out fights. Certain types of people have been compared to the jay, chattering all the time. It is said that man was created first, and that the god Twashtri then took the gentleness of the moon, 
the softness of the down from the swan's breast, the beauty of the flowers, and the chatter of the jay, and combining these things made woman. And man was so happy. But after a while he went to Twashtri and said, She is a beautiful creature. I really appreciate her. But she talks without rest, and she has become the bane of my life. Take her back. Then after two months the man again visited Twashtri. I am very sad, he said. Please return the woman to me. But after a while he came again and said, Please take her back. This time Twashtri said, No, you have to keep her. Poor man. He couldn't live with her, but neither could he live without her. Women can complain for their part about men. Unless man and woman understand each other's nature, they ignorantly torture one another. Both were created equal in God's eyes. No man can come without woman, and no woman can come without man. It is the duty of man and woman to attain within themselves a balance between their respective predominating and hidden qualities. Man is guided more by reason and woman more by feeling. Each should strive for an inner balance of both reason and feeling, and so become a whole personality, a perfected human being. Some people behave like donkeys. No matter how much they have suffered from the consequences of sense slavery, they stubbornly go on nourishing their bad habits. They seem to have no memory whatsoever, quickly forgetting the painful results of sense indulgence, and so never learning from their experiences. In nature all the different animals represent different emotions and characteristics, but man has them all in himself. He can act like the snake or the wolf or the fox or the lion. Within us is the essence of Hades and heaven. We should learn to express more of the heavenly qualities. Intuition is the surest judge of character. Though an interesting study of character is possible through analysis of the eyes, the emotions, and the physical features, as has been pointed out, the greatest and highest way to learn about character is through soul intuition. If your mind and feeling remain perfectly calm, you will be able to feel intuitively and exactly the nature of each person you meet. My task is to take all kinds of people for training and help. It is not good to set a limitation on any human being confining his possibilities to a certain analysis, but whether he changes or remains the same, intuition will be able to tell you more than your diagnosis of the eyes, feelings, or physical features, whatever the nature of that person is. Intuition is the greatest analytical power. As a mirror reflects all things held before it, so when your mind mirror is calm, you will be able to see reflected in it the true quality of others. If you are busy doing good to all, remaining calm and meditative, the true character of whoever comes to you will be revealed to you. Chapter, How to Be Happy at Will Date and Place Unknown As you watch the faces of human beings, you can usually classify their expressions into four basic types with corresponding mental states. Smiling faces bespeaking inner and outer happiness. Grim faces denoting sadness. Dull, unsmiling faces revealing inner boredom and calm faces reflecting an inner peace. A desire satisfied produces pleasure. A longing unfulfilled creates sadness. Between the mental crests of happiness and sadness are troughs of boredom. When the high waves of pleasure and pain and the depressions of boredom become neutralized, the state of peace manifests. Beyond the state there is an ever new state of bliss, which the individual can find within himself and recognize as the true native state of his soul. This bliss is buried beneath the exciting mental waves of exuberant pleasure and deep depression and the hollows of indifference. When these waves disappear from the mental waters, the placid state of peace is felt. Reflected in the calm waters of peace is the ever new bliss. Basis of Reactions most people in the world are tossing on the waves of exciting pleasure or pain, and when these are wanting, they are bored. As you watch the faces of others during the day, at home in the office on the streets or at gatherings, you can see that there are only a few who manifest peace. When you see a merry countenance and ask that person, what makes you happy? 
he is likely to answer in this way, I had a raise in salary or I met an interesting person. Behind happiness lies the fulfillment of a desire. When you see a doleful face and make sympathetic inquiry, its owner may reply, I'm a sick man or I lost my wallet. His desire to regain health or his lost money has been contradicted. When you see a face registering a sort of blank neutrality and you ask, what's the matter? Are you unhappy about something? He promptly answers in the negative. But if you press him, are you happy? He will say, oh no, I'm just bored. Negative and positive peace. You may meet a refined well-to-do man living on an estate, looking healthy and plump, and neither unduly happy nor sad or bored. In such case you might say he is peaceful. But when that comfortably fixed person has too much of this kind of peace, which few people have the good fortune to experience, he thinks within, I've had enough peace, I need some excitement and diversion. Or he may remark to a friend, please give me a knock on the head to make me feel that I'm alive. The negative state of peace is derived from the absence of the three mental states of happiness, sadness, and boredom. Without change or excitement, protracted negative peace becomes stale and unenjoyable. But after long continued indulgence in the happy, sad, and bored states, negative peace is enjoyable. For this reason, the yogis advocate the neutralization of the waves of thoughts by concentration to achieve mental peace. Once the yogi has stilled the waves of thought, he begins to look beneath the lake of calmness and finds there a positive state of peace, the ever new joy of the soul. I met a very wealthy man in New York. In the course of telling me something about his life, he drawled, I am disgustingly rich and disgustingly healthy, and before he could finish I exclaimed, but you are not disgustingly happy. I can teach you how to be perpetually interested in being ever newly happy. He became my student. By practicing Kriya Yoga, and by leading a balanced life, ever inwardly devoted to God, he lived to a ripe old age, always bubbling with ever new happiness. On his deathbed he told his wife, I am sorry for you, that you have to see me go, but I am very happy to join my beloved of the universe. Rejoice at my joy and don't be selfish by sorrowing. If you knew how happy I am to go to meet my beloved God, you wouldn't be sad. Rejoice to know that you will someday join me in the festivity of eternal bliss. Drink deep of bliss. Now after observing faces that register pleasure, sorrow, boredom, or temporary peace, wouldn't you rather that your face reflect the contagious ever new joy of spirit? To be able to do this you must drink and drink of his bliss from the cask of deep meditation, until you become a bliss alcoholic manifesting bliss in sleep, dreams, wakefulness, and all circumstances of life that might otherwise tend to make you boisterously happy or abysmally sad or saturated with boredom or temporary negative peace. Your laughter must echo from the caverns of sincerity. Your joy must flow from the fountain of your realized soul. Your smile must spread over all the souls you meet and over the whole universe. Your every look must reflect your joyous soul and spread its contagion to gloom drunk minds. Stop dreaming that you are just an ordinary mortal constantly going through mental ups and downs. No matter what happens, remember always that you are made in the true image of spirit. The living joy in all things, the fountain of cosmic bliss, must shower you with its spray and send joy trickling through your thoughts, through every cell and tissue of your whole being. Remember, for many hours in the state of deep dreamless sleep, which is unconscious soul perception, you are happy all the while. So during the day, regardless of how much you are disturbed by nightmarish mental trials and upheavals, you must keep trying all the time to be inwardly ever newly joyous, like the ever fresh laughing waters of a gurgling brook. As a man can be drunk with liquor all the time by continuously imbibing it, so also can you be drunk with true happiness by continuously perceiving the joyousness of your soul after meditation. When you can constantly feel the blissful after state of meditation, you will live in ecstasy, you will be one with the ever new joy of your soul, and whosoever will be around, you will be like you, even as the constant touch of sandalwood makes the hand fragrant. Their thoughts fully on me, their being surrendered to me, 
enlightening one another, proclaiming me always my devotees are contented and joyful. Chapter Steps Toward the Universal Christ Consciousness In this world we are limited by our thoughts. It is natural for us to be partial to our own ideas, but because of this partiality, we often fail to recognize that the ideas of others may be bigger and better ones. When we learn to be open-minded and not opinionated about anything, we grow in understanding and wisdom. A person is mentally free when his judgment is no longer influenced by the prejudices, customs, and conventions that are imposed on him by racial, national, and familial background. In the West you sit on chairs, in the East we sit on the floor, because the climate is extremely warm and the air is cooler near the floor. But one cannot say that everyone should sit on the floor just because the East finds it more comfortable to do so. National customs and conventions limit our outlook considerably, but as soon as we become free from blind slavery to our provincial prejudices and habits, we can see truly what is right or wrong in any other nationality. As individuals we are to some extent limited by our desire to do whatever contributes to our own personal good. Thus each human being is more or less fenced in by his egoistic desires and experiences. As he increases the range of his experience, his consciousness begins to stretch. It is like a rubber band that can be expanded infinitely without breaking. Indeed, the more you stretch your consciousness, the greater it will be. Learning to love our relatives is simply a training in stretching our consciousness. It is a preliminary practice in loving all others as we do our relations, whom we think of as our own. We have to learn to look on family and strangers alike because all are children of God. He has given you certain family members with whom you are practicing stretching your consciousness. When the husband serves the wife and she serves him, each with the desire to see the other happy Christ consciousness, God's loving cosmic intelligence that permeates every atom of creation, has begun to express itself through their consciousness. Whenever you do something for someone else, without any selfish motive, you have stepped into the sphere of Christ consciousness. If you limit your love to your family, however, you have only that much capacity to express Christ consciousness. When you love your neighbors as your family, your consciousness expands and you express a greater degree of Christ consciousness. When you feel for all people with the love that you feel for your own loved ones, when you have that soul preparedness to do for anyone else as you would do for your own, then you are exactly expressing Christ consciousness. Selfishness is destructive to one's own interests, hence, it is an unwise policy in any relationship or endeavor. Many of the customs in India give wonderful practice in expanding the consciousness through unselfishness. The mother never eats until the children and the father have had their food. As a result they feel for her and have a sympathetic desire to share choice tidbits with her. However, to feel concern only for yourself and your own few loved ones is still selfish. When you do something for others as feelingly as you do for self and family, you leave the little territory of selfishness and enter into the vast realm of Christ consciousness. So the first step toward Christ-like unselfishness is to expand your consciousness to include your neighbor's interests and well-being. It is not necessary to give everything away, but you should have an intense desire to help others and be prepared mentally and physically so that when the occasion arises you can do the same for your neighbors as you would do for yourself. You can do it but you don't. Whenever you find a lonely heart or a brother weeping by the wayside and your heart goes out to that soul, your consciousness impinges on the Christ consciousness. Human love has its limitations. Family feeling is hemmed in by clannishness. Patriotic love is greater, for when you are ready to give up your happiness for the welfare of your country, you have expanded your consciousness on a much wider scale. And when you can feel for all nations as for your own country, your love manifests in an even greater way, you become a wider channel for the expression of the universal Christ consciousness. Jesus could say, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? 
because he was aware that there is only the one love of God manifesting through all individual human relationships. In my consciousness I see no difference in an American, an Indian, an African, a German, a Frenchman, or an Englishman. That comes from the training I receive from my guru Swami Sri Yukteswar. Most parental, social, and educational training tends to foster prejudices. I love all races and nationalities alike. I do not want to be limited by attachment to any one country. After all, we are only Americans or Indians for a little while. When we die we are all the same. We are conscious of being world citizens, we have an expanded consciousness. Psychological expansion of consciousness. You can stretch your consciousness psychologically so that you no longer feel for your little self but rather for the good of the whole world as your expanded self. That is one way of expressing Christ consciousness. Every day you think thousands of thoughts, about a thousand an hour. When you are writing you are thinking, in about an hour and a half, 2,500 thoughts. The ordinary human being thinks about 12,000 thoughts a day. A deep thinker puts forth about 50,000. I have found that by concentrating it is possible to produce as many as 500,000 thoughts in a day. I used to know a man in India who knew 18 languages and was a master of arts in 12 of them. Think how many thousands of thoughts were passing through his brain yet he was never mixed up. You are to some extent conscious of every thought that you think during wakefulness. If you receive a pinprick anywhere on your body you are instantly aware of it. That means your consciousness is present in each of the trillions of cells in the body. At the end of sixty years can you remember all the thoughts that you have had? It seems impossible. Yet all events of your life have been recorded in your subconscious mind and that mind does recall most of those thoughts that were outstanding. The more you develop concentration and memory, the more you can recall. Conscious, subconscious, and superconscious memory. The scope of the mind is very grand. God has given you waking consciousness, subconsciousness, and superconsciousness. Your conscious mind has certain limitations. After a few years it begins to forget various things. But your subconscious mind has a greater memory capacity. Every thought and experience is stored in the repository of subconsciousness. Your conscious mind may forget every word that I am saying, but your subconscious mind is registering them all. Behind the subconscious is your superconscious mind, which never forgets anything. The superconscious mind has kept a record of everything you have done, every thought you have thought. When death comes, all these thoughts and experiences flash through your mind before you leave the body. Those impressions that are strongest determine the environment and habits of your next life. As an ego your consciousness is present everywhere within yourself and is therefore present in each thought that you think. If you can expand your consciousness beyond ego into the realm of superconsciousness, you can watch from that point all the thousands of thoughts passing through your conscious mind. Those who have developed the superconscious mind can remember all the thoughts of a lifetime and of previous lives as well. In divine memory nothing is forgotten. Our thoughts are real and they are eternal, ever present in the ether. All the sounds of the earth are recorded also in your superconscious mind. Thus Jesus could say, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without the knowledge of your father. Think of 1500 million people and the 12,000 thoughts that each one thinks every day. If your consciousness is aware of all those thoughts, several trillions of them, then you have Christ consciousness, omniscience conscious awareness of everything in creation. God gives man a mental barrier so that no one else can know his thoughts. You are alone with your thoughts even though you may be with many people. Even those who have Christ consciousness, do not intrude on the thoughts of others, unless they are ordained by God to guide others, or have been requested by their disciples to take that liberty in order to help them perfect their sadhana. Sympathy a key to Christ consciousness. If you would develop Christ consciousness learn to be sympathetic. When genuine feeling for others comes into your heart, you are beginning to manifest that great consciousness. 
When you talk unkindly about others, you are far from the universal sympathy of Christ consciousness. Jesus said, Bless them that curse you. He practiced divine sympathy. Jesus fought against those who were doing wrong, but he hated no one because he saw God in everyone. Lord Krishna said, He is a supreme yogi who regards with equal mindedness all men. Do not sully your own thoughts and tongue by criticizing others. Be sincere with everyone, and above all, be sincere with yourself. God watches you. You cannot deceive him. God is the whisper in the temple of your conscience, and he is the light of intuition. You know when you are doing wrong, your whole being tells you, and that feeling is God's voice. If you don't listen to him, he becomes quiet. But when you wake up from your delusion and want to do right, he will guide you. He is always waiting for the time when you will return home. He sees your good and evil thoughts and actions, but they do not matter to him. You are his child just the same. In your heart must well that sympathy which soothes away all pains from the hearts of others, that sympathy which enabled Jesus to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. His great love encompassed all. He could have destroyed his enemies with a look, yet just as God is constantly forgiving us even though he knows all our wicked thoughts, so those great souls who are in tune with him give us that same love. The transcendental way to develop universal sympathy is meditation. The man whose mind dwells in the superconscious state is always happy, always wise and loving, and always retains the after-effects of meditation. If you can retain effortlessly that consciousness you feel just after meditation, you have attained superconsciousness. When someone unknown comes before you, you will instantly know all about that person's life. But Christ consciousness is still farther beyond. You feel everything in the universe in your consciousness at the same time. By developing sympathy for all, you can expand your consciousness and learn everything there is to be known. Just as you are aware of your body and limbs and thoughts and brain simultaneously, so when you have Christ consciousness, you will feel the bodily sensations of every human being you meet and know all the thoughts they have ever had. When the scribes and the Pharisees brought an adulteress before Jesus for judgment, he said, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. How did Jesus know about their private lives? He lived in the all-permeating divine Christ consciousness. In that consciousness you are able to feel what others are doing and thinking. Sometimes you even forget momentarily in which body you are living. Metaphysical way to Christ consciousness. The metaphysical way to Christ consciousness is through meditation and holding on to the after-effects of meditation. There are persons who read a few books on truth and then say that they have attained Christ consciousness, but you can have that consciousness only through deep meditation and unceasing spiritual effort. So don't say you have Christ consciousness until you have attained what I have described. Your present consciousness is limited by the body, but when you expand it by deep meditation, you will become aware of the feelings of all peoples. You will be able to know all things. Marvelous realizations will come to you. Sometimes when that state comes, you feel yourself simultaneously in the stars, in the moon, and in every blade of grass. We are a part of the divine Christ consciousness present in all creation. Each individual intelligence is a part of that vast Christ intelligence. We are like the jets in the burner of a gas stove. There are many little holes through which the flames are pouring, but under the burner there is only one flame. We are little flames coming from the big flame of life. Beneath all the tiny jets of human life is one life. Behind the flowers, behind all nature, is one life. When you feel your consciousness in every pore of creation, you have Christ consciousness. Beyond creation is cosmic consciousness. When you lift your consciousness from creation and see the vast eternal joy of God alone, you will be in cosmic consciousness. When you are in tune with that cosmic consciousness which is beyond this creation, you will understand that God begot his intelligence in the womb of creation, the Virgin Mary, 
and that this intelligence of God the Father, which is reflected or born in every atom of creation, is the Christ consciousness or only begotten Son. The sons of God. The Indian name for this universal Christ consciousness is Kutes the Chaitanya. In India we might also call it Krishna consciousness, because the consciousness of our great avatar Yadava Krishna, like that of Jesus Christ, was in tune with the Christ consciousness in everything. These two great ones had discovered the one life behind all life. By divine concentration and will in meditation, they had withdrawn their consciousness from the material world and seen that behind everything in creation is the one reflection of God, the only Son of God, the Christ or Krishna consciousness. Jesus, Krishna, Buddha, Babaji, all are Christs. They had expanded their consciousness to receive Christ consciousness. St. John declared, As many as received him the Christ consciousness that was manifest in Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. My Guru Swami Sri Yuktaswar manifested the Christ consciousness. He was always calm and all my thoughts and feelings were reflected in the mirror of his calmness. Sri Yuktaswarji wasn't interested in what others were saying. He was interested in what they were thinking. It was impossible to dissemble with a true teacher such as my Guru. His consciousness was aware of all that was going on. The Christ consciousness dwelt also in Lahiri Mahesaya. One day when he was discoursing to his disciples on Christ consciousness as explained in the Bhagavad Gita, Lahiri Mahesaya suddenly cried out, I am drowning in the bodies of many souls off the coast of Japan. The next day his disciples learned from a newspaper account of the deaths of a number of persons whose ship had foundered the preceding day near Japan. Life and death are but a passing from dream to dream. They are only thoughts, you are dreaming you are alive and you are dreaming you are dead. When you get into the great Christ consciousness, you see that life and death are dreams of God. Because Jesus lived in that consciousness he could say, destroy this bodily temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He knew he could transform that dream of death into a dream of life, even as God can. Develop sympathy and unselfishness if you would expand your consciousness. I have no consciousness of possession. I can leave everything in a moment if God calls, for I am not bound to anything. And yet all things are mine. In Christ consciousness the whole world, everyone and everything in it, is your own. The whole of space and everything in it belongs to you. When you begin to feel the sensations of others as though they were happening in your own body, you are developing the Christ consciousness. When you cultivate this consciousness and therein understand that everything is yours, you will have no prejudices about race or color. In that consciousness, you feel the love of a million mothers in your heart, not just for a few but for everyone. You do not imagine it, you feel it, this love that Jesus, Krishna, all of the great ones manifested, this universal intelligence and love which is called Christ Consciousness. Chapter, Even Mindedness in a World of Change In the West we find emphasis on physical comfort. When the weather is too warm the Westerner suffers without something to cool him, and when it is too cold he is miserable without warmth from artificial heat. But the masters of India teach a different philosophy. They say that sensitivity to heat and cold, pleasure and pain, accrues from the delusive suggestions of the senses and man's habit of catering to sensations, and that he who is wise rises above all dualities. The great ones do not suggest that man discipline himself to the point of doing injury to his system. Rather, they advise that when cold or heat is intolerable, one should free himself mentally from the sensation, at the same time seeking a common-sense remedy for the condition. The Gita teaches, those who are attached to sense pleasures cannot gain the mental equilibrium of meditation. They fail to receive union with God through ecstasy samadhi. Learning to disconnect oneself mentally from the disturbance of sensations brings peace of mind. That man who remains untouched by the sensations that come and go being neutral to their ever-changing stimuli manifests the soul's essential changelessness. 
In that unchanging consciousness he becomes one with a changeless infinite. Slavish response to the various sensations of the body disturbs both mind and soul. With the disturbance of the soul man loses his true nature which is calmness. God is present in the coldest and the hottest regions of the earth. He is at the North Pole and in the African desert. He is not affected by any extremes of his earth creation, and we, being made in his image, should behave like him. He put us in this body that is subject to conditions of heat and cold, pain and pleasure, but he wants us to look on these dualities with even-mindedness. He wants us to rise above them. We should develop endurance without being rash. When we cannot avoid excessive heat or cold, we should simply disconnect the mind from it. The more we strive to practice this, the more the mind will free itself so that no unwanted sensations can touch the consciousness. Pain is perceived only in the mind. The skin's surface does not feel touch sensations, they are experienced in the brain. One cannot taste, touch, smell, hear or see except through the mind. We seem to experience taste on the tongue, but it is actually the brain that registers flavor. Similarly, when some part of the body hurts, the pain is really in the mind, not in the body part. We have two instruments for perceiving pain, the nerves and the gray matter of the brain. But we perceive only if the mind allows a connection between them. Unless the mind says there is pain, there is no pain. This is the marvelous discovery of India's great masters. Under chloroform you do not feel pain because sensations do not reach the mind. At the nerve endings there are fine fibers through which the pain sensations are relayed to the brain. Chloroform prevents the relaying of these pain signals. The brain is the sensitive instrument of the mind, and all the sensations of the body are reported to the mind through the nerves in the brain. The mind, being identified with the brain, receives and interprets these sensations. A mind made strong by the practice of powerful and positive thinking is less affected by sensations of pleasure and pain. It recognizes sensations in the way God intended, as a form of academic experience. Sensitivity was given to man only to protect the body. Without sensation, one could cut himself badly and not know it. Sensitivity was never intended to cause pain. Animals have not developed this faculty to the degree that man has, hence they experience less pain. Otherwise, the cruelty practiced on animals in some methods of killing would be intolerable. The lobster is put in boiling water while it is still alive. Because pain and pleasure are created by the mind, pain in the body can be lessened by practicing control of the mind then one can experience a sensation without its producing pain, receiving only its guiding or warning message. The Bhagavad Gita goes very deeply into it, and that is what the Gita tells us. Oversensitivity to pleasure and pain strengthens their effects. Reduced sensitivity makes one less subject to pain and less enslaved to sense pleasures. I have trained my body and mind to be less sensitive and have found myself free from sense disturbances. That training is the way to gain freedom. There was a doctor who had such mind power that he was able to perform a major operation on himself. The very thought makes the mind protest that one could not do it because the mind has been enslaved by bodily attachments. But mind can be made powerful by training. The more you discipline your mind, the more it will be under your control. A pampered child suffers greatly over even a little hurt. A Spartan trained child may hardly wince at serious injury. You can free yourself from the sensory dictators. In this respect the system of training given in India under great masters is entirely different from that given in Western schools. Indian masters train their students to free themselves completely from slavery to the body and its sensations. Comforts and conveniences developed in the West encourage pampering the body. As a result, little or no effort is made to cultivate mental strength. In India, we are trained from childhood to nip in the bud the dictates of sensations. In my school at Ranchi we had the children sleep on little mats on the hard floor, and they grew healthier. 
Westerners are conditioned to too many external necessities in order to sleep well or be at peace. In India we were taught to sit on the hot sand in meditation. Gradually we could sit in the heat all day long, and in the coal likewise. As a result of this training I found such mental strength that nothing can affect or disturb my consciousness. When I disconnect my mind from the sense telephones, I am not bothered by anything. Some years ago the weather was terribly hot, extremely so. Everyone else was panting. I was getting by mental association the discomfort they were feeling. I had intended to do some writing, but I was so uncomfortable I could not concentrate. Then I chided myself, what is the matter with you? And I prayed, Lord, the same electricity makes the heat in the oven and ice in the refrigerator. It is cool here. All around me the atmosphere became cool, as though a sheet of ice surrounded me. I began to feel great inspiration and wrote without any difficulty. Another time, many years ago, I was traveling across country in an open touring car. Accompanying me were several young men, all self-realization students, one of whom served as my secretary. He and I slept in the car, sharing one small blanket. The night was freezing cold. When I went soundly to sleep, he pulled the blanket completely off me, and when I half wakened from the cold I subconsciously pulled the blanket off him. This went on for some time. Then my mind said, Why are you behaving this way? It is all right. You are warm. I threw off the blanket and began to meditate. My body became as warm as toast. The students were shuddering with cold when they awoke two hours later and discovered me sitting there immobile. I was in divine ecstasy. They thought I had left my body. Roused from samadhi by their exclamations, I smiled and said, What is all this commotion about? Let us resume our journey. But you were sitting in this bitter cold with no coat or blanket. They protested. Nevertheless, I did not catch cold. I was the only one who was warm. What you must do is discipline your mind to be more positive. If you make up your mind you are not going to catch cold, you will be less likely to catch one. I must be trained to overcome pain as well. Mental sensitivity magnifies pain. To magnify pain is to forget the indomitable image of God within you. Habits begin to form at age 3. The ancient sages of India taught that all habits begin to form in man at the age of 3. It is very difficult to change them after they are set. If your family and environment create early prejudices in your mind, you may carry them throughout life. One of the first things I learned from my guru Swami Sri Yukteswarji was to overcome mental prejudices towards sensations. At the time I first came to him for training, I invariably caught cold if I didn't use a blanket when the weather was chilly. But Master taught me differently. As a result I became free of the cold-catching tendency I was virtually born with. Until Master's training I had caught colds one right after the other. Some people say we should depend only on mind, and others believe we should cater to bodily sensations. Both positions are extreme. According to one theory, it is good to have a physical examination regularly to see how the body is getting along just as one has his car checked over periodically. This is sensible enough but remember you are not a machine. If your mental well-being is too dependent on the condition of the body, a time will come when the mind is so enslaved by the body's demands that no amount of any kind of physical aid helps. This explains why we have chronic diseases. The physical debility became chronic because the mind simply refused to be master of the body. In the beginning it is better to follow the moderate path. If you have a cut put a little iodine on it, but don't depend wholly on medicines. Take adequate, sensible precautions until gradually you can depend more on the mind. Even great masters have used medicines which are, after all, God-created herbs and chemicals. Medicine is not necessary to a master, but to show that God's power works in countless ways he may sometimes choose to use pharmaceutical remedies. In any event, victory lies in the power of the mind. When you know with absolute conviction that you can do without all medication with no ill effect, you are victor. 
a certain master who had broken his arm had it treated and bandaged. When a rich man came to visit him shortly after, his worried disciples thought that the visitor, seeing their master with his arm in a sling, might become disillusioned. Don't pay any attention to these devotees, the saint remarked. They imagine that because you see my broken arm you will think God doesn't look after me anymore. And it is paining too. Another time this same master was in ecstasy, singing about God when he fell on a small pile of hot charcoal nearby. Still he went on singing to God. When the disciples picked him up, they discovered some of the hot coals clinging to his back, burning the flesh. The devotees were alarmed, but the master laughed and said calmly, Well, why don't you remove them? He never complained of any pain. Such is the mental above, Ness masters show. On this occasion the saint demonstrated that he was above pain, and on the other he showed that he was capable of human suffering and of bearing it humbly. Develop an adamant attitude toward the body. The ideas of heat and cold, of pleasure and pain, are produced by the contacts of the senses with their objects. Such ideas are limited by a beginning and an end. They are transitory. Bear them with patience. Why be so sensitive about a little coal or a little pain? Think of the agony of those who suffer in war. But even stronger than the patriot is the spiritual man. He develops a greater mental courage through disciplining his mind to endure and ultimately rise above every kind of pain and trouble. Man's life is totally independent of the body. The body is only a flesh-covered cage of bones in which the bird of life stays for a time. The life itself is totally independent of the body. But the life has become identified with the limiting conditions of the body, hence it suffers. If you analyze body and mind you will find there is no connection between them, except what you give. Only in the daytime do you accept the sensations of the body. At night in sleep, when your mind is detached from the body, you are not aware of its sensations, you feel a deep peace. Being made in the image of God, man can live in the body completely separate from physical sensations. Instead, he adopts the conditions of the body as though they were his own. To be free of sensations, one has to separate himself mentally from the body. Therefore, the saints teach mental detachment from both pleasure and pain. To understand and experience mental above, Ness, one must practice it. I have proved this truth to myself, and I know how wrong it is to be sensitive. Catering to sensations is the cause of all suffering and misery. God didn't intend for us to suffer. He created sensory perceptions to guide and entertain us in the form of mental pictures. He meant for us to use the body instrument wisely, not to become so identified with it that it makes us miserable. St. Francis called the body brother donkey. If one loves a pet dog with a deep attachment, he will be sensitive to his pet's sensations, even though he is not physically connected with the dog's nervous system. In the same way, our body's suffering is due to too much mental attachment to brother donkey. Mind must acquire greater control over the body. To be able to live by the power of mind is wonderful because the mind can do whatever you want it to. How to start depending more on mind? Little by little habituate yourself to heat and cold, to sleeping on a hard bed, to being less dependent on accustomed comforts. While I have been speaking to you I have been utterly unconscious of the high temperature today, but just now as I mentioned the heat I began to feel it. Once I was lecturing in Milwaukee when the weather was extremely hot. In addition the heat inside my body had increased greatly as it does when I am speaking of spiritual things. My mind said, you cannot continue the lecture without wiping your face, it is wet with perspiration. I reached into my pocket for a handkerchief but found none. Then I looked in the spiritual eye and suggested to my mind there is no heat at all. Immediately the feeling of oppressive heat vanished. I was calm and cool. The right way to look at death. Practice these things and see if what I am saying is not true. You can increase pain by sensitiveness and lessen it by mental detachment. 
When a dear one dies, instead of grieving unreasonably, realize that he has gone on to a higher plane at the will of God, and that God knows what is best for him. Rejoice that he is free. Pray that your love and good will be messengers of encouragement to him on his forward path. This attitude is much more helpful. Of course, we would not be human if we did not miss loved ones, but in feeling lonesome for them we don't want selfish attachment to be the cause of keeping them earthbound. Extreme sorrow prevents a departed soul from going ahead toward greater peace and freedom. Most of the people living on earth today were not here a hundred years ago. Others were here before us. And we who are now walking the streets of the world will not be here a hundred years hence. It will be all over for us, and the new generation will not give us a thought. They will feel as we do now that this world belongs to them, but one by one they too will all be taken away. Death must be good otherwise God would not have ordained that it happen to everyone. Why live in fear of it? Those who are afraid of death cannot know their true soul nature. Cowards die many times before their death. The valiant never taste of death but once. The coward lives over and over again a mental picture of pain and death. The valiant experience only the final death, quickly and without pain. If one dies of natural causes or is spiritually advanced, the body of sensations simply drops off, and when the consciousness reawakens on another plane it has all the sensations of the body without any physical form. Awareness is all mind, just as it is in dreams. This is not difficult to picture. In death one merely sloughs off his gross physical body, which is only a lower form of mind, and the cause of all manner of troubles for the soul. Exude peace and goodness. There are roughly two kinds of people, those who continually lament what is wrong with the world, and those who smile away life's difficulties and remain always positive in their thinking. Why take everything so seriously? How wonderful this world would be if everyone were more positive, more harmonious. In the jungle of civilization, in the stress of modern living lies the test. Whatever you give out will come back to you. Hate and you will receive hate in return. When you fill yourself with inharmonious thoughts and emotions, you are destroying yourself. Why hate or be angry with anyone? Love your enemies. Why stew in the heat of anger? If you become riled, get over it at once. Take a walk, count to ten or fifteen, or divert your mind to something pleasant. Let go of the desire to retaliate. When you are angry, your brain is overheating, your heart is having valve trouble, your whole body is being devitalized. Exude peace and goodness, because that is the nature of the image of God within you, your true nature. Then no one can disturb you. Good and evil are created in the mind. In the ultimate sense, everything starts in the mind. Sin is created in the mind. Little children go naked without any consciousness of sin. To the pure-minded everything is pure. To the immoral, everything is evil. An undisciplined mind causes great havoc in our lives. Since enslaved minds are the perpetrators of all wars, cruelties, and injustices, God puts you in this sensate physical form with the intention that you live in the world as an introspecting soul, enjoying the movies of creation without becoming identified with them. That is how God wants you to live, to demonstrate mind control not only when everything is rosy, but in the midst of your troubles also. Far from just talking about it, self-realization teaches you that self-mastery, the dance of life and death goes on all the time but man has the mental power to rise above all sensory experiences of change, to be unaffected by life's inconstancy. The Bhagavad Gita offers a sublime assurance of this freedom. The relativities of existence, birth and death, pleasure and pain have been overcome, even here in this world, by those of fixed equal-mindedness. Thereby are they enthroned in spirit, verily the taintless, the perfectly balanced spirit. When you manifest changelessness you become a king among souls. Changeless within, even though body and mind are constantly changing, you become